I've just been diagnosed with um, three leaking heart valves. Um, the main artery has got a mild leak from the heart going in. I've got two hernias, um, five ulcers, and one's in the food gullet. So when I eat, I can't really eat all the time because it traps it. Um, I've got a blood problem. You know, Darren started going going downhill and um, uh, there was a, a way forward and that was maybe to look at, um, the situation might be different and we'll discuss it in a sec, that we could get this remedied privately for the private healthcare because the NHS, you know, isn't match fit at the moment. So I so said, well, let's do, do a fundraiser. So um, what I decided to do was um, I thought, well, why don't we cycle? So I said, well, let's get together and let's go. So I thought we'd go from beach home, kids home, cycle from there to Glasgow. But, you know, I'm kind of like at a position at the moment where I just want to get better. I want to try and live a life. I'm 52. Oh, wow. I've never been happy. I've never, I don't know, you know, I've only, I met my partner a couple of years ago and I didn't know what happiness was. I spoke to John, um, opened up to John and, you know, he let me share some of my stuff. You know, he let me get some of the stuff off here, which helped keep me alive, you know, and, you know, it helped me then. It gave me a, a voice and I do, and I believe that, you know, I've helped others because people have contacted me personally and said, thank you for what you did with John because, you know, my son was going through what you went through and we never knew and he's opened up to us tonight. You know, we're going to get him help. Coming out and, and voicing your inner feelings on these podcasts uh, has been a new lifeline. Hopefully, uh, I don't know, you know, of, of what's going to happen. Once it's done, I just want to live a life. You know, I just, I, I do, I just want to be, I just want to be happy. That's all I want to do. I just want to be happy. All right, so I've lost count now of the parts we've done with John Wedger. <laughs> He's back again, always a viewer favourite, and always stokes some controversy <laughs> as well. I think many of his views come from people who just watch it to think, you know, and say bizarre things, because we do get a lot of bizarre comments on yeah. these videos. Um, we are going to be using some euphemisms throughout this video to not trigger certain things. And the theme, though, of this video, and the, the main story is the health problems that Darren Jeffrey is going through. If you've not seen our first podcast with Darren, it's about how social services let him down. And that is understatement. It is probably one of the most horrific stories we've ever had on the channel. The viewer reaction, everyone was completely up in arms against the perpetrators of what happened. And everywhere Darren went, he thought he was going from one place to a place of safety. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And he was only a kid. It's an absolute tragedy. So Darren, as a consequence of the things he's been through in his life, has some serious medical problems presently that you have an opportunity to perhaps help him with. We'll have all the links in the description box below the video. And John is going to give us an update on his activism. And, you know, he's always out there doing so many things. There's always so much more news with John and he's such a fantastic speaker as well as is Darren so all the links like I said will be in the description box I'll put the link to the podcast we do with Darren as well and then if you want some organic cotton Jen's links will be, Jen's links will be down there too. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like that. that's a lovely lovely blue top you're wearing as well yeah yeah, so, yeah, yeah it's yeah, beautiful yeah. matches not, the sofa it does yeah that's yeah. why I did it you know yeah, yeah, yeah. not sitting there blending yeah, totally. so you contacted me and yep. you said, you know, Darren needed some urgent help. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's a health crisis. Um, can we elaborate for the viewers on, on that? I know it's a very private matter, but... Yeah. Let, let, yeah. Well, well what's, what's happened, Sean, is that we, we've all near enough stayed together. There has been, as you, as you know, with this world, ups and downs, because you're dealing with people with a lot of profound problems, and there's a lot of pain there. But on the whole, those that started together, we, we, we still are together. Um but we're working independently. So we're all individuals that come together and then we drop out and then we come back again. So we might disagree, but we don't fall out on the whole. So um, I, I periodically link in with Darren 
uh, and find out what's going on. And um, Darren will explain his health problems, you know, better than I ever can. But, you know, Darren started going going downhill and um, uh, there was a, a way forward and that was maybe to look at um, the situation might be different and we'll discuss it in a sec that we could get this remedied privately for the private healthcare because the NHS, you know, isn't match fit at the moment. So I said, well, let's do, do a fundraiser. So um, what I decided to do was um, I thought, well, why don't we cycle, get together? So there was, there's there's Anthony as well, Anthony Roberts, who, um, again, very similar life to Darren, kids home, crime, armed robbery, whatnot, and then going forward to, to help, you know? So I said, well, let's get together and let's go. So I thought we'd go from beach home, kids home, uh, which is down in Banstead in Surrey, cycle from there to Glasgow, right? But and because there's a care home in just north of Glasgow called Quarriers, horrific abuse. And again, I mentioned this in in the last um, interview I did, I think, well, two before that, when I went on about the history of the care homes, how these are just a massive money making trading children, you know, mm. and. Uh, and they've got a survivor group out there. And again, what you see is the consistencies between the survivors. It's all seems to be the same algorithm of abuse and the way they silence the kids and the way they get away with it for decades and decades and then rely on the justice system to suppress people by classing them as, as you know, delusional, mentally ill or just dishonest, which is seems to be how they've got away with it for and so long. Yeah, criminalise them. So yeah, criminalise them. they won't yeah. be trusted in court. So one, one of the survivors, Alan Merritt, and I did get a podcast with Alan. Alan's been on the podcast, Alan. yeah. So I, I rang Alan up and I said, Alan, when was you born? He went, well, born in the 50s, the 1950s. So I went online and I bought a bike that was made in the 1950s. <laughs> oh. I just showed down a picture yeah. of it. I mean, it's, it, it's uh, some of them were going for big money, but this one, was it was only 50 quid. And I went and saw this old boy and he said it was my dad's. And he had it, he rode it till he was 80 and then he mothballed it. So it's, it's, only one owner this it's an old rally bike and it's like the old butcher's bike type thing so i thought well i could redo that strip that down and again there's an analogy between stripping something that is basically dysfunctional and of no use and making it work and making it do a job and it really goes back to when that young lad um i did up a bike for him that he found in in a pond and i did it up and got him to ride the bike that even though someone's thrown it away, we can still make use of it, that sort of thing, you know. And I thought what we could do is a road trip. We could meander our way through the UK and stop at various places. So I was thinking about going into the Midlands where the Blair brothers, the, the two boys that were in the care home in, in Ireland, we'll interview them and then we could go here and then maybe we could do something outside HMP Berwyn where Wilfred is, is now residing. And then, you know, sort of... Um, traverse our way through the UK, you know, over a couple of weeks and on the way, raise money so we can pull it forward and, you know, help Darren. And also Anthony um, is active in in an anti-knife campaign. Um, so so that's what we're doing. But um, and, then, and Anthony's filming things now as well, isn't he? Yeah. So he could film the whole journey, couldn't he? Yeah, which which is exactly what. And then so Darren's going to come along. We Hopefully we've got the transport yeah, I've got sorted it done. out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, transit van. <laughs> it's going to look like, you know, it's, gonna, it's good. Well, well, the other thing with it, Darren, is is that part of the healing process is, is fitness as well. Fitness is so good, sunlight and exercise, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it is, but which is, you know, something at the moment, you know, I'm struggling with yep. because of w what I'm going through. Darren, do you want to yeah. explain to the viewers what you are going through? I know it's yeah. very private, yeah. but if, um, you know. Yeah, no, 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 I've got my paperwork here, which I'll, I'll just cover my address, but I'll show John and Sean afterwards. So I'm going through, um, I've just been diagnosed with um, three leaking heart valves, um, the main artery has got a mild leak from the heart going in. I've got two hernias, um, five ulcers, and one's in the food gullet. So when I eat, I can't really eat all the time because it traps it. Um, I've got a blood problem. The red my blood cells and the white blood cells, they're not adding up. And I've got a problem with the plasma. And I've got um, a problem which i've had since the approved school courtesy of you know mr sydney cook from one um you know i, I basically on the bottom of your you call it your tailbone on your spine and i got a chip out of it 
and because the winter and stuff i suffer really bad i can hardly walk i have to keep wearing um heat pads um you know on medication for it so come sort of like november to like run about now really kind of become a bit of a recluse because i feel bad and i have to drag my leg because my leg goes dead as well from it but yeah i've just been diagnosed with all the heart stuff so and before christmas i um, was putting i've got the paperwork here as an hospital with internal bleeding from it and that was just the distress of people that are kind of like being horrible sort of thing you know one or two so say ex-survivors kind of putting the horrible things into myself and you know we had to move a couple of times because we come across a couple of rogue landlords and you know it, it just i just got when everything as well i got depressed really really depressed because was getting a bit of trouble from the police because you know with shawnee help me with my voice he helped me come through it and i did one video with sean and it was phenomenal you know it really helped me um then we did a second one and I had nothing but hassle from the police, like really coming in saying that they were going to, you know, come for me and stuff. And I was worried because we just got a dog as well. And I was, we was living in Great Yarmouth and I was worried for the dog because we got threats as well. And, you know, it, it all led to like me being like heavily depressed yet again, you know. And of course, I suffer with, the, you know, it's no big secret. I suffer with depression because of what I've been through. And my anxiety can be quite high as well at times. Because, you know, with the illness, dealing with my backlog of my abuse, people that got away with it, you know, certain people that, you know, you can't help but see most days wherever you look. You know, it's, it is what it is on that one, I'm afraid, for the time being. But, yeah, that's where I am at the moment. And I'm waiting now to have um, what is called a My View. And in the folder, I've got eight cancellations where it keeps getting cancelled. So the My View is to scan the heart to really see how bad it is. And how long, basically, you've been told that if it's untouched, I can, I, I can go for about five years and obviously... It's, curtains then you know um we're going with this guy <laughs> frank zappa um so it'd be, you know and but i keep getting cancellation after cancellation they bring me up and say you got on my view for next week and then a day before they say oh covid it's closed it down so you can't come can you wait another month then i don't hear nothing for two three months but you know i'm kind of like at a position at the moment where i've just want to get better i want to try and live a life i'm 52 oh, wow. i've never been happy i've never i don't know you know i've only i met my partner a couple of years ago and i didn't know what happiness was you know i just lived a life where i was just basically to me trying to kill myself was the normal at one time because i was living in bad places surrounded by bad people and i was just full of bad memories you know a lot of hatred and you do because w w when you been in that position do you know what the most important thing is with it all? You hate yourself so bad. And as I told you before, Sean, you know, I really hated me. You know, so, and getting ill for a little bit, I kind of thought, yeah, you know, it's what you get for being raped. You Darren, um, since we last spoke, I've been pulling to the police station and the cops have put restrictions on me now yeah. about reporting on abuse cases. And <clears> one of them is... That because of the nature of what you're saying now, yeah. I have to ask you a question. Yeah. A, a legal question, which is yeah. do you waive your anonymity for this interview? What's that mean, really? That means you're talking about your own abuse. Do you consent to do that on, in this interview? Yeah. Mm. Okay. If you're okay. Yeah. 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 yeah it's publicly yeah. putting your name out. Yeah. Yeah. No problems. Yeah. That's okay. fine. Yeah. Because I've got nothing to hide. So, yeah. 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 That's and, fine. And, and, and before we sat down, you said that one of the health problems you noticed when you went to the toilet. Yeah, it yeah. was basically, um, I had internal bleeding for about four or five days and I didn't know because obviously I've lost a lot of weight and your skin, my skin went all yellow, like jaundice Jaundiced. and it was going white. And obviously not being rude to the viewers, you know, I was going to the toilet and my stools were like tar and they were really like pongy and... You know, and every time I went, I always felt bad. When you get off, you kind of, in a way, you kind of fall off the toilet because you were getting weak. Mm, and, um, yeah, I didn't really tell Kelly because I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. And um, it was, the, uh, that was the Wednesday, Thursday, and the Friday. And 
Kel was at work and I was with the dog. And I just, you know, there's days I was basically crawling around the house because I never had the strength. And I went on the sofa on the Saturday and I didn't come around until the Sunday because it's just completely shattered from everything. And we got the doctor on the Monday who confirmed straight away that I had internal bleeding and had to go into hospital by me. Um, I had emergency surgery because I had a couple of rips inside which led it to bleed. And that was through stress. Wow. It was, yeah, stress caused me two tears. So I went in, I had um, four pints of blood because that's what I'd lost. Um, more plasma because I'd lost plasma so they had to put it into the bone. And obviously two clips in the chest and they're only temporary. They're due to come out any time now. So I've got to go back in pretty soon to have um, the clips out. But when I went in, he says to me, I looked at your folder Six, this was in November. Six weeks ago, you just had two hernias. He said, in six weeks on, we've just found five ulcers. What is going on? How come you got five? And then I explained. I said, look, I've been under a lot of pressure of lately, you know. Uh, and he asked, what do you know to, to cause five ulcers? What gives you, you know, what has gone wrong sort of thing? And I just said, you know, a couple of people have come at me through, you know, just being horrible. Just trying to put me down. Um... I wouldn't beat around the bush, yeah. I had one person that was trying to, you know, <laughs> push me into suicide. You know, they were really being horrible. They were saying horrible things about my partner. And, um, yeah, they were just putting stuff on internet about us. It weren't true, you know. Trolling. Sorry? Trolling. Well, yeah. Welcome to the club, though. Yeah, <laughs> but I think the hardest yeah. bit was when I got, they put it up, but the police rang me and I got, they put it up, that was a, you know, a wrong one. Oh, everyone's getting that. Oh, I know, but that. I think I was yeah. upset because they like they were concerned for my welfare because they said like you know you're okay and I was like oh here we go again you know more grief. Is this it's horrendous? It and is horrendous. They, they seem to always turn to that, don't they? Though that's because that's the, the lowest thing you can call me. someone. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. yeah, I so mean that's what they all got turned to. Yeah, yeah they, someone you know basically it on that you know they basically it was a person that contacted me out of the blue who I never knew from you know a place in Great Yarmouth and basically he was like you know I saw your video I feel really really sorry for you but have a guess what XYZ you know and I was like I didn't contact this person because I had no reason to and all of a sudden they just wouldn't let go they yeah. just literally kept on to push and push and push but I wouldn't respond because I'm not that sort of person I don't want conflict don't believe in conflict I just believe in a quiet life you know I've made mistakes, everybody's made mistakes, but I want to live whatever time i got in peace and harmony, you know, and try and help and do good if I can. And it just, it did, it drove me down. You know, I lived, met Kel, moved to Great Yarmouth, and it wasn't great. <laughs> there was no great, I'm do afraid. You, do you have anything in place, Darren, so that you don't have to deal with these messages yeah. to protect yourself but, from this do you haze? Block them? Uh, yeah, but the thing is, I'm not really great at reading and writing. So I don't really understand a lot of things. Like when you said about the immunity thing, I, I don't, you know, because being in an approved school, you, like we didn't learn nothing, you know, and I, I can't really, it's no big secret and I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm 52 and yeah, I struggle to read and write, you know. Um, uh, yeah, you know, nothing to be embarrassed about. No. Nope. No, I can't really read and write and add up and, you know, I get confused with left and right. I can't use um, what you call them, sat nav. Well, well, it, well it's been statistically um, cited anyway that eighty percent of the of the um, people in prison in the under twenty five category of the lower category category C prison are what they class as level one illiterate. Eighty yeah. percent. I mean, it's incredible. And that's what it is, you know. I, and that's how I block it because I'm really I don't understand what they're saying. So they could put like I had somebody got me yet a week uh, a survivor of saying I went ill and stuff. I made like some of the words like yes and the and and, you know, but the big long ones like that sort of thing kind of thought like, well, can't understand it, too. It didn't mean yeah. odds to me, you know, and it's just you like you do your block, you know, and kind of like got my neighbor to help me and I said, you block, and he's like, right, do this. And that's how I cope with it, really, because, you know, try not to let too much phase, phase me if I can, you know, Sean. Um, like I said last time when I met you you know it was a really nice time and you really helped me and you know I admire you and respect you dude for that and I've always done ever since 
always put yourself and John in like high category, you. you know. I, I was waiting for you, you to send good. me a picture of you raving at Tomorrowland because yeah, <laughs> at the end cool. of the podcast, that was his dream was to oh, go to Tomorrowland. Have you canc- been? No, oh, it got cancelled because uh, you know that's that's what helped me in my life is music. It's a thing, John, called what? electronic dance music. Well, <laughs> 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 Have you got any festivals booked this year? Sorry, any festivals booked this year? Yeah, it's called Hospital. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I, I haven't got. I haven't got the energy. I've. We booked uh, to go. December had just gone to go to Printworks to print see Printworks, yeah. my mate. So I need to go Printworks. Is that the one in Bristol? No, London. London. We were going to go and see Jody Wisnoff, mm. James Grant. Um, who else was there? Yotto. Um, Dosum mm. and you know, but we had the tickets. Oh, I'm a friend, he's on my Facebook, Richie Blacker. You've got to listen to him, he's, oh, send me the link. he's having yeah. it. Yeah. But then it's just come up again now for a two day one this year in London and drum sheds. But Latrell's playing, and I'm a big Latrell fan, mm. but it's good because it's you know, it helps me escape from all the pain in my head, you know, but I get like depressed. I'll put the headphones on and I just think of nice things, you know. Um, and it does. It helps you escape. And music's my escape. And I love, like, say with Sean, we had the tickets booked, myself and Cal, when we were going to go and it got cancelled. Then he was going to put it on again and it uh, got cancelled again. So we got our money back. So, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> But, you know, I'm going to look at next year because this year I'm going to write a lot of it off because of Ill- illness. You know, you're not going to get to do a lot of things and I, I struggle now with walking and stuff because I've got a dog and he's nuts cocker spaniel and I'm, I struggle walking with him I have to have sprays and aspirin and stuff you know and I have to keep stopping and, and there's days I walk like I'm 90 oh. you know yeah, and I've got, I've got a walking stick as well so is this going to be reversible with this treatment some of yeah, this yeah what, what, what treatment is required so with the um, I've got have open heart surgery and I'm, I'm not even nowhere near the my views yet. So the, by the time that I get a my view, you're going to be talking about June. Then I'll get a referral. But I'm already two years into it already. So for me, the clock's ticking now. is going down. And, you know, I can I can feel it in me, you know, because I don't, you know, I don't really eat. I can't really eat at all. I can't really eat much. Um, like my belly's up. But I'm swelling because i got blood in my belly. So it's sw- my body, belly's swollen. So have you got, just got no appetite or when you eat, no, does, I, it, does I, it have a bad I reaction could literally on you? Live on, um, well, I could live on a yogurt a week. I a don't, yogurt a week? Yeah, I don't think of food. I don't think of food oh at all. So you don't get hungry and fancy no, takeaway? No, no, and I could, with the pain, I could sleep about two hours and that's it and I'm awake oh and I just God. sit in the chair. I have a hot water bottle. Um, I'm on tramadol and sleeping stuff and you just yeah, I was going to ask what kind of drugs you're on. Yeah, tramadol, um, uh, a meprazole, um, which is for your ulcers to kind of take them down a bit. Um, I'm on blood thinners, which is the aspirin, and meprazone, which is a heart tablet. And I got the spray, you spray under your tongue as well. And I take, for depression, I take 45 mil every night of... Not gabapentin, because that's for your chest. Metazapine. Wow. Yeah, I have to take 45 mil. And believe it or not, it's meant to knock you out, but because the pain will override it. So I Whereabouts try, do you feel the pain? Like now, as I'm talking to you guys. Ooh. So I've got it there, there, and my back passage is really raw. Have you tried magic mushrooms? Yeah. Yeah. And acid. Because I watched the <laughs> program Fantastic Fungi on Netflix. Yeah. and the wonders of it for stuff like that yeah but the thing is is like do you know you say about like magic mushrooms and hallucinogenics mm. so do you know that um for abuse victims that's their go-to drug due to the fact the test, it yeah. takes you out of where you are yeah, okay yeah. it literally you know it takes you out of the place you're in so like back in like late 80s if you was to drop like a load of acid in a night you know, one, you'd have the best place like to go to, but it would take you out of the body you was in. I could like now and again look out and see my, my old body. Wow. And I could walk pain free, you know, but that was with a lot of acid. <laughs> one well, just, one they, they, they used to give um, the survivors of the ritual abuse that they would be given LSD 
mm. because they needed them awake, they needed them lucid. But when they recalled memories, they had stupid things like rabbits jumping about and all that. So they, <laughs> th- 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 yeah, I spoke yeah. to some woman and she said, all I remember were these giant rabbits and all sorts because she, uh, you know, she was away with it, but she needed to be awake. Whereas when they used them for the pornography, they were better sedated. Um, you know? Do you know what? The crazy thing was back then when I used to do it, as you said it, there'd be like five of us lads and every one of us had been abused. Oh, and we all got together and we didn't know it at the time until we all started talking. We come from different approved schools in and around the southwest. And that was their escape. I got introduced to it. Someone said, like, you know, it just you're not gonna die, but it's gonna get you out of a horrible place for a for a night. You know, you won't feel anything, you won't know anything. And then you know, before it happened, you start dropping and stuff. Well, I knew that I wasn't alone then, because for a long time I felt like I was alone. It's a bonding experience, apparently. Well, it is and it ain't because, you know, I've lost, um, in the last couple of years, I've lost about six friends again on top, you know, through suicide. Suicide? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've lost so many friends recently. I lost... What were their stories? Yeah. Um, I lost three. I lost one of my best friends, uh, Nick. Um, Nick... Uh, house from Bristol. Me and him were really, really close at one time, and he was in three ways with me. And obviously, he went to Kingswood after me. Then I went back to three ways. And but with Nick, it was the fact that he was my age, so we were like forty when we got back together again as friends. But he had a Zimmer frame, and his right leg had completely gone, so he used to walk and drag his leg, so he'd get upset, you know. And um, obviously, he could relate to me and I could relate to him with his illness of how it made him feel, you know, being abused, what it done to him, the place where it put him, it really, really got him down. You couldn't really talk to anybody about it, could you? Because no one understands you. Psychology ways, you know, what's really gone on in your head. And with Nick, I could relate. I could try and talk him out of stuff. And he'd done it with me. Then I had a mate, John, who went last year. He was another one that went through it. And I had a friend called Vlad, King. And he went through it. And I had a mate called Nicky Newman. He tots himself. Yeah. And, you know, quite a lot of others that you just read about. And people, you know, ring you up and say, do you hear about so-and-so? And I was like, no, you know, I couldn't believe it. You know, and it was hard because with with Nick, I I see him the day before. And he kept telling me what I thought he was joking. He'd say, like, you know. Not long now, mate. Not long now. I'm going to get out of this body soon. I ain't going to feel pain. And I'd be like, come on, bro. You know, we've really got to beat this. You know, because I... Used to, you know... <laughs> do, do you know, what you're saying that, Darren, I can always remember being in, in Crown Court in London and the judge there, I remembered him from the family court because he, he was on the family court case when I was going for the application for my boys. Yeah. And at the end of the trial, this guy got 15 years... For abusing this little girl and she was brilliant she was a strong kid you know and the defense turned around and they said uh well we can't be too hard on him because she's she's moved on she's 17 now she's obviously got a job so the damage is done and everything's okay and this judge went mad and he said to me the officer knows me and i was like well, well i do because from the family court and he said he knows that that this sort of abuse goes on for life it doesn't go on and this outlines exactly what you're saying you know the pain goes on and on because when you when you want justice and you want healing they have to coexist so in order to heal you need justice and we are seeing justice denied all the time all the time and especially what we've just seen with you know with the death death of Epstein and then the allegations made against Prince Andrew I mean how must that make victims feel you know mm. with, with, with your situation then Darren yeah how do you stop yourself from killing yourself yeah at the moment um I've got my partner Kelly nearly two years now who told me that you know to believe in myself you know, that I'm a good person, the, the, the shame and the blame is not mine to hold. You can help people come through. You know, you can go on camera and, you know, help her family stay together. Where Because it's not just a, a male thing, it's a male and female, because there was male and female approved schools at the time, you know, and some were mixed. So, 
you know, like she said, you know, you go out and give your voice. Let people know that you're there. Let people know that the, the shame isn't theirs. They can all dare that up and say, hey, you know what? It happened to me. You know, I'm not going to continue to do what I've done to myself. And, it, you know, the crazy thing was, though, before I met um, Kelly and two weeks before I went with John, I actually tried hanging myself. What brought you to that moment? Just couldn't hack it. It was 2nd of May. Yeah, of... Tw uh, what we on now? 22, 20, 2020. 2020. Because that's when I met you. Yeah, and it was two yeah, weeks before. South London, yeah. Yeah. Was that and, anything to do with the lockdown? Um, yeah, and I, I was trying to get help from mental health, someone to talk to. And I just wanted someone to really talk to. I wanted someone to sit down and let me get everything out. Names, everything, and not stop me. Because, you know, you got certain names and they go like, oh, you can't say that, you know, whoa. And I just wanted someone to sit in front of me. And I didn't care if they believed me because I went through it. So it was, that was enough. You know, I just wanted them to listen for me to get off my chest, try and clear my head, you know. And I was never getting it. And, of course, I was going to the doctors, but you were ringing them up and you couldn't get an appointment, could you then? Everything mm, was like shut enough. doors, you know what I mean? You're trying to talk to a doctor over the phone of how you're feeling. It's, it's not working. You know, you can't talk on the phone, can you? And... You know, and I got really, just got really frustrated. I was in a bad place. I was living in a part of Bristol at the time. And it wasn't, it wasn't a good time for me. It really, really, really wasn't. And I just had enough, you know, 2nd of May. And I just thought, you know what, there's got to be, there's nothing more left. You know, I've had enough of the pain, the torment, the torture inside of me. So I tried hanging myself, you know, and um, can kind of sort, Got some, went back to a doctor and this time she let me in the surgery and she said to me like about how I was feeling and I was really, really low and, you know, she said, look, I've been following this chap, you know, guy called John Wedger, he's an ex-police officer, you know, and I was like, oh, I thought, here we go, like, you know, <laughs> not, not, not like that, John, sorry. <laughs> got a load of them. No, but, you know, I thought, oh, another crank, you know, and it wasn't. And, you know, I spoke to John, um, opened up to John and, you know, he let me share some of my stuff. You know, he let me get some of the stuff off here, which helped keep me alive, you know. And it's hard when you go all through your life. and you, you, cause you It's like you're wearing a steel coat. You can't get it off. You're very tense inside and you're very irritable. And, you know, you've got so many triggers in your head that, you know, things you don't like, things you see with people, stuff people say. It kind of sounds like, you know, something from your past. And um, that was, you know, meeting my partner and meeting John and, of course, meeting the great man himself. And, you know, it helped me then. It gave me a, a voice. And I do. And I believe that, you know, I've helped others because people have contacted me personally and said, thank you for what you did with John. Because, you know, my son was going through what you went through and we never knew. And he's opened up to us tonight. You know, we're going to get him help. You know, I had loads. I had loads of personal emails that people were saying thank you like thank yeah. you so much you really helped you know i know it was hard and it was hard and but thank you because you've saved our family you know uh, we're not going to lose our son because we know now why he was drinking or taking drugs because you know that's the thing as well that people um, that's what used to make me mad but because i spent a fair bit of time homeless as well because i kind of felt safe when i was homeless because when you're dirty and scruffy, no one wants to come by you and talk to you. So you kind of felt like you weren't going to get touched. And, you know, in amongst that society, that community of homelessness, there's so many that have been abused. Really? Why they're there. Yeah. Majority, yeah. 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 And, the, you know, then you talk to them about drinking drugs and it's because of what they've been through. And that was their coping mechanism. That was all they knew. Same in prison. Well, yeah, you know yourself. Cause, and most, yeah. most on the heroin to block it out. And that's what he do, doesn't they? You know, and it's, it's it's sad when you see such great people go down that channel. It's a vicious cycle, you know. And, I, yeah. and I've seen some really, really good people that you know have later on in life that in their forties have opened up about what they've been through, and they've hit the brain pipe. And I'm thinking, really, mate, there's just more to life than that, which I now know. You know, I I didn't two years ago. And if you think about it, Darren, that you know all the medication that you went through and everything else, it didn't help to that degree. Yet coming out. And, and voicing your inner feelings on these podcasts uh, has been a new lifeline. And people, I, I get it. I get messages. I, I, I get trolled. Like we all do really badly, but 
And to be honest, I've learned to live with it now. It's just one of them things. I just sorry. ignore it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and they're, they're crackers anyway. Yeah. But the other, on top of it, I was out the other day, Central London, and um, this black girl comes up to me. I said, I know you, you're John Wedge. I went, yeah. She said, can I have a hug? I went, yeah, of course. And she said, <laughs> it's because of you I'm still alive. And I went, oh, wow. I was joking. Wow. She went, no, John. What you got? So this is the importance of these podcasts. And I know there's a lot of turmoil in there, but we can't lose focus of what they're for. Mm. They are to give a voice to the voices, something which the mainstream media is deliberately ignoring. Yet, while the law allows it, we've still got this channel to use to to positive effect. And these people out there, John, I mean, Darren has just come here and said, meeting you basically was one of the things that saved his life. Yeah. Yeah. And yet these horrible people out there are still going to watch this and send nasty things. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? And, incredible. And, and especially when, when I started then talking about the ritualistic side of it, and then I got attacked by this other genre of... Very, and like we mentioned prior to this, they'll put out videos and they'll say, John Wedge is stealing money, John Wedge is um, doing this, John Wedge is defrauding people, John Wedge is... You know, all this stuff like that. But they never deny the allegations I'm putting against them. This is what you lot do when when you hold these rituals. You're doing this, this, and this. We don't need to go into it. But no one actually, one of these worshippers of that deity, ever, ever comes on board and says, look, actually, you've got it wrong. We're ancient. We do this. We do that. They don't. They don't deny any of it. All they do is attack. And there's a saying in the Bible, they'll see the speck of sawdust in your eyes, yet ignore the log in theirs. And it's so relevant. You know? I urge people, if you're not familiar with John's work, I urge people to go back to podcast one with John, which we just reposted with some edits. They told him, if you keep blowing the whistle, or in the beginning it was, if you keep helping these kids, he was assigned to help these kids. If you keep helping them and filing these cases, because where there was none, there was like, suddenly there was hundreds, because John was actually doing the work. If you keep doing this, you're going to lose your job, your family, your pension, everything. John lost everything yep. for the truth, for his activism. And these people who said that he's doing uh, GoFundMe things, it's, it's like anyone who does a GoFundMe, people out there are just jealous. They sat there in the mum's houses with popcorn in their ass cracks and they're thinking, <laughs> why is he getting this money when I should be getting that money? I'm going to spoil that on him. They get yeah. on the computer and then they report they're it. They're usually yeah. always rolling a fag online as well. They're usually always got a roll up. <laughs> and another thing, <laughs> you think you're flitting around the world in luxury, yeah. John, on the back of these golf like one, one I've known John for years yeah. now. He puts every penny he has raised into his activism. He's not going around. No, no I'm not living in riches. Living in luxury. No. I, gu- I guarantee that. I've, I've known him for years. He's the most sincere, altruistic person, or the most sincere, altruistic podcast guys we've ever had. And a lot of the podcast guests come on and talk the talk. John is 24-7 yeah. on the front lines doing yeah. stuff which we, we we could get to. I've had 10 people sleeping in my in my house. 10 oh, people wow. on the floor wherever I can. What, but, homeless? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, there are people that are in trouble that needed help, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, one lad, I, I put him up for nine months and he was in a, he was in like a, a home. He'd, he'd, he'd left the care system and they put him in this place and, and he couldn't afford to heat it or anything. I said, no, you come and live with me. And he went on to join the army you know, and he, he sends me messages, you know, you've been like a dad to me, Father's Day, he always sends me a message. So it, it is upsetting, but they know it's upsetting. They, they know exactly. But if, if we if we go back like, to the care system, I've just, um, well, last year I gave evidence um, at the government inquiry and I was one of two court participants. So it was quite high status. And again, what happened was um, the solicitor's firm got attacked by trolls. They kept ringing them up, ringing up the inquiry, wow. trying to stop me giving evidence. Um, and the the and the government refused to give me live evidence. Um, they tried to take my statement away. I gave I submitted the largest statement on that part of the inquiry, something like fifty pages. And um, when the government gave it back, when we argued over three day legal argument to get the statement back, they repaginated it. So page one was next to page eighteen was next to so it didn't make any any sense in chronology. Mm. So they and then they Nothing only give them yeah. a little bit of time to put. It. Luckily, I had a brilliant legal team, and we got it in. And I put in five recommendations. They've been implemented. And when we look at what were those? Well, it was all to do with the care system and and how we we're ignoring it. 
Um, so one of them was victim blaming. Again, we see this all the time. It's a lifestyle choice. Oh, come on. You know, how are these kids, mate? And what I say to adults is this, right? Ignore it. Please ignore child abuse, right? Because leave it to children. They'll sort it out for themselves. I mean, but that is a government attitude. How are the kids going to remedy this? They can't remedy it. They need us as, as adults and protectorates to pull it right. But people, because it's not on the front door, they can't see it. So my argument was it needs a proactive approach. You cannot be reactive to this because if you don't look for it, you ain't going to find it, right? And if you don't want to talk about it like we're doing here, yeah. mm. then no one knows. And if you don't want to hear it, you you sit down at any event, uh, social gathering, whatever, and you start talking like this, what we're doing. And we're only doing what tribal people used to do. We're expressing problems so healing occurs. They go, can we not talk about this? Can we not talk about this? You know, and what they talk about, football, celebrity, come whatever, skating on thingy. And <laughs> Love Island. <laughs> Love Island. <laughs> you know what I mean? and, it's, and they don't, they want to live in their little bubble. And all the time, this is going on. So the figure, a figure come out that over 100,000 kids go missing every week in the UK. Now, that needs to put in a context. They don't go missing and never reappear because by the end of the year, you won't have any kids in this country, you know. They do reappear, right? But they go missing for a short period of days and then they come back because they are being used for crime, usually prostitution. Kids are used for sex and that's it. And why are they used for sex? Because people want to have sex with them. So whether they came to, to worship a deity or do this or do that, under duress, it's nonsense. They choose to do it. It is a life choice they made. Kids don't have a choice. So um, I I said on my evidence that when I went out there, I'd approach the kids' homes and say, how many kids you got? Usually five. How many go missing, you know, on a weekend or whatever? And they all consistently said between two and three out of the five would go missing, right? Now, if we look at my findings on that small microcosm, so within 10 minutes, I'd, I'd found... Um, I think I'd found 10 kids. By the end of three days, I found 50 kids. And bear in mind, I was told for that borough of London, which was Haringey, that an officer had been looking into child prostitution in that area and had not found one case in two years. I was there and in 10 minutes, I'd found 10. And this was part of my evidence. What is the process of finding these kids? Well, they, they, they reappear. They right. just reappear. Yeah, but what they didn't do is they didn't debrief the children. There was They should have been taken in, debrief where you've been, who you've been. When you talk to the staff and said, right, come on, what, what happened? And they all said the same. There's a car parked up the road. There's two men in it, you know, um, and then they bib the hooter and then the girl runs out. Some of the staff were actually writing it in an occurrence book. Some had a little bit of vigilance about them. Crazy. But there was no need for them to do it. We have 55,000 children's homes in this country, in the UK, 55,000. So if they're losing two to three, that ties in. That That's what I was saying would happen. So two to three out of the five would go. So between two-fifths and three-fifths of the kids were going in, into, into this vile criminality. Well, that ties in with the statistics because that is about 100 to 110,000, maybe more. Um, and again... They now have to look at the ethnicity of the kids and the abusers because all we hear about is Muslim grooming gangs, Muslim grooming gangs, which are a reality. No two ways about it. And we've just seen um, that video that's gone out with Tommy Robinson's done about the um, uh, thing in Telford, which highlights that. And, you know, but however, when I was in London, I never really dealt, I did deal with some Muslims that were involved in it, but majority of them were kids from care homes. That, and they all come from the yeah, cases. Yeah, they going, aren't they? They? yeah, yeah. You know? Well, they all do. So, so this this statistic now mm -hmm. looks at there is a bigger reality. 80% of kids are abused, taken out and used for crime within that family environment. 80% of it. Um, so it's putting everything in context. And my evidence was corroborated by survivors, kids that have gone on to give evidence, and also the CPS. And I think Bristol Council also... Um, uh, backed up what I'm saying, you know. So there was a police trying to subdue me and threaten me, whereas on the other side of it, you've got the reality of the independent inquiry, which went for nine years. So I said, no, he's right. So this is why I'm happy to see the commissioner of the Met Police now stand down under duress from, from the mayor of London. I'm happy personally to see that. 
because I think there has been a failing because when I was exposing it, I was the one that was the target of attack instead of, I'm, I'm the one who made the allegation. So I've never, ever seen this in my career where someone makes an allegation and they get attacked and, and the perpetrator doesn't, which is what happens with child abuse. It is the reverse, the inversion of normal protocol. Here's a message from our sponsor. Do you really need all those streaming services now that you're back in the office? The pandemic almost required us to have 12 different streaming services. Yeah, Zoom, Restream, YouTube, Going Live. It's, it's endless. StreamYard. StreamYard. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you're back in the office and you've watched every show available, what is the point of spending hundreds a month on streaming services you don't even use? Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's something that drives me mad. Absolutely mental. Of course, it's a business scam out to get you. <laughs> Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take care of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions. That you don't need, want or simply forget about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Which is approximately 500 quid. <laughs> <laughs> because these damn companies make it hard to cancel your subscriptions, Truebill makes it incredibly easy to cancel. Just link your accounts and Truebill will make it easy to cancel your subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there for when you want to cancel any unwanted subscriptions. So you don't have to. Take control of your subscriptions with the new free Truebill app. Truebill helps you discover hidden unwanted subscriptions and cancels them with just one click. Like Jennifer B, he says, with your help, our family has saved $587 this year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start cancelling today at truebill.com forward slash Sean. S-H-A-U-N. So go right now to truebill.com forward slash Sean. It could save you thousands per year. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. It's very important for the podcast production and the links as usual are in the description box below this video and we see this all the time in the crown courts um where they're coming forward and they start then attacking the survivors mm. don't they say you're a liar and everything else but that's what they do because they, they got to silence you because they know the truth that comes in such great waves yep. mm. and the people it implicates as well that the people that you know we're not, you know, we're not afraid to name because of what they did to kids. So that's why they try and silence a lot of it down. They try and like, there was a thing went there that they said that, um, I forget who it was, who was in parliament at the time, that they were, you know, us kids from approved schools were not to be believed yeah, yeah, because yeah. of the pressure we've been put under and that, that what we come through, that, you know, they didn't want to hear us because they knew that they were scared themselves that they would get mentioned from around the country. Well, well Boris Johnson equated the money that's been spent on historical yeah. inquiries as money spaffed up a wall, which is akin to spunked up a wall. What an analogy to use. And we even approached him and we said to him, I explained who I was. They know who I am. Uh, Theresa May has mentioned me in Parliament. The Home Office knew, the Home Secretary <laughs> knew who I was. Do you know what she said about you in Parliament? Um, <laughs> yeah, it well, well it, it was myself and another campaigner called Chris and she turned around and she said, I'm aware of the works of, of, of this guy, Chris. I won't say his other name. And John Wedger, I'm aware of it when wow, it was raised. congratulations. And yeah, so a little pat on the back. And I had the, the minister, <laughs> there, there you go. The minister for policing and crime stood up um, in, in a meeting in parliament and said, had he not stood by me, that he didn't think I'd be alive today. The day after he made that speech, to Nicholas Hurd, who was the, the new former Minister for Crime, Police and the Fire Service, and six members of the Home Office okay. in Parliament. The next morning, he was removed from his post. Was he? Yep. He wow. was then Minister in Charge of Pens and Toilet Roll. And this is what we do. We, we, we collared Boris Johnson just before he was 
um, going up. putting the Premiership. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we said to him, please, Boris, look, you know, this is who I am. And he sort of nodded. Um, and he said, I said, look, this is what we're campaigning for. And he went, nothing to do with me. And he just wasn't interested. He wasn't interested. So it's not a priority. 80% of, of offending offenders have come from dysfunctional backgrounds. I'm not saying it's sexual abuse backgrounds, mm -hmm. but a good percentage of them, let's be real about it, will be. We know that um, it was cited by, by a senior family court judge that a third, they, they said the conservative element uh, estimate was 25%, a quarter of society has been affected by sexual abuse. And he turned around and said, no, a third. It, this is greater than that. So it affects, it is. it really is the epicenter of this rot. But attacking the victims is the wrong way. This is, when you see um, ministers, police and crime ministers, crime commissioners, uh, senior police officers talking around about what we need to get to the root of the problem. How better can you get getting to the root of the problem where you've got me as an ex-detective sat next to Darren, an ex arm robber, Anthony Roberts, another ex-bank robber, and we are friends, we yeah. are buddies, and we are going out there campaigning on the street, on the front line, out, all on our own personal expense, most of it. If someone chucks a couple of quid, good on them. It'll go a long way. And we're getting the messages out there. Between us as a collective, we have touched lives and we have turned people's attitudes round. We'll never know the full extent of what we've done. And that is thanks to the huge profile that you've got here. Sean. Definitely. And, definitely. And, and this is what we're doing. So how can they proclaim to do this yet with no effects yet we do it Darren. yeah but that's, uh -huh. the, that's the thing that's why you know like if it weren't for the likes of sean you know we couldn't get the message out to yeah. greater places because sean's you know known like here and well, here the right. globally yeah the viewers actually let's credit the viewers as well for well, sharing yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely and spreading the word and liking and sharing these videos yeah uh, it is though it's because i think it's because it's you know you, your likability as a person you're a good interviewer you're a good art person and you know, people got is respect he? for you. I was trying to steer it away from me then. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Put me right back in the spotlight. Didn't <laughs> no, no, but it is no I appreciate that. I'm, I'm blushing. Like, no, I'm blushing. You know, credit very for Thank you, you Sean. Thank you, you. You've done me a world of good. And you know, mm. what you've done for me, I've did for other people in return. Mm. And you've saved a lot of lives just off that interview. You well, when I got out of prison, um, people had me on their shows and, and things, and and helping get my story out, yeah. save my sanity. So I felt it was my duty with as I built my own platform to, to keep that going. I, I reckon we're going to change the law because I'm getting a lot of yes. ex-servicemen come to me. You said that, yeah. yeah. And they're saying, Bloody we want hell, to help. what a podcast. Yeah, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's amazing, isn't it? But, and, and there was one group, they ended up, you know, the lot near you, they got their camp raided, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, the yes, yeah. Um, the one up in Bath. Yeah, PTSD. yeah, PTSD. Yeah. Camp, they said that under the Terrorism Act, that they went crazy. In, because of, they're worried. They're worried because this has controlled global politics. Let's get this right. It has, and, and that has, has been proved by independent inquiries, but also information that's come out with groups like PI, Pedophile Information Exchange, which had links mm. to the intelligence services that's and correct, central yeah. government, you know, and we saw it with Operation Conifer when you got Wiltshire Police, Mike Veal exposed that Ted Heath was actively involved. New tree in, and stuff, new tree, yeah. So it has, so it's going out there, but they're, they're worried now of, of us getting together, but do you know what? there's nothing they can do about it because it's happening. Because people are fed up of seeing perverts in positions of privilege, power, and position that are abusing it and touching children. It's got to stop. Well, everything seems to be coming out the shadows now, doesn't it? So, but yeah. the, more, the yeah. more we cover it, the more flack we get then, because we lost yeah, the channel course. twice over it last year. Of course. Yeah. But again, it's it's because it's you know what you're trying to do. You're trying to highlight it, but in a in a, in a light way because you really can't go hammer and song can you you've got to be careful no. because of the strikes you know they say that that's offensive you can't say that but yeah it's all right for them to put the strikes against you but all we're doing is letting the world know what we've been through is our pain it's not youtube's you know it's nothing to do is as us you know i'm not here now with a gun to me head saying i gotta talk i'm coming here because you know it, it helps relieve stuff off of my head it helps get the pressure off it keeps me normal. Do you feel like you get sane. a buzz doing podcasts? N no, I don't. You know, I don't get a buzz. No, I don't. I come away buzzing. Do you? Yeah. No, it's just, I felt it when you do a podcast that you just, you're helping someone in my heart. I'm thinking that just say, for instance, you had like, I don't know, 
a million people. I'm, I, I always open pray that under the nose are survivors and that they seek help after because that's what it's about. It's about people. You know, my, my mission, you know, once all my illnesses are done and I can live a bit, bit of a better life, you know, I'd like to, you know, continue to go on and, you know, let people know that it's not theirs to old. They can share it with other people because you haven't got to be embarrassed. And, you know, with the interviews, no, it's just, you're open, aren't you? You're spreading the word a good measure, you know, like with John and Sean. Well, well one of the things I say, because people say to me, what advice would you give? And I say, right, there's only one bit of advice. Do not infight. Don't fight each yeah. other. And that's to survive. Don't fight each other. Your enemy is not each other. Exactly. You, you should know. all work together, you know, and that's that's what I didn't get with, you know, when you watch like YouTube with all the wars and I think, man, that's you know, bollocks. just just be just be friends because mm. life is too short. We're not here for a long time. We're here for a short and good time. Just make the most of it because, you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. You know, no one can, you know, we got plans like mine would be to get out and take the dog for a walk. Yeah. You know, whip you do. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's not it's not happened yet, has it? You know, I got to make it to that stage. You know, and you know, um, that's what, you, and that's, that's what I didn't get when people really, really got all the infighting. There's no need. Just be grown up. And it's, it's, it's kind of tacky to wear your dirty laundry over the internet. It's not nice. Well, well I will say to everyone, work within the parameters of the law. Yeah. And and I tell the police if I get information, I tell them. We had a meeting with West Midlands Police a little while back, high level meeting. And we, wow. we told them exactly what we found. You yeah. know, this is what we've got. This is the information. Got. I went and got statements and I served it on them. If they did nothing, that's up to them. But I'm not going it independent on that front because th th you will be taken down and you'll end up in prison. You will yeah. be because, again, look, it was at the lady, is it Mel Shaw? Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, she spoke out, you know, yeah. dropped mm -hmm. names and, you know. Mm. What happened to her? I, she, she, she got... Um, John knows more She about had her. a photographic memory and she's um, a survivor. And she knew so much. She even knew, um, again, I don't want to say too much, but yeah. there was someone very, very high up. She even remembered all the numbers on their credit card. And um, she got um, arrested. They always arrest them for something minor. And then let, I can't remember exactly what she got nicked for, but she got put away. And now she's um, they've sectioned her and they put her in an institution. So that could be an indefinite tariff. And we see this all the time, anyone who does it. And I say this when I podcast, I said, if you go outside the parameters of law, you are going to get the maximum. Mm -hmm. So you either go you into will. prison or a mental home. Yeah. 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 And and if you look years ago, what did they used to do to the kids? They were The kids' homes were always next to a mental institution. Always. And they, boom, you, you know, Sue, they, they did it to Sue. Um, Sue she, Peaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She walked in on when she was in the care home and she caught um, one of the housemasters raping a six-year-old girl. She was 11. And um, she went and told, she reported it. She said, look, I've just caught Mr. So-and-so doing this to little whoever. And she was caned, caned a girl, you know, um, and then she was sectioned. I mean, they, they sectioned away forever. Um, anyway, she managed to get out, but that's what they did. And she spent years in a mental institution as a young girl. Uh, and they did this legitimately. This was done within, and they, of course, they would have to lie and they'd have to bear false witness but then the, the full statements would have gone onto the likes of Darren's record, you know, as, as a fantasist, mm -hmm. a liar. So years later, when Darren then, you know, after years of crime, usually crime of theft, and that's classed as dishonest crime, goes before a court um, after making allegations of people who have done this, and they'll turn around straight away. And under the new um, provisions of the 2003 Criminal Justice Act, we'll pull it on him. Well, you, you actually you know, to the jury, you know, members of the jury, this is a man of dishonesty. You say the word dishonest to people, what do they think? Liar. Liar. Straight away. Liar. You're Liar. Not, yeah, because yeah. the jury is persuaded straight away, see, by your criminal past, yeah. even though it was many, many, many moons ago that you're speaking about something which has happened to you, which has nothing to do with your crimes, but were what led you to the crimes. You know, you haven't got a leg to stand on. That's why you've got to be so careful on, you know, what you say and how you say it now, because you got to protect yourself because... You know, the police are quite crafty. They, Like John said, they will pull you in, but then they come up with the old trick that, you know, we had you in a cell and you were trying to top yourself, right? Or so you were banging you off the minor walls. Then. Yeah, yeah, so therefore, for your own safety, we're going to section you. And if you can't articulate mm -hmm. 
and then they'll put a bit of paper in front of you, just sign that. Yeah. Can you read and write? A lot of people go, well, yeah, I went to school, yeah. But of course you can't. You, no. you can't articulate. You can't elocute yourself properly. And um, what did the police where you always just say to people? Oh, just, just admit to that we'll do your favour and my mate said since when did we ever do anyone a favour it was a stitch up <laughs> and that's how it yeah, was from an you know? I mean like like I said before someone said to me once I went you must have been involved in seeing things well I'll, I'll be a fool to ever say well yeah but I'm telling you now there were practices that went on especially in, in the bad old days which were horrific and it was institutional and it was it was institutional and it was just Man, if they if they had body cameras then and they showed this, mm. no one would believe it. They're going, how this this is like a third world military junta doing this, but that, it was the norm in some departments. Um, and you know, to be honest, I managed to sort of transverse my way through all of that. But when I come across a cover up with children, that was something that no way, not on my watch, and I just couldn't believe the attitude towards me for doing it. And no one stood by me. They were all gone. And I was just thinking, why? And it was only, I'm telling you, it was only Jimmy Savile being exposed. How ironic is this? And that's going to be the name of my book, Ironic, because this is <laughs> this situation's ironic, Darren. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You're writing your book, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on way now. I'm on way with it now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and someone said, Call it ironic. I think everything is ironic. You know? Okay, I, got, yes. I got baptized as born again Christian by an ex murderer. You know, in the States, so everything is... Brian. Yeah, brilliant. You know? <laughs> and it was a big scar down his face and, you know, yeah. tough guy. You know, Sorry, uh, training him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everything is, is ironic. And, um, you know, and I, 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 I'm just not having it. I'm not having it. But, you know, it, it does give me hope because when we get together and people like Chris Lambriano, 82 years old, still on the street. He was outside Scotland Yard the other month campaigning. With Anthony, yeah. and there was something that's brought us all together, Darren, didn't we? Of course it is, because, you know, like with Chris, and you had his brother Tony, and you got Jimmy, and, you know, but Chris is a good guy. He's good a man, man yeah. of God now, yeah. and, you know, he, he knows his stuff. He's he's influential, you know, and and what I like about Chris Lombriano is that he doesn't big the fact that he was with the craze, but he never bigs it up, does he? Not now. He used no. to, but not now. No, he don't now, I know, but... He, he said there's only one he wants to talk about, and that's Jesus and not the craze. Yeah, but... <laughs> but... Again, if we look at the the Falkland Islands, you know, there was, I don't know, 2,000 soldiers, I might get, you know, put right on that one, died. Um, British servicemen died in that battle. M many, many more killed themselves afterwards mm -hmm. because they couldn't cope with it. They just couldn't cope with the trauma. And and I think if we ever got the statistics of how many people commit suicide and what the link is, well, you'd it'll be, be horrific. Like I said to you, and I said at the beginning of the podcast, you know, I've lost about five or six in the last year of friends, you know, literally. And you, you kind of dread, you know, looking at Facebook and stuff now because you know that you, you, I see people and that they're not in good places and you try and message them. And I think it's hard to reach out to them because I'm going from my own battle at the moment, you know, and I'm, and I'm trying to, you know, there's days I keep, I'm trying to keep me sane as well. Cause you, when you start worrying about other people, then I have to look at myself in the mirror and think, well, my health's not there. Then, you know, I, I dwell then as well. So you, I could have, you know, if it weren't for me and John and Sean, I could have been a statistic. Well, I, I know I would have, because in my head, I had nothing to live for. You know, it was just more pain. Another birthday brought just another bad memory for me. You know, that they, they, they should have been times of joy, but they weren't for me. You know, it was just a, another bad memory. You know? and, and if you look now with, with the prison system, they're locked down. They're like 24-hour lockdown, especially over the COVID. Yeah. I mean, I'm are. in touch with poor Pepsi and he's, he's slowly, yeah. his mental health is going. It's, it's dropping away. And again, he's a victim. Yeah, yeah. Pepsi, Adam, guy called Adam Watson. Yeah. You know, he, he, he's a victim, the poor chap. And again, you know, he's an IPP, but he's shut behind the door and it's, it's not helping. And, and the hope's gone. The hope's gone. And you can you can hear it when you talk to him. The hope has gone. He said, now that's 13 Christmases I've done over my tariff inside 13. Well, I was like, that's his life. How many did you do? Eight, nine Christmases? Six. 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 Yeah. It's had a long time. You know, but again, you come out the end, a good guy. You know, you literally had your battle, didn't you? you know? And on the subject of, um, like, soldiers, more than half my friends in prison were soldiers. Were they? Come back from, with PTSD from the wars, didn't get any help from the government, 
and then went on to street drugs to self-medicate and ended up in prison. And that was in Arizona. In Arizona, and yeah. Did you ever find it, a lot of people that you were with in Arizona at the time, they had problems in their childhood. Oh, they yeah. left, again, with Third, drugs. This is the yeah. thing, right? So when I was a, a kid, you know, our drugs education, egg frying in a pan, this is your brain on drugs. Heroin users are like zombies who live under bridges and mm -hmm. go out stealing and, and, and robbing cars yeah, and all this yeah, stuff. yeah. So that was what I had in my head. Go to the uh, the jail where ninety about ninety percent were injecting heroin. In there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But then hearing the sad stories of what had led to that, which I had never. I've, this is how I woke up to what was really going on in the world because had all these parasitical corporations making money off it. Private prisons just won hundreds of of them, sixty thousand a year, taxpayers' money per person. And hearing the stories, thrown away as kids abused as kids, seen the parents murdered, been molested, and on and on and on and on it went. And they'd never been given the tools to deal with the trauma. Never are. So they'd gone on to the hardest drug to block that pain out. I've been there. Which then led to the criminality. Mm. So for the men, robbing, drug dealing. For the women, shoplifting, sex work. You see it over yeah, yeah. and over and over and over again. But it's exactly the same over here, exactly yeah. the same. It's, like, yeah. it's identical here yeah. because, you know, when you come out of the approved school system, you're, you're literally, you, you can, you're, you're a zombie. You're after the shadow of who you were. You don't even know yourself. And, yeah. you know, you don't even know, you haven't got a direction. You know, somebody, people see that you're vulnerable. They take you to drugs because they know that, you know, your head's gone, that you are going to commit crime, you know. And the same happened to me. I went through the, the all, all the drugs, you know, to try and just, a lot of it was to try and kill myself. You know, become yeah, I was just hell bent. You know, hell bent on just going over the top with drugs because I just couldn't see it enter the madness in my head because there was so much going on. There was so many. You know, I had years and years of torture, torment. You know, and it wasn't just that. It, it, it's your physical pain as well. Then, then your body starts to ache in the winter, and you know, and you, you get trapped. And somebody comes along and they offer you like heroin or acid or anything you know, to take that pain away. And, you know, and it works for a minute. But then when you come around, you're back to square one, but you're twice as worse because, you know, and you're clucking. You're depressed. You're heavily, heavily depressed. Mm. And whatever you went to, the place you went to before you took the drugs, is now even bigger in your head. So that, you know, you've got no money. You've got to commit offences to get this money. And you, you, you're you reckless. You've got no consideration for yourself or, or, or anybody else. You know, and I, I was, I look back now, I'm I'm 52 now and I'm going through what, what I'm going through now. And I look back with like, you know, a lot of regret in my life, but I, I can't change it. I can't change it. I can say I'm sorry to the cows come home, but, you know, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. You know, it's, it's something I got to live with and I live with it in, with a lot of things in silence. And I just hope and pray that, you know, um, life you know continues to be okay and outside of my old circle now the only person i really talk to is john you know i've literally got myself you know cow and the dog and um i live a very quiet life now and i, I love that quiet life you know we don't involve anybody around our little circle we do our walks and you know and it's it's, it's how i wanted it because I, I never imagined that life could be this peaceful because it never has been for me. It's always been chaotic. It's always been crazy. Some are always going off, you know. And, you know, I, I still, like the other night, um, had a bit of a little meltdown in me. I had a trigger. I had a door open on top of the stairs. And I kind of gone up and seen it and froze. And in my head, I felt, that, you know. Back in the home. Yeah, there was someone by the door. And I froze. Yeah. And I kind of got a bit angry in me. And, you know. It's horrible. It really, really is. And there's, there's, there's not that I want to take them. There is no tablets for that. There is nothing no one can say about that. You know, it's just some I've got to deal with on my own. You know, you, you can tell people of how you feel. And, you know, I've, I've seen so many shrinks in my life that, you know, they're meant to be the best in the safe West. And this guy always oh, going to help you out. You start talking and they're rubbing their hands on their head and they're like, well, hang about, mate. What am I going to do with this? And I'm thinking, well, I'm you? rubbing their hands together as well. Well, yeah, but... I made a counsellor cry once. I, I thought, I, I can't be with her anymore. <laughs> yeah. I have one guy called Derek from um, Avon in Wiltshire, mental health guy. And he looked like Elvis. 
you know, he, <laughs> and he kind of sat back and he was like, you know, and he's doing this. And I was like, <laughs> you right, Thank mate? very much. Yeah, and he was patiently, yeah. And he said, okay, he said, uh, I'm ready. And I thought, <laughs> ready for what? And I was like, all right. So I just took him to the darkest moment of my life and it's everything changed. And he went from like, Elvis to oh, I don't know like Buddy Ollie like really quiet he's just gone like Ugh. and he's, he's like he said I've got to stop you there he said that is way too heavy for me brother oh my word he said when I was in uni have you seen uh, that what's that program Afterlife where they have a, the therapist on yeah, there yeah, yeah. have you seen it he just takes the utter mick he's all self-indulgent talking about his fucking self that for him. hours <laughs> yeah that was, that was Derek <laughs> that was Derek the Great you know and he did he stopped me halfway through and he was lost was that some of the stuff that you told us in the first podcast? Yeah. yeah. And it just blew his nut. And he was like, what can I say? And I said, well, come on. And I said, because you're the great Derek. I said, but bear in mind, you're all right. You're going to piss off and have a coffee and a cigarette. I've got to walk out with this on my head. Yeah. Who's going to help me tonight? And he went, brother, you're a lost cause. <laughs> oh, my word. Yeah. No. He said, you're a lost uh, cause. Unbelievable. And he said, wherever you're going, May God bless you and oh. pave your way. Well, well that, 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 that'll help you, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I just, yeah. I walked out. confidence. Exactly, right. and I walked out. And, and you're saying you never got better after that? <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh, you're a lost cause, Darren. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, you know, but you, you do, you walk up the road and you're thinking, what have I just witnessed? What have I just, you know? And then I get a letter to say, Derek, don't want to see you anymore because you blew him away because it was too deep. But he, he didn't study that in textbook. But, you know, the, the stuff I've been through with, with like with the split survivors, you, you know, there's so much is so deep yeah. that we had things done to us that you wouldn't even do to a bloody I don't know a rag doll, you know. But that's why the the, the, the rates are so high, and that's why my body's in a bad place now because of the trauma. Yeah. You know, I I stopped growing. I'm five foot four or five foot five, you know, and my brothers are taller than me. Do you know that's interesting? You say that. There's um, a woman, she's a counsellor for um, uh, uh, people who have been ritually abused. Uh, Carolyn, her name is. And honestly, she's a, she's a size of that can. She is the smallest woman ever, right? She's that big. And her s twin sister wasn't abused. And that's how they got away with it, because they cast her as a liar. And she's one of the best therapists for this multiple DID wow. personalities. And her sister is like six foot and she's that big because yeah. she stopped growing. So you, you think... The trauma piece. stopped her growing, yeah. yeah. That's what it yep. is. That's, that's what's happened that's to me. Bang on. Yeah, because that's, that's why I'm five foot four or five foot five. But it's a bit like a plant, isn't it? If you don't give it the nutrients and the nurturing, it's going to grow stunted. The, the it water won't be. and the sunlight mm. and Everything, you, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you starve to that. You starve the food. You, you know, you, you're having things done to your body that, like I said, you know, you wouldn't do to an ash bin. You know, we've seen better things put in that ash bin. So obviously with the trauma and the, the stress, your body does stop the growing. If you notice with a lot of victims, they kind of walk with a little bit hunched as well. Yeah, yeah, looking What's down. And, uh, yeah, go, yeah, like kind of, you're, yeah, you're over yeah. a little bit. You know, you're hunched because of, you know, the way you were positioned as a child. And the other thing is not being able to gain fruitful employment because you see coercive control in managers and yeah and people's like tone and the way they talk to you and stuff and because you don't know if they're having a dig or yeah. you know I, yeah there's this this just so can many... i ask you did you struggle to look people directly in the eyes for a while yeah yeah can't stand it because you think <laughs> no i know <laughs> no, but no you know I, I do i don't like you just you, you look at people and i generally I, i'm not really a a big talker either believe it or not a, quite a quiet person I've always been quite a quiet person and I've never liked it because I didn't want people to see the pain in my eyes because a few people said like you know you, you're dead behind the eyes that's what he's a classic is dead behind the eyes so rather than have to talk about the pain and so and said oh you look lost if I didn't look at them they wouldn't ask me so I could just go about my whatever I was doing in my own little world so then you just don't get I never really got close to people either I couldn't yeah, I preferred a lot of the time on my own. You know, it's like within prison and stuff. I actually preferred it in solitary confinement. Do you know um, Bill Maloney? He's uh, one of the the pioneers, really, of of, of getting these videos out there. A filmmaker a and, and a survivor. Yeah, mm, you, you met him, guy, you, Darren. Yeah. And uh, I took Darren to meet him. And he's he lives on um, a housing estate in South London. Oh, and there, he's yeah. done his kitchen out. Oh, sorry. He's done his kitchen out and I said to him, and he spends a lot of time in his kitchen. I said, 
Bill, you've done your kitchen out like a prison cell. And he went, yeah, yeah. And he's, he's <laughs> honestly, the towels are like the old institutional <laughs> towels no. with, with black oh ironwork. And, and I said, you've actually reconstructed a prison cell. And he went, yeah. And he was the youngest ever kid in solitary confinement. Mm. He did like long him. periods of time. Was it? And, and that's what he's done. And he said, I actually feel safe when I'm in here. And he and calls his wife Sheriff Joe Apaya. <laughs> 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 is your bedroom like a prison cell? This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of The Girl Gambler, a young woman's story of her escape from gambling addiction. The story of a young girl's entrapment in gambling addiction, the true advert for problem gambling and how it controlled her every movement, every thought and almost took her life. How the guilt and shame that go hand in hand with addiction stopped her from reaching out for help for eight years as she didn't feel it was okay for a young female to be a problem gambler. How she believed it was a male-dominated problem and how eventually she did find the tools that enabled her to become free of her addiction. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. So I went from the prison to... My parents like built an extension in the house, what used to be a garage. And my mum, before I got out, my mum was like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll slide a tray on the, the door, yeah. door. No. And we'll just keep you in the garage. You won't let you out in the beginning. <laughs> Should have. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then I lived, I moved into my friend's Mike's house. So I moved from the garage. I was in the garage for a year. <laughs> then I moved for 10 years to the bedroom of my friend Mike's house, which was the same size as the garage right. room, wow. which was b bigger than a cell, but not that much. No. So for 11 years after I got out, I confined myself to one little room. But your focal point goes as well. Because when you're outside, your focal point is further out. And when you're mm. confined, mm. they found that. Because you might know, yeah. Because it does. Mm. Yeah. But that's, you know, yeah. It's, it's all interesting, isn't it? It's like what you see with yours, because you can relate, can't you, to a lot of things that when you're yeah. behind the still door and you're mm. on your own. You, you know, I used to feel safe. I don't know if you felt the same. Lockdown. It, yeah, Lockdown. in my head. You didn't have to deal with people. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, idiots and just, I could be at rest. And, mm. you know, I knew that with the door being shut, that I could just get on with my time and, you know, I, I could relax my body, you know, mm -hmm. and I could try and like manage some of the thoughts in my head mm. that I could get out of stuff. And, you know, it was... Because they were trying to break me down psychologically because I hadn't cooperated. So they kept putting me in higher and higher security levels. In the beginning, that. I was thinking, I was a bit scared. You know, I'm going to su su maximum, then I'm going to super. Terrified at the thought. What's it got? No, I was like, this is quite peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah su super max, you know. Yeah, yeah. But all the, super uh, max, very peaceful. Mexican mafia and stuff. Great. Yeah, but you can't get out your cell, so there's no... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're just in your cell. Continuous lockdown, aren't you? They yep. don't... Cause yeah, yeah. I watched the thing about the... Um, Mexican prison, and they were under 24-7. Oh, in Mexico? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a whole different world. But they were, like, really yeah. segregated, and they had no connection with anybody else. And mm. they were happy, like, the cartel leaders, to have got on with their time and not get stabbed up, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. In SMU in Florence, the only thing they did was let you out for handball court. Did you do it? No, because they come, like, at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, so they can tick a box and say they offered it when everyone's oh, asleep. Oh, right, yeah, when they're asleep, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I did go once or twice, but uh, not not regularly. And then the other thing, they, they have to take you out for a shower every three days, and that's wow. quite a process. Cause Under the body chain. So if you want to get a shower in Supermax, they come to your door, they say, B -b back up to the door, put your hands through it. Okay, yeah. They handcuff you through the trap. Then they tell you to face the, go back and walk and face the wall while they slide the door open. Oh. Then they tell you to very slowly back out of the cell. Wow. And there's two of them in the Darth Vader stuff, shank-proof body armor. Yeah, They yeah. walk you to the shower. Shower door buzzes open. Oh, on the way to the shower, they say, if you so much as look as another prisoner or turn or smile or say anything, we're just going to grab your skull and smash your head into the concrete. Oh, my word. So you don't want to do any talking to the prisoners on your way down the room. Then shower door buzzes open, you go in, closes, you back up to the door and put your hands through the trap, they unhandcuff you, 
and then for about t- you press the button and the water runs for about 10 minutes for security purposes but they leave you enough hours and hours oh, right. in the beginning i was like let me out let me out but i realized they just got off on it so i, I started to do a yoga routine in there <laughs> you're gonna aren't you because you got to make- adapt yeah because yeah. you're out of your cell mm. you're in a different environment and i suppose you, you just got to make the most of that moment aren't you yeah. really because you, you can't go back can you mm. until they're ready yeah. Until the big boss. But in those security levels, they weaponize crap. Do they weaponize crap in the, the high security levels? Yeah, in, in the UK? yeah. When I was in like long lighting and stuff, mm. and you know, it was, I suppose it wasn't as bad as where you were because mm. I've seen the stuff where you've been and that was just unbelievable, you know. And, but yeah, everything's kind of like locked down. And, you know, it, the biggest thing with long lighting was that in the kitchen was the fridges. You had those metal trays, like thin bar things. And they were forever getting nicked and cut down into ice picks. So you get like three um, picks. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be literally, that was the main thing. Yeah. Did you we, see anyone get attacked with them? Yeah, there was loads. There well, was, what was that over? Uh, one was over a Twix, literally. Twix. Yeah, it was a Twix. Yeah. So and we had a guy, um, <laughs> Yami knew him, called Nicholas. And he was the Chinese guy. And you had that. No, Nicholas was the Indian guy with the long hair, and he was just one spooky mother. You know, he was he was okay. You know, I used to, I used to call him Sandman because he was foreign and he looked like he'd come from the sand. And someone basically he'd, he'd done a Twix, and he, when he got him back, what for do his you mean canteen, done a Twix? Well, he, he gave him a Twix, and when he it come to pay up, he bought a double, but instead they gave him a Mars where it should have been two. Should have been two Twixes. Yeah. And Not Mars bar. Yeah, because you oh. do, like, if you borrow one, you've got to pay two back. And um, my neighbour was like, you know, watch this, watch this. It's going to go, it's going to go. Oh, Nick's right on one. He's right on one. And all of a sudden, I just see him run up on, on the guy and the pick is just straight in the side and oh, they're having oh, it, you oh, know. Yeah. Twigs. Yeah, but it's, it's like, like it's always, but when, you, when you're in the catties, it's different. It's a different ball game. You've only got to look at someone and he's off. And you're having it, you know. People, you know, you, you got guys that are doing like double life, triple life. They're never getting out. They've got no hope. You know, when someone's got an all life tariff, what hope have they got? Mm. Whatever they do is a 28 lay down, lie down. The majority of it, they know that they're not going to go for, lar- you know, long lighting because nowhere else to take them. They're there for a reason because it's the end of the road. Mm. You know, people go on about Wakefield and stuff. With, you know, Bronson was, they say that no, that was bad. You know, Larton left it standing. It's like you used to go on from reception on to inductions on A-Wing because you had like ones and twos and threes. Well, no, grand ones and twos and the TV room was always on the ones. And the amount, I was in there one day with a guy called Martin Harrison and I was sat down just watching it. I think I said it was you and I was just watching telly and all of a sudden he'd come in and put a carrier bag over his head. Well, and it's just like, whoa, you know, nothing to see here. And it's literally, it's just, you know, trying to get him. You know, and that's what it was like. The TV room was forever going up. But it's, it's cat ease. And just say you had like 10 receptions come through on a, a Friday. I can guarantee you by Monday there'd be three left because they've like checked on the numbers because it was crazy. You know, it's just... But to me, it was better than the approved school. You know, I wasn't going to get raped. I knew who to avoid, to, you know, to look out for the sisters and stuff. You know, so you kind of avo- avoid them you know, and just keep some good people. But you just, again, you, all you do when you're in prison, you're making good of a bad situation. you got yourself put there. The best you can do is toe the line as best you can, get on with it and try and learn something from it. You know, try and take a piece of it with you. Mm. The, you know, I think I used to get a lot of it off with the lifers. I used to think, I, I got a chance, they haven't. They're never getting out. And when they do, they're under life license anyway. And there's nothing, if they were to sneeze in the wrong direction with probation, they're going back. You know, so at least with an EDR, earliest date of release, or an LDR, whichever last date of release, at least you were free from it. You know, but with those guys, then they're just part of the system, aren't they? They're just part of the will. It keeps revolving round and round and round. You know, that's why there's a lot of people that have come out doing little podcasts for themselves. And, you know, I didn't get, with what they're doing because they're half of them's on license and it's if probation ain't going to see what they're saying it's crazy some of them are doing them from the prison cells now I really know. yeah I saw yeah guy, there's quite a few isn't there that yeah. 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 I saw a guy the other day yeah. I ain't going to say his name but because I don't want to get him in trouble was his first name Sam 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see phones? yourself? Have all your phones so just... in, the, in the bums? Like? Well, you can your little plug-in phones are like that, aren't they? Well, you seen the li- we were talking about yeah. the little bum they phones, are. and they're all plastic, <laughs> so they don't ping up on the. Did you see yourself when he had his clothes hanging up? And yeah, he was one about his photographs. So, oh, and so how, how did they get away with all that? Then can't can't the guards like? So these new things, <sighs> yeah, they're undetectable. So when you go on the the big boss, the chair, yeah. the yeah. insides are plastic and all plastic, yeah. So it didn't set anything off. But again, what you got as well, you've got to remember, and every gel got them, and I'm sorry to say it, you're going to have a bent screw. Yeah. And your bent screw is a young screw. Because what you do, look, you go onto them, don't you? you? You're singling that screw out. You know, you're all right, you are, Governor. You're a good guy, you are. If it comes on top, the lads are going to back you. You try and get them on your side a little bit. You're bringing them across. They, they don't realise it. Then, you know, you how you doing, Governor? You're going to have a good weekend. And you, you, in a way, you're kind of like, I suppose... What do you call it? Manipulating. Yeah, but you, you're building his trust and he's gaining yours because he thinks that he, he's, you know, you know, the lads like you on here, Gov. You know, and it starts with something small like, you know, do us a favour, can you get us a packet of fags in? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm only doing it at once. And you're thinking, mug. Yeah. yeah. You know, it ain't no once. It then, you know, a week later, you go, oh, do us a favour, can you get us two packs of fags? You know, you're paying them for them because they know that, you know, it's, it's worth good money inside. Then you hit with the bigger stuff. Then you, you know, any chance you can get us a phone with a charger? Because you know you're not. You told me yourself you're not getting search coming in. You know you reckon you've been there three years and you've been searched once, and they're like, oh, go on in, but don't you know do it again. And of course you, you just get them and well, well you got them then, didn't you? Of course you have. There, there was a a guy when I worked in South London and he was getting information for criminals, right, for gangsters and whatnot, and. um they were paying him two grand in an envelope. So they'd say, we need a check done on this this guy, this guy. And he was doing it for the competition and he'd get an envelope. And then he handed himself in in the end because what they did was it got escalated more and more, exactly that. And then they they wanted a load of info and he got it for them. And he went to his meeting and they got 50 pence and said, pushed it over and went, that's what you're getting paid from now on. And we'll see you next week. And so he had to hand himself in because it was only going to go one way. Yeah. And he went to prison. Because yeah, he, he, he was bought. bought. He was bought. He's bought in the already. pocket. In the pocket, yeah. There's a lad um, on YouTube. Uh, he's an ex-prison officer. Right. I think he had the same, like, you know, he was from up north. Do you ever see Lee him? Lee Davies. Yes. That's yeah, him. I interviewed yeah. him. Oh, you've been, he messaged me this morning, We're going to do actually. part two with him soon because he's got a prison governor that's going to come on as well. Wow. He was quite a likeable bloke, wasn't he? Hi, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could just see how he fell into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. Bol- you know, you, you, again, you win them, don't you? You kind of, yeah. You know, I've, I've only seen um, a little clip. He was with uh, another prison officer guy. Sam That's, Worth. Worth. That's yeah. him. Yeah, I've had him on as well. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Because I've seen that Sam with a guy with crazy hair. Oh, Marvin. Um, Lee Marvin. That's him. Yes, out of Manchester. He's Wonder- just been on. Um, Lad Bible as well. He's got a hell of a story. Yeah, he seems. He's to- the one who at the recent what's um, it was the weigh in for the boxing event in Manchester. Okay, and living in London got socked by one guy and then got socked by another guy. Oh, and it was actually Lee Marvin came in and protected living in London. Living in London. Oh, well done. Yeah. Well I, done. Because remind I- me after podcast, there's a guest coming on that I've got. Cool. A really good one. Yeah. Okay. There, there was um. A guy and he was harassing a uh, couple was harassing the travellers, and he sort of he was their homebeat officer as well, and he did something. He crossed the line with them. Anyway, the the boss of the traveller invited him down to this site, and he he drove down, you know, in his car parked up, and no one would touch it because he had you know they sort of knew him, but it it definitely crossed the line. So they got him drunk, you know, said, come wow. on, we love you, you're a good bloke, you're one of us. Got yeah. him drunk, got him absolutely hammered. Then they picked him up, threw him in his car, all stood round it, blocked it in, and called the police and said, We're stopping him driving off. Oh, uh, stopping him driving off. They got you know, him. Yeah, and they got him, yeah. I'm meeting um, an old guest of yours this afternoon, Little Yummy. Oh, what a great guy. Yeah, I'm going to go and take him for a pie and mash. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, oh, we have a Whitechapel. So I'm going to, oh, yeah, going to fly across and see the Yummy Bee. So know. when you were in prison with Yummy, then, have you got any Yummy stories from I, in prison? I. Literally come across Yummy. I'm yeah. sure that's what I'm going to go with this afternoon. There, I think I met him in Lewis, but many, many moons ago. And again, I don't. The one with Yummy, I didn't really know him, mm. so that's what I'm going to go and clear it, make sure that it was him. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure because 
I come across him with your po- uh, podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know? I was like, it was Carl was watching it, and she said, oh, "Have a look at this guy. He looks interesting." So I sat down, and I was like. <laughs> He owes me a Twix. No, I said, <laughs> we love him. I said, his name's Sansom. She's like, yeah. I said, he's um, a little guy. I said, I was in Lewis with him. And he was like chatting away. And I was like, oh my God, it is, it is. And He's got such a good vibe, hasn't he? Yeah, he was like, on the way up, he was messaging us with his voice clips and like, oh, 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 how he goes. And We went on a country walk near, uh, you know, in Guildford. And um, we were going down this hill. And it was he couldn't stop himself from walking forward, and he went faster and faster and faster and faster. He didn't and stop then rolling. He, f- he went head, o- he flew into the air, he went head <laughs> over heels. I thought he's going to break his neck here. And he, but he, he landed perfectly and did a break fall and got up. And he laughed and he goes, If I had died doing it just now, do you know what they'd be saying about you? <laughs> <laughs> But he's, Brilliant. you know, the first time I'm meeting him today. So yeah, yeah, and he's 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 a really he seems a really good guy. He's just always smiling and always giving off this positive energy, and he does. He's, he? a, he's he's a yeah. positive guy. You know, he he really is a positive guy. Did you meet Charles Bronson in prison? No, no. <laughs> Blame me. <laughs> no. what, what about any any notorious? Um... I met loads. You know, you, you're gonna. I meet. Um, in Lewis, do you know Neil Razor Smith? Yeah, yeah, the bank robber. He showed me how to use a tray. Yeah. How to use a tray in as a weapon? Yeah. How how do you do that? So basically, just say that's your your tray. Mm. Obviously, if you got beef with someone after grub, you kind of use the corner of your tray to, mm. you know, yeah, give them a little bit of a cheekster gotcha. sort of thing. Yeah, but he. You know, I knew, like, obviously with Frank Fraser and met Charlie Cray in Long Larton as well, mm. you know, and there's a good one, like, you know, there, there's, so, what else would I say? There's so many, you know, but it wasn't until you got older that you see them doing podcasts, like um, Tony Lambriano. Uh, oh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Chris's brother. Chris, yeah. Yeah, and Jimmy. Yeah. He's, the, he's the one that passed away. And he was a really nice guy, you know, had a bit of a deep voice, mad for the cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy's still about. Yeah, Jimmy lives down by Bournemouth, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, and but it's been such a long time now, you know, and I'm just like I say, at the moment now with coming up here today with with you guys and just you know trying to see what we can do now. Yeah, because see, this is a way forward that, that we're gonna um, just wait. But come, 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 come on board. <laughs> yeah. go on. Yeah, because we want to know. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Because obviously, how how did um, oh, when, when is this basically? Well, well it'll be in the summer because I, I I work with kids, so I, I have to go by the holiday thing. So it'll be in the summer. They'll give us time to sort stuff out and to get the money. Um, and I think because Anthony as well is um, he's got a young family, so we, we're just going to cycle our way up. And I mean. I was before when I because I wrote I did similar thing I wrote down to Cornwall I was doing about 60 70 miles a day which is achievable but it will it will alter you know according to your bike your fitness and 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 the terrain you mm. know so can you live stream some of it on the way yeah that, yeah that, yeah yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. yeah we'll do that yeah and, and what Definitely. we want to do is meet up with people along the way you know and the survivors wherever they are and then pop in and do an interview and make yeah, it like if you live trip. stream to us we could be like the headquarters yeah and then of course. we'll like get the That'd viewers to meet yeah. you guys along, yeah. the, along the way. We'll have to get like a GoPro or something, then, won't we? Yeah, Borrow yeah. mine. Never use it. Wicked. We can <laughs> like, yeah. get it nearer the time, so we get it all set up. But that's yeah, what we need to do, is to get like one with you every day. We check in and see yeah, this, is, what, this is where we're going. That'd be That'd be great. But yeah. I think with it, we're going to, you know, it's about trying to raise money so I can li- literally get this done. So I can, How I can, much do you need? T- truthfully, like... It doesn't say in the paperwork, but that's just hospital stuff with appointments. But for a triple art bypass and the aftercare, it's going to be about twenty five grand. Right. You know, so it's, it's a lot of money. It's a bit. It's a big if, you know, and a big ask. But we're not asking, you know, for people to donate like pangs and pangs. If basically, say, you know, everybody was to put in like twenty pence, it's you soon get there. You know, we're not asking people to raid their bank accounts in order to support myself. You know, so I get this done. We're asking people that if they got a spare twenty pence or a couple of coppers, if they can donate it. But it's all going to be done for a proper bank. Yeah, it'll be done. It'll be done properly because um, before, when I've done it for the GoFundMe thing, mm. the amount comes up, 
and you get all of the, you know, uh, Nob Edge United get on board oh. and then he's not done this and he's done that. And then last time I did one, I someone, he says, this is quite upsetting. Someone donated a thousand pounds. Because you were on your mission, weren't you? Yeah, as, yeah. as they sabotaged it, weren't yeah, you out yeah. doing, I was doing ba- it. were you bicycling? Yeah, no, I was, I was walking. Walking, walking. I was on the way to, doing it for me. To, to, yeah. For Darren to the woods. So we walked with um, Big Dylan, Dylan. Li- little dog, Millie, from Parliament Square all the way to, to Rainbow Woods. Yeah. And we, we did get there. It took a week, I think, or something. Anyway, we got there. Someone on a deathbed said, I want to donate a £1,000 for, you know, Darren's, um, the cause, you know, what we were doing. And they all, at the, this group attacked. And they they sort of wrote to GoFundMe or one of them. It's similar to the stuff, the, the trouble you had with it, or you know, I think Just Giving or GoFundMe. And they put a hold on it. And what they did was that they just sent all the money back to people, mm. right? But this woman, in the meantime, had died. So that £1,000 went into probate and it was lost. And it's I just lost. thought, why? Why would you do that? For what reason? And they sit there all happy with themselves, you know? And you're thinking, you know, we're out here speaking out against people that are raping children, destroying lives, committing suicide, and we get attacked so we must really look at these trolls that attack us for exposing child abuse and see their motive. There is no motive other than a malevolent one. These are very dark-hearted, twisted individuals. People. No matter what they claim, that they're doing it. I'm not the one that is exposing. You can't expose the truth anyway. It's an oxymoron. It don't happen. You can't expose the truth. You expose a lie, you know. And, and and you put light on darkness, it doesn't mm. work the other way down. And they're very calculated as well, aren't they? It's like a, when they've got a campaign against you, they infiltrate your community, they pretend yep. to be your followers, yep. and they try and, like, just poison. Well, well, the other day, I pull it out. Um, this is what one of it. It just come to me. I thought, I find out how old Alan Merritt is, got this bike, and I thought, oh, we, we can do this. And then... I spoke to Darren and, and he's in, you know, he's in a bad way. So, I've, so I said, well, let's see if we can raise the money for you, Darren, and, and get, get your, get this sorted. Um, so I did a podcast. I said, look, I've come up with a great idea. I did one of my brew with a view from the rooftop in central London. I said, look, this is the idea. You know, Darren needs this operation. The NHS, this is basically it. The NHS uh, have given him such an extended protracted waiting time. It ain't good. His body can't sustain that. We need it sorted out this year. Let's raise the money. Let's get Darren in on on the national health. So, for, okay, good response. Yeah, great to see you back, John, and all this stuff. Brilliant. We're all behind you. And bear in mind, I've got. I, I did have seventy five thousand followers on YouTube. If everyone them even gave like Darren said twenty p, we'd get the dust. You know, it would be sorted. Um, a pound just on a one off. Please send a pound in. If you're my YouTube subscriber, and then let's get this off via Patreon, and let's let's get this off to Darren. We'll still do the thing anyway, but to raise awareness. So about a week went by. Now I was I given evidence with the government inquiry, and their solicitors, so the solicitors that represent the survivors for this inquiry, they get contacted, right, and by Surrey Police saying, um, John Wedger um, knows that this man is live on air committing suicide, i.e. Darren, and he's refusing to give the location. But we, we know he's in his house in Surrey. Now, Darren don't live in Surrey. And I sort of thought, well, at what point did I ever say anything that? It was an unambiguous, benevolent appeal for funding to get Darren an operation. And it was clear as that. Mm. So I thought, I've had enough of this. So I contact Surrey Police. So I get in touch with this um, constable in Surrey. And I said, this is the link. Watch it yourself. And you tell me what you think. So bless her, she did. And then I said, right. So who contacted you? Oh, they didn't leave their name. So I think, well, why are you taking it seriously anyway? Mm. I said, have you seen the video? Yes, I have. Okay. Tell me at what point I'm saying that Darren's committing suicide and I'm withholding location. Well, the person said, so there's obviously been dialogue. The person said they were in a hurry and they didn't see it all. So I said, well, if they were that concerned about Darren, why were they? Why did they not watch it all? It literally was minutes. Yeah. You know, why did they then not give their name? And I said, surely this is malicious. This is one in a long line. And again, contacting the, the ICSA solicitors to discredit me, another to embarrass me and discredit me a long line of people that have rung up the solicitor firm doing it. 
clearly a load of nonsense the rally, and not leaving their name and then getting the police involved. And this is what they do time and time. Mm. We had another incident, which we can't go into because the police got involved in something. Again, Surrey police with yeah. someone else. And this is what they do. They are so twisted. And in doing this, we protect ourselves because we're saying to the police, we are not out to purposely, intentionally commit crime. All we're here to do is to expose this evil underbelly society, which is preying on children. It's all we're doing and giving the voice to the voiceless. That is it. If you want to cooperate with us, please contact us. You, Please, you, my, my email address is online. My phone number is online. Call me and I'll I'll talk to you. Don't do a warrant on me. I'll turn up. You can come around my house anytime you want. I will always let you in. I will always surrender a data storage device to you because I'm totally up front. If you need to look in my phone, my computer, you can come anytime. You want me to attend police station, I will willingly come and talk to you because I have no intention of committing any crime. But I have a problem with people who sexually abuse children. I have a major problem with it. And I will push the boundaries of the law as much as I can to do what I can to protect them. I'm not going to cross the line, but my toes will be on it to protect the children. Uh, you can't get any clearer than that, really, can Great you? Great message. You know? and it's, it is a good message. And I'll just say the same with, you know, John going forward. The, you know, Surrey police or whatever police, they've got no, you know... <laughs> I'm not going to commit suicide. So if anybody does again try salvage, you know, I, I, I'm in such a good place in my heart of where I want to be, and I know that there's hope, you know, and th there is a, a life to come once all this is done. So if anybody's trying to sabotage it by saying that you know John's watching me commit suicide, it's an absolute load of cobs wallop, you know. And and you know, John just stated his mission, and you would think that everybody in the world will be behind you yeah. if you yeah. want to protect kids. Yeah, but once you start putting videos up about this stuff, you get you go through hell. Yeah, you do, Sean. You, the campaigns right. start. I mean, we lost our channel twice over it. Yeah, hacks, trolls, black ops, you name it. Is you know that's the thing. That's, that's what we we'll see. But with like myself and John going forward, we're going to do the ride. You know, with my I, I bought a, a a van last year, a, a transit van in good conditions. We use that as a support. What chuck a mattress in the back. Uh, it's going to be minging by the end of it, isn't it? <laughs> uh, because I, we'll I get places to stay, but it'll be a support vehicle, yeah. a pickup, because food in there and drinks, yeah, and spares for the bikes. Because my partner Kelly, because I I can't do the ride, I haven't got the energy, so I'll just I'll drive, and my partner's going to do it in my place with John, yeah. oh, wow. so she's going to ride with John. So we're, we're giving something back. So, you know, because people will say, well, he's not doing nothing. Well, I can, <laughs> you know, I can make sure they're fed, they're watered, that they're safe, that we report them with Sean Daly, with live videos, we can link to everybody. You can charge the phones up on the... Um, yeah, on the know, van as van, well, because we're going to have to have camera, you know, equipment. But, you know, this would be done proper, that once we got the monies raised, if we're that lucky, then we, we'll, you know, we'll have it all done, that we'll film it, go into a private, you know, doctor, that, you know, the money goes across so they can see with receipts that, you know, it's not, nothing to be coming our way, and, you know. And the other thing, Darren, there are going to be expenses, so diesel needs paying for oh, yeah. campsites or bed and breakfast, whatever. So, And that's going to take a chunk because there's going to be a little groove. So we got to allow for that, but no one is making money out of it. No way. This is expenses only, uh, and some no of that way. might be cash expenses. So we're going to keep a book as much as we can, but at the end of the day, we don't need to disclose it. You, you don't, it's not a problem, but these yeah. people are just, they will find anything, anything. I, I just think it's basically, really, if you do put everything down to the penny, yeah, yeah, you can't course. go wrong. Then, exactly. You've got, you know, yeah. we've got nothing to hide on this. Yeah. It's Tell just you what, what they won't do, when you're announcing where people can meet you, yeah. these evil people will not come and meet no, you. They won't. Because they they're won't. in the shadows. They are all the yeah. time. And they use false names. So, especially when you get the ritualistic stuff, they use false names. Their accounts are empty. You know, why use your false name? You know who I am. People know where I live. There's uh, what, what am I hiding? Well, who are you? There's a, there, there's one guy, um, and uh, again, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to jeopardise this, but I'd like to name him, but I, I won't. Yeah, let's not. No, let's not. I know, you know, for... <laughs> to get the video for, taken you know, down. Yeah. <laughs> for maturity's sake. But he uses a pseudonym name, you know, and he never counteracts the argument you know it never says no i don't do that i'm not part of this group that does these things i'm not i don't do blood rituals no no instead they're attacking attacking that they transcribe everything transcribe it they pull it online and they'll find any inconsistencies they'll highlight it um if there's anything they think is is contemptuous 
they will pull it before the attorney general and get you then you know summons to a police station to to receive a caution or a telling off web i've had it that's exactly what exactly. happens to me and this is what they got do caution over my coverage no yeah. that's wrong yeah it's wrong it shouldn't be the case because you're just helping people yeah and and i say to to the because the, the police will watch this they do watch this i've had the public order unit that have said we watch your podcast we look at your website you know please you're picking low hanging fruit dealing with us look at these people you know deal with them go and get them but don't come for us because what are we doing you know we will work with you not against you yeah because when i got my caution what what had happened was a journalist who came on my podcast she said a name of someone who was in a, a case that had a court order on it oh. which is a, you can't do that i had no clue yeah i had yeah. no clue so when i went to the police station the, the cop he was a part of child protection and he said, he, you know, obviously me and him are on the same mission. He couldn't even understand why I was there. Do you get that? Yeah. You do get yeah. some that back you. That, that don't oh, he was backing side. me, yeah. totally backing me. Is yeah. your side all right there? Sorry? Is your side all right there? No, yeah, it's yeah. my hernia. So hurting it, yeah. 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 yeah, they've played up. I've done my tablets this morning. It's just it, when you sit down, that's all. And yeah, I was. Can I get you anything? Sorry? Can I get you anything? New body. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get me heart we'll transplant, please? The bionic man. Oh, hopefully, I don't know, you know, of, of what's going to happen. Once it's done, I just want to live a life. You know, I just, I, I do, I just want to be, I just want to be happy. That's all I want to do. I just want to be happy. You know, it's like I said to you guys earlier, and I said to you before, Sean, that, you know, I went for so much, like, pain in my life. And it's only, you know, I met Cal, and, you know, she, she really did. She helped me look in myself, and she, you know, she really looked out for me. You know, she really did. And she had my back and, you know, love her dearly for it. And she, she understands my pain and she lets me talk to her most nights about anything I, I've got on my head. And she says, come on, get it out. Let's let's go there. Let's get you to that place. Let's work it out, you know. And I, I never had that. And that's why I just want to get this, you know, operation done and dusted. Then, you know, join you guys on the mission. Yeah. I don't you think know? 25K is a lot because in America... To have what you you require will probably be about hundreds of thousands. Yeah, because there's only a triple R bypass. Only. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and believe it or not as well, do you remember last time when I come to you both, I don't know if you'd noticed something different, I don't smoke. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. I've, yeah, last time I've I'll stopped smoking done. as well. Have you? You yeah, just stopped. What, before you come in the flat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, you know, I literally New Year's Day because I knew I what in my life. I knew I valued my life. Yes. And, you know, I don't drink. I don't drink at all. I'm not against drink. Mm. And I don't do, you know, recreational drugs or nothing. I mean, if we would have gone to Tomorrowland, my, my drug would have been seeing the gigs, like the, yeah. the sets. Just vibing that, with the natural music. high. Yeah. Yeah. That is it. You know, when you got someone like the Trail or a Yotto or a Ben Boomer. And the lights are amazing out there tomorrow. Dude, did you yeah. see Eric Pritty's in Mexico? No, not yet. Wow, brother, you've got to watch one. it, man. Oh, oh, well, you know, you've yeah. got to watch it. It will literally light your front room up. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he's good. Yeah. Oh, but wicked. That's what I want to do, and that's why I want to get this done, and it's all thanks to this man here, you know, John, and again, to my friend Sean, oh, and, and my new friend Jen. But the thing is, Darren, <laughs> And Darren, James and Joe, Joe. <laughs> they're good guys. No one gives them a mention. James and Joe. There, there, there's so many others out there. It, it, yeah. This don't have to. This could keep growing and growing and growing. And it, you know, and it, it does, John. Sorry, it yeah. does. And you do. There's so many good people out there that do check in on Facebook, and they go, you know, are you, are you okay? Are you all right? You know. And I think a lot of people think I'm being rude, and I just go, yeah, I'm okay, because I don't really, you know, want. I don't really. I'm not a big talker, believe it or not. And, my, you know, I just go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. You know, I've got my battle. And, you know, I put a little bit on that again, as James has seen, you know, of how I've been. I've done up a few lives in the hospital when I was in there. Didn't look great, you know. <laughs> Looked like death warmed up. But look a lot better now. Yeah. It's because I've had a shave and stuff. And, <laughs> you know, generally when I've not had a shave, I look like compo from last of the summer wine. <laughs> you know, but I suppose now when you look at it, it's a bit like looking at a young Burt Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> it. that's where it was. I knew it was something. Yeah. Like a young Burt Reynolds. Chiseled. Chiseled. I knew you was dodgy. Yeah. <laughs> uh -uh. But yeah, going forward, we just want to get this right and, done. And Make a memory. And, and, and also, you know, big up all the other groups, the Beach Home groups, oh. Martin and... And all, all the others that have always supported throughout, you know, Alan Merritt and their campaigning. Who is it? Alan 
Alan Merritt, so, Sue Jean, and Jean, the old yeah, lady. Yeah. Then you got the Blair twins. Yeah. Then you got um, you got Martin. Martin Harrington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Harrington. Yeah. yeah. Then you go up again. you got a few, aren't you? Going up. Yeah, there's quite a lot. Sandy. Um, Sandy Smith. From was, Quarriers, yeah. And they all right. sort of all, all, all interlink, you know, and, and back each other up. And they don't fight. There's no kicking. There's disputes here and there. But, you know, they and some of these, they, you know, they're in the 70s. I mean, Jean is in her 80s and she's still out campaigning tirelessly because of what Get she went girl. through as a kid, you know? Yeah. And can you imagine what it was like in the 50s in these homes? Post-war England, it was absolutely horrific what they went through. Did you, you get a chance to watch our podcast with Christopher Spry, who survived yeah. the UK's most evil mum? No. Oh, wow. Made me cry. Really? Yeah. He's still, well, didn't he just have to have something removed from his body recently? Yeah, he's doing all right, though. He's out of hospital. What was it he had to have removed? Was it like glass or something in his... They found a blade in his throat. A blade. Oh, my like God. A knife blade, She yeah. fed him a blade. Oh, all Table kinds. legs. That's just a, all sorts. That's just a little oh. bit of it. What was his yeah. goat's bustling a lot of stuff? I think he was out, yeah. wasn't he out Bristol way something? So it's Cheltenham. Cheltenham. Yeah. His sister, Victoria, committed yeah. suicide. She yes. did, yeah. She wrote, wrote the book. book. Yeah, yeah, Victoria Spry, but she yeah. changed her name to Victoria something. Hamilton. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, she she went away, did she, the mum? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. out now. Right. Rose yeah. about, yeah. Well, um, and what, what, uh, you know, every time she took them to the hospital because the injuries she put on them, yeah, she moved to different yeah, areas, yeah, yeah, different yeah. hospitals, so they looked like isolated incidents. Yeah, yeah. And she had these yeah. stories to back it all up. Well, 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 this this is what people need to understand about psychopathy. They they cry, lie, and deny. Mm. You know, and we, we've just seen it. With again, it was all about part of my mission was changing the face of. A Everyone thought it was an overweight, middle-aged man lives with his mum. You know, it was a bit odd, you know. Um, but it was it was anything, you know. It was women. It was young blokes. It was, you know, every single age group. And we saw at the, the latter end of last year two horrific murders of infants, both by women. We saw the little yeah, boy, was it yeah. George or something? The little poor Are we allowed kid. to say the names of these? Um, dead. The kid's dead. Oh, the dead. Kid dead. And there's a prosecution. Yeah. Um, so and it, yeah, and it's been named in the papers mm -hmm. and everything else. So, and this was the the the, the feckless, weak-minded father. His new girlfriend tortured this poor little boy to death, tortured him, and he was a poor little kid that was crying out, saying, "No one loves me," and they were feeding him salt. His body was dehydrated, and the other one was this poor little girl. I can't remember her name, and it was the lesbian lover of the mother who, who was a door door person. And was, she, that, was that one in the north? That yeah, one? and she we was caught giving the kid right handers, leaning over the car and punching. And the kid had bruises and was going to school unchallenged. Unchallenged. And you think, and again, the social services listen to these people. And I've been in these strategy meetings where they give them chance after chance. And you look at all these referral reports, because these police get these referral reports. My God, and there's pages and pages, and they still give them another chance. And you think enough is enough now. Stop this. And... This is what all these changes need to be about. It, th th there needs to be a whole cleansing of all this. And there is no way anyone with a modicum of intelligence or sensitivity would have ignored that. Yet they do. They do all the time, all the time. I give an analogy, right? And I say to them, if, if I, you wanted, you had a house, you wanted an extension and I was a builder and, or I knew a builder and I said, right, I'm going to get this built for you, right? And every phone call we've had, you're going to charge 50 quid. Every text message on between us, you're going to get charged 75 quid, right? I'm going to charge you £450 an hour. But bear in mind, once this extension's built, there's 80% chance it's going to fall down. I mean, who in their right mind would do it? But that is the no. same analogy for the justice system. It, it, it fails to that degree from the bottom right way through to the top. And, and people, please wake up to this because you're going to be picking the pieces up for the next three generations if you don't. You're living on estates where there's antisocial behaviour, there's robberies, there's stabbings, there's knife crime. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? It comes from damaged people. And why are they damaged? Because their parents, for whatever reason, allowed them to be harmed, failed to protect, whatever the reasons are. Mm. I'm not here to placate an adult. They can get stuffed. I don't care if I upset an adult. I really honestly don't. I'm not here for that. Right, I've been cast as a misogynist. This now, I'm not interested. I'm here to put a message out anti child abuse. And if anyone has a problem with that, well, I hope society has a problem with you because you're wrong. You're wrong. And we've got to see these things as being a bit of the past now. 
And this is why it's so important that, that survivors, ex-criminals, ex-coppers. Why am I the only ex-copper? Why have we got two armed robbers, two to one here? <laughs> you know, well, if you, Chris Lambion, that's three to one, whatever, yeah. and many, many more. I'm the only one. Why? Where's all the others? Please come and stand by me and back me up here. Yeah. You know I'm right. You know it's the truth. You know, I've, I've gone through three cases, civil cases in the police, and won every single one. I've given evidence at the the independent tribunal, you know, and that's been cited as as been five points been taken up now in statute law. I'll yet to be proven wrong in anything I've said regarding this topic, you know. So why am I on my own? I think there is one of uh, what's a different, slightly different genre, Maggie Oliver. Yeah, Maggie, of course, you know. Yeah. Um, and Maggie was the one that came to me to start with and said, John, be careful. She backed me and, and really she supported me from the very, very early days of me speaking out. And um, she's gone her path and I went my path. But, you know, I'll always thank her for what we did. And she gave evidence sold shoulder to shoulder with me in the government inquiry, you know, and there's another guy called Lenny Harper who exposed the care home Hope de la Okay. Really. You know, and do you know what? He's up that part of the world when we get to Glasgow. Yeah. Let's oh, invite wicked. him. And he still get, keeps in touch, you know. And and maybe, you know, if we go that way, Maggie can jump on board. She came on board with my walk to Manchester for the last bit. So yeah, that there are there, but on the whole, you know, no, and it, it means a lot. We This is how you bring about change, mm. by standing up. Definitely. And, and they know what they've done, Darren. These people know what they've done. Yeah, I know they do, but they just don't want to yeah. do they? But, you know, they, they seem to put us down. Yeah, but they mm. hate this. Yeah. But you know what? God loves it. But there's nothing you know? wrong with this. And this is what there's we're going to carry on. We're, we're in a good surrounding. We're yeah. good people. Yeah. You know, we're just, you know, I'm trying to help myself by getting better so we can help other people to go forth and, you know, that, that's what it's about. Because as I said to you earlier, life is too short. We yeah. can make change, but we can make it now with, you know, ex-criminal or, you know, ex-police officer. It makes yeah. no odds. It don't. You know, we're all different. one. We're on the same journey, the same crusade, you know, of what we really want to be in life and what we want to do is to help. Yeah, and I, I look know. at those tender years when, when they did their best to try and take my children off of me. And what if I'd have lost one of my kids to the care system? What would their life be like now, you know? One of the most heartbreaking parts of your story was when your son was in hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know. he was critical, wasn't he? Almost critical. Yeah, well, well, he died. He died. He was dead for 10 minutes and they revived him. And guess what the police yeah. did to John? Yeah. Because well, he went to the hospital well, to what, see what, son. What happened was, because I got threatened with the loss of my home, my job and my children, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so my home, they didn't pay me for nearly three years. I was Only because I was working on building sites, you know, and that I managed to keep the banks come round and to to do an assessment to take my house okay. off me and that and the woman she'd been in a care home and she said john they ain't getting a penny you pay us a penny a month a pound a month and anyway that that got resolved i ended up having to Stroke pay it back but bless them you know yeah. so i can't knock them too too much um my job well there was nine cases against me i weren't going to lose my job i was going to lose my liberty you know they tried to do me for supplying heroin was one of them Oh, they said, you're going to get 15 years and all sorts of cases. I put threats to kill. Wow. Um, a, a deputy assistant commissioner, they said, because I said, if you take my kids off me, I'm going to cut you ear to ear. You take, of course, the next thing, threats to kill, all sorts of madness. But you so, got charged for going to the hospital, didn't you, to see your yeah, dying yeah, son? Well, well what happened was, at the same time, my kid was in hospital, terrible, horrific accident. His spinal column was snapped 95%. Oh. It was basically hanging like that. And they pull it back, but then intensive care. He went, I got on one day, and they said, um, "And I was, I was on my knees. I literally, I, I've been stripped bare of everything, Jeez. you know." And they said, "I got home from this hospital. We didn't even have the petrol." They said, "Please, can can you come back?" And I, you know, when you know that tone, you know I said, "What? What?" They said, "We, yeah. I did family liaison. You, 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 just like, please, just come back." I went back, went into the ICU, and there was three. And it was miles away from my home, specialist ICU, three consultants. And they said, I'm sorry, but we've lost your son. I was like, what happened? And he went, well, he's, his heart stopped. Um, he went into cardiac arrest. 
we had for seven and a half minutes we've been full revival you know three three consultants on it we've had a whole team for seven and a half minutes it had gone two and a half minutes before that he's been 10 minutes now with no oxygen and um he's on full 100 percent life support um but we're, we're going to be pulling the plug you know it'll be switched off in five days and they said if you want to contest it We'll put them in touch with our legal team. And I thought, well, they've done their best. You, yeah. And with me, I'm pragmatic. When enough is enough, I I, mm. I know when I'm beat. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, I get you know, I'll shout, scream and cry all, all I want. I've got plenty of time to do that. I have to deal with a situation. And probably that's been in a police for so many years. Dealt, yeah. Give that me that ability to, to shut off and carry on. And so they said, and this was also another turning point in my life as well. So I said, can I stay with him? And they said, yeah, yeah. So I, at home, it was um, one of my boys had, had, had left. He was living with his girlfriend. It was my 25-year-old, my 15-year-old. So I made sure they was okay. And I got in touch with my sister. She lived nearby to check on everything. And for three days, I held his hand. You know, and there was no change. It was it was awful. And it was a bit like, do you remember that footage of, of Leah Betts when she was, her father put it out there, the ecstasy girl. Oh, the one from Essex. Yeah, the yeah. Essex girl. And her father puts out a video of all the pipes and all that. It's horrific. Wow. And it was the same as that. Yeah, all this. And no one should ever see their kid in that state. No. And I went into the chapel and I prayed. And I prayed hard, right? And this was this this was my, my journey of becoming a, a Christian, you know, a real soldier for Christ on this one. And I prayed and I prayed. It was a multi-faith room. So there was Indonesian doctors that come in and have their little prayer and the Hindu doctors have their bit. And I just sat there and I opened the Bible and I read Psalm 23. It was like, Lord's my shepherd. And I'm reading it and I'm reading it. I kept reading it and reading it, reading it. And in the end, I turned around to God and said, do you know what? I've had enough of this. I said, all this pain for helping other people's children because they can't be bothered. I don't want to insult anyone out there, but I'm just saying it as it is, because they can't be bothered. They, they decide to hurt instead of to, to help, to heal. I said, why am I picking up shattered pieces? You know, and I, and I said to him, if you can't give me my son, then don't expect me to ever, ever go out there and help anyone else. I'm done. I lose this, this machine's shut down. It ain't happening. And I said, give me my son, please just give me my son, God, give me my son. And I went back and I sat and I held his hand and it was like something out of a film. The next thing, is his finger moved like that. Wow. And bear in mind, he had total paralysis from his eyes yeah. downwards. Yeah. And his eyes opened and I went, move your toe. And I thought, if he moves his toe, I know there's a He's connection. coming back, yeah. Yeah, and he went like that. And I went, son, I love you so much. And he sort of tried to say, I love you back, but he had wow. so many pipes in it. He's like, oh. And I said to the nurse, <laughs> oh. I said to the nurse, right, I'm going home. And she went, what, what? I said, no, I'm going home. I've got to go home. Yeah. And what I've done, I've become a blood donor because I could park my car with a blood donor sticker in the blood donor's bay. Because yeah, I didn't even have the money to pay for <laughs> yeah. a parking, you know. So I, I drove home and I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you. I, I said, you've got me. And I said to him, you, I'll do whatever it takes to help kids. I promise you, I'll, I'll keep to my side of the bargain. And that's when I really started all this stuff. And I got home. When I got home, I thought, I need a cup of tea, you know. I used to go in through the back door, you know. And again, I, used, I said to the Met Police, my back door don't open. If you ever want to raid my house, just go in. I'll give you an invite. You know, the door's open to come in. And, and I see my son, he's working on his car and there's these two blokes talking to him. And I'm like, they look like old Bill. You know, when you, yeah, you know, what I mean? know it, yeah. You know, they're detectives. And he's he's telling them, he's, well, I don't know, John, where do you done what you're on about? <laughs> and, and good lad, loyal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I opened the door and said, Aaron, it's okay. It's okay. And they come in and they brief it. And they say, look, we're from Hertfordshire Police. We've been sent by the Met Police. You know, you're under arrest for child neglect. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I went, you what? And I turned around and said, listen, wow. you you go near my son, because he'd gone up the shops to buy some milk, my boy, for the tea. And he'd come back. And I said, if you ever touch him, it, honestly, I'm going to bite you. I'll bite you. I'll, I'll, whatever I've got, you're getting it. You've got to get more because you don't understand what you're dealing with here. And I said, please hear me out. And his sergeant went, okay. And I told him, I said, look. And he went, and he had the log there, the, the printout log. He went, you've been stitched up. We've been lied to. We were told by the Met Police, this is why I'm happy to see Christa go. I'm happy to see him go because my argument went right to the top. And um, 
And he said that we've been told that you had left a young boy for three days home alone. No one, no food, no nothing. And I said, well, it's not the truth. And he went, oh, okay. He de-arrested me. And he said, can we just do our checks? I said, yeah. So they check your fridge and they check the cupboard that there's food in there and yeah, they check yeah. that it's clean. Welfare and check. Oh, the welfare check, you know, mm -hmm. the toilet's not blocked with crap and all this. So I said, do what you've got to do. And then just can we interview the boy? I said, yes, of course. So he was scared anyway. They just, bless him. They spoke to him. And the guy come past, he said, no one's going to touch you. And he shook my hand. How old was your son at that point? 15. 15. 15. So right. there's no age limit. He weren't, right. you know. But this is this is the level of veracity and spite that they will implement at the very top to gain mm. your silence. But I say to people, these are bullies. These are bullies. Like Sean said about these trolls, that they, they mm. hide in the shadows. They lurk in the shadows. These are underbelly, bottom-dwelling morons. You take this fight on, and this goes to all survivors, you take this fight on, you stand up because God is behind you. He's got his hand on you. You do stand on your own sometimes, but your bravery will bring many, many more forward. I promise you that. We cannot have this no more. This has to stop. We really need to speak out and shed light on this underbelly that is right in our society. Give them no quarter and you will win. They, you will not be proved wrong. And then after that, they all sort of backed away from me. You know, um, every case got dropped by the CPS. Um, you know, yeah, do you know what I mean? And you it's what you had to go through though. Yeah, get yeah, pain. Mm -hmm. You know, all the pain. They gave me, reinstate my money that they took off me you know, and everything, and then they pension me off. Uh, but they will do anything to protect this, what's going on, because they know that they've screwed up and they know they've protected the paedophiles. But And that story as well shows that a lot of it comes from the top. There's a lot of good always. cops, isn't there? Yeah. But they're getting these bad orders from above. And this is why I I, I, I take umbrage with these, they call them auditors. These, and I, I'm calling them out because I think they're wrong in what they're doing. They say they're exposing police corruption. Sorry, Darren, you're, you're suffering there a bit. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> and um, they go up to police in the street, uniform cops, and go, oh, you acting under your oath, oh, you this. And yeah. I'm thinking, if you worked in a shop, you know, that, that that's doing bad trading, you don't attack the poor, you know, shop assistant. You know, you go for the top. So it's wrong. We don't have that low-level corruption. We have low-level stupidity and incompetence. But this country does have high-level perversion, and it does. And they, there is, I think there is always a trade-off when they get up there. I think there always is. Otherwise, you ain't going to see the game through. You you won't last mm -hmm. unless something is traded. And in this country, it tends to be sexual perversion with children. Big business for them, wasn't it? Big business. That's all there is to it. And hence why we're coming across now to try and get myself, yeah. you know, back on track and out of pain. Yeah. To live a normal life, whatever that may and, be. And can clearly yeah. see you're in discomfort there, yeah. you know. It's, um, it's just a bit sore, that's all. How, how can Darren reach you then? Uh, people reach you, Darren, support you. So on uh, Facebook, because, you know, I've done a few things of recently. I've got rid of my old name, so I've changed my name by Depot now. So um, uh, my real, like, my name now and uh, Depot is Hugh Hefner. You're joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> no, um, Doctor Love. Uh, yeah, Doctor Love. No, uh, Darren Webster. You know, it's just it was. I, I want to get rid of my old name. It was a lot of bad stuff to it. So fresh on, start. Yeah, I needed it. You know, I got a new start, new life, new crack at life. It long last. I don't live in where I live in Bristol. Now. I live in a quiet part of the world, but we're trying to come near London. So, and on Facebook, I'm under Darren Webster, but the main one is to go through John. Yeah, yeah, e either or. I mean, um, they, they, John Wedger, J O N Wedger, W E D G E R, foundation at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch and make a donation, come go to me John. and I'll pass it to Darren and then. Darren can supply details of where that money goes if they want to make that, yeah, you know. That's we'll what we'll definitely gonna... be doing one, won't we? So, All the links yeah. will be in the description box. That's what we're going to do now. That's why I've bought, as I say, I right, need a dress so I can show the guys. Is I've bought all my stuff so no one can say, oh, there is no, there is yeah, this, yeah. everything there. Um, so, you know, we're going to get a proper bank account for it so the money goes in. And I want to do it all above board, which Everything. we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Every penny it'll be accounted for. And I want to do a, a, a video that when we meet the consultant, when we sign and pay, and they can say, right, that's where your money's gone. That's, you know, what we had to use for the, 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 the ride. 
And just say, for instance, there was, you know, if there was a couple of grand left, we'd just choose a charity and donate that to Yeah, them. I think Anthony's got one, you know. Cool. Then, you, you know, yeah. if something comes up with a charity or a split between a couple of charities, and you, you, you're giving back again. And, um, you know, I, I like, and if I was, you know, in, in, and it all goes to plan and I do get a life and I can enjoy my you will. life. You will. I will. I hope so. Then, you know, I'd like to do it for someone else. You know, if I could write it for someone else to help someone else with their calls, because it's, it's about giving back. It's something I never thought I'd do in my life, but I'm like really big on it now and like helping people, you know, and that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of giving like a new lease of life, you know. Like I said, I just, but yeah, if you want to reach out through like Facebook and stuff and, you know, and I do it that way, but go through John and... I mean, we come up with an idea. I spoke to Darren, spoke to Anthony, we should do it. So we've got to finalise and put things together properly. But if there are people that have got that bit of cash that they want to give a, you know, even a significant amount, whatever it is, you know, we, we can arrange it and then it can go from there. But everything we've just, in its infancy, we're putting it together. We've not even worked out the route and the bike. I've got to strip it down, rebuild it, but it'll be done. It'll be a work in progress. You can follow us through um, to the summer. It's not that far away. No. But you know, like I say, if if every subscriber gives a pound, we got it. We've done pounds, it. Twenty pounds. Twenty yes. pounds. So there'll be some kind of page that shows the amount being raised. Yeah, 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 I, we, yeah we, we, we can, but we we we've got to be very careful with it because this is what what happened. Sorry, with the last thing was that it, it become too much point of contention because we still have to do the accounting for for the petrol doing bits and pieces like that. Do you know what I mean? So. Yes, there will there will be an estimate of how much we're near the target. Definitely, do you know yeah. what I mean? As opposed to definitive to the to the dot. This is it. Only post event we can we can do that. I think yeah. it's going to be good to keep people informed that they can see where every penny is going because you will get some cranky that will have something to say and go, "Oh, that never happened." You know, I'd sooner do it all on on camera. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, cause well, you're going to get it anyway. They're, yeah, they're going to well, come. We know, we know we're going to get it. Yeah. So, because you know, we've Darren, got... what's the risks of this operation? Of me having it. So basically, um, because I've had you know meningitis, and I, I'm a couple of years back, I had a couple of brain tumors. I got a big scar on the back of my head. So going through the operation, as they say, there's like an eighty percent chance that it could go wrong. Yeah, it 80% could, chance yeah, it could go gone, wrong yeah because the bleeds have got, could have gone too far is that not yeah it's, a bit scary high. and is that fatal if it goes wrong well yeah if it goes wrong I won't know nothing about it I'll be under the general anaesthetic so it's just something I won't come round from so yeah that's why at the moment they were reluctant when I was in theatre before Christmas to take the ulcers in the urinals out when I was under he just stitched everything up because he didn't want to disturb the heart he didn't want to take that chance. Jesus Christ! So this is like, it's a big you, thing. It's me. your life on the line. It yeah. is my life. I'm fu I'm literally. If you didn't have off this this operation, is there a chance that you're gonna you're gonna die? But I got between five. I think it was five and seven years. But he said you're looking at the five, and I'm two years in already now. So you have got three years left to live Dude, unless it. you have this operation. And this done. operation is also a massive chance that you might die. There's a, there's a very good chance because nothing's guaranteed because it's with the heart. Because when you do a heart bypass, yeah. they've got to do the repairs to the arteries and they put you on a bypass machine, which is, uh, what did he call it? Uh, when, when you're on a machine and they, they, I forget the name of the machine now. Um, so when you're under anaesthetic, they got to bypass your heart. So they got to yeah, put yeah. your heart machine. You go oh, on a, a your machine, machine yeah. to pump your heart for you sort of thing then when you come off it they got to restart your heart. The heart that's it yeah. so there's a chance that that's if, where if it's fragile out. if anything gives away with the new valves or archery but again you know with the my view because they got to see how bad the archery is how bad it is bleeding Be before christmas back in last summer it was mildly it went slow it was a mild leak into my stomach and that was what got me ill because i had a collection of blood and it just turned into well, it wouldn't come and ain't. And how's um, this affecting you psychologically facing death like that? It's hard. It's hard. When I look up, I wake up every morning and I see Cal go at work and I think, you know, <laughs> one day that may not happen. You know, you, you do. I, I face it every day. I look at myself in the mirror and I really, really do. And I, I hate, I'm not a vain person. I, I hate looking at me because of what I've gone through. So, 
yeah, there's a big part of me. It still hates me for what he done to me. You know, I can't escape that. And But when I look in the mirror, I just think, you know, what's next? Am I going to... I do get scared going to bed at night. Do you? But yeah, I really not do. Not going to wake up. Not going to wake up. Because I... Most nights I'm in pain and I, I have to go downstairs and go on the sofa and push my back into the sofa because my body is spasm and it, it's, it's going into shock sort of thing and it's not fair on Kelly because, you know, and I can't, and I groan with the pain. You want know, oh. to let us get some sleep for work? Yeah, because she has to drive right. at her job and, you know, and it's, I don't think it's right. But I, I, I cry. I cry every day on my own. I cry on my own. I ain't, I ain't going to deny that. I ain't going to be, you know... I'm a man, I, I can say I cry because I get scared because I've, I've had to fight for my life all my life and now i got the biggest fight because it's to do with my heart. But I'm only under pressure from my heart because of my life, because of what people have put me through as a child and going out, you know, through adult life and it, it's all pressure. But basically, your body wears down and mine wears down. So yeah, one of my biggest fears is, is not waking up if the operation not going to plan. When in November I got put asleep to go and have it all um, cleaned up, I got upset because I didn't think I was going to wake up, and I was in, I was in a bad place because I had the operation. I went in on a Monday. They operated because it started getting bad on the night time. They took me in a the theatre, and he said, "If you'd have come in Tuesday, you wouldn't have survived." I was a day in. I've I've saved, but because I wasn't telling Kelly that I was bleeding, because I was scared, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should tell her, would it stop? You know, I don't. I'd never had it before, so I was I was bleeding out and I was turning yellow, and I, I've lost a lot. I mean, you can, my face from now, you know, I don't look great, but I'm just trying to get on with it. That's why it's kind of crucial that I get this operation done because with the NHS, they give, I, there's like a two year wait in this because there's so many, but I'm not even in the stages yet of seeing a consultant because they keep putting my my view back which has been eight times now. They keep cancelling all the time. You know, it's either been COVID, the machines broke down, or a staff member has gone ill. And the last one was, last week before last, they said they wanted to do blood tests before, more blood tests. And they keep doing blood tests all the time. And they get fed up with it, actually, like a pin cushion. You know, and I just want to just want to get it done. Just want to get it done. I just want to try and live a life without having to worry, without having to be on tablets and sleeping stuff and antidepressants because it all it's all psychology. It all plays on my head. Well, and your liver's got to clean on that as well, isn't it? Well, it's, yeah, yeah, you know, and it ain't gonna be good on your your system. Yeah. And I just yeah, I worry because the percentage is high if not coming through it. You know, there's a good chance that I will get it done. That I, I I may not come through. It depends on your heart with the damage which is done. And that's what the my my it's called a myo view. That's what they look right into everything. They speed your heart up. They slow it down to see if it can cope. And if there's gonna if if it does go to a point that my heart is in a bit of a dis, you know bad bit of distress and he can't do it, then then I'll die. Because you have to die a slow death. You know, there's nothing they, nothing he could do, is there? Because they can't start some up, which ain't gonna start. So I'm really speechless. No, it's just. <laughs> life it's what i've been through i've had it all my life i don't know any different and i think the sad thing is i'm used to pain to me if i want in pain i think something was wrong because i've had pain all my life you know i've struggled with pain since coming out of the approved school you know if it went from a back passage and meningitis and loads of you know trying to kill myself and you deal with the mental pain of that and you know um then having brain tumors and stuff you know that was it was all come it was all caused by trauma but getting beat as a kid and stuff you know what i mean not having a great life you know and yeah i never had a great life i care what anybody says you know it was well oh, crap that's why i'm in the mess i'm in now with it you know and it ain't through drink drugs or smoking is none of that it's to do with my lifestyle with the way i was treated is there is my body is that enough it's basically saying to me look bro you know we're about to give up on you mate you know I've made changes in my life. I, I, I try and eat a healthy diet. I can't eat, you know, I don't drink alcohol. I'm not a drinker, you know. I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't do recreational drugs. I can't, they kill me. I can't do them and I won't do them. You know, I just want to live. That's all I want to do is live. I just want to be given a chance to live. You know, I'd like to see if I could, like, you know, 53, 54. You know what I mean? Because once you're gone, you remember for two weeks. 
You know, I've got yeah. I've got a lot more to give. I don't want to be a headstone that pushes daisies. You know, I want to try and give something back. I want to try and help people if I can. Not I'm not going to say I'm going to change the world because I'm not. You know, but I just want to let people know that if you, know, you want it, you know, if I can help you, I'll help you. I'll try my utmost best. You know, I just don't want people to go through what I had to go through. There's no point, you know, because if I'd have met a, a lad like me growing up when I was younger, it saved me a lot of hardship in my life. You know what I mean? It saved me a lot of trying to hang myself and take overdoses left, right and centre and, you know, trying to starve yourself and stuff because, you know, when you're in prison, they go on hunger strikes to die and stuff like that, you know. shouldn't have to do it, should you? You shouldn't have to wake up in the morning and think, right, I'm going to kill myself today. That's not what life's about. You should wake up and think, right, I'm going to go to work today. I'm going to go and do this. I'm going to go and put some back to society. Not wake up, look at your bathrobe and think, right, that tie on the bathrobe is going to go around my neck. You know? You didn't do it for a cut. And I wouldn't have tried for help because I didn't do it in places where people could find me. I was just unlucky that people found me. Mm. You know, I didn't realise that once I was trying to hang myself on a tree that I was being watched by a couple. I made sure it was out of the way. They were walking a bleeding dog. I wish they'd have caught them, but I didn't realise they were watching me. And I put a rope in, and I swung off the tree. The bloke caught me. Oh, you know? And I was angry afterwards when I got released from hospital. I hated that person for catching me because he had no right to. Should have just let me swung and get out of this pain. You know, it's all right when you sat there with a psychiatrist and they're going, come on, mate, life ain't that bad, ain't it? Get inside this body and I'll show you what bad's about. Get inside there and see where that journey took me. Because believe you me, you don't want to look back and you don't want to go back. You know, you just... And that's what I used to get upset about. That's why I used to just think, right, that's it, I've had enough. Trying to get out of this shit now, like, you know, I've had enough of this body, I've had enough of these nightmares, I've had enough of the breaking out and all sweats all the time, can't sleep. It's not right. That ain't life, is it? You know, I should have been given a chance like everybody else. Yeah, I made mistakes, I can't take them back. And I'm sorry, I can't take them back. But I was in pain, I didn't mean to do the things I did. You know, just couldn't help it, didn't know any other way. Couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't exactly go and get a job, could you? You know, couldn't fill out a bleeding application. Mm. you know McDonald's at one time went up higher banks I couldn't read you know I'd have been giving her food to the ash bin thinking it was something like that, you know <laughs> but it is what it is but I just try and make light of everything I try and smile as best I can you know I try and be polite to people I try and stop and talk to people you know how you doing you okay you and good and it's nice just, you know see people smile you know that's why I got my dog in so I can go out for walks with the dog in, in the woods and just escape. Me and him, you know, it's lush. It's really, really nice. Just want to be out of pain, Jen. Just want to be out of pain. Not a lot to ask, is it? You know, people ain't got 20 pence. And I understand it's fair enough. It's tough times. And if we don't meet it, we don't meet it. It's not the end of the world. I've lived my life. You know what I mean? I've lived mine. I've done mine. You know, just, I think I'm going a little bit, little bit longer. Got a lot <laughs> you know? If I can get yeah. a chance, but if I can't, I can't. There's nothing you can do about it, can you? Your day's marks up for you, and that's it. It'd be what will be. You know, like to think I'd left a bit of a legacy. Yeah. But, you know, like to do it another year or two more yet, but who knows? <laughs> well, God willing, God willing. Yeah, yeah. but that's it. Sorry. <laughs> no, that was powerful get, stuff. How am I supposed to close this incision after hearing that? Bloody Everyone hell. donate sorry. 20p. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Like, <laughs> you don't do this. <laughs> can, can I have some of your antidepressants down? <laughs> <laughs> well, how many do you want? <laughs> Last, um, all right, so I'm going to finish right. this on a happy... Uh, my brain is gone. How did and you my... meet the lovely Kelly? <sighs> Um, through John. Through John? Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's yeah. watching me. I didn't realise when we done a live, I thought... We, there's like 10 people watching and it was a lot of 10,000 on it on the yeah, live yeah, yeah. 10, 7 yeah. and I didn't realise I told my brain it was only 10 people watching me and she um, when I put my phone on she was the first, first person first person to say that we believe in you I had oh. someone believe me how lovely. someone believed in me the first person and and, and, yeah. and do you know the, the ironic thing when we did the, the walk can I from, from water, yeah. Um, yeah, surely. Oh, cheers, sure. When we so did the walk from London to, to Bath to highlight Darren's campaign, the guy who walked with me, when we got to Bath, there was a little group turned up to support us. There's one girl that had helped throughout, Nancy, and the guy I'm working with, yeah. they got talking and they got married. 
We got oh, married. We look got at married you, last year. Cupid. Yeah, we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's so, what I'm, I'm doing yeah. this year. Yeah. I'm getting married this year. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Only a little small thing, little yeah. tiny little wedding. But um, just to both of us, Gretna Green. Oh, love it. Wow. They're cheap, love 300 pounds. That's been universal. Take dog along as well. <laughs> yeah, she's the best man. <laughs> yeah, he's going to eat the rings. So that wait until he bumps them out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, how <laughs> romantic. Sitting here somewhere. I'm going to put a, a green glove on. Yeah, here we go. Oh, Do the glands while you're there. Hey, breeding sausages. <laughs> oh. Put that on your finger. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. But yeah, I met her through... Um, John, like How John's there watching it, and that was it. And brilliant, you know, loved it. Not look back, you know. She, like, see, she believed in me, she helped me, you know. And I was in a bad way. And prior, like two weeks before meeting, I was trying to kill myself, so and I ain't done it ever since. Wow, so only when she talks. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, good question. Thank yeah. you, thank yeah. you for having me. Get this on a positive note, nice. yeah, definitely. I think, I think the final, um, to try and end it on happy note, the, the final live stream that Darren's going to do is going to be from Tomorrowland after, yes. his, after his operation yeah. on his, yeah. on his uh, honeymoon. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 can you feel it? <laughs> <laughs> Can you show me the love? I'll give me your the your oh, no. It's now portable on a machine. It'll be in a bag oh. next to you, won't it? Be me showing him bicep. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh my god. So yeah, the, to the people story. watching this then, I mean that just what you said at the end, Aaron, that was some of the most powerful oh, testimony I've ever heard. Wow. Mm. Thank you. I, I just felt I looked at John's face. There was tears in his yeah, eyes. Yeah, we were just. I tearful. felt. I felt the energy just. Cha- the energy just, just completely changed in the room. Yeah. If the viewers have just felt that, what we've all just felt, you know, please let us know in the comments what you think about the video. Please reach out to Darren. Give him your love and support, like he said. Doing these podcasts, it's cathartic telling his story. But then for all the love to come for people to come into his life out of the blue. People have been through these similar experiences to let him know how hearing Darren's testimony has affected them and it's, it's prevented them from wanting to kill themselves. It's amazing. You heard John's story of what he went through with his activism and with his son in hospital on his deathbed. And then all the links will be in the description box if you want to reach out to anyone in the room and and, and Jen's uh, down there as well, her Instagram, her, her cotton company. Good old Jen. And um, <laughs> ah, good. yeah, I'm Thank still, my, my head is still a bit gone. <laughs> but you know, yeah. you know, d- despite all of that, it was still coming to comment. Darren works for MI5. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, shields, yeah, yeah. All shields together. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you can afford 20p, <laughs> just 20p, man. That's all it is. Yeah. That's all I'm asking. Not having, asking for pounds or don't to your bank account. 20 pence. If we all did it around the UK and around the world, we'd do it in no time. 20 pence. Mm. You know, that's all I'm asking. Not asking for pounds because I don't want pounds because I, I prefer if they kept that and fed their families. I'd be happier with that way. They there could just go. chuck us 20 pence. But there are people out there that do have a lot of disposable income that will quite happily help. And if they help, then brilliant, you know? Yeah. Let's, p- let's pivot these so we can have a group hug. Definitely. Yay. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery.
Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organiccottonclothing.co.uk Another first on the channel, John here has done 27 years with Scotland Yard. The uh, eminent, what was he said? <laughs> benchmark of policing. The benchmark Global of policing. Global benchmark of policing. Global benchmark of yeah. policing, Scotland Yard. So we're going to get in, get in deep from the other side. We've had a lot of people on here who have committed crimes, or been involved in crimes, a few journalists. So this is the first. I'm really delighted to get more from the other side. So thanks for coming down. No, it's a pleasure, Sean. London, John. Yeah. What made you want to join Scotland Yard or become a police? Uh, well, it was it was a strange one. I actually um, didn't want to be a police officer, to be honest. And uh, I had a passion for swimming and diving. And the, the police had a diving unit. The Metropolitan Police had a diving unit. So I actually joined, and I said at my interview, that I wanted to be a diver for them. And uh, they took me on, you know, as, uh, but it sort of changed. So once I got a taste of investigating, I never, uh, I did get um, put on the, the river unit, which had the diving unit there in the east end of London uh, for a couple of years. But then I got seconded off and ended up dealing what with What years were they? Uh, I joined at the beginning of the 90s. So it was uh, at the beginning of the, the, the millennium, really, 2000, I ended up on the uh on the river unit and you're assigned to do what as a you know dive obviously but what what kind well, of well the, well initially uh, I, I got put on there it, it's it's strange how it happened because at the same time in 2000 um my ex-missus left me with four children on my own to bring up and i needed a job where i could get home for my kids and they worked a really good shift pattern they worked four days on four days off so i and it's a really sought after job um, so I applied, I was, uh, a detective, a trainee detective up the West end of London at the time and this job come up and it was a bit of a welcome break. Uh, but I was, um, sort of just learning the ropes. So I'm driving a boat. I got on my boat driving line. I've got a ferryman's license. I can actually drive a ferry if I want to. <laughs> and, um, within a couple of months I was getting very bored and we had a, uh, an intelligence. It's really strange how it works because, that little um, police station in uh, Wapping, in the east end of London, is the oldest police station in the world. 1798 it began. Hmm. And it's quite weird because you, you hear things um, and people get classed as conspiracy theorists. And one of them, they go on about maritime law and how that it underpins all our laws. And it's really weird that um, maritime law actually is the basis of all law. And that's why you stand in the dock. And if a boat sinks, it's in trouble. It needs to be bailed out. We get bailed out. That's where it comes from, bail. It, that's where it all comes from, yeah. So um, they they had a uh, special branch were based there because it was classed as a port. And they uh, they were really good to work with because they um, had access to phenomenal information and they were like the crossover with MI5 and things like that then. And once you got in with them boys, you, you, you know, you could really glean some good info. Uh, and, well, as a diver, though, did you like discover anything? Well, well I never went diving. Okay. I, I never went diving because I just didn't want to. And <laughs> and you wouldn't see anything anyway. It's just murky, black water. You just end up <laughs> diving the Regent's Canal in Camden for prostitutes. That's all they ended up oh, sort of. Uh, but um, th they had an intelligence unit there and there was a detective sergeant there. And it was, every now and then you get people you work with that, that really boost you. They really got that energy. And, and he was a fantastic guy, a little tough guy, a little tough ginger egg guy. And he said, look, what are you doing now? I said, look, I'll, I'll get home for my kids and, you know, and everything. He said, look, there's a problem. There's a problem on the river and the canals. Come and, come and work with me. Come and help me out and I'll get you seconded. He said, we're getting funding from the file unit. And it was to do with sex offenders living on canal boats because there was a loophole in the law which allowed them, when they brought in the Sex Offenders Registry Act in 1997, when I do a presentation, I get this board out and I draw the map of London with the Thames and all that, and there is a loophole. 
And what it says is that you used to have to sign the sex offenders register within 28 days of conviction, uh, caution, or or serving of a sentence for a sex offence against a Schedule 1 sex offence. You had 28 days to go to a police station in the policing district where you resided and sign on as a sex offender. And a lot of them didn't want to do that for obvious reasons. Now, there was a copper in Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. He sort of made an issue of this because they had a lot of transient in Peterborough and in Cambridgeshire in general. So I went to see him and I said, well, what's going on with it? And he went, oh, it's because they don't have to register. If they keep moving from county to county, so if they move from Lincolnshire for a couple of days then come back, in effect, they don't have to register. Mm. And he said, look at London. He said, and at the time, I, I was studying geographical profiling. Everything goes to a pattern, absolutely everything. And human beings all go to a pattern. And geography answers a lot, you know, and um, also how empires are built. If you look at why the British Empire was so good, because we had geography on our side, whereas other places don't, we, you know. So uh, London is built up of, I think it's 26 boroughs. And each borough in London, London's unique in as much as it's not one policing district, it's 26 policing districts. And when you look at the canals, they're so old, the boundaries, the old parish boundaries are built up around the canals and the River Thames. So if you take sort of like where Wapping is, that's in the borough of Tower Hamlets. But if you go into the middle of the river, you're then in the borough of Southwark. So the River Thames is tidal and moves about too fast, but the canals don't and canal boats are all right to live in. So certain parts of London, there was um, a collection of So you'd get them around Hackney, uh, Southall, and when I overlaid a map on top of it, I found out that these were areas where three boroughs were meeting. So the canal boat, in effect, could be here. And then literally a canal is only three metres wide, some of them. You cross over on your, your 27th day onto the other side in another borough, and legally, you're not going to get caught. This is blowing my mind. I can't believe what I'm hearing. So I started looking into this. And see, my reason why I do what I do now, I'm a whistleblower in as much as I blew the whistle on the cover-up of, of child abuse in general and I was threatened and bullied to a monumental degree, threatened with imprisonment on nine occasions if I didn't shut my mouth. And it all came from this uh, unit I was on. So how many years after you'd entered the police were you on this unit? How long did that take? Uh, I, I started... I started off on the street, then I quickly went into the CID because that's where I wanted to go. I didn't like uniform policing. I just found them like drones dealing with the same rubbish um, all day long. I was never excited in fast cars or anything like that. And the detectives had a lot of freedom. I'm a bit of a loner. I love working on my own or in a small group. I don't like big crowds and I am responsible for my own merits and my own hard work. And so I really liked detective work. And I loved it. And how, how many um, years had you been in the I'd police been, you I'd, I'd the been in uh, about seven years. All right, so you've, then... you've jumped ahead quite a bit. Let's just go back at a second. Um, you went from dive into the street? No, I start, No, I, ne I never actually got diving. I joined to become a diver, but I had to become a copper first okay. and specialise. So I started off in South East London. Yeah. And I moved from South East London into the West End of London. And what were your um, initial duties? Um, just patrolling, really. If you're on a car on foot, I went to a rough part of South East London and it was exciting. It was violent. Uh, it wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, what did you think it would be? Uh, I thought it'd be a lot more organized than what it was. It was just chaos, really. It was, um, just going from one court to the other and, uh, and it was very violent as well. So did you get attacked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been attacked. I've had my ribs broken. Um, and what was the circumstances uh, that your ribs got broken? Oh, well, well, it's uh, a laugh about it now, but um, my stepfather was a tough guy and he was a big, hard man, but he was a lovely, lovely guy. And I didn't want to tell him that I joined the police because um, he didn't really like the police. And we were in a pub one day and I said, look, I'm, uh, I've joined the police. And he'd already found out, I think, from one of my sisters and I said, I was frightened to tell you because I, I thought you might, you know, be against it. And we're in the pub and he's got a pint in his right hand. And I said to him, I'm a bit worried because he, he was six foot seven and he was huge, big, strong lad. And he liked, he was always fighting. And he turned around to me, he said, look, 
what you're worried about. I said, what if I got nicked someone like you? I said, you, 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 you're just massive. You kill me. And I was very lean back then, a very lean and, and quiet lad, you know. And the next thing, he's taken the pint from his right hand, put it into his left hand. He said, listen, son, it's not what I'm going to do. It's what I'm not going to do. And I think, what does that even mean? And with that, he's chinned me. He smacked me right on the chin and knocked me flying. <laughs> because I'm a dopey idiot, I had my tongue out and I bit my tongue, nearly bit my tongue off. Blood everywhere. And he picked me up. He said, oh, my God, whatever you do, don't tell your sisters and your mum I've done that. <laughs> I said, why did you do that? He said, listen. He said, I love it your bits. He said, when you go out there, those that mouth off and they're going to tell you they're going to do this, they're going to do that, get straight in there and grab hold of them because they're not going to do it. But the quiet one will hurt you and will hurt you bad. And it was when I was... Uh, very new to the streets. We stopped a taxi um, in South London, South East London. And the guy I was with, he was an oracle, knew everyone on the street. And he said, look, I'll talk to this guy. You talk to that guy. I think he's wanted. And he was wanted. And he was over the side from prison. He'd so done... this is someone that's a passenger in a taxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to use, a lot of the burglars would use taxis back then. And he'd, uh, he'd done a runner from whatever Nick. And he was a junkie and he didn't want to be caught. And I went over to him and said, what's your name? And he gave me a name, gave me a false name. And he said, listen, son, he said, it's easy enough. He said, a bit difficult to spell. Get your book out and I'll, and I'll spell it out for you. I said, oh, okay. So because so I'm, I'm looking down there. And he said, get on your radio, you can check me out. I was known for a few things, but I'm not known anymore. And because as soon as I've gone like that, he's, he's headbutted me. And of course, I've gone down, but I grabbed his leg and, and I wouldn't give up. And it, it was like a school fight. And it was, and he, my mate started fighting with his mate. So we're all fighting. My radio's gone mild, so we can't call for help. And anyway, um, well, we were just clumping each other and it was rolling around the floor. But in the end, he gave up and he said, right, enough. He said, I've had enough. I'm, I'm wanted. I went, all right. And he, and I'd had all blood ready to hit me all down my white shirt because it was in the summer. And we sat down and I said, uh, do you want a cigarette? He went, oh, would you, son? Roll us, a, they called him a salmon back then, and they rolled us a salmon, salmon and trout, snouts. So I rolled him a little fag and gave him a fag, and uh, he shook me hand. And he said, do you know? I went, yeah. He said, well, don't let him ever change you. Don't let him ever change you, son. <laughs> but th 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 there's a flip side of that, that um, when I w went back to the station, um, it was obvious that I'd been assaulted. And uh, the next thing I know, he, he was, I was told to go and have a shower. When I come back, there was an ambulance and he was carted off. Apparently, he had uh, tripped and had an accident in the cells, you know. And so that's what went on. Nothing to do with me because I was having a shower. But anyway, so that was. Um, uh, but another time, um, someone did try and kill me, try and stab me. Mm. And this ties in a bit with um, what you were saying. I, I was on Vice and I loved it. It was all street work and it was good. I was in King's Cross and back then was a frontline King's Cross. And there was a lot of street prostitution, hell of a lot of drugs, a lot of violence. And a lad I was working with was dealing with um, a prostitute in an alleyway, just getting the details and everything else. And a pimp came out of nowhere. And as he's come up, he's walked towards the copper because he was all in civilian clothes. And I've seen him and it was something out of a film. I see this glint from the light and he's got a blade. I think, God, flipping hell. So I run up to him and he's pulled the blade on me. So... Um, I punched him. Anyway, he's sort of gone back, jumped on him, and we're rolling around. Again, we're having a fight on the street. And um, I got my ribs broken. He broke my ribs and uh, all down one side. And uh, I managed to get him down. And then someone else came along, got him handcuffed. And I sat him down. And he was from New York. And I said, look, are you all right? You're cool. And he went, yeah, yeah. I said, are we, are we all right now? He went, yeah. So I said, listen. He was handcuffed at the back. I said, push your handcuffs under your feet and bring them up to your front. And my mate was going, what are you doing? I went, no, it's all right. Let him do it. I said, I'm going to roll you a cigarette. So he went, okay. So <laughs> I rolled him a cigarette. I gave him a cigarette. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I'm from Brooklyn. He said, I was a pimp in Brooklyn. And he said, I, um, I ran girls out in Brooklyn. And one night, the vice cops out there, same scenario. And he said, I went to stab one. He said, they shot me. And I got nine years in Rikers Island Police Station. He said, I'd do it to you, Bobbies. He said, you fight like a man and you give me a cigarette. He said, you're a class act, son. <laughs> <laughs> he said, whatever you say I've done, I've done. But no, I started off um, in Southeast London uh, and then I, I got, 
I got moved. Uh, there is a reason I got moved from yard protection. Someone actually tried to kill me, and I got sent to the West End. Someone that tried to kill. What was that? Tried, over? tried to kill me. Uh, that was over the fact that um, my ex missus husband was in uh, prison. I met her from that area. I was in prison um, for attempted murder and got released and decided to come and shoot me. So, uh, no way. Was that a credible thing then? Uh, yeah, it, it was deemed a credible threat. Uh, so they moved me to uh, the West End. They they was deliberating whether or not to sack me. So they moved me to the West End to sort of um, give me another chance, you know. So I went to the West End and I went to a police station, which was, I went to Belgravia and it was classed as a very quiet police station. But what I didn't realise was that it was totally under surveillance and the, the back of the building, there was flats there and they were all occupied by the corruption police and they were viewing everyone that came in. It was the only police station back there that had swipe card access. Um, so everyone that came in was monitored and all the phones monitored and all the detectives, well, not all of them, that's a bit unfair, but all the, the senior experienced detectives had been moved from the flying squad and the regional crime squad because of corruption. And they were all put into one pot and they were monitoring them. And of course they carried on their old ways and they all got, um, loads of them got arrested when you say corruption what methods of corruption were they employing uh there was um a lot of money being stolen from informants back then the police would get paid money and they give it to informants so and what they were doing were, were keeping half giving half keeping half uh so would that encourage police to like cultivate informant informants just just to get that money yeah well because it was a money owner you know um i heard of one guy that actually managed to pay for sales for his yacht from money that they'd stolen. There was, I mean, and the DI, this is how crazy it was back then. The DI, he's mentioned in a lot of books, this fella, and uh, on police corruption. And I won't name him because this never came out, but it was common knowledge back then. Uh, and what do you mean by DI? A detective inspector. Okay. Right. He was a great big strong guy and he would deal with everything, what he knew, which was violence. He'd come from the regional uh, crime squad, the flying squad before that. And uh, there was one of the detective sergeants, the DSs there, um, had screwed up on a job. And everyone had gone out for an office lunch. They used to go out um, to the East End for a curry. And his way of dealing with his problem was uh, he took the DS outside of the restaurant, punched him punched him so hard in the face he splintered the guy's cheekbone the bone went into his eye and uh, and blinded him and he fell on the floor and he walked back in and said no one's to pick him up he stays there like the piece of shit he is and the, the, the bloke ended up having to be pensioned out the police for it but nothing was ever said uh, you know and this is what happened but loads of there, there was money being stolen from fellas that were in the drug squad and it was mainly stealing the money there was you know um, I imagine the temptation if a drug dealer's got a lot of money there would be easy targets to take the money because you know who, who they're uh, going to complain to yeah I mean and it was part of the culture I mean what you're looking at back then when I joined a lot of them that their, their training had come from the late 60s and the 70s and it was absolutely endemic that's how they did it and uh, what I was told one of the reasons why the Sweeney the program, the Sweeney, was taken off air was political pressure because too many coppers were copying them, you know. I mean, what one guy, um, on a Friday, we did the warrants. So in the CID on a Friday, someone's turn, you go and get the warrant, we kick a door in, get in there six o'clock, have an early day in the pub. Big drinking culture as well. Um, one of the, um, the, the sergeants there, his thing was he, he went in first and if there was a man in there, he'd just go up and he'd headbutt him. You know, and it was, it was, so, I mean, it never go on now because of cameras and everything else. But back then it, it did go on. So say like six police were assigned to raid like a drug dealer's place and 10,000 pounds was found in there. How would that be distributed? Do you know, th th this is quite funny because this is the, um, you know, and in no way am I saying I've had anything to do with this. You know? <laughs> but they'd, they'd be the same way. When, when you'd be booking property in. You go, you go with your colleague up to the custody desk with the with the property, and they said, "Right, how much money?" And you say ten thousand pounds, for example, ten thousand. The sergeant go eight thousand. Are you going to book six thousand in? We haven't got room for four thousand, so we'll book your two thousand in, and, uh, and then that's at least a <laughs> all the time. But um, so this wasn't just isolated few police 
corrupt, corrupt police robbing drug dealers. This was part systematic. Uh, yeah, it, it was. I mean, I think it changed. The nineties really changed it. Paul Condon came in, and it, and he he had a real pole shift on corruption. Unfortunately, he swept over, and there were some good coppers that were classed as corrupt that weren't corrupt, and there was one guy. And he was a fantastic copper and he was someone I really, really looked up to. And they tried to tar him with that brush and he wouldn't have it. And because he wouldn't play ball, they, they, the, the corruption police stitched him up. And again, the corruption police, this is a problem I had. Those, th There's just been this line of duty program on and it angers me because they're the ones that tried to stitch me up and they did try and stitch me up. And I'm taking them to court next next year. Um, because of what they tried to do to me. And if you, with me, it was, I reckon it was, it was virgin on the political because of what I was exposing. Should we build up to that? Then? Yeah, of course, of course. So, so what happened if I go through the chronology of it? I mean, I joined uh, in the 90s, didn't have the best of starts, but enjoyed it. Uh, again, it was rough and ready and, and it was a bit of both. Sometimes um, the people you're dealing with, they expected a roll around. So it was who could get it in first. And, and you'd actually go in the pub and the lot you, you dealt with like maybe a couple of days before, be in the pub and they'll pass a drink over <laughs> and they say, next time we'll have you. And that's, <laughs> and that's, how, and I can always remember once I was, I was out um, in the East End with my kids and I used to take them to a pub that was on the River Thames there. And I, I, my kids were only little and this car's come steaming past with four, four up, as we'd say, and it's big handbrake skids spun round and pulled up beside me. And I've, all I've heard is, it's Wedger, get him. So two of them had jumped out and I said, boys, I'm, I'm with, with my kids. And they're like, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. And one of them gave my kids a pound each. <laughs> but they were going to fill me in because they thought I was on my own. I went, I went, no, 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 no. He's with, with his kids enough, you know. It's tribal. Yeah. And it was, um, so there, there was this agreement. But my career went to a path where I was used because I had a good nature with people. I was used, and I don't think it's a sneaky thing to do. I was used to get information, and people. What we was discussing off camera, what you got, what people got to understand is you get this criminal fraternity. We don't talk to the police. Total, absolute, hundred percent nonsense. And I'm not denigrating ex cons at all because I do a lot of work with Chris Lambriano, and I've got the utmost respect for Chris. You know, ex Cray twins henchmen and all this sort of bloody bar, but. As a guy, a fantastic guy, and 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 an upstanding guy, and there's a couple of others in in uh, the, the sort of group that he's involved that I've been introduced to, which are lovely, lovely people. But the criminal fraternity grass on each other, and they do, and it's an unwritten rule, and they all grass. Not all. Well, you, you get what I'm saying with this. I had over, I had over 100 co-defendants, and only four cooperated. Yeah. So it was not always like not always, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and there's inducements they can get, you know, certain things they can get, but it is a big department in the police information. And people think that the old Bill or the old CNI, they're not the old CNI. The only reason the old Bill know about something because someone's grasped them up. They say there are more informants in America now than there are police. Yeah, probably right. 100% right. You know, um, so I, I ended up at the West End and then I ended up in the CID, but I ended up in this... All right, so... What year are you now going into the CID? I'm, I'm going into the CID years? about 90, about, I think it's about 95 to 96. So I've many gone years into, into your career, are you? Uh, a couple of years into it. Yeah. And I, I go into CID very early. I got offered a driving course, but my inspector said, you bet, your career's better off in the CID. If you have a driving course, uniform one, you're going to be obliged to the uniform teams. And I didn't like the shift pattern. I didn't like getting up early and I just didn't like being part of a team. And I wanted to be in the CID. So he said, turn it down and you'll get on, on the crime squad. So I turned it down and they put me on a crime squad. Um, so I went into the CID department, but I was amongst all these um, more senior and experienced detectives who were all under investigation. I never knew at the time, you know, 90% of them were being investigated for very, very serious crimes. Um, so... <laughs> What they were meant to do was, if you, you manage your crimes, your crimes get allocated to you, and you usually get five or six crimes. I mean, now they, they have a lot more because they've got less coppers, but you go up to about 10 is about average. But all these old boys screened all their crimes into me and my mate. We had 100 crimes each. You know, they just screened everything into us. And have you got like a deadline on these uh, crimes? Well, you know, 
they're meant to be sort of um, looked into daily and they're meant to be updated every month and people want their crimes investigated. And how right? serious are these crimes? Well, one of them turned out to be an attempted murder, you know, and it initially didn't come in as it, and it, it ended up going up to an attempted murder. Um, did you solve that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> it did get solved, but uh, me and my pal didn't, unfortunately. But um, from there... Then I ended up, we're moving now towards the 2000s. I, I, you know, I had a good time. I enjoyed it and, and I, I really did like it. Um, but I had a young family and I had an ex-missus who had a lot of problems, uh, a lot of self-induced problems, you know, and uh, she just ran off one day, leaving uh, me with one infant child, one toddler and, and two older kids. And uh, so then mm. this job come up and uh, I took that and then, I started looking into the and what happened was that the unit had got information from a prison again had got information from the prison that uh in order to get away with being released and not becoming a you know um a registered sex offender uh what you got to do is you've got to get a canal boat and if you get one in london they ain't going to touch you and from the reasons I've explained, but also the canals are on the edge of nowhere, you know, and kids like boats. Mm. And what do they do with special needs respite? They take them on boat trips. Mm. I mean, we had one one of our that we was watching, he'd got himself on a boat that would take kids kids um, oh. day outs from Camden to the, to the zoo, and he was put in charge of toilet duties. Mm. I mean, you, you couldn't make it up. Um, so what what the pole unit said to me? Look, we're we're going to get you seconded to us, right? We're going to sponsor you. Uh, we've got two sex offenders. We think there's probably another couple. If you can find another couple in the next couple of months, brilliant. We'll keep this going, and and it will then come under the national. Um, was it was it? It wasn't the national crime squad. It was the uh, national. Intelligence. Oh, so it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, it's it's a big collective intel uh, policing intelligence thing. Anyway, in the first month, I found ninety nine zero. Ninety. Ninety. Yeah. What was your technique to get that many? Well, it it was quite easy to be honest. Um, what what we found was that it was an alternative community back then. Now it's trendy to live on a boat, and with house prices, British waterways are the the biggest landowner in the country. And what they call riparian, if any land is on a water, you get 30% more, more back on it than if it's landlocked. So anything river-based or canal-based gets good money. Um, so they had governance, right? They were really good. They gave me a lot of help. And they had a phenomenal database. So I had access to their database. But there's no duty for anyone to register a boat in their name. So as people registered in the name of Donald Duck and all this. And they all hated the old bill because they like to smoke a bit of cannabis. So instantly they hate the old bill. And you've got quite a few of these sort of pseudo middle classy lot living on there. And they, they you're the Babylon and all this nonsense. So what, what I did was I used to get, the, they had these, excuse the term, but they had these cruising clubs. And they were like these little um, hubs, uh, like, like little scout huts along the canal where all the boaties could meet and have a little social club. So I'd hold little talks in there on crime prevention and the angle i did it was say is anyone had and the main problems they had were people throwing stones at boats and nicking their bikes so i said look if you've got problems with the kids you throwing stones i can get a few of the lads there and we can stop them doing that chucking the stones from the tall flats and everything else and also we'll start up a bike marking scheme i had absolutely no interest in all that stuff anyway but what it did was it got them on board and I say, I'm not bothered about your cannabis. I really couldn't care less, you know, and all that. And people start coming on board. So I said, in order to do it, let's have a collective database. Give us your names and address, your names and dates of births. We'll put you all on there and we can have a little feedback. And I did a couple of proactive operations with kids lobbing stones just to placate them. But my reason for doing it was I got their names and their names and dates of birth. And that's how I found out they were. And it was just incredible. And then I started cultivating informants. And so when you get the name and date of birth, you put that in your computer and yeah. that shows they're registered. Yeah, it was coming up. Gotcha. You know, and it was amazing how many of them were helping out special needs kids, oh. kids from kids' homes. And anyway, it was incredible. So I started then giving presentations on a national level to the walkways agencies and also to other intelligence agencies. And one thing I didn't realise um, because I was naive was how many intelligence agencies there are 
You've got um, the NHS have got an intelligence agency. You've got one for the post office have got one. The aviation authorities have got one. And they were all monitoring, you know, they all had databases which they'd share, you know. And so it was incredible share of information. So they said, right, we want you to carry on doing this. Well, what happened then was that um, names started cropping up of certain people. And these are names that have come out on the pie list, which has come out the information exchange. And uh, they were involved in boats, mainly around the Richmond area. And, and, and they've come out you know, just sort of subsequently in the press, um, uh, uh, I think linked to people up and things like this. Th these names started cropping up and that was it. It got shut down. And I came into work one day and my chief inspector said, uh, ever so sorry, but your, your secondment's finished. I went, well, well no, it hasn't. I've been promised that I'm here and I built my life around it, my schedule around it and, you know, and everything. And he said, uh, no, no, it's come to an end. And I said, oh, come on, be fair. And he went, look, it's come from my up, John. It's come from my up. There's nothing I or anyone can do about it. We're grateful. We can never thank you enough for what you've done. But unfortunately, these things happen. Right now, the strange thing is there was a very, um, when I say senior, senior inexperienced detective from the unit that was working with me. And he said, John, this happens all the time. And he said, we've had, and said the name of an MP, we've had him twice, this MP, prominent Tory MP. Are you allowed to say that name? Uh, well, he is dead. Um, oh, what his initials are? I'll leave it at that. Anyway, he so said twice that, you know, that they had him and on both occasions, the plug was pulled. And he said, it will happen again and it will happen to you. And sure enough, it did happen to me. So this was the first time I realized a so-called conspiracy exists and it comes from high up all the time. It comes from high up. But I was doing good work for the first time. I was really believing in what I was doing and I can always remember a few years before I was in the custody suite in Woolwich Police Station and there was a lot of heroin and crack cocaine about in the early 90s in London. It was really pretty much bringing London to its knees back then. And what I used to do, if I was ever on jailer duties, I used to always take people out for a fag and I'd always get my cup of tea. I was always good to people, you know. And I remember one guy, he was a little bit older than me and he was banging trouble with heroin. And I said, tell me about it what's it all about and he said to me mate he said if you'd have had my life you'd be on it i went well what's gone so badly wrong you're on it and he went i was in a care home and i was and i can't cope with it and this is what i've done i've done this and i've done that now i'm on the heroin and it's a vicious cycle and it was at that point it it, it was a poignant time in my career and i thought there's something in this you know and then when I started doing this work, I realized, my God, what's going on? Then I realized the cover up started happening and I, I wanted to carry on working with the children because for, for the first time I realized I'm actually going to make a difference. The other stuff, you're just chasing the tail. And it's like um, an author said to me, an ex-copper who's written a book, and he said, all the old bill ever do is pick low hanging fruit. And I think yeah, they're damn right. And it's only as we'll go on, as I'll explain how, how this happens. So I said to my boss, I can't, I can't work here no more. I'm off. He said, well, and I was promised any job I wanted. He said, any job you wanted, you'll have it. I know you've got, you know, your domestic issue and all that. Um, and I said, I want to carry on working with the kids. And a job had come up at that point on the vice unit. And it was quite difficult to get in. And it was, then it was classed as an elite team. This is where you get the Scotland Yard squads all come out, the specialist operations, and they all come out of Scotland Yard. So, but we was based at Charing Cross and I got it and I went along for the, uh, for the interview, did well and got the job. And I initially started off working with the street prostitutes. So they dealt with gaming, prostitution, nightclubs, guns in nightclubs and, and porn images and decent images, you know, magazines and videos and all that sort of stuff. So I, I started working on the street with the prostitutes. And again, it was just number crunching. They used to have competitions, how many prostitutes they can nick in a night. And these were girls that had all, everyone had come from the care home. Every one of them was a heroin addict and the rest, you know? They've been abused. Every single one of them. So um, 
I I started talking to her, and one of them, she turned around to me, and she said, why are you always doing this to us? And she said, "It's why aren't you dealing with the people who have actually done this? So I said, well, if you help me, I, I, I'll help you. So um, she started giving me information, and I started working with her. What kind of information? Um, about her life to start with. So she explained her life, but also how it was run on the street and how the kids are brought into it as well. And one night we was out and there was a girl, a little girl on the street. Now, it was it was called the Street Offences and Juvenile Protection because the Victorians back then, they wouldn't allow children in brothels. They had quite staunch laws around vice and they were way ahead of their time and, and the, the offences were quite quite stern as well. Um, so we were sent out to, to look at the street prostitutes, which is a street offence of loitering, curb calling and all that. Rarely did you deal with the curb crawlers it did happen but on the whole you just really hassled the street girls because it was easy pickings but there were kids would turn up on the street young girls mainly what age are you talking about well at this time about 14 but we'll move on in a minute and it gets a hell of a lot younger and one day was out and there was a there was a little girl there and i was told by this other woman that there were a couple of young girls at work in the area and because she was on heroin as well she looked a hell of a lot younger and I, I, I got her, but we would deal with them as victims. And I was told, and this this is part of my statement, to get rid of her because she had scabies that she would contaminate the car and then you'd have to take them back to the police station and put them in a certain room. That would need cleaning as well because she's got scabies. She's a pain in the ass. She'll only be doing it tomorrow. Tell her to F off. So the 14-year-old girl. Now, what you're looking at, anyone who has sex, you've only got to watch her. If anyone has sex with her, you're talking there, you know, because you can't consent at that age. You've got someone, you know, they weren't interested, but you you couldn't allow a kid to be put in that position anyway. And it, it really shook me. And I thought, my God, what, what, what's going on? And um, they'd all come from the care homes as well, the kids. And again, I'm going to bolster this up shortly. I will always quantify what I say. Um, and I started looking into this and started recruiting some of the girls as informants strictly for the side of it um, but then I was moved overnight and I was moved and I was put onto the casino unit which uh, I'll, I'll go on about that at the end because I'll lose my thread here but that was incredibly interesting you know and phenomenal and that got me involved in organised crime and that nearly got me killed there was a bounty of 40,000 put on my head because of that um, uh, the Turkish mafia don't like me you know so uh, anyway, I'll explain that later. But um, what happened then, I was asked to go back to Vice and because a little girl has come forward, a 14-year-old girl was saying that she's been working as a prostitute and that one of the street prostitutes had been pimping her out, which is what happens. Sometimes, you know, the poachers turn gamekeepers and the other way around, you know. So some actually have been through themselves and will protect the kids. Others, they're, they're so in deep and they'll make money out of the kids, so they end up pimping other kids and their kids, and, you know. So this one prostitute was pimping out young girls. Uh, this girl had made allegations in the past, but hadn't been believed. They classed her as a liar. Now, we're seeing that in these trials that are coming out in the media at the moment with Cole Beach. We had Esther Baker before that. They're liars. Now, these kids that have been in care homes have had a shitty life to start with, and when they came forward and speak out, they'd just be cast as a liar. So they'd pull it on their record. And with the new legislation they brought in in 2003, the Criminal Justice Act of bad character, they can use that information. So whenever they, they come forward in later life, say, I was abused by this person, that person, and I totally believe them, they're discredited instantly by the court. And it's done deliberately, Sean, and, and it that will come in the chronology. Anyway, I went up to the, this kid's home in Cambridgeshire and I sat down with this this little girl and she was a bit of a horror but God bless her she's dead now she died in mysterious circumstances um, and still a kid at the time when she died and that never got properly looked into and her grandparents are still campaigning for justice because they know something went wrong you're allowed to say her name yeah, her name is Zoe and God bless Zoe Thompson and actually someone her mother died recently and her mother's friend got in touch with me and said John, you're right. We remember looking for Zoe on the street, me and her mum. And uh, yeah, so very, very sad. But it, it was something that really spurred me on to, to, to keep fighting. 
on this. Um, so no matter what they put me through, the kids go through a million times more, you know. So I went to see her and she and she started explaining. She said, look, this this one woman, street name of Foxy, uh, is pimping me out. We knew Foxy. We, she'd been about on the street for a long time. And it was all around the Sussex Gardens area of Paddington. And again, geography comes in because it's a lot of hotels there and they will rent the rooms by the hour and it's very near to the, to the Arab areas. I'm not saying that the Arabs are predominantly the, the punters, but there was money there and it was also the, the, the more dodgy areas of Paddington where the drugs were, so everything was catered for. And she said she pimps me out for crack. Sometimes she gives me money. Sometimes she takes me to posh restaurants. So one restaurant, I know they get £2,000 for me. And another place I'll go to a crack house and she'll get 20 rocks for me. And she gives me some of the rocks and she was a little crackhead herself. And she said, but she gets me to get my friends involved. And one of my friends is involved and I'll give you her name and, and I'll tell you of others. So uh, she started working with us um, as a victim, not as an informant, she was a victim and she was treated as a victim and she was treated very well by us. Um, unfortunately, the, the system failed her miserably. Um, and then she started introducing me to other girls and other girls and other girls and other girls. And there was one girl, and this, this girl was a traveller. She was nine years old when it was happening, nine years old at the relevant time. And it was just horrific. And it was everywhere. Now, there was a judge that was involved. Um, and this judge was involved with, with this girl, Foxy. Um, and there was, we never got the name, but there was rumours of a senior police officer. There was someone... Uh, that was high up in the BBC in the uh, arts and music department. Um, and the venues, they would range from upmarket Curzon Street Mayfair restaurants, which are the you know the top echelons of, of, of that sort of scene. Was Jimmy Savile act active around this time? Yeah, uh, well, Jimmy Savile was active until the day he died, wasn't he? But, uh, um, you know, it, it, was, it was massive. But um, there was a barrister involved. Oh, it, it was it was just it was it was going mad, you know. It was going and in the end we were dozens and dozens of kids. They were coming forward by the day. It was hemorrhaging. Anyway, a social worker got in touch with me. And the social worker was down in the Croydon area and we'd spiralled out of central London by this time and we started going everywhere. And and Croydon was another big hub, uh Southall and the East End. And it it was honestly it was just mad. So she, this girl from South or a social worker said, uh, John, we've been going to your unit for 10 years. So the last decade we've been pleading with you. She said, we've got girls that are turning up, young girls, kids. One girl, she's got so many cysts and abscesses inside of her that she oozes when she comes in. She is dying. She said, there's one lad. He is being pimped out. He is in the latter stages of HIV AIDS. He is dying on his feet. He is still being pimped out. Your unit don't even turn up. She said, you've got to help us. You have to help us. There was mainly me and another girl. We did have a few little support staff afterwards, but me and another girl, and we were absolutely sinking. And I said, right, the only way to get more funding, we didn't even have a car. We had to borrow cars. I said, is that we... um." Everything we do, we record it, everything. She said, but it's sensitive. I said, it doesn't matter. Let's record it and I'll, I'll pull it forward to the management. So I wrote a very, very uh, concise and factually based report, two paragraphs. Uh, I handed it in and to the intelligence unit. Within an hour, I got a detective inspector screaming down the phone at me, get to see me now. So I went in there and he starts what we call fuck chucking. Who the hell do you think you are? You effing, you can't put things like this. And he said, we, you know, you're demeaning the unit. We've been doing this for decades. And, you know, who do you think you are? And it turned out that all the, these reports that of these kids from the care homes, whenever the kids went missing and turned up in red light areas, were archived. And I found these reports that went back a long way. So known about it for uh, well, at least 15 years, they knew about it. Anyway, he, start, he said, you're off the case. And I went, well, you, you can't kick me off. I said, this has become my life. Um, he went, you're off it. It's shutting down. And he, he just belittled everything. So I then went to see the chief superintendent. And I'm going to say this now, that he actually was a nice guy. 
albeit he is the architect and the instigator of everything that happened to me, but he was a, a very respected and light guy. And I said to him, uh, you know, oh, Governor, what's going on? He said, look, come and see me. And what he, he said to me, go and have a holiday, take as long as you want, and when you're, when you're nice and safe and ready to come back, come back and we'll have a chat. So I took the kids away and I come back and sat down and I said, uh, Governor, I don't know what I've done wrong. I, I thought this was going to be a good thing. I, I really thought I'd given them the goose, the shit and the golden egg here, you know. And he told me, he said, what the hell have you done? He said, this is going to F us. And I said, the F word before, but I don't keep saying it. But he said, I want, this will F us past, present and future. You have no idea how deep this goes. He said, if you mention a word of this outside of this room, he said, you will be thrown to the walls. And he said, you will lose your home, your children and your job. Now, one thing is, OK, try and sack me and I'm going to lose my home anyway. But but what arrogance to say that you can be the architect to take my children off me. And that really got me. I thought, how oh, dare it's only God can take my kids off me. And, and But he was confident in saying that. He said, you've got no idea who and what you're dealing with. So that showed me how big this was. Right. And uh, I, I said, so that was it. I was off and I was scared. And I generally was scared. And of course, I'd seen it before with the canal thing. Uh, and, I, and I was told by the senior couple, look, this is what they'll do to you. And, and I knew it was political. And... And I was worried, and it and it caused um, a real demise in me. It, it caused a lot of anger and a, and a lot of hatred towards the system. And he said, "You've got to take an, have an undertaking that you never ever look into child prostitution again." So I said, "Okay." Anyway, I said, "I want to carry on working with the kids." He went, "But you never look into this again. This is shut. This is sealed." I went, "All right." Anyway, I went to the child protection unit, which is different to the vice. It was dealing with you know when social services get involved with a kid and the kids at risk th these detectives come in so i was sent to the london borough of haringey it would cover tottenham and so it covered some posh areas muswell hill and all that but on the whole it you know the areas i always work were, were, were tottenham you know north hackney that sort of you know that uh area a very deprived area and um i remember first going there i was taking, talking to the detective sergeant that runs it and i said uh do you have any problems with with um child prostitution she went Oh, no, 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 none. I said, right. I said, uh, no kids going from kids' home. She went, oh, no, there, there is a girl that was looking into it, but she's left to have a kid now. And a lot of these child protection officers, I'm not denigrating them because they, they were the hardest working coppers I have ever, ever met in my life. You know, when they're going about the detectives, you see these these shiny suited lot from the flying squad and all that. They, they, they're nothing compared to these child abuse coppers. They really do put their heart into it. God bless them. Not all of them, but most of them did. And uh, she said, there was one girl, she'd gone to have a kid. and But she used to go to meetings with the social services about the child prostitution. She said, and, um, no, nothing's been, she did it for two years, nothing's been highlighted. So we've got a detective sergeant saying that in that borough, that inner London built up borough, that there are no problems with child prostitution, categorically saying it, and then saying that there was an officer dealing with it for two years, never come across one case of it. She said, you'll go to a meeting. So... He said, it's a jolly. So if you go to the meeting, what you call job or not, go to meetings, go home. So I know now why this girl did it. So anyway, so with that in mind, she pisses off this this sergeant uh, and I get the phone and I ring up social services. I, I knew someone else. I said, look, couldn't fax me for a list of the care homes. But it turns out that Haringey's got more care homes than any other borough that in the UK. It, it's got 26, or it did have back then. And I got fax through this list, care homes, right? Uh, with the phone numbers. And this is how it works, Sean. So I've been told two years, not a problem. I get the list and I start off care home number one. So I dialed the number, picked the phone up, introduced myself, said no one's in any trouble here. I'm looking at this problem with children and prostitution. Goes quiet. I said, look, I'm here to work with you, my friend, you know, and a lot of the poor staff that work there, that, you know, it's not them, you know. And we got to look at the care homes, they're sold as a business. So the care home manager, owner, will buy it. You can buy them at the Dalton's Weekly, these care homes. And and they they were getting up to £2,000 per child per week. And some of these, these homes had five kids. So there'll be like a, like a house like this that we're in here, you know, in a residential street, five kids in there. 
that's 10k in your pocket every week. I mean, my God, ka -chink, you know? And on the whole, they had five children. So I said, how many children you got? I said, five. I said, how many of them do you lose at a weekend due to prostitution? I went, three. Right. And honestly, that was a time scale. Bang. So two years, F all. In that four or five minutes, three kids. Right. And that went on consistently. Right. So by the end of three days, I'd done all of them. I had 50 kids. So I then held a meeting. So I got all these support agencies and, and everything else, brought them all in and social services. And I said, well, we need to sort this out. And I started talking to some of the kids and some of them started working with me. Brilliant. And they started naming places where they were taken and everything else. And then there was uh, a leading children's charity. Uh, the woman in charge of um, this term they used and I want to go on about that in the short, if I may, uh, turned around and said, you're treading on toes. You think you know everything. She said, we've been looking at this for a long time. There's been a unit set up. There's a cop already looking at it. There's a superintendent looking at it. You're to back down now. And then a senior social worker in charge of child exploitation or whatever, she turned around and she said, what the fucking hell you done, John? She said, we've got now putting 50 care plans. I said, but you knew about these kids. She said, yeah, but while they were making money, they were quiet. You know, and that's how it went on. And of course, then what happened, I, I had to go and see a superintendent and I was panicking, thinking, oh shit, they're going to have me now. Um, he told me to back away, said this detective's looking at it. I spoke to her, when I met her, lovely girl. And she said, I've been to two meetings. I've never even met any of the kids. How the hell could I deal with that? That was one borough in London. So you imagine all 26 boroughs, if we take that as the norm, although it's not going to be the norm, you know, but you're talking thousands of kids. And and these kids go missing. So they'll go missing on a Thursday and they'll come back on a Monday. They're usually worse for the wear through drugs and through sexual activity and coming down from it. And, you know, so there'll be all health problems. Some of them will be bleeding they'll all be high and they'll be kicking off until the middle of the week when they'll be looking forward to going out and getting their drugs again and then going back out to work again. And so when they say about kids going missing, yes, they go missing, but they come back. Now, the police units, they've got the missing persons unit, which take records of this. So they knew about it. That would be given to the child protection units. They knew about it. And if it was prostitution, it'd be given to the vice unit as well. Yet none of them were talking to each other. The vice unit wouldn't come to the meetings. The missing person team did, but they said, we're desk, we're desk jockeys, we're desk bound. What do we do about it? So they knew about these kids, these failings, and did nothing. And all the time, money was being made, money. And then, of course, when you look at these kids that were involved in it, girls and boys, they would just start getting involved in crime because there'll be antisocial behavior. There'll be a lot of violence because there's a lot of anger. You know, and then that will lead to the class A drug addiction, which then goes way to the prostitution, to the, the street prostitution, to the shoplifting, the robberies and everything else. And then when you look at these kids, these are kids that aren't getting educated. So we go on about, you know, you know, the angle you come from, Sean, and I've watched your stuff. And we got illiteracy rates of up to 80 percent in some prisons. You know, we, we've got kids, uh, people in prison, the majority are coming from abused backgrounds, not all of them. But they are. So really, I was right in what I was looking at. Now, I weren't the first, and many have looked at this, but we all get shut up. We all get shut up. Now, of course, lo and behold, I moved. I moved, and I'm sent now over to the west side of London, you know, and this keeps happening and keeps happening. And in the end, I did blow the whistle, officially, and I made, I had already done it, but then I made allegations of corruption and I made sure my youngest was a little bit older and they couldn't really take my kids off me because I knew that they'd come for me. Now, bear in mind, I was threatened with the loss of my home, my job and my children. I made allegations of corruption against senior officers saying they'd deliberately covered it up. They said, we're going to take this seriously. Now, the strange thing is I rang up the corruption command and said, I need to talk to a senior female detective and this bloke went well you'll talk to me first and he's a uniform constable and I went no you, you're not listening to me you get me and it, it was an effort to get this anyway they granted me a, 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 a detective chief inspector DCI woman met me 
And funny enough, on my way up to the meeting, I was accosted in a corridor by one of the um, inspectors that was on the vice unit when it was covered up. I was thinking, what, what, what were you doing here? And he was like, all right, John, uh, and started talking about the senior officer that had covered up. He was really not, and, he, and he's called me in a corridor and thinking, how the bloody hell did you know what's going on? So, oh, anyway, so I managed to get to her and, I, and she said, why did you want to talk to me? And I said, because you, mom, cannot roll up your trouser leg. And she laughed and she went, I know exactly what you mean. Now, the funny thing is, a couple of years later, a few years later, that exact line was used in the line of duty in the document, in the, the drama when they were dealing with child prostitution. I thought, I wonder if someone's nicked that off me, you know? So anyway, she said, we're going to take this extremely seriously. We are really going to, you know. Um, what I did was then I actually walked out of the police. I thought, I can't work. I can't work with these snakes anymore. They will do anything and everything to nab them. And they were. They were really starting to pick on me for everything. And one day I just erupted in the office, kicked off and said, right, F the lot of you. I ain't putting up with this. And I went home. Then what ensued was a two-year bullying campaign to have me put in prison. So that was a 27 years after you joined. Yeah, we're not far off it. You know, uh, we were talking about, because it went, this bullying went on for a few years, soon about the 24th year. Um, so then I kept getting served with, well, basically the equivalent is a summons. It will be a bit of paper saying you're under investigation and it's gone to CPS. So at the same time, Prominent police officers have come forward, one of them being Maggie Oliver, the, the lady in uh, uh, Rochdale. She's and, agreed to come on the podcast. Yeah, uh, Nick, oh. by 95%. So I then made my way to Adamsbrook Hospital, which is in Cambridge, which is nearly 100 miles away from where I was. I made my way up there. I was covered in mud because I'd been grafting. And my other boy was there. He said that they don't think he's they're gonna oh, he's gonna make it. Was it a car crash or something? It was playing rugby. Playing rugby. Playing rugby. Snapped his neck right and um, snapped all his neck and he's um, almost a perfect cut. <sighs> anyway, they they got a surgeon on and he remained in intensive care. Um, and I was there every day going up there. And then one day, um, I get a phone call and they said, "Can you can you come now? Can you come now?" So I made my way to hospital and there was two um, consultants there and they said, we've lost him. Unfortunately, oh we've lost him. Well, but we've got a brain pattern back. He's on 100% um, life support, but we have got a heartbeat and a brain pattern back. We don't think he'll survive. He was dead for seven and a half minutes. Um, he's unlikely to survive it. Um, but we will keep the machine going for five days. And they said, if it comes to it, will I sign a disclaimer to, to turn it off? And I was like, gentlemen, you've done what you can. Of course, I'm, you know, he said, you can go to court. I said, look, I'm not interested. You've done, you know, they said 10 minutes we were on him. and But he was dead for seven and a half minutes anyway. So I sat with him. Uh, oh, it's horrendous. I mean, anyone who's been in that circumstance, you know, God bless them, he had pipes everywhere. And a, a lovely girl that I was working with, she went to my superintendent and said, look, John's in trouble. This you, You've got to know what's happened now. He's um, He's got no money and this has happened to his son. He can't even, he's sleeping in his car in the hospital, which I was. I, I actually become a blood donor because I got free sandwiches and I could use their parking space, you know, and that's, um, and so I was getting free biscuits and sandwiches and, uh, you know, because I had my blood donor badge and things. So I was doing that. So anyway, on the third day, he moved and he woke up. And I said, listen, T, I said, just just move your legs. Just move your legs. So he, he flipped his feet a little bit, grabbed my hand. And I said, son, I love you. And he couldn't talk because he was. <sighs> anyway, I've gone home. And when I get home, this girl and my work has gone to my superintendent. Right, bare enough and told her what's going on. I get home. There's two detectives there waiting from Hertfordshire Police. The Met Police have sent them there. And then they want to arrest me for child neglect because that they they state that the Met Police have accused me of leaving my 16-year-old, no, I think he might have been 15-year-old at the time, 15-year-old boy home alone. I said, I've been with my dying son. And bear in mind, my 26-year-old son was there anyway. And I said to this cop, I said, you, you, you've got to be taking a piss, seriously. I said, let me tell you my story before you do anything. 
they searched my house, they searched my fridge, and they actually interviewed my son. And then I said, look, listen, let me tell you. And I, by this time, I was I just had enough. And he said, the Met Police told us that you'd um, you, you'd left your son home alone. He said, we've been lied to and you've been stitched up, son. So bear in mind what was said to me by this chief superintendent, you're going to lose your job. Well, I'm looking at going to prison. You're going to lose your home. You're going to lose your children. So this is what these bastards do. So if they can do it, you know, when you're saying about you know, gangsters, and I was talking with Chris Lambiano, who says about what Nipper Reed done and things like that. And and, um, and I said, well, they done it to me. They they will stop at nothing to silence you because the key to all of this, the key to all the shite in society, and I mean this in the most respectful way, is child abuse. Now, what I do now, I work with victims and survivors of abuse. I campaign for um, protection for police whistleblowers because we have no employment law. I've been in Parliament untold times. I've been before the Home Secretary's team. Um, I've had cabinet ministers with me and everything. We, tomorrow, this is probably a pre-record, but tomorrow uh, we've got a protest in London. Where every month we have a protest out there. Um, I, um, I help victims try and put cases back together again where the police have deliberately covered things up. And it's a no-brainer. If you look, a kid is a cash cow. From cradle to grave, all that child will do is make money for the system. They will make money through through the family courts, which are closed courts, right? They then go through to the juvenile courts where they make money out of the kid then. What do you mean they make money out of them in the courts? Well, by representing the kids in, in, in domestic cases. and All the legal child, fees and legal stuff. Legal fees, child protection cases. Creating and all that. Yeah. work for the yeah. lawyers, judges. So, so, and then and then if you take the kids home that is making two grand a week, these barristers, it's just about 450 quid a week. I've seen the bills come through and I've seen them because I've spent most of your detective's work is in Crown Court and you do a lot in chambers with the barristers. Now, well, there are some good ones and there are some vile ones, right? Now, and there'll be the barristers that, that will really be up in arms about this, you know. But when you look at the breakdown, right, I send you an email. Say I did tree surgery for a while, right? And, and you say to me, John, come and look at my my tree and all that. So I say, okay, right. Send me an email about what it is. So you send me an email. So I will I will put down 50 quid for receiving and, and, and uh, reading email. And I'll itemise that. That phone call, I say, what, 30 quid for a phone call? Site visit, well, that was two hours of my time, £450 an hour, let, let's call that a grand, right? So all of a sudden, I've done absolutely F all, and you've got a bill for 1500 quid. Now, imagine if that was the case, you'd go to the police, the watchdog, and, and it would be wrong. It's morally wrong, and it's just wrong. So it's taxpayers' money yeah. getting safe. And well, exactly, but they can do it, and it's classed as business. You know, and then of course they're part of a tax avoidance. Uh, what do they call it? Not tax. Uh, there's there's two tax avoidance. One's tax avoidance. One is tax evasion. Yeah. So we do tax evasion. They do tax avoidance, and it's legally allowed. Um, and it's criminal. And and you know, so if we go back to this kid, right? So a kid is coming to notice. Now, if a kid comes to the notice to the police, it's usually pretty late. You know, there's something bad going in. If you don't catch that kid early, there's a lot of etched in damage going on there. And if you're going to divest your kid from the family environment, that's going to cause a lot of pain as well, you know. But kids go into care because sometimes it's the safest place because the parents are doing horrible things to them, right? But there's a lot of trauma. And if they go into kids' home and then that kid's home is making a lot of money and they're also then, back then they would, they would have been abusing them, but now they're not protecting them. They're just letting them get abused, Right. And then you've got social workers working with that. You've got barristers representing them. And on it goes and on it goes. And on the time this kid is criminal history profiles picking up. I remember once getting, um, we, we call it pre-cons. They used to call it rap sheets in America, didn't they? Of this one kid. And he was sat there for firearms and he had bullets. And he was about, I don't know, 19, 20. And his barrister, his solicitor was there protecting him and all this. And so I was reading through it and I, and I turned around and I, and I just had enough. It was one of them moments. So I said, I'm really sorry, but look. And it started off with common assault. This kid had common assault with someone at school. And then it was shoplifting and then it went to ABH and it was combined to robbery. And then up it went and then it went all the way up to possession of firearms and, and, and in GBH. I said, what has anyone that's meant to intervene and stop this cycle of abuse done to help him? They've done nothing but magnify it and feed it 
and make a bloody big dollar out of it as well. Now, Chris Lambriano with the uh, the charity that he was working for, the lay community, the rehab centre, £17,000 for one person per treatment plan, right? With an 80% success rate, seventeen grand, brilliant. A government run one through the prison system, 70,000. And, and the prison, we have a recidivism rate in this country of 75 to 80%. It ain't working. Sean, if if I said to you, right, you want an extension built, right? And I turn around and say, Sean, I'm going to put you in touch with a builder. He's a good guy. He's very expensive. But bear in mind, 75 to 80% of what he builds falls down within the first year. You're going to tell me to do one, aren't you? <laughs> but we're expected to swallow that load of crap from them. And it don't work. So it's working for them financially, but it's a disaster for society. Yeah, and it's breaking these children. When they abuse these kids, they're breaking them. They're spiritually crushing them, and they're setting them up to fail, and they are, and they're damaging them. And, of course, there's also a macho thing with the men that they don't want to admit that that's happened to them. It'll happen to their mates, and they might have seen it, but it never happened to me. And, of course, there's anger, and there's... All no one is intervening to break this cycle of abuse, you know. And when we do, the ones of us that do stand up, and there would have been social workers that stood up and NHS staff that would have stood up, we're crushed. And that's why we've all got to work together, you know. In the jail I was housed in Arizona, um, approximately 90% of prisoners were injecting heroin. And just living with them for almost six years and, and starting to hear the stories, thrown away as kids, um, molested, seeing yep. parents die. And I, I understood, I started to understand that they were in such pain, they were doing the heroin because it, it really put them out of it. Well, well, what is heroin? It's an analgesic. It is a painkiller. And then what does the system do? It, it puts them in this brutal environment that just re-traumatizes them. Yeah. Where they're just doing drugs all day long to just not think about that as well. Yeah. So it is... An absolute disaster. Um, you mentioned earlier about satanic paedophilia. Yeah. Elite satanic paedophilia. How does that work? Well, well I mean, I, I don't know about the elite thing, okay. but, but um, again, privilege and power. And I would have thought w with anything like that. I, I, I did deal with cases would come in um, to the unit I was on, but because I worked uh, an area that had big African community and, and Jamaican communities, we would get the Jamaicans had a, had a form of um, witchcraft called obia, and there was a lot of sexual abuse within that. And there was a lot of Congolese, and there was some also indigenous beliefs going there, and there was sexual abuse going on, you know, again, within select groups of that. Um, it's only really at, since I've, I've come out that people have come to me. Now, I, I met up with uh, a woman called Carolyn Bramhall, and B A R. A M H A W L. She's written a book and she's one of the leading therapists for what they call DID. It used to be called multiple personalities. And 90% of people with DID have come from satanic abuse because it's so horrific, it fractures the mind. And I've had people then come to me, and there's there's one girl that works very closely with me now, and she's she reckons she's got in excess of about hundred different personalities. And um and and it, it's just horrific. Um but it's also understanding. Uh, this girl, she's come from America and she says she was part of what they call the MK Ultra program there. And it's it's a mind dealing with the problem and now it fragments and shuts itself down and it gives itself an identity. So um, one of her um, characters called Icy and I went, well, is that something to do with water? And she went, yeah, it's obviously that freezing water was used, you know, in one of them. And then there'll be another character that would deal with violence. Another character would deal with this and deal with that. Um, and Carolyn, the therapist, and I said to her, Carolyn, I hope you get information about where all this is coming from. And she said, of course. I said, because otherwise it's of no use. You know, you've got to have the information because we've got to find out what's going on and where it's going on. And again, you've got to look, it's a covert thing. It's a very, very covert thing. And she said, I do. I said, well, where's one of the biggest hotspots? And she said, Surrey is, is a massive area for it. Virginia Water, Camberley and, and all that. And funny enough, there was a book written uh, and I would encourage anyone to read it and it would explain it. And it very tight, much ties in with, with stuff that I was dealing with. And that would lead me on to an example. I always want to 
evidence everything I say, Sean, I always do. And it's called Dances with the Devil. Not dancing, Dances with the Devil. And it was written by a woman called Audrey Harper. Audrey Harper had come from the care system and ended up as a street prostitute in her teens in central London. Again, a lot of the people I spoke to, central London, the meat rack area. Again, gangsters were involved in procuring the kids around the Soho. This girl was in Soho and she was on heroin and she was offered free drugs. But part of the thing was that she was taken to a satanic ritual. And once there, she was um, told to drink the blood of a, a baby that was killed in front of her. I've heard that of two women. Two women have both told me about babies being killed. And and again, with Satanism, from what I've been told, there there's no bystanders. You know, everyone is a participant. Some people said, oh, I watched it and it weren't really for me. Absolute nonsense, apparently. Anyway, she did this and was given drugs and she was sort of looked after. But one of her jobs was to go on the street and get the young kids from the care homes and the runaway kids to sex parties. And she said they wouldn't experience Satanism, but the the, the uh, coven people, the members of this church of Satan or whatever it was, liked shagging kids. So she would procure the kids for him, which did tie into what some of the kids were saying to me. They'd go to parties in posh houses and, you know, and there was one guy, uh, what's his name? Paul. His first name was Paul. I won't give his second name because he might still be alive. Uh, he did write a book. I can't remember what it was. Uh, it's called No Human Touch. Um, anyway, Paul um, came to me and had spent most of his life in prison. And he said, I want to help. And he said, I want to... Uh, when I was doing a transient paedophile thing, he said, I'll come and I'll, I'll talk to the police. I'll explain to the police how grooming works, which is brilliant, which is what we need. Someone who's been through it and he was abused from the age of four and everything else. And he said he was uh, on the street of London about 10, 11 years old. He said, doing every drug going. Circa 70s, that area, very much when Audrey was on the street. And he said, uh, I had a pimp. He said, but I had a pimp for safety. My pimp weren't a bad man. You know, my pimp helped me. And he said, all I knew, I just wanted drugs and all I knew was just to be buggered and that was it really. And he said, but I've never gone on to do it to any kids and I'm not interested. I got married and so it, it didn't, you know, send in that way, you know, but it's just what they did to him and he, he used it as a tool to get money. He needed to survive. And he said, one day a Rolls Royce pulled up round by the meat rack in Piccadilly. And he said, I went to get in and he said, my pimp grabbed hold of me. He said, don't get in now. He said, the last two lads that have gone with him too, there's two men in it, bear in mind, white Rolls Royce. We haven't seen him again. We reckon they killed him. So he went, okay, I won't do that then. He said, but I was so rattling for the for the heroin. As the pimp turned around, he gesticulated to the car to like do a circuit, you know. So the car went round and he jumped in it. And he said, they took him to a big house in Hampstead. Uh in North London, a very affluent area of Hampstead. And he said, um, the next thing he knows, he's in the Royal Free Hospital on life support. And he said, for three days, they buggered and, and just abused me so bad. All his, um, his bowel and his intestine were ripped open where they'd done God knows what to him. And they dumped his body, um, believing he was dead. And he was found and taken to the Royal Free. And he said, he said, but as he was tripping in and out of consciousness, he said, one thing that got him, was these two were, were dressing up in suits to go to a wedding and had little um, uh, presents for their niece to go to a wedding and they'd like bugger me to death, but virtually, you know. And I, I said this to someone once, I said, and this might sound very obscure, right? Part of the investigations that we would have to look into child porn and things like that. And and um, that's what I'm saying about these coppers that have worked on these child abuse. They're, they're, they're just incredible because most of us were, were drinkers, you know, I, there were two I worked with were actually registered alcoholics because the work was just horrific and it was relentless and we were absolutely overworked. The, the police refused to properly staff us, whereas if you went on a special branch or an anti-terrorist unit, you'd have a card, expense accounts, and I've been on similar units and had all these benefits. There we'd have to share a car, one car between 10 of us, uh, and it was just awful. And I would say to people... Right, play a child porn video, right? 
And they've gone about abuse. No, it ain't abuse. It's torture. It's ripping open body parts and putting them in extreme agony. And once someone's seen that, I'm telling you what, they're, this this bar the odd weirdo that would enjoy it, which would be a small percentage, 99.9% .9 reoccurring would want the death penalty brought back the next day. And they would when they've seen what they do to the children, you know, and what they put them through. Is the child porn more prolific than the physical abuse? Well, they're both the same. They're hand in hand, you know, and each child porn image is a victim, you know. Um, one person said to me that uh, when she was put into child porn, she was drugged. So she said she didn't realise what was going on really until the drugs had worn off and then she was in a lot of pain. And she usually was infected with all sorts of gonorrhea, syphilis and all the, I mean, things like that, which destroyed a womb and a lot, can't go on to have children and, and all sorts. And if untreated, they're deadly anyway. Uh, but she said with the satanic abuse was a bit different because they needed you lucid. So they would give them hallucinogenics. She said, so the problem I have, because she has spoken to Operation Conifer because uh, with Teddy, because there was a link in with Teddy, for although she's a girl, there was a connection with it. Um, she said, my memory was skewed by the hallucinogenics. So my statements would involve places, but then there'd be butterflies and rabbits jumping everywhere because she'd, she'd needed to be awake for the, for the thing. So, um, but again, easy to discredit. So easy to discredit them and call them. I mean, what we've seen with, with Carl Beach, this Nick, Okay, the guy had child porn images and uh, and may well and uh, probably is under the category of what they call a nonce. Um, and I'll tell you how that come about, nonce. Anyway, however, the case when we had with Zoe, a lot of the the uh, people that gave statements or witnesses were were crackheads, heroin addicts, and prostitutes. Uh, they called it herding cats. It was a, one of the hardest ways to get victim, you know, uh, witnesses to a call. <laughs> But we did it and we did it and people actually said you know i i have lived this life however seeing a child in a crack house making to do this and to do that is wrong and i'm not having it so you can win um and there is a way of doing it and you just got to be very resolute and a stalwart in what you do but what they've done is they've just concentrated on him being a fantasist and everything else and really sort of sidetracked what he's gone and now what you're seeing is people like daniel janner which is um, lord janner's son coming forward and saying we've got to stop these people from coming forward. So virtually um, saying that anyone who comes forward now has to be treated as a liar. Um, and you, can you imagine what that's doing to the victim and survivor community? They must be absolutely screaming. And they've done it on purpose to stop anyone ever getting. And the other thing they do is, Sean, they're giving over the top sentences. So he got 18 years. I mean, my God, 18 years. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't. He's upset people by making allegations, which in my opinion are true allegations, against perverts. Um, we saw it with this woman, Sabine McNeil, who who um, spoke out about the satanic abuse in Hampstead. She was given nine years, a woman in her 70s. And we just had another guy who's exposed, I think it was um, uh, Venables, the, the kid involved with the um, Jamie Bolger thing. He sort of exposed him and he's just been given nearly a year inside. So they're really hammering them to silence them, you know. And, and it, it's just through, it, it's, when you look at it, it's just a perverted country. It's a country that just seems to, everything circles around child abuse. Well, earlier on, you mentioned about the man who was going to teach the police or talk to the police, specifically yeah. how grooming occurs. Yeah. How does grooming occur? Well, I mean, what, what you're looking at is a kid that's devoid of what they call love. Now, we we all need love, right? There's like Maslow, this guy Maslow had this hierarchy of needs, didn't he? And the first thing is shelter and somewhere in the middle is, is a, a, a need to be part of something. Now, um, what they found is that any attention is better than no attention. Now, um, I might be wrong with this, this is more your feel, but they showed that people that are put in solitary, the life expense is a lot less than people that are in a collective thing and just getting abuse anyway, because at least you're being part of something. But when you're isolated, it kills you. People do want to be around people in prison. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that. And and if you isolate someone, you, you, you kill them. It's a bit like they do it with dolphins. They just die. Um, so, you know, the, the, the child will tend to go back to the abuser. You know, someone said it's a bit like a tramp's dog. It's just got loyalty, whereas a cat will run off, but a dog will be loyalty. 
and and they just need it but th there is a gap so what they do is they know that there is this void now if we take girls for example they'll have a romeo so this guy will turn up and he'll be nice to the girl and he'll tell her she's beautiful and and everything else and and then she thinks you know maybe she's in her young teens and she feels part of something they strike up a relationship and then they start having sex but it might he starts then showing up porn films getting her used to and he's grooming her and then he'll have sex with her and then he'll get his friend to have sex and then they'll start making money and then they'll get the drugs once they get the drugs in it's like um, they get her hooked on drugs yeah they get her hooked on drugs and then it, it's a chemical need as well and then because they're not just the boyfriend they're also the medicine man you know and the drugs are very very important and I, I sat in a meeting I was meant to have a one to one meeting with Cressida Dick the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and at the time she was an assistant commissioner and when I turned up she was sat with nine other women around this big table and I thought oh hum you know and uh and I thought, I'm not being intimidated. This is, It was an overkill. And I turned around to her and said, do you know something? What what upsets me is Cressida. And she said, no, 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 there's a protocol. Wouldn't mean to call her mom. And I said, well, no, when your senior officer's bullying me, that went out the window. I'm not calling your mom. I'm not, and I won't do it to anyone anyway now. I'll never call anyone sir or anything like that. I'm not doing it. Um, might call a cop a gov or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, and I turned around and I said, you know, what upsets me is that I can... Go into a children's home, I can groom a child, I can have sex with that child, I can get my friend to have sex with that child, and we can then both sell that child for other men to have sex. And we can then get that kid to get her friends involved, and we can do the same to them. And you have not employed one copper, not one copper, to deal with that, and it's prolific. It's a massive, huge problem. However, if I was to lean over my fence and call my neighbour, and I said a, a derogatory racist word, but only to prove a point, and that's not how I am anyway, I said, you would have me nicked, you'd have me asboed, and you'd probably have me evicted by the time the sun went down that night. How is that justified and balanced? And it just went silent. And do you know the, the, the sad thing when I said that, I said this, this word, right? Uh, give me the P. And someone went... Phew, and I said, there's a sharp intake of breath because I said that word, but I said it to prove a point. I said, I've just been talking about having sex with children and no one even blinked. Yeah, and, and this is the distorted mind of these people and this is how it works. But you, all you do is you, you just fill a gap for them. I mean, how it worked with little Zoe was this girl Foxy would get hold of her and brush her hair for her and just sit there and brush her hair and take her to the pictures and start doing her makeup. And then she'd introduce. Then what she would do? Then she would have sex with her boyfriend in front of her, and then get them involved. And that's how we do it. And they start doing the drugs and say, "No, we're all a group, and it's normal, it's natural." And then and then start doing it, you know. And that's how they did it. And of course, you're in 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 on the conspiracy, and and it's like most things people get in too deep. Sometimes it's a bit like police corruption. You know, you take a backhander one day, not not have or anything like that, but you take a backhander and well, they got you. And there was quite uh, an interesting story was told to me. Uh, and it was about a copper that was selling information to a well-known um, South London gangster. And he was selling information and he was thought he was in with the boys. You know? What does that mean, selling information? Uh, getting information off the uh, criminal intelligence system. and then, Who's going to be raided, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. What's going on? Yeah, if, if you're going to be raided, who else is the new kids on the block and, and all this? This is where the stuff is. And, you know, basically compromising. And it's very dangerous, you know. It puts people at risk. It, it's shocking. Anyway, he did it for his ego and for whatever. And he was getting a bung. So every time he did it, he got £2,000. Every time he passed over a bit of criminal intelligence, he got two grand. Right? And that went on a couple of times. And then he, he got called into a meeting, this copper. right? And they said, right, we want information on this now. And they went, yeah, no problem. They went, here's your wages. And they slid over 50p. I went, there you go. That's, that's the wage from now on. And in the end, he had to hand himself in. He went to prison and he handed himself in because he knew how it was going to go. You know, uh, so it's... Did he have a rough ride in prison? Oh, they have to segregate them, don't they? I mean, there's one there's one copper I know that um, he didn't get segregated and he just got his teeth knocked out straight away. Straight away. Straight away, yeah. And funny enough, the um, 
the guy I do uh, the, the, the tree work with, he, he did 19 years in prison. Everyone, everyone I work with now has done serious time. It's quite ironic. And I said to him one day, he shot a policeman, this guy. He's a lovely fellow, Dave, but he come from a very rough background. Again, a very abusive, violent father. And he become, I think he was classed as Britain's most dangerous man at one point. You're allowed to say his name. Dave Brown. And he's a lovely guy. And why so, did he shoot a policeman? He was angry. <laughs> he didn't like the police. Um, so it was a general angriness at the police, not at that specific individual. Yeah, yeah it had been years and years of in and out of every institution. Um, and he was a tough guy as well. He was a good boxer. And he was a heavyweight boxer and, and he knew how to fight and he just had years and years of horrific, violent abuse from his father and ended up in a very violent system and he, he ended up doing a, a, most of it in Dartmoor prison. But he, he shot a policeman in Cornwall. Uh, I think Mevagissi it was, someone just shot him. And uh, uh, and I was talking one day and I said, um, and, and he's a one of my best friends. He's a lovely, lovely guy and I, so I did a lot of work with him. And I said, what what would happen if I went to prison, you know, and I know we get on and all that, but he said, oh, they, they, they'd stab you straight away. And I went, but you know me, I'm a nice guy. And I'm a, he said, but once I got to know you, he said, but it's full of too many nutters. He said, you, you, you're dead man. He said, you're dead man. He said, uh, however, saying that, I, um, you, when I, we used to do his stuff with um, the National Crime Squad involving organised crime with the Turkish gangs and things like that. And I used to do quite a few prison visits. And they've got quite a good intelligence system, you know, the prisons here. They've got what they call a PIN system and all the telephones are monitored. I know mobiles are prolific now, you know. I had a couple of them. These little mobiles are like plastic things about that big, you know. But back then it was all done on this PIN system so they, that they would monitor them. And we used to listen to the calls sometimes, you know. Over that Zoe case, we would sit in the prison, listen to in Holloway. But I was talking to one guard and he was saying that he was um, in a prison over in Norfolk. And he said the worst ones for the drugs and the mobile phones were two um, ex-Liverpool coppers. And he said they were just horrific. He said they were just mad, you know, and they were general population as well. But he said they were just right off the scale. They just lost the plot. Is that because as well, the, the, the financial motivation, um, if you're a policeman or woman, you can like allow some dealers to deal and like bust some others and like well well, well how, it, how it works is the the mythology they don't like this coming out uh but there's it, been many a book written about it uh and, and to do with informants and and let me tell you now it, it is prolific it is absolutely everyone grasses on everyone and you know and i'm not calling gangsters grasses or anything i'm not doing that but what i'm saying is when you get the big criminal communities are going, we don't talk to the old bill. Absolute total and utter tosh. It's nonsense. And for whatever reason, now there were legitimate reasons. It might have changed, but one of them was to get rid of competition. One of them was uh, general, you know, they want justice. There was other people and it was generally heard that a bit like Chris, they, they, they turned to gods and wanted a better society and others wanted a reduction in sentences. And how it would work is that they'd have to give you information that would result in a prosecution. And only then would they get paid out. Uh, but they would also get reduction in a sentence. And what you'd do as an officer, you'd write a letter. It's called a text. And it would be handed by the CPS to the judge at the first day of trial. The judge would read it. And in, in the UK, we have a thing called PII, with public interest immunity. Uh, that Europe, it's banned. They don't like it. And what it is, is when they clear the courts, oh, there's a legal argument. Sometimes it's a matter of public interest and immunity. And what it might be is that one of the defendants is a grass. So they can have it with the defence team or without the defence team. You know, move them out. And then they say, look, this man, he's an informant. And any information relating to that, you can't say it. So they'll say to the defence barrister, you can't go there with this. And sometimes that's when judges go, oh, no, 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 not allowed to mention that. And it might be, it might not be, you know. But what, what used to happen was that you get two co-defendants, right? One snitched and one hasn't. And this resulted in deaths. I think the IRA, there was a lot of it. Uh, one guy would get 10 years, the other one would, would get, you know, an 18-month sentence, you know. And they're like, oh, hang on. So what they started doing was then they started doing it on an appeal basis. You go to court and then you appeal he'll get it and you won't. And so there's all different ways of doing it, you know, to protect them. But uh, it's, um, 
it's it's just massive and it, it it really was but you know one one of one of the legitimate ones was um that that you um wanted to get rid of competition and back in the day when i joined um you were you were actively told get out there and recruit them and i was good at recruiting them i was just very very good at recruiting them and um and the vagrants were, were, were fantastic because they saw everything they were like foxes on the street and you could recruit your own informants uh, but now it has to go to a special professional system that does it, you know, and then you were responsible for the payouts and sometimes they wouldn't be paid out. Sometimes the coppers would steal the money and it was just, and it was a, a nightmare and some would get compromised. And um, there's there's one guy that um, it, it's really, really bad because he did get compromised and the National Crime Squad compromised him and there was three attempts to have him killed. And, uh, they tried to deport him as well because he was, you know, he's foreign national. And I actually went to his um, deportation hearing and gave evidence in his on his behalf to say they did compromise him and they were denying any knowledge of it. And they tried to sack me for that as well. And actually, they they served me a, a bit of paper saying I'm not allowed to go to court, but um, they wouldn't. No one would put an author put a name to it, and they wouldn't even put the Metropolitan Police was just on a scrap of paper. You know, it was perverting the course of justice, you know. Uh, but yeah, it is a big thing, and they'll never admit to it, and it's always going to be quiet and taboo and everything else. Earlier on, you mentioned the Turkish mafia had a hit on yeah. you. What's the story behind well, that? Well, what happened was I, I was on this uh, casino unit, and it was an incredible unit, and they'd never had a prosecution, right? They'd been going for years, right? but they'd never prosecuted anyone. <laughs> And uh, I, I had a, a detective inspector was a Sikh guy and he was the loveliest guy I've ever met. And he took me on. And the reason he took me on, I went from uh, Vice onto there, was I did a job for him one day because uh, I was a good exhibits officer, a very thorough. And he and this guy was, he was an ex-boxer. He had no bone in his nose and he was just walking along swearing. And he was an ex-covert undercover officer, real tough Sikh. And there's tough lot of the old Sikhs anyway. And... Uh, he'd brought up kids on his own and he'd found out that I was bringing up kids on my own and he went well who's looking after your kids while you're here and I went well my mum so he went well, what's her name so I told him he went I'm ringing her now so he rung my mum up said god bless you for doing that and he went over bought my mum a bottle of um, wine and told me to take her home and he went as of uh, Mrs Wedger as of um, Monday I'm having little Johnny Wedger working with me so he said come and work with me and I'll make sure you get home for your kids and he was a lovely guy he said but you work for me and if you have to take work home you you, you do it you don't go home and dust and I was very very loyal to him and the casinos were getting ripped over by a, a, a plethora of scams um, some obvious some not so obvious but all incredibly clever and um, can you name any of them yeah 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 there was um, there was one called Top Hatting and it was very clever and what they'd do uh, uh, if I had a note on me it's um the, the roulette wheel would spin and see in the UK it's different because we're allowed to put bets on while the wheel's spinning and that, that gets higher bets so just as it's about to slow down and it bounces around a bit they call no bets so what they would do this guy is they would um, they'd, they'd have some chips um, so they'd they'd, um, they'd get the table chips you've got the, the money chips you've got table chips so they, they, they'd nick them from other tables or certain casinos they knew that these chips um they would use that there's slight variations so there was about 15 different types so they'd, they'd nick one of each well, or a collection of each and go around the country and working out what tables have got which one and you can you can don donate the uh the value of a chip so they would go into say a crappy old casino in say northampton uh buy a load of chips for 50p play a couple and keep the rest. And then they go to an upmarket one, like in Mayfair. And the one thing is the British casinos pay out more than any other casino in the world. Not collectively, but on one payment. So you can get 10, 20 million paid out in, in one night. And whereas Vegas, you won't get that. But but you, they'll get these chips, go to an upmarket one, and then they'd, they'd pull it down as a thousand pound chip. <laughs> and they did this scam. As the, ball, as the ball's dropping, they're like, oh, I want to put 20 pound on and all that. And the dealer would go, no, no, no more bets. And they could see the balls dropped and went, okay. And they'd throw the money. The dealer would give them the money back. And on the way back, they would drop the chips on the winning square. They're going like that. 
and then they'd sit and then of course they, they won so they've got these chips they pay 50p for and they're, they're wow. off, you know they could make 70 grand easy like that so anyway so, so they had them they had um others that were and these were the turkish boys they were card markers and they would they would get their fingers and they would crimp the card in little places so under certain light wherever they're playing they can see the so they start off playing small crimp the whole packet and then they knew the value of every card and then they could bet and, and the, these <laughs> these were good these were really good and these were the, the main ones and they had another guy that had this algorithm programmed into his phone he was a bit of a one-trick pony because he made one and a half million in one night never heard from him again you know he did the ritz casino you can google it the ritz scam and uh i i managed the reason I solved that I managed to get hold of the bloke who actually made the program and and they were like serbian gangsters they were but the main ones uh they thought the unit thought there was all these different gangs right but when i started getting the photographs and the casino um intelligence teams were all ex-military and they uh, a lot of them come out this 14 inch regiment which were the bit like the sas but in northern ireland and they were super sharp guys you know they were very very good um intelligence teams and uh i said to him look the, the, these these are all the same people these are all the same these aren't like 15 this is one gang of about eight and they're mainly turks you know and then what I, I did was i found out that there was this bizarre rule that giving false information to game is an offense under uh, it's classed as a pecuniary violence it's a deception so they've had to sign in using a false name so i I sort of managed to find out who they were and I was nicking them for giving false information and I was getting handwriting experts to do things on that and that's how I got them. And I was getting them banned from casinos and this information was getting shared all around the world. Well, of course, they were making a minimum of 80 grand a night. And with that money was going in to buy heroin and it was the big Kurdish um, gangs were... And I really started getting into them. But then also I started then getting information coming in about heroin and I was seizing heroin. One In one week on my own, I had a lad with me, um, seized 240 kilos of heroin and it was in two hits. Plus I destroyed them and so I became a big problem. And what happened one day was that um, I got pulled into the office by the boss and said, look, there's some information coming from the covert. They had a, a covert officer working within that environment and found a picture of me being dished out around the coffee shops around green lanes in Haringey and saying this man they called me the blue eyed Turk right because I was dark skinned and they're blue eyed and he said he's a snake and he's doing a lot of damage his name's John Wedger he's a copper and then the information come in it was £40,000 put up to have me shot and funny thing is it was given to one guy to do it and he actually he actually came to the police and said look you need to protect John and uh he liked me and he, he said look and he came forward and actually gave information up but yeah it was 40 grand and the fella who put the information up to have me shot was found dead in Epping Forest four years ago with his head cut off a bloke called Chetting was found dead with his head cut off and his hands tied behind his back in Epping Forest so they were serious serious you know people and I was moved out of that I was banned from Hackney and Haringey for, for quite a while I couldn't go to Green Lanes and yeah, the the, the the Turks, they well, they were Kurdish gangs. They were uh, very active, very very dangerous, you know. And yeah, and, and not not good at all. So, and I've had I've been I've had three de credible death threats. That was the only one that really did bother me because they, they were a class act. They you know they really did mean business, and they would do it. So yeah, that was uh, that was my little run with a with a mafia, as it were, you know. But, did that not make you rethink your occupation? well i don't know i mean it's uh now i look back on it it was quite funny it used to worry my i never used to tell anyone really i never told my children anything you know uh the, the the one the only time that really that i i really was like worried was when they threatened to take my children off me because i knew i was dealing with the british establishment and i think they they piss all over the mafia any day <laughs> that's the biggest you know? mafia yeah that is that's the most corrupt and perverse mafia on you know and that's that really did and they they came very near to crushing me but like someone said to me it's a uh it's what's the word he used it's a war of attrition and they've got the, the money the people and the willpower to see it through you haven't and they want they want you ultimately to commit suicide go mad commit suicide 
what they needed was me still in the police. They didn't want, uh, so they could then sack me and prosecute me. Um, in the end, I I think I won because I ended up getting out, getting my full pension and uh, and not getting prosecuted. So it's nine files went to the CPS. Every, everyone was dropped. Everyone was dropped. I even um, wrote a letter um, to the commissioner just saying, look, here's my, whatever you allege me are doing, I've done it, I admit to it. I don't care what it is, but I will go to Crown Court. The reason that I'm here is because Chief Superintendent so-and-so covered up child prostitution. And then I wrote down a list of all those that knew, and she was on it, so was Hogan Howe, was all on this list. And that is my evidence. And I, and I also put, my back door's broken, the, and it just opens. So you've got an open invite. Do not get a warrant. I invite you in. You can <laughs> search my house anytime. Don't break the door. Go around the back. It's open. Please don't break the door down. It's open. So I gave him an open invite to come in. <laughs> you know, uh, but they, um, in the end, they did back off from me. But I, I pity anyone who takes them on. Anyone who takes them on. What is the purpose of the police? And in your experience, how effective are they in achieving that purpose? I, I, I think, it's funny that I had this discussion with um, Chris Lambiano and Bobby Cummings. We sat down and uh, and I think Charlie Richardson's wife was there as well. And we were discussing the purpose of the police. And the funny thing is, uh, they all said, we need the police. And I thought, yeah, agree. And what they said, they had a problem with the regional crime squad and the flying squad because they were corrupt. They were bigger thieves than, you know, and they were violent. And, and, and that's where it goes wrong. So that are very honourable coppers. And if any of your member of family is getting their head kicked in, you want the police to turn up and steam in. You know, if your house is burgled, you want them to do it. Um, unfortunately, if someone is is raped and abused in this systemic fashion, you want a proper investigation and they are failing in that. They are monumentally failing. And they deliberately cut police numbers. I get these um, these jobs come through daily right and they want retired coppers with investigative experience on child abuse they they they're calling out i, I did apply for one but they, they've classed me as an activist so i failed the vetting they, they won't take me i couldn't even clean the bogs in the police station now i actually had a letter banning me from all police stations <laughs> you know so um, <laughs> but but and the funny thing is right what what isn't known is that there are huge investigations going on in the Falkland Islands with the police there, with child abuse, not with the police, but I, there's a huge, it's not come out. The Ascension Islands, they've basically stripped their police force and they're rebuilding them. We don't hear about it. All these um, British overseas territories have got major problems with child sex abuse because it's an island. We saw it in Jersey. We've seen it in the Hebrides. You can't run when you're on an island, you're stuck there. They'll do what they want for you. Um, so coming back to your question, are they effective? I think they were. I think they were highly effective. However, along with that came corruption. I think the police need to be paid properly. They need to be housed. They need free medical. And, and the same with nurses and the same with the fire service. We granted, don't do a great deal during the day, but we need them and we need them well paid. And and the ambulance crews, I, I, out of all the emergency services, total utmost respect for them. What they deal with, my God, I mean... And they get treated like shit by their by their people. I mean, they really are phenomenal. But they need to be properly maintained, properly disciplined, and properly looked after, and not overworked. One and given time out because a lot of the, you know, you take uh, especially where where I started off. Um, how how it works is coppers would spiral out. So we'll start off in an inner London post and spiral out. So. You, if you went in the West End and you lived in North London, you'd spiral out, you'd end up in Wembley, then you'd end up out in Stanmore or something like that. What happened with South East London is a lot of it is bad, you know, and a lot of the main rotten crime goes on in and around South East London. And you had certain areas. One of them was Woolworth, which was Elephant and Castle, and it was called Carter Street. And it had a reputation for every prisoner getting battered. And they shut it down because too many prisoners died in custody. And funny enough, they renamed it and called it Woolworth and... I think the first week it was open, someone died in custody there anyway. So the mentality didn't change. Now, the next place they spiralled out to was where I was working. So I remember when I first started, there was a guy there and his locker was next to mine. And he had 666 written on his locker. And he said, they call me the Antichrist. And he was one evil man. He went, and he's just come from Carter Street, done all his service from the 70s in this area. He said, I've had a fight, a proper fight 
every day for 19 years. I'm not stop, stopping now. And I can remember going out with him and there was a bloke walking along with some fish and chips and he's, this bloke's got a bit of cod and he's peeled off the skin and he's thrown it in the bin and he's eating his fish. So I on, we've spun the car around and I think you can't nick him for chucking a bit of skin away. He's gone in the bin, picked the skin up and took it and ate it and, and ate food out the bin. And then the next thing, we've gone round to some domestic and he's just given this bloke the biggest kicking in front of his family. He's sticking him. And that's how it went on and on and on. He, he did that every day, every day. I mean, now they wouldn't get away with it with all the cameras and all that. But um, yeah, there were, they were, there were some really violent areas and every part of London had it. So that area had Carter Street. Uh, the East End had Stoke Newington. The, the West End had Paddington. Harrow Road was um, notorious for, for punchy coppers. And, and they sort of strive their reputation on that, you know, and corruption. So it, it, it was a stigma that stayed with them wherever they worked. I mean, and yeah, so uh, corruption, I think they, they did do a good job in wheedling it out. I think they, they took hard measures on it. and uh, But again, uh, they're going back to the old days. There's no experience now. The public are being let down because they've got rid of all the trade craft. It is a trade and it is a skill, you know, and they some were really good at what they did. They had a sixth sense. They had a knowing. And there was a need to be tough as well because there were coppers that were brave that wouldn't back down. We don't, we, we shouldn't see coppers backing down. We shouldn't. What, what message is that giving out? But they should be fighting the right people. Where you tend to see, I watched a copper program the other day, and they were in Cambridge, and there was some, I think, Lithuanian lads all drunk, and they were mouthing off, and there was this one young copper, and he went straight in there, grabbed old, put one in, and I'm like, and I thought it's, it was old school being a man. It was proper coppering. He weren't brutalising, but he weren't hanging about, and he weren't messing his words. He's like, you know, enough's enough, and we need to go back to that, but we need to also get back the old skills that have been lost, the old investigative skills that are lost. And there is a world of difference in Europe. Um, you take Switzerland, Austria, and I think Germany as well. Uniform and detective works are two totally different things. In in Austria, you, you join as a detective or you join as a uniform cop. You don't intermix. Here, we do, we, we, we branch over. Uh, Uniform coppers are totally different to detective. Detective is a fascinating world. It's an incredibly interesting world. Um, and it's miles better than uniform policing. That's just absolute appalling. I hated it. And uh, I feel sorry for anyone who does it. I just can't stand it. But there was guys that did 30 years of it. You know, same place every day. You know, I can, I'd be like working in a factory. But I think they are failing the public. And when it comes to the sexual abuse, Historically, it's been failed and, and covered up. And we're seeing the same coppers being used each time. And it's coppers. Their name is coming out each time. And they seem to be the ones that are doing the establishment bidding. You know, Mike Veal was a very, very brave guy. Um, he's now being attacked by this ex-copper called Paul Settle. Um, and I don't know what his agenda is, but he seems to be brought out a lot whenever there's, you know, and there's, a couple of coppers like that, they're always using the voice and I, I'm not on board with them. I make no allegations against them, but I'm not on board with them. And I think some people do get bought and paid for. Did you find that racism is a problem in the police force? Didn't you know, funny enough, well, I had this chat with my mate and uh, who was the, the covert copper, right? And I said, now, if you was to talk to a black copper or an Asian copper, you might get a totally different viewpoint on it. Um, and I said, and I said that, I said, did you ever see any real overt racism? He went, no. I said, well, I don't think I ever did. However, my mate, Jamaican lad called George, he, he joined in the 70s and said it was appalling. Absolutely appalling. But when I was there, no, not really. Um, and when I was in the West End, we had, um, we had a team of about, I think about 20. We had, we had a black girl, three black lads we had two lesbians and three gay guys all on this team and there was banter and there was banter and there was um but i remember once that um i was getting a rough time on the street and i was um they they 
this well it, it turned into a mini riot they turned the car over and we were me and another lad were getting a right good hiding and the first fella on scene was this gay guy <laughs> and uh but the day before he'd been he'd been the victim of a bit of jiving in the pub but he was first on the scene and he took out nine people on his own he was like zorro he came along <laughs> 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 oh, he absolutely smashed in the bees. And uh, you know, the next day, he was he was also camping it up in the pub. And I thought, well, oh, on the street, he was an absolute animal, you know. <laughs> he was incredible. But uh, but I, no, but there were others that would say yes. And and again, um, like my mate once, we both had to go and see a senior officer, so something be told off. And I sort of got an easy deal. And he got a hard deal and he said, look, it's because because I'm black. He said, that's the only reason she's done that. She hates us. She hates the brothers, you know. Um, so I would say there were a lot of, when I first started in South London, there were a lot of snide comments and there were. And and, and it was quite funny because, um, well, it's not funny. It's just how things have changed. But I remember uh, at a briefing, you'd start off your shift and the inspector would come down and everything back then was very official. And I was a new lad. I always had to make tea for everyone. So I had to make tea for everyone. And they'd have a brief and they'd do the crimes crimes of note. And this inspector was there and he went, oh, he said, yes, and uh, usual suspects. And he said, uh, three Biffs had um, mugged an old woman. So get out there and sort them out. And, and I said to my mate, what, what, what's he mean, Biffs? And he went, oh, it stands for Black Ignorant Effer. And, oh, and, and this was inspector said it <laughs> and that's what he said in the meeting I said, really uh, I mean that was I mean and when he joined it was probably even worse but no when with with my sort of um, intake and all that it was pretty mixed anyway and it, it was it was on its way out although it was it, there were still people in there that were horrible but I, I think you'd get that anywhere you would get that anywhere but institutionally, it probably was, and I got the back end of it. Me personally, didn't, but I, you know, when I was in there, the back end of it, it was pretty raw, and the sense of humour was pretty raw, and that would involve racism and homophobia and everything else. But that did, um, it did sort of die out, you know, really. But again, it it never really impacted on what I was doing or or anything else, really, and. And you know it, it's easy for us to all talk like we got halo burn, but, but I've never been that minded anyway. I grew up in a mixed area, I, you know. I went to a mixed school, and and it did. I'm, I'm not like that, so it never really, you know. Um, if someone's a tosser, they're a tosser. It, you know, they come in all shapes and forms, don't they? Really, you know. Um, but unfortunately, I think that we're, we're just not catching the real ones that are doing it. I r only wish I could wave a magic wand and people would be exposed for what they truly are, which all their crimes would be listed in front of them. My God, as a society, we would have our, well, I wouldn't, but a lot of people, their jaws would be on the floor. And the the stuff I did know and, and the connections I did get involved with, like you said, with the yew tree and the celebrity stuff, um, I can't say them because I'd get in a world of trouble. But, you know, the, the footballers that people think are fantastic, there's one or two of them, they're not. Again, same as the actors and, and, and everything else. And you see them and you think, my God. But they just, the burden of proof is the highest in the Western world. And beyond all reason, without an incredible amount of work you need. Statistically, when we take... Um, a, ch a historical child abuse case and people don't like that word historical but it is what it is like and it is what it is historical cases they they have a success rate of two percent two percent what but that isn't saying that 98 percent of those accused are innocent because they're not no however the likes of who's sitting in there proclaiming his dad's innocence he go that they're, they're, they're they're you know they're harking on about that well, they've not been found guilty, therefore they are innocent. Well, they're innocent in the eyes of the law, but they're not innocent in the eyes of God because they know what they've done. And and as coppers, we know what they've done. You'd have access to intelligence and you knew what people had done, but you just couldn't say it, you know, and you, you get to deal with the suspects and the victims, whereas a solicitor will only deal with one or the other. So you do get a balanced, you know, thing. So. I just watched the Madeleine McCann thing on Netflix, which is heartbreaking. Any thoughts on the Madeleine McCann oh, case? Oh, so many thoughts. I mean, again, I 
I did get a lot of good information um, because I knew someone that was involved in there. Uh, and what I got back is, you know, the parents were heavily involved. I mean, take you take that copper Amaral Concalves. I mean, he didn't just write one book. He wrote two books. I mean, the British have got no jurisdiction out there. What the hell were they doing out there? If a Portuguese is killed here, it's our job. They'll have a family liaison. We don't send search teams and all that. Why was the Pope involved? I mean, it's just disgusting. I mean, what, what I was told, what I was told, I mean, and I'm not going to disclose my source, was that they were swingers, the um, the family, you know, the, the whole group and all that. And um, uh, the, the child was... Um, given a lot of uh, sedative, you know, because our doctors, they got sedative and and it was a, a residual amount was too much and it killed them. But the, the very sad thing is that, the, the, well, it's sad that the little girl died, but uh, again, if, if a body can't be found, then you can't do an autopsy, can you? And with a child, there's going to be what they call a special post-mortem, not just a normal one. If I had a heart attack and died, they'd just cut me out and say, look, John Major's heart's knackered, that's it. With a child, they're going to look at everything and they'll be looking at the downstairs region of a kid as well. Now, what if that came up with signs of interference, which it would, you know, if it had been done, it would be there. So, um, Was that the, the dog that was used? Now, that dog uh, couldn't be discredited. It was just a phenomenal machine that was just 100% bang on all the time. Uh, so they, they managed to discredit the dog as they've discredited everyone who speaks out against them. But then that dog was discredited professionally. And of course, that dog was used in Haute de la Garenne in Jersey, the kid's home where they found the scent of the, you know, the bones and everything else in that kid's home. That Lenny Harper, that brave guy, was running an operation. And then, of course, that collapsed as well. So look what they did, the backlash. And all them kids that were in that home that want justice and won't have it. They had an anthropologist just going on to Jersey a minute, an anthropologist, and they had a pathologist, and they had an archaeologist. All the ologists were there. He did a proper job, and they found human bone. And the human bone, the bone they found, had collagen. Now it's only humans, I think, and pigs have collagen, right? And a cadaver dog is trained to either sniff out a pig or a human because they're, they're so intrinsically linked in smell and because we could use every organ in a pig. We can't use a monkey or anything like that that we're meant to be related to, but a pig we can use. And how many religions won't eat pig? It seems very odd that... Anyway, so collagen was on there and, and they got the, this expert on bones to turn around and said, that is a human bone and it's aged between four to 10 years old, right? So good evidence, almost irrefutable evidence, arguable evidence, but very good professional evidence. That got bagged up, eunuch seal, ratchet sealed up, off it went to lab. It come back and the report that the ratchet seal had the same number but a different seal and it was a coconut shell. So it was coconut shell. And then they said, well, the dog's been discredited anyway, so the dog obviously had made a mistake. And this is what they do. And again, with a McCann, I mean, my opinion, my opinion that, that, that they killed the girl and uh, I don't like them. The best bit of um, investigative journalism on that front I've ever seen was that embedded confessions with the American, have you ever seen it? Peter Hyatt. H-Y-A-T-T, Peter Hyatt. You must watch it if you're interested in it. He's a statement analyst. And I was lucky enough that I, when I was on Vice, I uh, went to work with one, did a bit of work with a statement analyst and a profiler. And it's an incredible science. It really is fantastic. And it's just brilliant what how people react to things and, you know, what they do. Um, and anyway, he analyzes the written words. So he's transcribed all their interviews and he gives a rating of um, dishonesty detected and for both of them. And he, he's picked up that Kate was a victim of sexual abuse. Uh, and I sort of go along with it, you know, and he's also said that she's lied about the child. Uh, but he sees Kate as a bit of a victim, but he says Jerry McCann is an incredible deceiver. He's just an absolute incredible, and on the point of narcissism as well. Um, so, yeah, embedded confessions, fantastic, really fantastic, professional, forensic uh, bit of evidence. And all forensic means is evidence for a court. That's what forensic means. It just means a foray court. But yeah, brilliant. So, um, yeah, why would they go to such an effort? Why would they go to such a... I mean, they're, they're, they're denigrating Mike Veal with Operation Conifer. 
you know, and we need to get together. The problem with victims and survivors, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, you fight amongst each other. You've got to stop doing that and you've got to attack. I've been attacked loads of times. Oh, you know, things they've said about me online. I, I'm only doing good and I've just been hounded and hammered by, by all sorts. We've got to stick together, get the message out, do the right thing and we can bring about a change, but otherwise no change will come. They will keep ruining it. And how many more deaths will be through suicide and, and drug addiction? Too many. You mentioned drug addiction a few times there. What do you think about the criminalization of addiction and the war on drugs? Because I'm an associate member of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and they're policemen who say, you know, they, they joined to arrest murderers. But they were assigned to like infiltrate student groups and get them smoking weed and, yeah. and arrest them at the end of the month. And that's not what they signed well, up well, for. Well, funny you should say that because I, I was put on a unit. Uh, I was meant to be investigating road deaths, right? And I was told my first day there, no, you're being sent on this unit. And it was when a student protest started and we were put to investigate the students. And they were going out their way to criminalise them. They were hammering. But the, their solicitors were on board with it as well. Their solicitors, there was one judge and they were getting over-the-top sentences for really what they could have got a caution for, right? And they were just protesting about their future, you know? And there was one lad, I was over at um, Horsery Road Magistrate and the, the judge was there and he was talking and he said to this lad, look, I've seen the evidence. And his solicitor saying, go not guilty, go to commit or go to Crown Court, go to Crown Court. And this kid was like, didn't know, di didn't understand, you know. And he was like, oh, and the judge said, I've seen the evidence, I'll deal with you fairly. I've seen your background, I've seen your antecedents, I will deal with you fairly, you will be walking out of here. And his barrister solicitor kicked off. That's unfair. This is prejudice and all this. So yeah. You know, anyway, started mouthing off. I had to go to the judge for it. And the judge went, "I'm sorry, son. I can only be guided. You know, I can only tell you what I'll do for you." And this 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 kid solicitor made him go not guilty, as is his right, but it was wrong, and took him to Crown Court. He got sent to Kingston Crown Court. So they'll they'll, they'll pick certain Crown Courts, right? Very white middle class area. Very male reading you know the tory graph no we're not having none of this nonsense and he got 18 months this kid 18 months he weren't a criminal he done nothing wrong and again this is what i said at the very beginning what my friend said to me they pick low-hanging fruit they pick low-hanging fruit and that's all they do you know and i when when i um i seized um all that heroin uh, it was in two hits and i I ended up getting um, interviewed under caution. Instead of getting, well done, John, you know, and it did cause a fluctuation in the price of heroin, actually, what I did. Uh, there was 220 kilos at Southall, and then there was uh, a, a 10 kilos over Hackney, and then there was another five kilos in, in somewhere in Dover. And um, they they interviewed me under caution because they didn't know how I got this information, and there was a lot of jealousy, and I was I was put up as being corrupt and running unlawful informants well of course the inf I, it was all run properly and i'm not going to tell them anyway so that, that's how they treated me yet the, there was another group that worked in the the clubs area that dealt with the nightclubs they 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 raided i think the, the fridge at brixton and they see something like 50 ecstasy pills um and about three rocks of crack and a few joints they all got um tea and medals with um ken livingston uh, uh, or boris over at city hall you know, and it was on the news as well. The major police bust and all that. Nothing about what I'd done, but all, and they showed it all. And a couple of spliffs and it. And of course, those lads that were dealing that, they're going away for a long time. They're going to get big sentences, you know. And this is what they're doing. They're, they're, they're picking on these dealers that are dealing out their mouth, deal by mouth, you know, what, five or six rocks. And, you know, they're going to get 12 years, eight, 12 years. And they were deliberately sending them to Kingston Crown Court. You know, whereas if they sent them to Snaresbrook or one of the, the Wood Green or someone, they'd have got a hell of a lot. They might have got, been acquitted by the jury up there. <laughs> There's a Vice magazine video going viral right now on YouTube. It shows this undercover cop, baby faced, goes into the school undercover, pays an autistic kid twenty dollars to get some weed, oh. and then well, that's uh, how provocateur that at, is. At the end of the investigation, um, twenty something kids were arrested. More than half of them special needs. The rest of them minorities and the news headline was dangerous crack yeah, and heroin will, gang yeah. dealing drugs in school yeah and the the, the documentary went on to explain that the more arrests they got like the low-hanging fruit you're talking about yeah. 
the more federal funding they got. And these are the easiest people yeah. to arrest. And of course, sort of with here, it'll be the middle England. They're all happy with it. You know, the mayoress is happy with it and all that. And it's uh, it's just, it's absolute. And I'll, I'll tell you something. We, we've, um, why I exposed, at the time, the policing and crime minister was Sir Michael Penning, Sir Mike Penning. And it turned out he was my constituent MP. So I bent his ear and said, Mike, come on, you've got to help me. And he did. Fair play, he did. And he took it right to the top. And he, he summons Cressida Dick into Parliament to, and she refused to turn up. So that speaks volumes. <laughs> um, he then took it high up. He, he took it to Theresa May, what was going on with the cover-ups. <laughs> the next day, he was kicked out and they made him Minister for the Armed Forces. And he continued to um, help me. Uh, I held a meeting with um, Nicholas Hurd, the new Minister for Policing, Douglas Hurd's son, and members of the Home Office. Uh, we had a meeting, and the, and the next day, I think he ended up as Minister for Pens and Toilet Roll, I think, in Parliament. <laughs> they kept busting him. And he said, John, every time I come and help you, they, he said, it's, it, what can we do? And there, there's another MP, bless him, called Andrew Bridgen. And he said, it's above their pay scale. They're never going to help you. They, 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 you. You can wait all day long. They are going to do nothing, John. And it's true. They are, This government will do nothing about. And Boris Johnson, I mean, this needs to be said when this goes out, and hopefully you'll get some good viewers. Uh, we collared Boris Johnson about four months ago outside Parliament. He was on a crappy old mountain bike. He dresses like a tramp. He does it on purpose. We collared him on in Parliament. It's just he was going in and said, Boris, come on, this this is what we're doing. We're campaigning for decency here, for whistleblowing, for victims. He went, no, nothing to do with me. And he just went straight in. And then he classed... The independent inquiries as money being spaffed up a wall, which is akin to being spaffed up a wall, which isn't the right term to use to victims of abuse anyway. So if we think him as PM is going to do anything about this, my God, no, of course he isn't. And he's an old Etonian. He would have been, you know, what they put them through in Eton. So I mean, is there any solution to this or is it always going to get covered up and it's always going to go on? No, there is a solution. And the solution is that we've got to stand together. Um, victims, please don't be offended and, and don't be ashamed. You've done nothing wrong. Speak out. Do you have any victims that w would be willing to come on this podcast yeah. and speak frankly about yes. exactly what happened yeah, to them? Yeah, yes, yes. And tomorrow, I, I mean, this this is obviously a pre-record, uh, but it's a shame because tomorrow, the seventh, there's we've got a protest. There'll be there'll be plenty there, and there will. And I'll put an appeal out. Look, uh, the John Wedger Foundation. You, you go on there. You'll find my email address. Get in touch with me and. Um, and we'll put you in touch with, with, with Sean. But um, yes, there are people. There are, and they will talk frankly, and they will talk freely as well without any hindrance of prosecution or anything like that because they're talking the truth, you know? And they are, unfortunately, people get angry and they, and they class them as renting and it's not, it's righteous anger. They, you know, there's, there's a lovely guy I work with. He's lost every one of his siblings near enough. Every one of them has died due to... Uh, side effects of abuse in the care homes you know no wonder the guy's angry uh, you know uh, on what happens if they shout or anything then they just get discredited for that so it's it's appalling and this is what we've got to do the victims need to come forward the police need to be held accountable and we, we basically need to bring this country to a standstill and make them do something you mentioned Lambriano and Cummins quite a few people have put them forward as possible candidates to come on this podcast do yeah. you think they would be up for that brilliant yeah I mean Bobby Cummings is a very intelligent guy, uh, and he's he's got an MBE. I think I think he's got an MBE. He he, he takes a fight into Parliament, um, and, and yeah, and he's got a bit of presence about him. Chris Lambiano must be one of the loveliest guys I've ever met in my life, and it's an absolute pleasure to have him as a friend. He is the the wisdom that oozes out of him. He never glamorises crime. He won't speak good of the craze or anything like that. He will just t say it as it is, and he's just. Um, a fantastic man. He really, he, he, this, this, will make off the, um, I, I go and meet with, with, um, a lot of ex cons and all that, this, this, this group that they've got, and you know, they're meeting the blind beg and things like that. And I, I, I tend to get either a good reception or an indifferent reception, really. So I, I don't, never get any trouble or anything like that. And, uh, and usually the, there's a lot of people that, that would like to have a sit down and chat with me because a lot of them, when you talk to them, their life of crime started because they're in care homes, you know. But uh, one day we were off to a, a venue in the evening and they meet sometimes in a cafe in the East End called Paliches, where all the gangsters used to meet and meet there, have a, something to eat and then 
we were going to an evening out. I couldn't make the, the, the meal thing. So I went off to the venue, which was the O2 Arena. And Tony, who runs a group, uh, he turned up with, I think, Charlie Richardson's wife. And I said, well, where's Maureen, Maureen Flanagan and um, uh, Chris Lambriano? Where's Where's Maureen and Chris? Where, 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 you know, they said, oh, well, they're outside the cafe. And uh, East End gangster tour bus went by. <laughs> And they've got all these people on this gangster tour of double decker going through the East End, and they've seen Chris and Maureen and thinking, "My God, we got you know the two living relics of the Cray era." And uh, anyway, Chris turns up, and I said, "Oh, I you got collared." He said, oh, "I've got to tell you about this, John." He said, "They've collared me and Maureen, put us on the bus, and taken us round all the haunts." And he said, "They've given me the mic because Chris is a born again Christian." And they've given him the mic thinking he's going to start talking about stabbing, shootings, and all that. <laughs> and he said, my name is Chris. It's short for Christian. And he said, I got the Bible out and started reading some <laughs> Psalms to him. <laughs> they looked him like it had two heads. <laughs> but he, he's a really wise man. And I've seen firsthand what he does with uh, addicts and survivors, you know. And he sits down and he talks words of wisdom. He's a fatherly figure and he, and he talks the right language to him guides them away from trouble, puts them in the right road, and he understands their frame of mind. Um, so, yeah, fantastic bloke, you know, and uh, I, I, I no doubt I, if you want me to, I can yeah, uh, love get, to get in touch with for, Chris, um, and uh, I would have thought he would do it, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I like I say, a lot of the people that I break bread with now, I, I've, I've done serious time, and no problems whatsoever, you know, you know, none um, whatsoever. What's your opinion on the craze? I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan, and there's things that I'd like to say, but it wouldn't be the right forum to do it. Okay. But I think that they were involved in some very nefarious things, and uh, no, nothing nothing really good I've got to say about them. I think if people really knew what they were involved in, I don't think anyone would hero worship them. Okay. Um, but then um, that was the era, and, you know, they, and they got involved with the politicians, and maybe that was their saving grace and their protection for a long time, you know? But yeah, no, I think it's, uh, and funny enough, someone who wrote one of their books, I had a meeting with her and I know a couple of things that they did. And I said to her, did you know about this? And she went, yeah. I said, well, why is that not in the book? She went, well, no one would buy it, would they? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not nice and it's not nice, but I will leave it at that, you know, but no, I'm not a fan at all. And I'm really not. So how can people who've watched this video help you? Um, we what we we do we we have uh, the campaign for decency. Uh, there's a guy called Jeff runs it, and it's the first Wednesday of every month outside Parliament, and we have a little protest. Um, I've been doing a letter writing campaign to all MPs saying that police whistleblowers and um, victims of abuse need to be um, protected. But I mean, really, research it because. At the moment, the media, the mainstream media are deliberately denigrating anyone coming forward. And what I say to you, that, that it's, it's a lie. Now, there are victims that have gone on to abuse, and it's an unfortunate statistic. It does happen. And in no way is that a blanket comment that victims are abused because they're not. But there is a percentage that does. Uh, there are victims that go on to commit dishonest crime, but it doesn't mean when they come forward that they should be treated with disdain and disrespect that they are. Um, I would say that, you know, get behind us and what we're doing. I mean, at the moment, I'm pretty much worn out with it all. I've spent um, all my money doing this. Um, I've been accused of stealing money. Being, everything's come out of my own pocket. The mainstream media haven't been behind me. Um, they have with Maggie, they haven't with me, they, you know. Um, so I've struggled it, but I, everything I've done has been on the cold face, you know. Um, but... I mean, just watch this space. I don't know what my next move is, um, but there are a lot of victim groups. You've got the Shirley Oaks group, the Beach Home Survivors groups. There's all them that, you know, they all need help in one way or another. A lot of them need the publicity. What we're doing is there's um, uh, a media company called Brees Media, B-R-E-E-S Media, run by Anna Brees, a, a former journalist, a BBC ITN journalist. Um, very well known back in the uh, back in the nineties, and she is now training the victim and survivor groups how to use their mobile phones as recording devices, and she's holding two day courses for free 
and giving them the skills so they can go out and take their own testimony. And uh, and I have helped out and I've also given them advice on, on what to say and what not to say, liable and what's not liable. You know, just be careful with naming names unless it's out in the public domain or they're dead. You just be very careful unless you can prove it to have your opinion, but unless you can prove it to a, a court standard, be very careful what you put out there. Um, so there, there is that, you know, you look into that, look into using your, your phone, put, you can put your own, it's very, very easy to put your own um, videos out there and your own testimonies. But um, that's basically really it, to be honest, Sean. I and mean, you've got a YouTube video uh, channel with videos and testimonies on it. Yeah. So I'll put the link to your YouTube channel in the description box below this video. So please go over and check out John's videos and subscribe to his channel. What other social media uh, platforms can we follow you on? Well, well Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, Brees Media tend to manage that. Um, YouTube, you know, I've not done much for a while. Um, funny enough, I, I was contacted by a former um, member of uh, MI6 about three months ago and sort of basically gave me words of advice on uh, not to get involved with politics and the fact that my viewing figures will drop i went from a million hits a month on facebook down to eighty thousand almost overnight and basically told me just to ease up a little bit and that was words of advice from former ex mi6 which i i took gracefully i was i was quite appreciative of that that someone would come to me and say that um so i haven't done a great deal but again they're still there you know and and ping them out moving forward uh, get them out. I know that they've um, gone off to America. There's, there's been quite a good response out in America. And and just research it. Research the Mark de True. That's a very interesting case because that's in very recent history and uh, and it showed what the people, what their reaction was. And really wake up, wake up Great Britain, please wake up. Wake up because, you know, this has happened to children and single parenting I'm not to denigrate. I was a single parent for over 20 years. It's a tough life and it's not to be recommended. The children suffer as well as the parent suffers and it makes you weak and it makes your family stability very weak. Now, if something happens to you as a single parent, where do your kids go? They go into care. And when they go into care, unless there's someone looking over them all the time, these predators are going to be there and wake up to the reality of this abuse. Wake up to it. Look after your children. Do not abandon your children know what they're doing at all times be aware of it who's around them and uh, and just just be good to them just be good to them and have a good open relationship with your children and for god's sake don't hurt them don't hurt your children we've got enough pain in this world there's too much tears in this world as it is it's got to stop sean it really has to stop we we've got to bring the love back in you know and start listening and um and have an open mind with mental health as well it's i mean look what happened two days ago when that lad 17 year old mental health patient threw that boy over the parapet of the um tate modern i mean my god what was going through that kid's head and no doubt he's an incredibly damaged individual you know and and the, the ripples of this go on forever and ever and ever and it affects everyone and it might not affect you but you don't know what will happen down the lines and you don't know what happened to your children your children might end up living in an area where you know these people that have been are, are and it comes to you you know but make it your problem make it your problem don't walk away they're all our children this is one thing i say my four boys i brought up two of them weren't mine they were going to a care home and luckily i had a guy looked after me like a stepdad you know and i said what do i do he said you're not my son but i loved you and looked after you you do the same they're all our children do not turn your back on them the beggar outside a shop by like the Romanian ones, and not knocking Romanian ones, but you know, the, the gypsy organized gangs, but the beggars, talk to them. You're fine, they've had a tragic life, a terrible life, you know, uh, don't turn your nose up out of them, you know, have a bit of understanding and a bit of compassion for your brother and your sister, you know, so uh, what more can you do but share the love, you know? Well, listen, John, I've sort of fascinated, it's made me uneasy and queasy at times, but I think this is one of the most important missions i've ever heard and i've ever been able to convey on my platform and you're a brave man indeed so ah. wish all, all the best in your, in your god bless you mate yeah, yeah. Hey. and you and i've watched your stuff with interest and he's look give me a book 
hard time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read that. I read that with pleasure. Thank you. Have you signed it? All signed. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh look at that. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, man. Yeah. Right, you guys demanded back our most controversial ex cop. This is John's third appearance on the True Crime Podcast. And his two first episodes and the combined clips now have multi-million views, if you add up everything. By far the most requested ex-cop to come on. And also by far the most trolled ex-cop to come on. <laughs> most trolled, end of. Most trolled, end of, yeah. <laughs> so... We've got a slew of subjects to go over today, including what we can legally say about Wilfred Wong and Jeanette Archer. Now, it's probably one of the most common questions I'm getting every single day. Will you make a video about Wilfred Wong? Will you explain what's happened with Wilfred Wong? Has Wilfred Wong committed something that he said he was never going to do, he was protecting people from, or was Wilfred Wong on a rescue mission? So there's all this controversy, but from my own experience, I know that all pre-trial publicity is bad publicity, so I've not said anything. I've written to Wilfred, waiting for a response for his instructions. It's entirely up to him. However, John here has spoken and corresponded with Wilfred, so he knows what he can say within the limits of not getting Wilfred in any trouble. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming back on, John. No, no worries. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry it's taken so long. You know, uh, it's okay. life takes over and... You know what a turbulent time it's been, you know, for everyone, but also in respect to myself, you know, it's been a, a roller coaster, and I say that lightly, you know. Are you enjoying the song that Brian Harvey's done about us? Brilliant, I'm touched. Effing John Wedger, <laughs> effing Sean Atwood, <laughs> effing Bill Maloney, effing Ian Puddock, they all work for the New World Order. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I know. That's his new Christmas single, isn't it? You know? Yeah, Doing absolutely. Well, He's know? got a podcast oh, yeah. coming out. Good luck with that, Brian. Yeah. Well, I looked on it. It's been out a month, and I think it's it's got a staggering amount of 938, <laughs> 39 now, because I viewed it. Is that our song? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> well done. You know, you, you might get a thousand hits. Well done. <laughs> oh. All right. So, let's, let's just start out then going. You, could you just set the record straight what the deal is with Wilfred? Right. Um, yeah. Now, Wilfred was arrested, I think, on the 4th of November. Um, Wilfred's a secretive man anyway, you know, uh, and that's the secret really of his success uh, to date anyway. Um, but Wilfred is probably the number one campaigner, I would say globally, uh, in exposing satanic ritual abuse, SRA, which is something that I really would like to go on about, you know, and something Wilfred's encouraged me to talk about as well. Um, and Wilfred is a good man. He's a Christian man. He's um, probably one of the bravest men that I know. He's a tough guy as well, you know. Um, he has served in the military. Wilfred, I know he doesn't talk about it, but he has. Um, yeah, it's come out in the press, hasn't it, that he was in some kind of special forces or something. He, yeah, yeah. He's a mixed martial artist. He's, he's a, a tough man, you know, and he's, he's fearless, but he's got a mission, and that is to uh, protect children and expose satanic ritual abuse. So stuff was coming out post arrest that he he was um abducting kids he was doing this that i was involved Do you want to just describe for people not familiar then what he was arrested for and how that arrest came about yeah, yeah so um it looks like my opinion you know um again even when i talk to wilfred in the prison system i don't just discuss, discuss a case i know that the prison phone system is what they call a pin system it's a private network it's heavily monitored Wilfred, without a doubt, his phone calls will be monitored. And I actually worked on a unit that used to monitor phone calls in, I was in HMP Holloway uh, for about two months monitoring phone calls on, on, on child sex trafficker that was in there. Um, so I know exactly how it works. Um, and also correspondence, all correspondence is, is read and it is filtered. So, so that's that. And you're right, there's contempt to court. There's an ongoing issue, especially when you've got a child victim, which is what we've got um, happening with this case, is that there's going to be some very tight parameters. So he was arrested with six people. That's in yeah. the public domain. That's in the public domain. It, that, what, what they're saying is that it was a kidnap of, um, I think it's an eight-year-old boy in North Wales. It's named um, the six suspects, five of which are alive, one now is dead. Um, we'll get to that yeah 
and it uh, appears that there was some sort of, um, in my opinion, a rescue attempt of a child. Is it true that one of the six was the child's mother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the child's mother was there. Wilfred was there. There was, um, I think there was a husband and wife team and other people. Um, so that lends credence then to it being a rescue if the mother's there. It, it would have looked like that that is a case, that there is a kid that if it's Wilfred involved, there probably would have been some sort of um, child protection element going on there. May well have been a satanic ritual element, don't know. Um, and it looks like there was like this abduction was made in Wales and they were stopped, um, I think, just south of Northamptonshire towards Newport Pagnell. I think that's Buckinghamshire. Armed police intercepted the car. That That is um, uh, footage that's on, on the media, I think. The Sun newspaper posts that footage. Uh, Wilfred, they said um, it was an armed and aggravated kidnapping. But again, the only information we seem is that Wilfred was in possession of a knife. Now, that doesn't in any way denote that that was used in, in the commission of the offence. It may well be a side issue that he was in possession of what they call a bladed article. And um, you know, again, I can't comment on that because I'm not going to ask Wilfred any questions about it. Cause so they probably, when they pulled him over, they discovered a knife and that's yeah, how they yeah. added that to the yeah, story. Yeah, and you, go, you know, I've um, done stuff with Wilfred in the past. Um, I'm unaware of what was going on here. Uh, you know, I know how Wilfred operates and he's a professional and he's an ex-military guy, so... You know, who knows? So is the media reporting that the child was taken from a family or from a care home? Doesn't say. Doesn't, doesn't say. Doesn't say. And I, I don't know if there's acrimony within that. I don't know if there's a residence orders, child family court issue. I would have thought there would be a child family court matter going on. But again, I don't know. That's pure speculation. Um, but I, I mean, the way the press have, and I've actually spoken to the Daily Mail about this, you know, and I said, you know, Wilfred has been neg negatively um, publicised on this. He's come across as some sort of child snatching, uh, you know, armed maniac. And so concerned was I of how the press um, did this. I, I did speak to um, the Daily Mail and they said that they won't be running any more stories on it because of the contempt issues and everything else. And uh, they... Actually, funny enough, the um, the journalist did say it clearly looks like a, a failed rescue attempt, and and I would agree with that, you know. Um, and then I contacted the governor of of the prison at Wilfrid's Inn, and I just said, and I expressed my concerns, and say, so, you know, this guy needs to be risk assessed properly because if the general population are, are, are going to be swayed by this negative slur on Wilfred, then then his welfare could be at risk. Um, anyway, they've written back to me and they said, look, we're fully aware of the situation. Wilfred is okay because there was this story that come out that Wilfred had been castrated in prison and his testicles flushed down the toilet, which I found very hard to believe because Wilfred, firstly, is a lovely guy and secondly, he's a tough guy. Um, so if Wilfred was to get hurt, I would have thought there'd be more than one person involved. But um, And then there was one of the suspects was um, found dead in his cell. Dead in what manner? What's come out via the press is that he had a plastic bag um, tied around his head or, or it was around his head, so it was suffocation. It's, I think it, it's in the matter of the coroner's court at the moment. I think they've opened an inquest in it. It's not been closed as yet. It's gone down as suicide. It may well be suicide. Do you have any yeah. theories as to what it could be? I think it's suicide. I, I generally think so. How old was the person? Do they have any history I of mental illness? I think in his sixties, in his sixties, and again, I don't know. You know, mm. I don't know. You know whether as and you know, and if this guy um, has maybe orchestrated this plot that they're involved in this conspiracy, maybe there's there's a huge overwhelming element of guilt. He's in an environment he's not used to, and again, if you have got aggravated factors such as mental instability. That's going to push people beyond the pale. You know? Being in prison pushes people yeah, beyond yeah. the pale. Of course it, it would. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, bear in mind, look at the charges. You know, kidnap that covers takes on a life tariff. If if you know it goes to its full extent, you know, so they could well be you're found guilty. So all the co-conspirators are facing potential life sentences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's incredibly incredibly serious. Um, 
Uh, you know, what Wilfred wants me to put out there is, you know, the fact that the, the government are not taking satanic ritual abuse seriously, you know, that there there are children that are caught up in, in, in cases and it's not being properly investigated. Not that he's saying that this is a, the, the matter here. So um, I will be going on um, today about a few pointers regarding SRA, you know, when we get to that, um, do, yeah. that little bit of it. You know, it's a very, very real thing, you know, and it's very prevalent, especially through the dark months of the year. You know, they, they tend to mimic the Christian calendar and invert it. And another thing I'd like to uh, go on about, Sean, is that, you know, I, like yourself, um, do quite a lot with, with ex-convicts, you know, and um, especially with Chris Lambriano, you know, who, who is a very, very close friend of mine. And I've just uh, raised a lot of money for Terry Ellis and Brian Cockrell. I've got a charity. We've had all those guys on. Yeah, you know, yeah. cracking blokes. I, I was up with Brian um a few months ago um i'm in phone contact with terry a lot and i raised a few thousand pounds for their charity you know uh, save a life put down a knife um and uh through that i've been put in touch with another fella um and i'm not going to name the guy uh but we're getting on very well and we're sharing a lot of information and you know and something that i want to talk about which ties in with the satanic ritual abuse was how much a lot of very serious organised criminals were using and are still using the services of 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 juju men, you know, witch doctors, mahamrabats, you know, and especially ones that are coming from the Nigerian communities, you know, which are very very um, prevalent active criminal element that have come from that part of West Africa, especially involving um, deception, but also involving human trafficking. I spoke Torso in the river. Your torso in the river, yeah. And I, I was on that case, um, you know, the Adam body. Um, so these are all subjects we're going to get to. Yeah, yeah. Just, just let me tell the audience then. So we've got a, a whole list of subjects we're going to cover today. We have your questions. I put a video up asking for questions for John, and a slew of questions have come in. We're also going to be talking about Prince Andrew and Julian Assange. But just, just a, a little bit more on Wilford. Does he have a trial date? Yeah, a trial date set for the 9th of August um, this year. Uh, he's applying for, he wants people to pray for his bail application. He's had three bail applications turned down. Um, you know, and so he's I, got no bail whatsoever. No bail. So, so he's reminded, you know, they all are reminded. Now, you know, in order for someone to be reminded, they've got a thing called custody time limits in the UK, which are looked at very stringently by the Home Office. So you can't just bang someone up on remand, you know, for up to two years, which used to be the case. You have to justify it. Now, Wil Wilfred isn't a flight risk. You know, they all they have to do is seize his passport and he ain't going anywhere. He's got no previous convictions. He's a man of exceptional good character. You know, and there's plenty of people w which will vouch for his um, his standing in society. So he doesn't understand why they keep refusing it, you know, and they don't have to give a reason why they refuse it either. I mean, the only thing I can think of is the fact that there is a child, which is class of a vulnerable person, involved, you know. Um, Someone mentioned to me today that Wilfred was a barrister, is that correct? Yeah, Wilfred is a trained barrister. Grief. Yeah, yeah, he works as a barrister. He was a lobbyist in Parliament, you know, um, and he's campaigned on many high-profile cases involving satanic ritual abuse. You know, he, he's an exceptional individual, you know, and his commitment um, to, to getting the truth out and exposing satanic ritual abuse is second to none, you know. So he's, really pled, he's pled not guilty. Does that mean then that he is going to go up and have a trial and explain his side of the story? Yeah, yeah, you know. So, I mean, what I said to Wilfred is I said, you know, whatever way it pans out, this is time served. And... Um, there's all this scaremongering that's been going out that, that like I said, that Wilfred's been castrated, that, you know, it's a violent prison and all that. Well, prison's prison, you know. Uh, I mean, it's um, a category, lower category, category C prison, but it's, I think it might have B prisons in there as well. But it, it's got a catchment area of a lot of poverty. So you've got North Wales, uh, Merseyside. My area. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, Wigan and all them areas. Yeah. So it's, it, there is a lot of poverty in that in that you know part of the world but he said he's getting on well he's he's interacting with other prisoners they've watched um the guards were watching your video with him the other night and he said they came <laughs> and uh gave him the thumbs up he said there's inmates in here that have seen his work online 
So he's known in there as being a person who is against child abuse. You know, so really whatever the media's put out there has made no difference. And whatever the trolls have put out there has made no difference. Because, you know, as we've mentioned in before, statistically on the lower category prisons, on the under 25s, 80% come from abusive childhood backgrounds. So there's, a, you know, a lot of people in there that w were warm to what he stands for. You know, so it's... Um, but it's he said, it seems there's a common theme whereby people uh, are exposing child abuse get accused of it at all, some point. All the time. Well, you know, what what's happened, if, if I sort of bring it back to my situation at the moment, now I've gone off the radar and there's people saying that John Wedges worked for MI5. Like I said... I am all all these things about. Uh, I am trolled. No, Brian Harvey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, no one... I don't think David Icke gets trolled as much as me. You know, I, I could actually give a talk at the Oxford Union on trolling, being a victim of trolling, online bullying. I mean, but do you know, the really, really strange thing about trolling, it, it's vexatious, it's nasty. They're twisted people and they are twisted people. They're, and they're sneaky. They're sneaky, devious, you know, and I want to go on a few of things that they've done. But really, the way to combat it, you turn them off. Because the second you yeah. acknowledge them, you arm them. You engage, them. yep. And I've learned that now, and I've got the yeah. strength of wild men yeah. keeping, keeping this troll shield in front of me so that yeah. we can keep those bastards at bay. Oh, oh they, I mean, they were, they were because I was asked to give evidence at uh, the ICSA government inquiry. They contacted the solicitors there. The police had to get involved with that because it was classed as witness intimidation. So the police did actually get hold of one of the trolls and went around and spoke to a well-known nutcase, to be honest. And they actually come back and they said, John, she's, she's a Fruit Loop. And I went, yeah, yeah, I know. You know, and they actually said to me, do you want us to nick her? And I said, no, just just tell her to pack it in, right? And the barrister for um, for Ixa, he, you know, he gave a statement as well. And um, they went around there and they said, it was a waste of time even talking to her. She, she was absolutely mad, you know. Um, They're good for views, though. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> thanks, mean, thanks, well, troll. they will, they'll keep the views up. I mean, I was... I was doing food parcels. Um, they 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 contacted the people supplying the food. Um, they've they've reported me to, to the fraud office. They've contacted everyone from my past life, ranging from Sammy the Bull to my prosecutor. Oh, it's unreal, isn't it? It's insane. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they've done it to me. It's it's just people are ringing me up saying, "Look, I had someone contact me," and you know, uh, one one of them, it was it was it was a fellow. Again, I can't go on about it, but. Um, he told me I had to get medicated. And because I wouldn't get medicated, he, he, he went against me and he started trolling me. And then went and got an injunction out. And I just said, to him, well, what's, it's just, it's madness after madness after madness. You know, and, and when, when you look at the pattern of them, a lot of them are medicated. You know, a lot of them are crazy. None of them work. Um, they're all experts at rolling fags, aren't they? Whenever you see them, they're always rolling, doing a roll up in their front room, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's screamed. They've always got a heap of facts as well, haven't they? You know, <laughs> look at the facts. And, and as soon as you get, you debunk those facts, they just move on to a new set of baloney. Yeah. And then they start on each other. All my trolls are battling each other right now. Yeah, you know, it is. It's like gladiator school, isn't it? They just, <laughs> and, and, and a lot of them have got the ump because I've, I've turned off social media. And it's just all gone quiet. They're like, well, what do we do now? John Wedger's gone. What do we do? <laughs> you know, I, I become the emotional dartboard for every Fruit Loop nutcase and everything else going. And the things I've been accused of are absolutely <laughs> incredulous. And, you know, I mean, I've been, they've reported me to the police, to the fraud office, to the Inland Revenue. And I think what happens is when these investigating teams and ombudsmen look at them, they, I think they speak to them once and then they go, oh my God, that, that ain't. And, and funny enough, the, the police rang me once and they said, um, you know, John, we've looked at your work. You, you bang on. And there's a lot of lads that, that follow you. And the Met Police even said, you know, um, you, you've got a lot of respect still here, you know. And they said, people have been saying this. He said, it's gone in the bin. It's just gone in the bin. And it's, <laughs> it, I mean, I had um, last year, uh, we were planning a really big demonstration. And it was, it was really good, actually. It really sort of was... Uh, gelling a lot of people together, people coming from all sorts. We had biker gangs, we had ex-criminals, we had the Sikhs, we we had Muslim boys were coming along, uh, the football lines, and it, it was a real sort of a, amalgam of everything. And um, the police rang up and they said to me, it was the public order team that deal with the, the riots and everything. And it was a sergeant, he said, John, look, um, got to tell you, you got to pull it because the COVID laws had just come in. 
then he said you're going to be smack bang in this more than three people thing and the last thing we want to do is arrest you you know we like you you're honorable he said there's a few lads here that still remember you he said one our inspector here remembers you and you know we don't want that that's what we don't want to do and i said well what do you want from me and they went well please can you ask people to stand down and i said i'll tell you what i'll do i'll do it now as we're talking i'll put it on i'll, I'll cancel it now but not not that i was doing their bidding not at all and you know if anyone's got a gripe with the met police it's me because of what i've been through with them but these lads and lasses they you know they were doing their job and you know we've got to keep a balance here so i cancelled it straight away um but subsequently i have been um giving speeches at these mass demonstrations you know a lot of them are sort of like the anti-lockdown stuff and they've mixed up with um child abuse issues and all that so when it comes to the other things, I, I, it's not really my argument. I'm not, it's all human I'm, rights, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but when when it comes down to child abuse, I'm I'm asked to speak, um, and I I will give a talk. But when I once I've given a talk, I'm out there, you know. And you see the police lining up, you know. I had someone saying, "Look, stay, stay, stay." I said, "No, no, no, no. They're, they're ready to go, you know." And I always say to people, "Look, the police are like wasps. You go near them, they're going to sting you, and that's that. You know, don't agitate them." You know, let them do their job. But, and the problem is, you see on these videos, people are going up and they're agitating them. They're agitating them. You think, you know, you're going to get it in a minute, mate. And, you know, with, with the public order, you, you've got the the normal coppers that get brought on on what they call an aid requirement. And then they've got the territorial support group. Now, these are guys and girls. A lot of them come out of the military. we got a lot of ex Royal Marines and, and, and squaddies and paratroopers and all that. You know, they're tough. And then they, all they do all day is they, they train and they train in public order, you know. So your average copper might be able to give you a good whack with a baton. But these guys and girls, they know how to do it properly, you know. And you don't want them. That's their job. Right or wrong, that's what it is, you know. And I don't want to be clumped by one of them and I don't want to spend my, my night in the cells, you know. So I would always. But it came to a point where I, I, I couldn't walk down the street without someone stopping. Lorries would stop and say, John, Major, I love your work. You know, I'll, I'll go out amongst the crowd. So if we gauge on what the trolls are saying, that John Wedger works for MI5 and John Wedger's doing this and he's, you know, uh, selling information, trafficking kids, and all, all sorts of, you know, crazy, crazy stuff. But when I go on the street. Now, these trolls don't go on the street. I go on the street. They're too cowardly. Oh, they are cowards. They're, they're total cowards. I will go on the street and, you know, in amongst every community there is. I honestly, I could not walk more than five meters without someone putting their hands around me and saying, "Well done, keep going." And one of the most touching moments was um, at one of the demos. Um, a homeless guy, Rasta, come up to me. He goes, "I know you, man." And he went, "Can I have a hug?" I went, "Yeah, of course." So he gives me a hug, and uh, and then he says, "Yeah, that's enough of that. Let go of him." So he lets go. And, and where's that come from? It's a copper. He went, "My turn now." And he come and give me a hug as well. He went, "I love your work, John." I love your work. He said, you've got a lot of support. So w when it comes to achieving what I set out, my mission was to give a voice to the voiceless, expose the cover-ups, and and then the SRA thing sort of pretty much took on a 50-50 role and, and, and speak about satanic abuse. I did that and some, you know. Last year, um, no, this year actually, I mean, bear in mind my podcasting was at its minimum this year. I got two million uh, YouTube hits at the height of my I wouldn't say popularity because I don't want to go down the ego route or anything no, the height of my, I don't know what it was the success of the campaign what's your YouTube channel called these days John? Uh, I think John Wedger just John Wedger or John all Wedger of John's Foundation. links are going to be below yeah. this video in the description box I, I mean I don't post on it or anything like that uh, anymore I mean there is a guy that does do bits for me and there's another girl that, that will update my website periodically but I've got no interest in it Facebook it's a no no but Facebook I was getting a million views a month. You know, I was up to 45,000 subscribers on YouTube. You know, it, it really was moving to such big proportions. So when you come into success, I achieved what I set out to achieve, you know, and then the government asking me now to advise. So I got asked to give evidence at the independent inquiry, which I did, and I got global publicity for that. And now the government are looking at getting me in as an advisory capacity, which, which it'd be brilliant because if I can get in to training academies, I can tell them, you know, 
you know, exactly what they did with the race riots. So they were getting community leaders into training academies for the police and everything else and, and saying, yeah, this is what you do. And if they can do it with me, um, because it, it was quite apparent that what, what I put out in my statement was corroborated by near enough every single other core participant said the same thing. You know, the, the child abuse, especially the trafficking of children, is, is, is working with impunity in plain sight and nothing is being done to curtail it. Even the Crown Prosecution Service uh, even mentioned John Wedge's right. You know, so I'm not blowing smoke up my own ass at all because it's one of the things you have to you have to you have to keep in check your own ego and and everything else. But it, it was getting to a point where I was actually I gave a speech at Trafalgar Square, and you know there was quite a few high profile speakers there, and I felt a bit sick, and I just thought I I, I shouldn't be having people clapping me like this. Do you know what I mean? I'm no one's hero. I'm not. All I was was a person that wanted to speak the truth. And then I walked away from that. And then the, all the team started arguing. There was there was money being filtered off. Um, I was being reported to every single agency or whatever for, for just doing good. And and it really was, you know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And it was like God saying, out now, out now. I've had you in the trenches, son. Time to go out. But what is, what is good about it, Sean, because a lot of people saying, what's happened to John Wedger? And I said, look, I'm still here. But I'm still doing stuff. I'm going on the more professional podcasts um I'm, I'm still linked in with one of the survivor groups um you know and again i'm not going to name names because then they get attacked as well so you know i don't tend to do it anymore chris lambriano i still do a lot with chris you know um and bill maloney so the people i started out with i'm still there and kareen hutzabar we're still there but kareen she warned me now bear in mind kareen is, is in the top 10 of criminal profilers in the world. You know, this woman is of such high esteem and, and she's quite good because we, we, we talk about the trolls, you know, and, and she will identify their personalities for me. She went, this one's this, this is one of them. So it's really, because she, she'll see the videos and she'll give me a rundown on their personality disorders. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's good in that respect as well because it's not just me being paranoid. So no, 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 you're dealing with this. We've had Kareen on the channel a few times. If you want to check those videos out, Kareen, C A R I N E, what's about? I won't spell that one, but you'll find it somehow. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but Kareen rang me up and she said, What did I tell you at the beginning? I said, Work like a submarine. You only come up for a bit of air and then boom, back down again. And she said, And work on your own. And she said, I warned you. And she said something really interesting. She said, Your foundation um, had, it was my facial image. She said, I warned you about that because that's idolatry. Now, people are going to idolize you for what you're doing and because your image and then they're going to have this thing that you are some sort of demigod and that you're going to save this and save that. And of course, you're not. You're a human being, not everyone else. And the moment you disillusion them, they'll go from your best friend to your worst enemy. And that's exactly what happens. So one minute you'll get someone, yeah, yeah, I'm with Johnny, I'm with Johnny. The next minute, he's went for MI5, he's this, he's that. And you saw it. Yeah, I had this discussion with Ron Swanson, who exposes things on the dark web. And he said that when you build up a following on social media, there's always a percent of those followers who are toxic. Yeah, yeah. And they will do exactly what you just yeah, described. Yeah, They're yeah. Re ready for you to just yeah. to stab you in the back at the yeah. slightest little thing. And, and, and they will micromanage you. They, they will go through the minutiae of everything you say. I mean, I had one uh, individual that um, I, I left the police with, with a pension of 27 and a half years service. My actual service was, was just over 25 years. Um, so then... This individual was saying, well, look, he's lying about his service. He's lying about his service. You know, and so, and then the other thing, which was really interesting, and I, I did an interview with, with a lovely guy called Joey Barnett the other week, and I said, Joey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you now verbatim what I said on another podcast, and this is how it got turned. So I said, I think that what they should do, and I, I probably mentioned it on, on one of our podcasts, Sean, is that the world should be shown a child porn video. And the reason for that is this, right? It will show the sheer horrors and the sheer gravity. It's a bit like how do you get people to change f from uh, from how animals are slaughtered? You show them how they used to slaughter animals, and people are like, "Oh my god!" And again, and I, I started off by saying I am not advocating the viewing of child pornography at all. No way. It's appalling, and it should. And, and I, 
if I had my own way, I would eradicate porn, straight porn, normal porn, whatever they call it, because I think it's destroying our society. But when, as part of my job as as a child abuse investigator, that's what's one of our disciplines. You have to view it. It's incredibly disturbing. And and I, I gave an example of when I was in court, and there was one image um, that there was thousands, thousands of images, but one that all stood on my mind. It was like an altar. And I think it actually was an altar. And there was a priest or someone dressed in priest garb, but I think it was a priest. And there was um, an infant, and I mean an infant, being not just raped, but tortured. You can't, you know. Was these photos or a video? These were photos. You know, there was videos as well, but there were thousands of them. And um, and it, it really hit me, this, and it really shook me, that, you know, and certain things, you can't unpick them. They're in your head. They're etched into it. Even my head right now is thinking... That can't happen. That can't be. But but what was worse was the guy that was that, that I nicked for it. He come out with it, like all paedophiles do. They come out. Thank God you stopped me, and you know I really needed stopping. It was getting a thing, and I'd only look at one, then I'd be disgusted with myself. But that's a lie, you know. You know this is how groomers work. It's all they nicely, nicely. But the reality is they're monsters. And uh, the reality is once it went off to the laboratory and the report come back. Yeah, at a few extent, not only was this guy viewing it, he was sending it out, but he was sending it out with comments. And the comment he put under this pitch was, "She's really getting it. She loves it." Oh so this is God. what this put. So this is what this now. Now this is why I say about people should see some of the things that I've seen. And it's a bit like war. You know, the Second World War film. It's all death or glory. Then we got the Vietnam War films, and people really started seeing what war was. It was absolutely horrific. You know, and it isn't what was portrayed in our black and white Richard Burton films and everything else. So the, these, uh, there was a legal argument. I won't go into it because it's a bit dull. But um, there was a legal argument going on between the barrister, their barrister, our barrister and the judge regarding the way that I'd um, categorised, you know, these these images because it's between a level one and level five. Five, you possession of one level five image, you're going to prison. This bloke had thousands, you know. And... Um, Anyway, so this argument went on and on and on. And in the end, the judge said, I'll be the adjudicator of this. I'll be the, the, the arbiter of this one. He said, officer, can you bring me the laptop? So I brought the laptop up to his bench. We sat on his bench. So I'll go up, open this laptop. And he said, if I have to look at one image, I will look at all of the images. Right. So if you're disputing this, this officer's ability to categorize, I'll be the judge. I need to see all of them. So he said, just pull it on a slow scroll. So it's going through a slow scroll. And we suddenly seen this image. And he's gone like that. He went, stop, go back, go back. I knew exactly which one. And he clicked. He said, click on it, enlarge it. So, and his face, you could see the, the blood just draining from him. And he looked at me and he went, is that genuine? I said, I don't know. But it, I, we've tried to enhance it to look at the... Because you'd look at things like plug sockets to determine the location and paint types and all that, so, you know. Um, I said, we we have been trying to look into determine if it's a church in the UK, if it's a church board, or if it is a church or a studio, so we don't know. But the fact of the matter is, the victim is the victim, and this is a man doing this. And uh, and then he went, there's comments. I went, yeah, so he read it. He went, who put them? And I went, he did. And this judge, he then picked up this pot. It was a pot of pens. And he picked up, he stood up, and he just chucked it. And he lobbed it at the defendant, and it, it smashed on the glass. All the pens went everywhere. It was one of them little plastic things. And he, he he lost it. It was a Crown Court judge. It was a Harrow Crown Court list. And if anyone wants to troll me on this one, I can even give you the defendant's name on this one. And it smashed on the glass. And he shouted out, take that bastard down, right? Wow. And as he went down, he went, 10 years. 10 years. It, it got reduced on the pill because it was far, oh. you know. <laughs> came into, but you. Th this was my example I was giving to Joey when he was doing the interview with me that the reality hit him. This what, is what was that picture that caused him to snap? The the one with the priest, ah, and the young, you know, because gotcha. it was so, it was just so horrific. But it brought the reality home to him. But also the comments that this is a man claiming that that he's a victim. They always claim that they're a victim, you know, and all of a sudden we're we're now in his world. In, inside this bloke's head which is where you need to get sometimes and this is what if you was to show it this is what we get anyway so i fully explained 
the preamble to Joey, the reasons, my rationale, and then the after effects of it, okay? And the reason for doing it. And the reason I would say doing it is because it would change criminal justice and sentencing guidelines in, an, in a heartbeat. And it would give more sympathy to victims and survivors of abuse, without a doubt, right? Well, what was the backlash from trolls? John Wedger, and they, again, taking like Harvey's done with your your voice and sound, but you know, Effin John Wedger, <laughs> Effin Ian Paddock, Effin <laughs> Sean Atwood, they all work for the New World Order. Yeah, yeah. well, the New World Order and MI Five, they must own more employees, and I hope they've got good like recreation facilities, you know, <laughs> and a social club and things like that. We can have. I a wish all my trolls yeah. made songs about me. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> So, so, but then these trolls put on John Wedge's advocating child porn. Look at them; he wants it, and this is how they turn it and turn, they turn everything, everything around, everything and, around. And, and this is why now, when when you look at um, seasoned interviewers and interviewees, that they, they, they've got it off pat. They now allegedly, and or they'll do this because they know people like Piers Morgan. They know exactly what they're going to face, you know, post event. But so so that was it come to a crescendo with me where it was all in fighting. There was a lot of mental health problems going on. There was people with agendas. Um, and I just thought, no. Nope. And I, I literally turned off. Now, I feel sorry for for the innocent ones that got caught up in all this that generally wanted me to carry on and needed me to carry on. But, you know, what I'll say to them is that I did what I had to do. It now has to go to a more professional level. And my doors were wide open. So I was basically, I was just a conduit for any, any, you know, anyone that had a gripe, had a problem with the police, had a problem with anything, let's go and chuck an emotional dart at John Wedger, he'll take it. And you know, and I always kept smiling, always kept going on the street. But the gauge, how I left it, the gauge I left it was that I walked down the street, a busy London road, you know, in the middle of a protest, I would be hugged every five metres. I had one absolute moronic idiot shout some abuse and that was it in all the years i've been doing it um and and that's it so so basically you know when it comes to that you know i i think i successfully achieved what i had to achieve and it's the time to take elevate this to to a more professional level which is which is what i'm doing but those i started off with i'm still doing what i'm doing but you know facebook has totally and utterly gone now but um it's um and it's a change in times as well because we are seeing people getting arrested you know um i always knew that that would happen arrested you know? for what um contempt of court you know we, we saw jeanette's been arrested for contempt, contempt of court um, oh yeah yeah should we go over to jeanette archer um because that after wilfred the questions coming in are all about jeanette so my understanding and please correct me is that she was arrested here in guildford and there are rumours that she may have named allegedly people that the uh, what's it called the family court didn't want her to name. Yeah, I don't, I, know, if, I don't I, know if any of that's true. I mean, going from the limited amount that I know, I would say that, um, and I haven't spoke to Jeanette over this, and but I spoke to a friend. I would say, and I said to a friend, if she's named a child, then then, then that's contempt of court. And I straight away said because no one knew why she'd been arrested. I said it will be contempt of court, in my opinion. If it's an ongoing thing and there's a child, you can't name the kid, you know, and that's that. Boom. Unless, you know, they waver their anonymity, that child, I think, was eight years old. It's beyond the age of criminal responsibility anyway. It's beneath the age of responsibility for the family court. So the kid can't acquiesce to anything. Um, so to name the court was a no-no. And uh, to be honest, to even talk about that case you, you know, you, you really have to be switched on and tuned on because you, you're, you're going to end up in a world of trouble. Now, I know that, that my site was heavily monitored by the Metropolitan Police because they told me. I, I got a phone call from the security services and again, they told me as well, you know, that they'd monitored not only uh, that but also my phone calls. Um, now, security services were, were really good to me because what, all, what they said to me was do not delve into politics. And the only time that I ever really sort of Got, what, what's your interpretation of that? Um, I think it's because I may be influential. What do, what do they mean? What what do they actually not you want? What you <laughs> what do they not want you to do? I, I think take take a political opinion and voice that political opinion and maybe set up a button. So if we look at and this is one thing that that got me shut down off social media 
for for a period of time um i did a podcast and i was in i think i was in suffolk or somewhere i was going to be giving a talk uh, a a a military place they'd asked me to go in their social club and, and give a talk about the work i did so um and what happened was there'd been there'd been a, a news coverage about tommy robinson being at a center parks in woburn in bedfordshire with his his little children i don't know the age of his kids and he'd been arrested for assault and what looks like what's happened is that his little girl has gone into a, a, a bathing area a swimming pool you know thing uh, I don't know how old his kid was. I think she may be 10 or something like that. Anyway, she's a little kid. And there's these three men there um, who apparently had been booted out of a centre parks before. I'm not too sure. But they'd, um, she'd been sexually assaulted. She'd been groped. They'd groped her, her bum, her bottom. And she'd gone home and back and told her dad. So he's gone down there like you know, a raging bull. And I think he's accosted them. I think there, there was an admission. Um, and he's done a citizen's arrest. Uh, but I think in the whole sort of process, one of them's, you know, accidentally tripped and hit every step on the way down, which, you know, <laughs> these things happen, like I said. And and then the police come, and of course he, he records everything, and the police come, and he's given his account, and he gets arrested. Now, and he's actually put out a little video thanking me for, for what I did, because um, he said it, it, it helped overturn the police's decision. Um, again, I'm not advocating the politics of Tommy Robinson, and he's aware of that, you know, and 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 that's how it is, each to their own. Um, but what what incensed me was that this little girl had been sexually assaulted, which clearly looks like a group of paedophiles. And just with my experience of my copper's nose, I think that these blokes that is their thing, that they they've done it before, and it turns out I may well have been right. And I just thought, well, well, what about the evidential losses here? They, they, they will be perverts sending images to each other. They may well have their phones in their locker room, and they've gone and, and snooped in locker rooms and, and everything else. I'm thinking, there, there is a whole wealth of evidential opportunities here, and the police have pissed them away by by nicking the low hanging fruit, and actually himself being a victim of crime because he's a witness to this crime. So I thought, in the spirit of fairness. I'm not happy with this, so I thought I would start up a little campaign in which people write to not just the Chief Constable of Bedfordshire Police, but also the Crime Commissioner and the appointed um, MP for Policing and, and, and Crime. And to get this matter looked at, because these officers, have, have not only have they acted in a very judgmental way, that you know they've, they have acted with fear and they have acted with favour, they've put other children at risk. Because these men, in my opinion, were very, very proactive paedophiles. So I got very incensed by this, you know. And again, I've got no political opinion on what he does. I don't want to make that clear because I can see how this is going to go. John Major's now promoting the works of Tommy Robinson and all this sort of stuff. But it wouldn't matter to me. It wouldn't matter if he was an Islamic extremist. I would still take the same stance because that's the sort of person I am. And, and I just thought, this is wrong. If this is the benchmark of policing today, this needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed now at the highest level because making a complaint to their inspector is just going to get a load of nonsense back, which is exactly what happened. But there was a letter writing campaign and the police did end up overturning what they did and went and arrested the people. They didn't search their premises. They lost a lot of evidence, but apparently they did get prosecuted, which I thought well done. And, and he actually did say a thank you on, on, on some YouTube channel. And I just thought, well, job well done. And that little podcast lasted eight minutes and I got 40,000 instant views, right? Which was quite incredible, you know? And I think I was running that. So when you podcast, if you run about 200 hits um, instantly as, you, as you're doing it, you're going to get 10,000 hits by the time you finish. But I was, I was sometimes I was running at 2,000, you know, if I did something. Um but then the next thing, I, I'd violated broadcasting standards. And um, and I thought, well, how? How have I, what have I done any different? And and all it was, was the, the fact is I mentioned his name. So this shows how much that this is this is monitored and how unfair the system is. So when it gets back to what you were saying, Sean, about um, MI6 going on to me about um, political um, 
uh, intervention and all that or, or affiliation because maybe I'm an influencer, you know, and, and I have some sort of standing and it could then cause a bit of a, a problem. Um, and, you know, they said, you're okay, just stay away from politics. So, so getting people to write letters in and things like that, campaigns, uh, were it's to the attention of powerful people that's what they want you to stay away from yeah yeah and and what happened then it, it was quite odd because then i get invited down to cornwall um a little town outside of st Austell, and i go down and I, I meet a guy in a pub in in the back and uh i, I want to actually say his name because he's got quite quite uh, he's changed his name and uh, but I won't do it. I, I, I won't. The guy's not very well at the moment. But um, he said, I like you. you you're, you're a good kid, you know. And he said, I want you to know a bit about my background. And he was um, ex-infantry officer with the British Army. Um, and then he went on to become a, um, a specialist. He went into the, basically the SAS, as it were. You know, and he started wanting to talk to me about um, contract killings, how contract killings work when they're politically motivated and they're government sanctioned. And I went, okay. And, and he said, now you're at risk because of what you're doing. And he said, more so now that you're, deep, you're talking out about the satanic stuff, which very much dovetails into what Wilfred said. And he had with him a little bottle of water. And he said, I've never done a, a, a killing um, on the UK soil. He said, I did one in Ireland, but we, we class that as enemy territory, not as, as sovereign soil, as it were. And he said, um, I've done them in Hong Kong and, and other places, right? I know guys that have come over and they've done similar stuff, right? And he said, um, it's business, you know, and that's how you see it. And, and he said, you're talking about guys that are, are totally desensitized. And he said, borderline psychopaths, really. They, they, that's what they do, you know. And I, and I worked with a guy, and he's a lovely guy. I'd never denigrate him. And he was in the Special Boat Squadron uh, for many years. And um, he said the same when it comes to killing. He said, you put it back in your mind, it stays there, you leave it. And that's that. It's just business. So he, he got a bottle of water. He said, what you do is you get um, a little pistol. And he said, I'll make out I'm drinking. He said, I'd see you. I walk up to you, and I'd bring the pistol up, the bottle of water, I'd bang. And I'd fire the bullet through. It would silence it. The water would silence the round. And it goes straight in your head. And there'll be a load of water everywhere. And he said, and I just double back and I go into the crowd and you fall over and that's it. And he said, and then we'll, I'll be extracted out of it. And that's how it works. And, you know, you know so it was, um, it, it, it brought it home to me, you know, the, the fact that there was a real and serious risk in, in what I was doing. Uh, I mean, the more obvious risk would be from the contempt of court issues. So having had a grounding, you know, in the, the criminal justice system, I was pretty much aware of where I could or couldn't go, you know. Uh, but, you know, there, there's, there's been some shocking things. I mean, one guy I did a podcast with, he got in touch with me and, and, and said that someone wanted my CCTV footage. And it was someone I knew, you know. Uh, of your um of your car, so they could get my car index and pass it on to to a um a, a private investigating firm, and that's what they were going to do, you know. And and you armed with that, then they they could then and my address is easy to find anyway, you know. And people have put my address online, um. But it was all stupid things like that, and I thought, for what? What have I done? I've exposed child abuse and the cover ups of it. And it's like someone said to me, you know, Johnny, you'll get attacked by paedophiles and their protectors. And so to a, to a more or less degree, I'm not call, calling a lot of the trolls paedophiles, but there are going to be an element of the people that have attacked me, specifically me, that are active paedophiles and and they're involved with paedophilia and they're active Satanists and there will be. I mean, Wilfred Wong finds it quite amusing that I get attacked because he said, if you upset a Satanist, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Carry on upsetting them. Carry on. <laughs> he wants me to keep getting attacked and trolled because he says you're doing your job. <laughs> and what was nice was a guy um, contacted me from America who's a well-known podcaster and speaks about the demonic. And he turned around and he said to me, you know, you, you're probably one of the premier ones globally that are speaking out on the subject. Um, there's a film called um, Deliver Us From Evil in which Eric Banner plays a detective, New York detective, and it's based on a true story who, who deals with demonic crimes, you know, and he works with a priest. Uh, this guy's called Ralph Sarchi. He's um, uh, a former detective sergeant, and he got in touch with me, and he just said, 
love your work. Love what you're doing. <laughs> you know, and I even had Frank Serpico um, get in touch with me and I go to speak with Frank Serpico about it. So, you, you know, it has gone everywhere and it is the likes of yourself and many others that, that have had it on that spreads the word. Uh, so I have to, I had to then balance it that, that how much of it was negative, how much was positive. And I would say um, 90% of it, maybe more was positive. And I do apologize to shut myself off because there were people were emailing me and I become a bit of a lifeline to them, you know, and they were devastated when I, you know, absolutely were broken when I walked away. Um, but I, like I said, I've not walked away. I've just had to change my game plan and really protect myself as well and get a balance back into my life because there was no balance. So, um, on a recent interview, Sonia Poulton said that there was black ops level activity among the range of the trolling, preventing, trying to prevent her from getting her information out. Is that what you, do you well, feel uh, that as well? Uh, Sonia called me the other day, right? And she said, um, oh, oh, I forget what it, how, how it started. So I said, Sonia, every, how are you? I've been heard you from age because I know Sonia. She went, well, I was going to say the same, John, but I, I need to discuss something with you. And I went, what? Someone had, had got a hold of my email, right? Got into my email and was emailing, using me um, to her, just saying, we, we've got unseen footage of you. We've got this with you. And not making out was coming from me, you know? And she, she said, you sent me. I said, Sonia, I haven't sent you anything. I said, I'll look at my account now. They've used a remote account with my email and they've been emailing Sonia, making out there me and, and, and hacked into it all. That's what they're doing. They're yep. set, people are setting up accounts in my name. People are being accused of taking people's channels down, taking people's Instagrams down. And I'm not doing any of this stuff. They're, they're setting up accounts in my name. Yeah. And then when the trolls, when I like, I've done a, like a copyright strike or something on the trolls, then they get all your information. So they could take the information and strike other people down with your information to make it look like it, yeah. it's you. Yeah. That's how sneaky they yeah. are. Yeah, it's, uh, but for people watching this, please support Sonia's brilliant work on YouTube and on, on, on BNT. Um, she is at the forefront of an information revolution. And I absolutely, you know, we, we all need to be behind each other right now against and unified against these enemies who are trying to keep us all separate and trying to play us off. So we're battling each other. We're not going to battle each other because we're all solid people. No Sonia for a while, no John for a while, and nothing has changed between us yep. since day one. We, we're not the backstabbing type, and we're not going to fall into these and, traps and, by the trolls. And, and, and oh, th this is one of the things. The ones I started with, they're still there. So all of them, like I said, like Sonia I've known for years, Bill Maloney, Chris Lambiano, yourself, and, and, and so many others, we're all still there. We've not changed. It, it's only a few have come in the intermin period, cause absolute chaos. You know, like a whirlwind, like a, you know, Tasmanian devil smashed everything up, and then they've left off, and then they turn around. I mean, one person was come on board, and then got all the information, was given it to to a private detective agency and and, and to, to a trolling group. You know, and I think how spiteful. And some of that information involved my children. Now, I don't care what they say about me. But, you know, there's a line, you know, and that's where, you know, if my kids are mentioned, I will go to the police and, that, and I'll do that in a heartbeat. I don't want to grass anyone up. But if, if the moment they're, they're caught up in this, then that's that. You, you can have it back. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it's it's very, very bizarre, you know. So I've, I've had the other thing, I, I, I did a walk. So I've, I have walked hundreds, I'm just short of a thousand miles with my dog, length and breadth of the UK, right? I've cycled hundreds of miles on a crappy old bike for charity. I swam round the Isles of Scilly, nearly 20 odd miles around the most treacherous waters in the Atlantic, you know, to raise money, right? And I've raised thousands and thousands and thousands for charity, but also I've raised money for my campaigning. Now, because um, when you do a GoFundMe, it gives the, the, the amount, a large percentage goes to charity and the rest, you need it to carry on doing what you're doing, which is... But then, of course, no, they're not happy with that. They're saying, well, John, we just nicked all this money and he's nicked. So. The thing about this, John, is it's not the donors who are not happy with it. No. It is trolls pretending to be concerned citizens yeah, yeah. that contact GoFundMe. So GoFundMe needs to have something in place whereby the only people who can complain about giving that you having that money yeah, are yeah. the people who gave the money in the first yeah. place. 
Oh, I learned that because a few years ago, my first podcast guest was Jamie Morgan Cain. Some controversy arose around him. And as soon as that controversy arose, I bowed down and refunded all of the GoFundMes. Yep. And the people were like, why are you refunding this? We support him anyway. We don't believe this bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, all right, I just to be clean out of this situation, I just need to refund the whole thing. But I learned from that lesson never ever to do that because it's the evil of the trolls that's putting in the complaints. It's not the donors. No, no, it's not. Well, well, there was one troll put some money in, and I made sure he got his money back yes. because he did that on purpose. And he, he's a very, and he's a very strange individual. And it turns out that that he's he's been investigated for harassing women, sexually harassing women in the past. So, you know, and there was another guy that was attacking me, and and, and he, he was, I think, he was convicted for two rapes. So there, there's always another element around it. Well, I, I had a GoFundMe this year that I raised for a victim, and um, the trolls absolutely just hammered GoFundMe. Yeah. So it said I was it was a fraud. Yeah. I, I was that. using the money to get high and traffic yeah. women. Yeah. GoFundMe investigated the whole thing. I sent all of my bank information in to show exactly where the money had gone. And they said, you're completely exonerated, nothing done. But for months and months and months, that's what the trolls are running with. Atwood spent this on podcast equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Atwood's trafficking women and spending it on cocaine. And it just went on and on and on and on and on. But not one of the donors no, yeah. complained. Yeah, I know. I mean, I had this- They're still I, offering to give money to that person to this day. I, I they, still, they still are to an extent in some ways. Well, I walked from Parliament Square all the way to Rainbow Woods in Bristol, which is the place where Darren Jeffries had all the organised abuse on him, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, a lovely guy, Darren. What is that, Rainbow Woods? That was- It's in Bristol, yeah. In Bristol? Bristol. Uh, well, Bath, you know? Oh, I'll never forget that story. If yeah. you haven't seen Darren Jeffries' podcast with us, check that out. So so we sort of did that because he's a very, very powerful story and he's such a good guy, you know? So what I said um, to, to my mate Dylan, he's an ex-paratrooper, big Dylan. He's, I don't know, he's about six foot seven, big, strong lad. So he, he come, always comes with me and we take the little dog, Millie, and we'll walk, we'll walk all the way along the, the river, Thames, along the, the canals and we'll get there. So we set up and I started, I thought I'll try and get five grand anyway. Bam. Within, I think, a couple of days, I was on my way to near enough getting the five grand. Now, that was for my campaign, and that was for Terry Ellis, who you've had on here, you know, the ex-criminal uh, gangster, whatever you call him, Terry Ellis, and Brian Cockrell, you know, th these good guys that have put life of crime on one side and, and are helping kids that are caught up in knife crime. So they can get that, right? Um, so someone else then set up another Facebook page identical to mine, and started filtering money off there. And then the trolls did exactly what they did to you. But the problem I had with GoFundMe was that people steamed into the manager of GoFundMe, who, who, this woman who said, I'll look into it. She was obviously getting her ear bent by some perverse troll. So she corresponded with me. So I got a name and I put her name out on social media. If you've got a problem, let this woman know that you're genuinely giving it for the right reasons because John, we're just doing it. And, and again, sent her all the bits and pieces. Well, I think a few of them hammered her, to be honest, and I think she got absolutely mullered. And it become, it didn't become professional, it didn't become personal. So she got very spiteful and said, well, we're shutting it down anyway. Um, so that was it. So, and then the people that you're helping don't get that money and they go back to a bad lifestyle well, well, because of the trolls who say they're saving the person because you're just defrauding the money in the well, first Sean, place. Sean, what, one, one beautiful individual. Insane gave me a thousand pound on their deathbed, right? They were dying. And they said, John, I want you to have a thousand pound for this for this walk, for this charity. Brilliant, right? And of course, money got refunded, but in the interim period, this poor soul died. Mm. So that's gone into probate. So that money never got back. So they, mm. caught, they kept a thousand pound. So who's a real criminal, you know? And so it got to a point, that was where I really was getting the feeling, enough is enough. Um, do you think that these sad loners sat at their computers are seeing you be successful and, and raise money and they're thinking, why haven't I yeah, got a life yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, jealousy. Why can't I just raise money like that? Jealousy. I'm going to spoil this for that person. Yeah, jealousy. And also, without sounding conceited, I'm a good public speaker. You know, I spent my life in Crown Courts talking out, you know, under pressure as well. And, um, you know, and I, I can orotate well and they, they don't like it. You know, like I said, 
you know, I become very successful incredibly quickly, you know, in, in, in what I was doing. And I think jealousy is a major part of it. Um, they are hateful. But when you do see them, they are, they're twisted. And one of them, I rang one up. And one was accusing me of fraud and everything else. And, and, and basically saying, I'm going to have it out with him. So I rang him up. And I said, what's this? You're going to have it out with me? He went, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, all I was going to do was, I, I wanted to meet you to give you some financial advice and do some book work for you. And I said, well, no, you won't. He was accusing me. And just a coward, just a, a, a real twisted, horrible. And after the phone call, he went and called the police and said, John was arrest me. And, and, and this is what they're like. They're, they're weird. They're, they're, they're total weird. And there's a lot of medication issues as well. You know, we, we can't take that away from them. They're, they're heavily medicated, some of them. Um, and there are some damaged people, you know. And, you know, and I, I allow for that. But the vexation, I can't allow for. You know, and if we look, cyberbullying is now a crime. It become a crime on our statute books because people were committing suicide. I mean, there was a story the other day of a, of a young 12-year-old girl who, who was bullied online. She killed herself. And I was actually telling her how to do it. Imagine being a parent of that girl. And all you need to do was turn the thing off. Honestly, the noise stopped the moment I got Facebook. Boom. Facebook is a cesspit. It's a sewer. And it's full of jobbies. It is absolutely madness. <laughs> and Twitter the same. The whole lot. Can, I mean, YouTube is a bit different because it's more for watching videos. But... um if I ever do anything again, it will be pre records Everything I did, Sean, was live. So I was dealing with some people that were very, very traumatized. Some people that were very, very damaged, you know. I didn't know how it was going to go. There was no belt braces and strings. Someone could have just stabbed me. I mean, some of them, I met them like that. I didn't know who they were. I mean, bless him. I think he's brilliant. But Darren, he just turned up one day and went, I'll come and see you do the interview. And I didn't know, and I didn't know how it was going to go with Darren. And Darren's a tough guy, you know, he's a hard man, you know. And, uh, but, but he's a beautiful guy, you know, and you can see that the guy just wanted his story out there. And I, and I, and I love him to bits. But some of them are multiple personalities, you know, um, some of them could have jumped under a train afterwards. Uh, you don't know how it's going to go. You know, I was paying people's um, utility bills because they were in trouble. I was filling their cupboards with food. I was getting them work, paid work. I was getting some of them cash work. This is what I was doing. So when they were saying John was doing this and he leaves people, absolute dire nonsense. You know, one person, I went and landscaped their garden at a cost to me of nearly £2,000. I'd done all the all the, uh, all the things, the, the slabs and everything, and I put pictures online of what I did. You know, so this is, you know, what, what I've done. And it, it just, you you can't do right for doing wrong, you know. You, you just can't do right for doing wrong. And, you know, the sad thing is there's people that genuinely, genuinely love you for what you do. And they, they're quiet and they sit there and they quietly just have admiration and respect for you, you know. And they don't shout and scream. And they're ones that are in so much trouble, you know. But um, it was the, what, this gave me that the police didn't was the satanic ritual abuse. That was the the area where um, I think that um, I was meant to do this because I think that was my raison d'etre. That was my reason for, for for being part of this was to expose this. And and if I can, I'd like to I'd like to show you. I've got a couple of yeah. Documents. Before I go, I've just got one more question yeah. on on the trolling and the threats because so I've had this channel for about thirteen years. It was the first prison channel. And I exclusively started with my story and then interviewing other people about their prison stories. Then we branched out into true crime. So that brought us then into interviewing not just people who've been in prison, but ex-police, yeah, yeah. ex-victims. And then the Epstein story became one of the biggest stories on the oh, channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the trolling has happened with some of the um, ex-prisoners. But once I got into the Epstein case, and once I got into talking to people like you and Sonia, the magnitude of the trolling and the death threats just went completely off the scale. And someone told me that when I first started getting into um, exposing elite abuse and child abuse, that people who do that end up dead. They do. Yeah, and, and and they cited some people who had ended up dead. So 
is it part and parcel of what we are doing and perhaps an, an, an acknowledgement of the success of what we're doing that this trolling and death threatening becomes so diabolical and al almost appears to be like a black ops level of trolling as described by Sonia. Yeah, yeah it, it, this is organized um, on two on two levels. Firstly, you, 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 you've got people that are just mad, bad and sad, okay? Um, and they're sitting indoors and they love to hate. Haters love to hate. Hurt people, hurt people, okay? And they're never happy. If you live next door to them, they'd be a nightmare. And I think even their own kids probably don't talk to them. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, and you just become this, this light that these moths can come bombarding into but on another level there is this organization now they're saying they've got this thing called the 77th brigade now which are, are um a, a, a branch of the intelligence service military intelligence and that there are a, a military unit on the intelligence regiment that's set up specifically for social media you know um so of course i i got the police contact me and I got the intelligence services contact me and, and I also then got an ex um hitman for 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 the you know the ex SAS hitman contact me. So, you know, and he and he was just saying, be careful because you're gonna come into our remit soon. You know, so that obviously is now now I think that's an extreme way to go, um, to, to shoot someone because it's also very high risk, you know? Um, and it's gonna get looked at. But if you can take someone down through social media then, then that's straightforward. So it's, the, it's the character assassination before the physical assassination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I think with me that you know I I think out of all of the podcasters I got the biggest kick in the Jacobs as they say when it comes to trying to attack my character. You know, literally everything, everything. Um, I'm, I, I, the, the key to it is you can't respond to it. You must not respond to it. Don't bite with it because then you engage it. You feed this beast, but it takes your time. And they contact everybody you've ever had any interaction yeah. with throughout your life. For example, they've contacted all of my podcast guests. Yeah. And 99% of my podcast guests have got my back and they've just, you know, contacted me continuously throughout all of this drama. But they do manage to twist the odd one's mind. Okay, and, so and, and, and the, and the, the uh, two channels that were responsible for that recently were live streaming accidentally and expose themselves as complete con artists. They, for, for like um, almost an hour, they didn't realize they were being recorded. Oh, they live streamed yeah. it. Yeah. And they were just laughing about how much money they were going to make, making videos about me and um, mocking guests they had contacted to turn against me, but actually speaking badly then about those people and yeah. what they really thought of them. Just expose themselves as complete charlatans. But... Um, it's like there's a whole spectrum of forces against you, isn't there? Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, like, like mentally ill people, loners, yeah. more organized people, and then black ops level. Uh, and the, it's, it's like this this nexus that you can't quite... F well, 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 with me, it was the SRA. That's when it went to this level, that, and that was it. Bang. You know, and it was, it was really strange because when I was um, whistleblowing in the police, the same pattern occurred. Now, um, I was contacted by a guy called Lenny Harper, and Lenny Harper's a police officer who, who exposed Hope de la Garenne in Jersey, you know, and, and he'd be a lovely guy to have on because he is a lovely guy. And he just said, look, you watch things start happening to you now. You're going to get arrested. You're going to get um, this done to you, this done to you. And he said, the other thing is, your bank account will get shut down. Well, that exactly what happened. And Maggie Oliver said very similar to me as well, you know. Is she going through this, Maggie? Yeah, 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 yeah. She, you know, exactly the same. So everyone, Sonia, yeah, yeah, Maggie, yeah, yeah. everyone yeah. is going through I, I don't know whether she goes through the, the trolling so much at uh, this. I mean, kind of, but, but I'm talking about when we were in the police together because when I was going through it, she she was very good to me, you know, as was Lenny Harper, you know. And they both said that there is an algorithm of bullying. This is what they're going to do. And with the police, what they do is that they, they destroy your character, right? So exactly the same thing. What they do is they start going through... Um, things that are going to get you screwed up and the easiest one is data protection violations now in the police especially detectives you you've got access to a phenomenal amount of intelligence how you disseminate and utilize that intelligence is a point of conjecture right and and it's a judgment call so i could be looking at someone um and i could justify it to myself and i could justify it for the whole overall investigations but i might not be able to justify it to some sort of crime commissioner or intelligence commissioner who says, well, why are you looking at this person, right? 
And when you look at a name, I could put in Sean Atwood, I don't know who's looking at you. But if you're flagged up by the intelligence services or the National Crime Agency, they'll be told, you know. And it's the same as if you ever do a name check on someone who's been in the Special Forces, they get told, right? Um, and, and the civilians don't tend to understand the depth of intrusion. You know, I saw it from the police and some of my work did coincide with intelligence services. So, so all of a sudden, I started getting these um, discipline papers, what they call a 163 form, served on me, right? And it's basically a summons. And it's saying that we're investigating you as an officer for data protection violations because you looked at this information, this, uh, right? And, uh, and also, we're sending it to the CPS. So it's a summons. You're being summoned to court now. So it's the same as being arrested. I end up nine of these things served on me, all told, you know. And so this is what they want to do. And knowing that one of them would stick. And then they look at everything else and they really, really try. And, and so firstly, what they're doing is they want, they want you arrested and then they're going to offer you a deal. So what they'll say to me is, you resign and take a caution. That's it. You don't, you're going to court. And that's prison. I mean, one of them. And th this is this is what they'll do. They um, there was a guy I worked with, um, who was an undercover cop, right? I think you have spoken to him, but he didn't want to come on. So you know, anyway, won't name him. But uh, anyway, so he w was an infiltrator. Uh, and he was brilliant at what he did. But like all undercover cops, he went mad. They they totally, they because they, they've got so many personalities, right? But he was a good friend of mine, and we worked on a lot of good work together, you know, um, mainly drugs work, but he was brilliant. And, and his legend was he'd live as a tramp, right? So he would go, um, it's really strange, and this is one thing, the, um, they, the Welsh police don't use their own officers for undercover work because everyone in Wales knows everyone. So they all know each other, right? So, oh, look, there's, there's Di, there's, you know. So they go on. So they always have to drag in people from elsewhere. So he ended up like in, in, in Wales and places like that as a tramp, and he'd get involved in all sorts of stuff. But he, he was so convincing. He, he got tattoos everywhere. He'd have a little dog with him sometimes, and he would piss himself. He would literally piss himself, and he stank a piss, right? And he always had a little bottle of methadone on him as well. And uh, he lost the plot, he left the police, he went to live in France, and he got lonely, you know, because he was isolated. And the other thing they do is isolate you as well, you see. So he ended up um, totally and utterly isolated, very depressed, point of suicidal. His phone, he didn't have it anymore, but all he knew was that my, I'm um, the only wedger in the police. That's it, there is no other, right? There's no others in, I don't think, in the UK. Um, so if you put in John Wedger, uh, at Met Police. Dot blah blah blah. You're going to get me. So he went into an internet cafe and he said, "Look, I'm, I'm coming to England. Oh, please, please, can we have a meet? Can we have?" And so I emailed him back, and I said, "Yeah, no worries. You're still living as a tramp." He's got, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. You bring the special brew. I'll bring the methadone. We'll have a cocktail." So the next thing, I'm arrested. Right, and they said, "Right, we got you now." I went, well, what do you mean? And they said, right, um, supply and conspiracy to supply class A drugs. And and they wouldn't tell me what the evidence was. And then they said, uh, this 15 years, you're going to get, all the others, two years, this you're, you're going to get. Not, we'll, we'll go through due process, a trial, and you'll be judged by your peers. But no, you are definitely getting 15 years. And then, of course, they need to provide the evidence. But they got in touch with him as well. And wanted him to give a statement that I was... And he told them, you know, to do one. And uh, but see, it's it's exactly the same thing. And then what you are, you're then in a state of confusion, a state of fear. You can't think right, and you're like a person at sea. When you're at sea, you will cling to anything. You will cling to anything. So any lifeline, you'll cling to it. You know, and you'll accept their terms and conditions. When really, what you got to do is is get a grip, take a step back, and realise you're not in trouble at all. And there is another way out of this. So your prescription for trolls then is just to completely blank totally them. Totally and utterly blank them. You know, and, and funny enough, like talking to Corrine, and, and of course she started then giving me a profile. And I'll give her a couple of examples of people, you know, that have been doing things. And, and she's bang on, you know. And, um, and she said that they get one chance, you know, and that's it. You know, if they're going against you, then that's it, boom. That's it, boom. So if they're your gone. followers call you and they've seen they've seen something negative about you from a troll and the follower says, I've just come across this. 
Can you explain yourself? What kind of a thing would you say to uh, your genuine well, follower? Well, what, what I do now, I say, look, I'm not explaining myself. And that's what I said to someone the other day. Someone said, look, you got to watch this video. Someone's put video out about you. I said, I don't care. I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not. And, and I like to think that their judgment would be good enough to know to know who I am and what I am. And I, and I just say, it's nonsense or it's bollocks. It's, I just put it's bollocks. Don't, ignore it. I've ignored it. You should. Because it's not about them. It's about me. You know, um, but I, what I would say to people, anyone that's going into this podcasting, I said to when I did an interview with Joey Barnett, I said, Joey, the moment you put out, you're doing it, you watch. And he went, when I went back for a second part, he went, fucking hell, John. He said, unbelievable. I've been absolutely it. He said, but when I go back to these trolls and I look at them, he said, it's all nonsense and they're all weirdos and all saying the same thing. And it's the same like with Team Harvey. It's the same little... You know, nonsense. John Wedger. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, honestly, it is. It's just, but, but you know. Please listen uh, to Brian Harvey's song about us. It's great. Uh, but uh, some of these people. New World Order. Uh, it, it, I know. It, it, it's just mad, isn't it? And what's the other one? Shill. I didn't even know what a shill was. <laughs> you're a shill. Someone said you're a shill. No, well, thank you very much. <laughs> you're a ducky yourself. You know? what, what was that? You know, um, but, but when you look at them, there's no substance to them. But, but there's some of the people that have attacked me. They're dirty. I know they're dirty. I know a lot about them. At no point have I had any need to attack or denigrate them or point the finger at them or, or character destroy them. Which one or two of them, I could absolutely muller them. I don't want to. I have no need to. And what it would do, Sean, it would, you spend your time going through all that. You've lost a day. He's creating content. Where's yeah, it yeah. gone? You just yeah. troll attention. And, and how do you feel afterwards? You you feel <sighs> what awful. A waste. What a waste of a day. It makes you feel horrible. You feel paranoid. You think everyone hates you. But then, like I did, walk out, you know, and I think James was with us. So people were coming up, weren't they? You know, John, John, you know, and, and that's the real gauge of it. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and that's how I deal with it. But look, if, if someone knows you, they know you, you know that. Uh, I mean, we've they, got we've got almost six hundred thousand followers now on the channel, and it goes up every month. Of course, it will. So those toxic people and the people who are just falling by the wayside, goodbye, basically. Yeah, yeah. And if you was to put them all in a room, you know, they'd amount to no one anyway. And then they'd all start fighting with each other. <laughs> then they'd, they are. they'd then they they'd are. go to the toilet and fight with themselves <laughs> in the mirror, wouldn't they? The target, the, they're doing videos yeah. on James the cameraman now as well. Oh. <laughs> You know, you watch it happen, James. Sorry, I've, I've been giving them information, it, James. It, it, <laughs> you know, it, it is humorous. Some some of the things. Um, what was I going to say? So yeah, blank the trolls. But it, you know, if we're staying on this mission, do we just expect yeah. the heat to yeah, increase yeah. and acknowledge that as being? confirmation that we're doing well, the right thing well well, well what, what does an actor do right you can't just get hold of an actor's details right it has to go for an agent and an agent will be filtering them out they'll be weeding them out and if you speak to any actor they'll be getting hate mail you know and and all the time so you so see you need a filtration system i had nothing I, I you know there were a couple of people who started doing it but then they had access to me emails and then that started getting abused so um you need to filter out what it is. Uh, you know, you, you need to get a grip of where you really stand in all this because when you're when you're getting the incredible hits that you're getting, it's working. You know, and when you look at their work, you know they'll have three hundred and eight views or something like that. You know, and, and so it's. I mean, so I've been attacked for having a suntan. You know, <laughs> he's got a suntan. I cycled a crappy old bike I found in a canal. 300 miles across Cornwall and Bob Moore and all that. I was dehydrated, right? Um, it was the hottest summer we've ever had. And that's why the suntan. And, and of course, my father was Sicilian, so I'm going to go like an Asian. And I was going to say another word, then it's going to happen, you know? What are they attacking you for, James? What are they saying? Oh, they're just saying um... But it's linked to me. one of them say you were well, going to beat one of them up or something? Yeah, well, I was having a go at him saying he's blown off. So you yeah, farted on an very, interview. Yeah, very, very silly. Oh. I, I was like just taking the mickey out of them back and trying to give them yeah. uh, well, like, medicine. 
Well, 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 I know that... Um, it is fun sometimes to do that, but... <laughs> one, one of them did contact um, someone who follows me who, who is hard man, you know, and they got it. They absolutely got it. And he's rung up and he said, look, I'm not saying this is right, John, but this person will never, ever mess about you again. And he said, they've, they, they've, they've had a visit, you know. And um, so, you know, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but sometimes they're going to, they'll pick on the wrong person. They will pick on the wrong person, you know, and that's that. But it, it is inevitable. It, you're going to get it and you're going to get critics as well, you know. And I mean, one of them, it was Private Eye magazine were attacking a lot were attacking me quite a bit. Were they? Yeah, yeah. And again, they've got a history. They've got a history of things, you know. And they get away with it because Ipsos are the regulatory body for newspapers. They're clusters as a satirical magazine. But it was all to do with involvement in talking out about satanic ritual abuse. And of course, boom. But there's a history of it there, you know. So, But you, again, you've got to look at it as recognition. Recognition. But some of it, is dangerous and i think what what they did with wilfred how the media portrayed wilfred was was dangerous and again i think i've done my fair share in redressing that balance and and telling the world you know wilfred wong is an outstanding human being who will do anything to he will he will fight any satanist anywhere on the planet you know shirts off in a car park right here right now and and he will protect children and he's a good good guy so um, and he's paying the price for keeping it oh, real. Oh, you know, uh, but but he's he's in he's in good spirits. You know, he's in real good spirits. Um, they just said it's the boredom, the absolute boredom, as you probably know. I so, did. I sent know. him some books. I hope yeah. he gets them. Yeah. yeah. So you've got your satanic. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm going to just move on to um to what um something that occurred just prior to me sort of um exiting left on this one was a, a lady got in touch with me. And and this sort of proves um, how deep this goes, and and something about the attacks as well. Now she um, corroborated so much of what everyone else has said, and I've had the response I've got from victims and survivors of satanic abuses. That's bang on. That's bang on. And she said to me, "Have you got a pen?" I went, "Yeah." She said, "Have you got a bit of paper?" I went, "Yeah." So you sat down, and I went, "Oh well, no." She said, "Well, sit down." So I sat down, and she explained the hierarchy of Satanism, how Satanism works and who's put in place. And she said there are police officers and they are usually on what they call the fixer level. And I'm going to go through these levels with you in a minute. And she said, one of them, she said, you've upset this guy. And I went, okay. And she said a name. And I went, oh my word. She said, you know him, don't you? I went, yeah, yeah. And so she, she named a copper that I knew as a Satanist and and it, it brought it home to me, you know. And she said, that, that, you know, the word we, we, I've got back is that, you know, you, you will one day find out how much you've upset them. So you've got them on board as well, you know. And, and of course, you're going to get Satanists at work in the registry office. Some of them might work for the local police. You know, I mean, Hertfordshire Police has got a pagan officer, you know, and a pagan appointed officer. And, you know, so you, you know they'll have access to all sorts of information. There's GPs, you know, you, we got it with people like Harold Shipman and all that, you know, that clearly, clearly demonic individuals and uh, very well connected and as are, you know, um, secret societies and things like that. So, so you know, you never underestimate, you know, who you're dealing with. But what what we had, and really this sort of came out um, post-interview with, with Jeanette Archer on, on, on her story. Um, so... A freedom of information request was sent out. Now, Wilfred had stats on um, uh, cases that had gone before UK courts that had resulted in convictions, which they clearly said had a satanic connotation. Now, one of the things that, that, that I'm, I'm pushing for now is that s satanic abuse is classed as an aggravating factor to abuse. So, whereas years ago, you could punch an Indian guy in the face, call him an effing this and effing that, and it'd just be dealt with as assault. Now it's racially aggravated assault or homophobic assault or wh whatever tag you put on with it. So it's an aggravated factor. Like the American things like that, I want satanic abuse to be seen as its own statute law and, and that it should be looked at on a, a national level and not, you know, a local level. So I sent out some freedom of information requests. Now, I, 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 I don't know how we'll do this. It's very, very small font, but if you can just 
see bits and pieces. I don't know if we can do that, James, but... Um, can you e actually email the image to yeah, James I'll, and he can yeah, just put I'll it over the I'll screen? Yeah, I'll email that over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just show it out. But, but what we've got is like a little bar chart. Now, each force was asked in the UK, I think, I don't know how many there are there, maybe if we say 50, for example, forces in the UK, what cases have you had that have got satanic connections, right? So they've got um, crime, incident, and then one is not stated. So we go through it now. Um, this is Surrey, so this is where like Jeanette stuff um, emanated from. To start with, they were the first to respond. They're thirty-two. We thought, well, that's a lot. So what does that mean then? There's thirty-two. Thirty-two crimes that have been reported. Um, I don't know the exact time scale, but this was in August 2020. That have got a satanic connotation. Just in the month of August. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, this could be over a few year period. Okay. Like, uh, I, I don't know what the statute limitations for FOI the parameters exactly are but yeah um, oh yeah no it's from 2000 so last 20 years what okay. this is over 20 years 20 okay. years okay so it's got on there 20 years so it's satanic cases now now what not is very very strange is that the metropolitan police zero now if we take like i said in my podcast before london being you know the third most diverse city in the world one of the most densely populated cities in the world you know especially in western europe you know, we've got a population of, of something like 11 million. We've had at least one podcast guest on who acknowledged participating in satanic crimes in London. Yeah, yeah. And and I've spoken to many victims, uh, you know, of it, but but not one. Not one in London, right? Um, Hertfordshire, just outside to the north, they've got 44, which is quite staggering. Um, but the, the biggest one was um, West Yorkshire. I mean, West Yorkshire, you know, they're, they're on uh, 74, 74 now um i know a victim of of um sra in west yorkshire you know and and so but again there, there, there's other forces that are just denying it kent nothing i mean kent my word you hear so much about kent wilfred had a lot of work he was doing in kent humberside none you know um hampshire none well hampshire what a joke because hampshire has got the new forest and the new forest was, was the heart of the rains list as is as is the Isle of Wight and places like that, absolutely awash with it. They've got the town of Burley, which is dedicated to witchcraft. So Hampshire, you know, the, the liars have said they've got none. I mean, I don't know how they gauge it. Um, <laughs> Dividend Powys, again, none. And again, the chief constable, Dividend Powys, the, the former chief constable, was on the reins list. And then the Kidwelly case and things like that, now, you know. Um, and do you want to just... Briefly tell people what the RAINS list is. Yeah, the RAINS list is an acronym, RAINS. It's Ritual Abuse Information Network Support. Uh, this was a lady called uh, Dr. Joan Coleman, who was a, a therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist at the, the Maudsley Hospital, um, just, just north of Brixton, um, and King's College Hospital, linked to there. And she would deal therapy for very, very traumatised individuals. And she started noticing this thing called DID, which is Disassociated Identity Disorder, which is a multiple personalities, as we say, um, in, the, in the victim field. So uh, and she started talking to, to these people and figuring out, well, well, why have you got this? You know, what's gone on? They all started saying very similar things. And it was ritual abuse, satanic ritual abuse. And that was a one thing. So she started documenting this. Now, what happened was, patterns started emerging as they do with all organized crime so if a name was mentioned a minimum of twice it went on the range list if a location was mentioned a minimum of twice so there is an extended list which has got hundreds and hundreds and there is a reduced list and it's on online if you put in reigns the acronym r-a-i-o list satanic list you'll find it and there's celebrities on there there's chief constables on there there was um, one of my former senior officers on the unit I worked on, Clubs and Vice, is named on it. I've written to the police about this as well. And, and again, no response, you know. I've written to the IOPC about this guy, why is he on it? And they've written back and they've said, John Wedger, please never write to us again. The IOPC, I mean, what are they there for if, if not to investigate this? So it's an incredible list. It stands on its own two feet. Um, again, it's very toxic because anyone who really puts it out there ends up in a lot of trouble. But it is a public document and it can be referred to and you will be amazed at the names on there and these names that keep, that you keep, yeah, it's an incredible document, the range list. And and it it's all centred around Hampshire. So again, absolute dire nonsense. And, you, you know, it goes on and on. I even 
Devon and Cornwall, I mean, I mean, they've only said eight. Again, it's an area that's always mentioned, Devon and Cornwall. Certain places, you know, keep cropping up time and time and time again. Um, Why are some squares orange and some red? Well, 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 well some are incidents, some are crimes, and some are not stated. Mm. So it could be intelligence or something like that. So, you know, th this is, uh, you know, it's an FOI document. It's a very interesting reading, and it really, really sort of um, backs up who who was actually bothering West Yorkshire are doing. You know, they're actually recording it. Um, Hertfordshire are recording it. The Met Police know, you know, um, Hampshire know. Two main epicenters. Uh, very, very sad. You know, sad. And and this is one of the things. Had I got a good little team that I wanted exploring, you know. I had a, a team of ex-military guys come to me, ex-special forces lads. One of them is well known. He's on the telly quite a bit. So we can put a team together for you for if you're going to do covert stuff, we're going to do this. You know, I'd, I remember the House of Lords wanted to put across a private member's bill to get this all highlighted. And of course, the trolls and everyone else brought this to an end, you know. So this was the level I was on. So when you're saying, uh, was it organised? Well, I was onto something very big here. I had a meeting with the Home Secretary in October. Everything was stopped and put on hold. You know, so I think it genuinely was not not just a vexatious campaign, a jealousy campaign, but also a very orchestrated campaign to 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 bring me to a, to a halt, to a grinding halt, to be honest, because I started talking about this. But, and again, anyway, so this lady gets in touch with me and uh, she is a victim and survivor of satanic ritual abuse. Um, she names many people that I've heard of, um, people that are in, in, in the public domain. And um, she again, she names a copper that I'm aware of. And everything she said ties in. I've got no reason to disbelieve this woman whatsoever. She's a professional. Um, and what she's given me is something that has been corroborated. Now, it's a pyramid, right? And I've, I've deemed it the SRA hierarchy, right? Okay. Now... She said, children are referred to as diamonds. Can I have a look? Yep. Yep. And I'll send you the range list because the range list is... Uh... And what, what I want to do is through, go through each level and their roles. And, uh, you know, and, and this, this does tie in with some of the stuff you've been dealing with, with Epstein and things like that. Prince Andrew, yeah. You know, and because... And what she said to me is, wherever you get a site, you'll always get a labyrinth and a maze. And she said, when you're looking at Epstein's Island, there is a labyrinth. You can see it. She said, John, that is not just a place of abuse. That is a place of ritualistic abuse. That's one thing she said to me. So if we start at the very bottom, these are spotters and lookers, right? So the um, the lookers actually are are a degree above the spotters. But she said, they'll be, um, they'll be going out, picking their victims. So they're very proactive, the Satanists. You know, uh, they're, they're never resting. They've got a job to do and they'll go out there. Now, they could be anything, the spotters and the lookers. They could be a heroin addict that is going out there to identify. Mainly, they, they're picking on and identifying dysfunctional families, right? So this is a need. This is one of the things the campaign that I was doing was also bringing the family unity back and family values back because when your family's divided and broken, your kids are prey to these beasts, you know, and they are. And, and we saw that with... Um, what was happening in in uh, there was a program about it. I'll come to me in a minute. In the north, they were deliberately targeting working class dysfunctional families. So they'll be going out looking for kids, kids that are, are sort of on their own a lot, latchkey kids and things like that. And the strange thing is, one of the children that was um, killed by Sidney Cook, the, the very infamous child murderer. Um, his best friend contacted me and said, you know, when they abducted this boy, I can't remember his name. Uh, off the top of my head it was one of the boys that Cook got convicted of murdering and he said he was always on the street John always on the street and they knew that he was easy prey his mother was a drinker and so they'll be looking out for for kids that they can get hold of they'll also be targeting families and they will have people that, that will be working in the records office in doctor's surgeries and things like that so they, they, they've got bits everywhere so they filter that information back and they'll be paid according to it right and she goes on about um uh mentioned about elm guest house she said you know there was stuff going on now which is which has come out in the public domain but also 
when when a child is needed, not just for a satanic ritual for a murder, but also kids are needed for sex. So clients will come over to the UK from abroad and they want a child. So the lookers will be sent out, you know, go and get us a very skinny little gingerbread boy, for instance. That's what the customer wants. And they said they will have kids in the care homes. They would have uh, kids from satanic families and all that that they can they, that they can pick in. But if there's not, they will abduct. So we have had cases of child abduction. And if we look at Mark Dutroux, he was abducted to order as well. So it all does tie in very, very nicely. Um, and and again, because she goes on for the reasons for it. Now, um, people will pay money for, for spells to be put on. So someone might want fame, might want fortune, and will pay a lot of money for a certain spell. And that certain spell might will, will always require blood, but maybe a dog, a cat will do. But on the whole, a child's blood is what's needed. And that's big money. So we've got a good money incentive here. Um, Satanism is all about the self. It's the love of the self as well as the devil. But, you know, it's all about me, 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 I, I, I. And um, so they'll be sent out to look to identify, not just for a one-off, but also for a long term. Right. And we move up now, right. Um, to the cleaners now this is where I said that there is a, a, a police officer was mentioned as being a cleaner um, they will make sure that any um, crime scene is forensically clear but not also forensically clear it can also be deliberately contaminated so which which was always a big concern with DNA because DNA can be put you can be put on a scene with DNA and um, you know I remember a bloke telling me once he's we was on one unit and uh, a guy took a bite, tramp took a bite of an apple through it. And he said that apple was picked up and dumped at burglary, you know, and the guy was subsequently brought in and he had no excuse. And DNA, you know, fag ends can be flicked through letterboxes and things like that. So you can be put on a scene quite easily, you know. Um, so they can contaminate a scene as well as clean it. But also, if you're, if you're going to have a ritual and a child is going to be murdered, right, there's a contingency needs to be put in place. So, um, what's been mentioned to me is all sorts of venues, even things like Legion clubs, um, military bases, police stations on occasion. So, so uh, for instance, if there's a social club that's going to be used, right, um, how are you going to get that? Well, you, you're going to need to know the key holder. You're going to need to know that, that cars aren't blocking the street, you know, so the police are called. The central station alarm, which a lot of them have got, has got to be demobilised. And you've got to probably have someone that's within a control room or whatever in the police. So if any calls are dealt there, they're intercepted and they're pushed off. They will have their sentries on the outskirts. Or even a police car is sent in to intercept anyone nosing around. You don't want anyone gawping through. So there's a lot. And also, once it's done, it needs to be left as it was and cleaned up properly and the body taken away with. And, and cleaners are given... They said there's five different areas in the UK and they will, they're given a certain area and it's up to them. And they are heavily financially rewarded for that, right? Right, and then you go up, you've got the fixers, you know, and these are the people that will arrange it, right? And one of them was said to me as being a fixer was Jimmy Savile. Was said to me, and that's why they said Jim will fix it, because he was a fixer. So they will they will organise it. They will make sure that the client gets a child. The venue is sorted out. So they will be like the area manager of, of this. So you you got you got these fixers now. Moving up, then uh, you have got the international fixers. So this is international trafficking of children. Epstein, exactly. And this is the name that was mentioned to me. Maxwell. Epstein was mentioned to me by this woman. She said, uh, and also a very very famous singer who contested his involvement and i can't say no more than that was mentioned to me right and and she said the one thing you're always going to get you're going to get um cages they love to cage the children they love to be kept in cages you know barns cellars underground structures are very very important tunnels basements did you watch the program about the two brothers were the in the West Country, where the mother had them outside in like a shed. Yes. And um, one of them lost his memory. Yeah, yes, yes. So the other brother didn't tell yeah, him that they yeah. were both being abused, abused and sold. Yeah. Just basically the mom was 
she was already a woman of status. And she was she? in high society, yeah. And she was giving her kids to these other yeah. influential people. And, and, and one of them said, one was a very well known artist. Tell me who I am. Was that what it's called? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 Brilliant, brilliant program. Yeah. Well, that, they had, she had them in like a shed or something outside, didn't she? Like, were, yeah, yeah, they had to, they, yeah, they were converted garage. They would put them in there and yeah. kept away. But again, she, and this is one of the things that, that is, is very prevalent in satanic abuse is the role of the mother. Um, that there's, there's a fantastic, um, thing on Netflix called Mind Hunter, and it's all about the inception of profiling. Um, you know, and I was talking to Karina about this actually the other day. And it's how it and when how they get it and the, the way they got it was basically what what they used to do with me and the police going to the prisons and that's one of the things they used to do with me send me into the prisons to talk to people because I had this natural ability to talk and and these guys were going and talking to serial killers and what was blatantly obvious was how many of them were abused by their mother near enough all of them and the reason they went on to kill was to a vengeance for the mother to get approval for the mother so a lot of people think of international trafficking then whereby kids are procured from countries like Vietnam, Nam, Cambodia, the Philippines, places where um, Gary Glitter hung out. And it's financial because the camera crews went in that one Gary Come Home or something, that documentary, if you saw it, they're on Gary Glitter's trail and they go through this village and they're filming it secretly and the parents are coming out saying, you know, do yeah. you want the kid for an yeah, hour, yeah, a yeah. day, a week? Yeah. But it's all about the money. Money, all about so, money. So, so, so in um, Tell Me Who I Am, if this woman's already an aristocrat and she's giving her kids out, what's in it for her? But but, but it, it's the position, keeping in that position of privilege and power, you know, so she maintains that style. And you, you, you just, it's like, I haven't got anything financially, right? Now, with a millionaire, one million's not enough. Two million is not enough. Three million. So it's all it's greed and greed and greed. So what they're doing then, they're not going to sit there and she say, well, I'm financially well off now. I can stop pimping my kids out. It's her way of life. It's what she does. It's what she's always done. So it's a status thing. The whole thing. And, and you Networking. know, working. Absolutely. And children are big. And, and, and this is what I want to come onto in a minute with this guy that I'm talking to uh, at present, who's an ex um, Coke smuggler, gangster, and all that. And, and he, he wants, you know, he's got quite a lot to say. But children, like I said to you before, drugs at the bottom guns at the bottom children are the commodity i mean this lady was saying that um that a lot of them were flown out in hercules craft to america they, they would be put in into like um little boxes i mean you know she said and there'll be drugs she said so an atlantic crossing you know you're not going to do more than eight hours anyway and if you're knocked out on a sleeping tablet or a strong injection you can do eight hours of sleep so it's not a problem you know but so I said, well, how can they do that? How can they get in there? She said, because it's their people that are always on. They always make sure their people are on. They're, you know, and it's a bit like maybe there has been a special branch um, or a military intelligence intervention into both yourself and me. But if you was to accost, that's why I don't like these videos when they, they stick um, cameras in some Bobby in the Beat's face and accuse them of being New World Order and a shill and all that. Well, no, he ain't, he, you know. But that's not saying that, that, that there isn't that involvement in there, that there isn't a Masonic cover-up, that there isn't a Satanic cover-up, but you're not going to know unless you're in on it, you know? I worked um, in an office, in a CID office, and there was guys there that were doing covert roles. I never knew what they were doing. And I was doing stuff for the National Crime Agency. No one knew what I was doing. It's just some days I weren't now. We had one guy, he was a former um, member of the Special Boat Squadron. He disappeared for, for six weeks. We never see him. And turned out he was in Sierra Leone. And no one knew. <laughs> he come back with a suntan and a, and a mad stare. <laughs> you know? Uh, so you don't know. It's a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. Uh, but these sweeping, overarching comments that all oh, coppers are Masons, all oh, coppers are MI5, and all. Absolute load of nonsense. But A lot of coppers watch this, and they support what we're doing. Oh, of course they do. And they resent that these orders are coming from the top. And it wasn't what they signed up for. No, no, I know. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It really is. You know, but you say we've got the fixes, which is Epstein. And again, big money, big money. You'll admit to doing cocaine. You'll admit to having a gun. You know, there was, there's a, um, a thing called, um, what's it called? It's narco something or other. It's all about the um, the Corrida bands out in. Narcos Corridos, the yeah. ballads for the, the ballads. Uh, narcos. Yeah. 
And I've got a fellow um, who I helped with his channel, OG Shadow. He's 120,000 subs right now in a year from nothing. And they've just made a song about him in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it's big It's big things, but then... It's on his channel. Check it out. And, and these, are, subscribe these to are wealthy kids from LA. They've got no idea of, of what goes on in Juarez, the, the actual butchery that go, you know... And, and like they, they spoke to a copper in Juarez and he went, look at these rich American kids, these Corrido bands, and this is what we deal with. And look at them, you know. But they're sitting there. They go out to Mexico for, for a week and they're there with their guns and all this and doing a bit of crystal meth and, and everything else. But but they, you don't, won't ever see them on there with a little kid. I'm not saying that they're doing little kids, but that's where the line is, you know. You're not going to see it overt, you know. And there is heavy criminality involved in children, you know, and there was. Big money. And, and you hear a lot about what the Cray twins were involved with, with, with children as well, and I do, I hear it, and it, it's a point of conjecture because of some of the people that, that I associate with. But Just aside for a moment then, what, what were the Cray twins involved with children? Well, well and I've heard that, that they, were, they were procuring kids for politicians. That's what uh... I've heard. Now, again, it's a point of conjecture. You know, but that's what I've heard. So, so that's how they were blackmailing to keep well, to well, maintain well, their operations. Well, yeah, and got away with a lot of things. But there'll be a lot of people won't like me for saying that. But it's it's there's enough on documentaries where people said I, I had enough of what they were doing. I knew what they were doing. You know, so you know that's that. And and there was intelligence coming out from the prison system. You know that there was, and and there was a guy who was going to do an interview with me about it. Um, that, that sort of you know, that that side above. The, the international fixes are the bloods, right? And he said, these are people of very high social esteem, right? You know, and if you, you, you're you in that world, your heart's gone, your soul's gone anyway. I mean, you look at people like that, uh, Philip Green. I mean, he's, he pays something like £100,000 to, to moor his boat for one day in in some port somewhere. I mean, what I mean, all them people whose pensions got collapsed by Maxwell and everything else, and they're living... They want to do good. They could do so much good with their money, but they, they don't want to. You so know? the mum in the documentary who had the kid, the, the sons, would she be considered a blood? May well be. She may well be a fixer, you know? I would have thought she's probably a fixer. Okay. But she would be with these people. Right? So it's the attention from the bloods that she wants, the yeah, yeah. networking with the bloods is her incentive. Yeah, and, and, and they call she said they call them bloods because it is blood. It is about blood. Not only is, is the bloodline there, but you have to have the blood. There's always blood in a ritual, always blood in a ritual. And children are better. And the more frightened the child, the younger the child, the richer it is. And she she goes on to tell that one day when um, uh, she said, there's two sorts of children. Those that have come from satanic families, that they're kept because of commodity, because they're already sexualized. They're used to... The, the the orgies the, the pain and everything else you know um and then there's the abducted children and the abducted children they're going to die and they're valued because of the fear element in them and they they will be sexually a virgin and they will be tortured and that, this is what happened she said and this is when these kids go missing off the streets and all that and she said and these kids go missing and no one worries about it, you don't hear about it anyway and some kids are bull and, and others, they um, they have women that, that breed the children for them, you know. And I've spoken to women after women that have given birth to children and don't know where their children went, you know. So it is a reality. I hear this so many times. I mean, it was getting, you know, you know I become the go-to person for it, you know. And I was hearing it bang, 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 constant. And above that, the royals. And she said that they are what they are. And she said, that don't need any explaining, but that's a global and thing. people through Prince Andrew, people have just woke up to that left and right, haven't they, in the last couple of years? Uh, of course they are. And, and the, the thing is that that interview that he did about, it was this, was it the pizza restaurant down here in Guildford? Was Walking, it? Walking Pizza Express. I mean, what a load of uh, uh, crap. I mean, His it's, daughter said she can't even remember it either. But why would they go there? I mean, it's just, I mean, and, and not only that, you know, if they go anywhere, it's got to be a pre-planned operation. You, you, when you see the, I think the only one they said would drive themselves as Prince Anne. She insisted on driving herself, but she would have these what they call prot officers, protection officers, all around her anyway. And all the royal protection um, diary logs are not have not been forthcoming to show where he was. And besides Peter Express, I think it closes at eight or ten because we filmed there. And 
the nightclub he was at, Tramp, opens at the same time Peter Express closes. Yeah. So how could he... How's that an alibi? Yeah, and, y you know, he... he He's recently said he's allergic to horse hair as well. That's uh, why another thing couldn't be possible. Uh, well, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, I, I had one guy um, come to me, and he used to... Um, he was a farrier, blacksmith farrier, um, and he would sometimes do work for not the Queen, but the other royals, you know. And um, he would tell me about a, a place in Hampshire that he would get invited to their parties. And he said, John, they're orgies. He said they were all. He said they were all shagging each other, you know. And um, yeah, again, you can't name, them, but I mean, it's uh, very close to home with, with what we're saying with Andrew. And, he, and he, he said, he said, I've been there. He said, I've been in there and watched it with my own eyes. And he used to say to me, never, ever bow down and call them people sir because they're not. He said, they're nothing but perverts. And that was his thing on, on, on the rolls. He said, don't ever look up to them. And um, But yeah, he he did that interview and it's been analysed now by, by forensic statement analysts. And it's just unbelievable. You know, there's, there's quite a few videos of professional statement analysts and they identify deception. And it's, it's honestly, it's like ping, 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 but ping. But it was just ping. a straightforward shooting weekend. Uh, you know, it's just, it, well, I think the only thing he says is his name that's correct. And that's it. It's, it is, and, and they expect us to fall for that. But then, of course, what happened was we ended up in, in this big health scare that we've got in the moment. And, um, and everything's been forgotten how, about. How arrogant was he in the first place to do that? It's incredible. Just, just to think that we're all going to buy that bullshit. But, but I think this is it. They think they're going to, we're going to buy it, right? And this is their contempt for us. They must really think that we are as thick as they come. But what, who advised that moron to, to behave in that manner? I mean, it's absolutely incredulous, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I, I did, I sat there and I just thought, he's, he's, he's taking the piss. That is just absolute madness. But even though there's been a distraction, he, he's lost in the port the court of public opinion he's, he's ruined oh, oh it's ruined no, and yeah. I, I think the royal family in general are, are, are ruined I don't think they have any respect whatsoever anymore you know and especially what, what's happening to this country at the moment and, and where's the support coming do you well, think do you think that they could save the royal family by passing it over Charles to Charles's firstborn well well, I wouldn't even credit that lad with it I think the only the only one is Harry Hewitt isn't he I think he's about a only bit of you know saving grace we've got because he's, he seems to be like a normal bloke harry hewitt i think he's um it seems all right you know it's, it's um it's it's if we're there's so many questions but again we what what is needed is people that worked in amongst these to come and speak in out and i've heard a couple of fellas from my old world uh, uh, that have gone on to royalty protection have, have mentioned one particular male member of the royal family consistently the same one and it's been mentioned by other people to me as well in a good or bad way always a bad way never a good way you know i've never heard anything nice about um you know anything i think um i think people like diana and that was about it um and i don't hear anything bad about them two boys but this one member i hear all the time all the time the same it's always this guy and um was, but again what can you do what can you say you know it, it, it's sad that we, we can't speak out and it's the same with these celebrities that, that have been involved in the child abuse horrific abuse that have been named to me so many times they've been named to the police yet they get away with it get away with it which, which brings this the reality of this in this is why there's obviously something other than just being a bit of a, a geezer or doing a bit of coke or doing this there's something else this is what will silence people and you die, you speak about this. That's it. You're finished. You're dead. You know, you're gone. Uh, and this is it. And, and Satanism, Wilfred's right, it is at the key. Which is, I mean, what we're on about, same with that that documentary with the, the twins, um, we're talking about the white upper echelons of society. What was very, very strange was that this guy's contacted me, former top-notch tier one criminal, you know, um, arm blagger, um, cocaine importer um, now wants to do a lot of good, you know. And what he's doing now, he's um, working with trafficked people. Um, and he put me in touch with a lady the other day, trafficked from West Africa, from Nigeria. Mm. And she started talking to me about how much voodoo, juju, is used in criminality, how kids are being brought over here. 
Um, they're used as prostitutes coming from Nigeria, um, but they're also heavily um, demonized because they've been subject to, to a hell of a lot of rituals where demons are putting them and these demons are there for money. And she said, but I could control men even as a young kid because of the demons in me. Well, let me just confirm some of that because I spoke to for quite a while the guy who wrote the book about the torso that was found Adam, in the Thames. Yeah. Yeah. And he detailed all of the satanic, ritualistic, voodoo um, methods that were coming in from that part of the world. But I'll, I'll let you expand on yeah, that. Yeah, well, and one of them, it's very real, and, and, and this is very strange you should say that, she said, but one of them is the, the Leviathan, the water spirits. The water demons are the strongest. And again, she said, if you find water in a ritual, you're dealing with very, very demonic. And of course, Adam's body was found in the Thames, you know, beheaded, torso was and it was my team that recovered his body ironically enough was it yeah yeah where when i was with the river police yeah wow could yeah. you detail that for us yeah it, it was um they pulled him i can't remember exactly where but i was sent out um to look for anything that, that could be linked to it and over in rotherhive was a disused um wharf um we went in there because i think it weren't too far from where the body was found i couldn't say exactly where it was found anyway we went in there we, and there was a satanic temple in there um so the murder team was brought in and it was all photographed and it was all um pentagram 666 and it was just satanic daubings everywhere all over the place whether that is tied in with with his body or it, it's geographically a bit different you know but i can always remember um i was on a unit that dealt with passport deception and we predominantly dealt with Nigerians. They seemed to be the ones that had it down to a T. And we went round a house in East London over in Dagenham once uh, to search it and I found like, um, it's like a sandpit, like a kid's sandpit, a wooden frame thing. And in it was all um, like chicken bones with uh, tags with names on it, all stuck in there. And I said, well, certainly went, it's, it's the juju, it's, you know, the voodoo. And he said, you sent me to court, your name will be on that. And they, they was all, honestly, all in there, And w which is what this guy that I'm dealing with at the moment is saying, that um, he would go to see the juju man. And they used to advertise in the back of the Loot magazine. We used to have a thing called the Loot magazine, you know, where you could buy everything and anything. It was always offered and then wanted, you know, a bit like the Dalton's Weekly. And in the back, it had these people in there, you know, there was like Mahamra bats and Juju and problems with neighbours, problems with court cases or infections and that, I cure it all. And mainly sort of black fellas, you know. Um, and, and he said there was one particular one and he would make us invisible. And he said he went on uh, an armed robbery and he said the police come, he said we were banking rights and he just walked straight past us. He said I've had a gun put my head three times, bang, 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 nothing went off, nothing went off, you know. And he said it's, but you are opening yourself up to demonic possession. It's very real. A lot of the the up and coming, very serious um, Nigerian gangsters, you know, that we get over here because it's ex-colonial, you know, it's heavily involved in it. And then they're influencing the other young gangsters are still getting involved in it, which is very funny because if you watch that that um, program about the the, the Caritas, the, you know, um, in Mexico, what do they go to? They go to Santa Muerte, Jesus Malverde, which is, you know, the green Jesus, you know, uh, um, what is it? And they pray to all these the, 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 the demonic entities for so protection. So with the torso then, specifically what religion or belief was behind that? Do they know or was it just an investigation? Well, well I think it was because it, they did go out to Nigeria, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. Because they did a DNA trace and found it from this Ariba uh, region of northern Nigeria. Which is because when you get Nigeria, it's neighbouring country, that the borders blend, that they're, they're a bit open, and it is with Benin, and Benin is seventy percent voodoo. I mean, even now, seventy percent voodoo. What was the conclusion of the police as to why the kid I, was I, chopped up? I don't know. I, I really don't know. And did they catch anybody for it? I don't think they did. I don't think they did. You know, the problem with Walter, it destroys DNA. Mm. I mean, that clearly was a murder because he had no head. But, you know, they pull out 50 bodies a year from the River Thames. In, in, yeah, between 
I think Twickenham and uh, I think down to the QE Bridge, you know, 50, one a week comes out. What's the, with those yeah. bodies then, are they mostly suicides? Well, they don't know. They don't I mean, even know. I mean, how they, how they used to gauge it was if anyone jumped off a bridge in central London, it was a cry for help because help was going to come. Right, but if someone was like further downstream from Wandsworth Bridge out towards Richmond, it was suicide. <laughs> it was suicide. But central London, you go in the river there, uh, because of all the old foundations and everything else, and the river's so constricted, and it's one of the biggest tidal rivers in the world. You know, in its tidal range is nearly eight meters, so you've got eight meters rushing in, and when it rushes out, it goes out faster because you've got the current, the tide, going out with the actual flow of water. And and it would it would drag you under. It, so there's a lot of bodies that get just dragged yeah, out yeah. and they're never even and, discovered. Well, well, what will happen is that, um, if if they've been sexually assaulted, the DNA is going to die. You're not going to find semen or anything else like that on a body. It's not going to happen. They're going to get hit by boats. The propeller's going to rip them up. They float twice. They instantly float and then they sink and then they could be down there months. So if a body goes in now, right, the water's dense now, right? It's four degrees. It's, it's densest. So the body will float initially and then it will it will sink within a day or so. It will go down. It could stay down there till April, right? It's going to blow out. The white skin pig, uh, pigments and goes black. So you think it's a black corpse. It's actually a white person. Black people go white. Yeah, they the, the skin goes white. The body um, fills up with gas. It pops. It explodes. They get eaten by eels. There's a lot of shrimp little tiny shrimps in there eels do a lot of damage and and the propellers do and of course they're they're, they're being bashed around all the time tossed around in the water so when and they've come, got to, and then they've got to be forensically examined when they're yeah, extracted yeah, yeah they had one fellow and he would go he was an expert because there are so many bodies that one of the only things was that there was quite a disproportionate amount of sex offenders would end up now you can argue is that suicide or you know I think the only time when it wasn't suicide is when a bloke had his hands behind his back and a trolley jack tied around his head, and that was deemed not suicide. Did but, you have to view corpses of that nature? Well, well not only do I have to view them, I, I have to pull them out. I pulled you one. You had to pull them out? Yeah, yeah I'll tell you what, oh. happened, what happened once, Sean. Um, there was a body come up because I, I had to learn to drive the boats because I ended up doing the stuff with the sex offenders on the canal. So Yeah, we talked about yeah, that in yeah. podcast one, so, didn't we? So the I mean, the, the training was brilliant. I got a lot of ferryman's license. And a body had come up in central London by embankment pier. So you've got like the Waterloo side and then the embankment on the other side. And there was a lot of tourists going up and down in the boats. And the body had cropped up in the middle. And they, they've got a lot of like these big barges that are tied up that they use for rubbish. And the body was between them. And w w went past and managed to pull it in with a long, had like a long pole with a hook on it. Pulled the body in. And the, pleasure boat was coming past all kids on it oh, right geez. and they sort of slowed down all kids were looking and there's this floated corpse and the fellows went bring it in pull it in quick and they had like this cradle would go down he went pull it in so i got hold of its arm pulled it and the arm come off <gasps> the actual arm come off and the body floated off so all these kids are standing there and i'm holding <laughs> this bloke's arm and he's gone off down the Thames. <gasps> yeah they were looking out screaming his arm ripped off. Another one oh. pulled him out and he started moving and it was an eel was in his stomach and it was like something out of, um, what's that film, The Thing or whatever, you know, um, Alien. Alien. It was an, and an eel in there. When it first started moving, what, mo did you, was before moving. you knew it was an eel, what was going through your head? I just thinking, well, couldn't wake it out because the bloke was clearly dead. His eyes were like, and then this, there was like a cut and then this eel come out. <sighs> I mean, it's... Um, it was just incredible, you know, it was, but they always get, and they stink. And it's just a <sighs> smell that you never get out. And this, this is what gets me about Satanists when, you know, they have sex with um, dead bodies and things like that. And you think, you know, I've been on autopsies, you know, I've been there when, when they, you know, I had to be an exhibits officer. So if there was a suspicious death, I'd go along and collect the body samples for the laboratory and things like that. And the moment they cut open the abdominal cavity, this smell, I mean, it, you never get used to it, but I would just be sick. And it, it's wretched. It's horrible. We interviewed Christopher Berry D about serial killers. He's interviewed a lot of them himself. And he said um, Bundy would go back and have sex with the corpses and eat cop pieces of the corpses. Yeah, and Bundy, 
whilst it was going through his body, would get would maintain an erection while it was digesting. What? Yeah. And I think it was Bundy. When I think did they electrocute Bundy? Yeah. I think he 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 had needles. Burn Bundy, burn. The, the, the people turned all their lights off, didn't they, to give him more juice? Uh, I think that it shorted out something because he had so many needles pushed into his his testicles. Oh. A very very twisted man. Yeah. And it's yeah. There was one case um, where a guy had killed a, a teacher. I think she was a music teacher, and he kept her corpse. At the big yellow storage um, on the A13, out of, going out of London, and he was regularly seen on CCTV going in. When they when they got the CCTV footage, they're like, "Well, he, the body was found there. He was paying regular visits." And then when they they tuned it in, he was getting the body out and having sex with his body up to six weeks. <sighs> I mean, the smell must have been absolutely repugnant. But I mean. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with a mind that that, that that deems that normal and deems that sexy. Wasn't there a Vincent Price movie about that? Dr. Fibes, was it? Oh, well, probably. I think so, yeah. Probably. I mean, Savile was classed as a necrophiliac. You know, that come out that he was going into mortuary and having sex. So, but and these people had access to our children. You know, if, if people knew that Savile was doing that, who was also then allowing him access to children and not speaking out and saying, no, actually, he wants to have sex with a corpse, but don't let him near any kids. I mean, you would say, hang on, there's a line, but... The Bloods and the Royals yeah, oh yeah, well, exactly. had, had the, the control strings over it, Savile. It, it it just shows how deep it goes. And now they'll... they'll I don't think you'll, you will ever know. You will ever know the sheer extent of all this. But what... What is highlighted is is the fact that, you know, it, in the criminal world, when they're saying that they're using these demons now for protection. So this takes it to another level. So it's no longer the white upper classes that are doing this. We are now dealing with, with, with lower down, lower class, working class criminals, which are also tuning in, which is what is happening with these, these Mexican gangsters are doing exactly the same thing. Tuning into it, tuning into this demonic protection because it gives them protection, keeps them alive, keeps them strong, and everything else. I mean, well, what Escobar's hitmen, they all um, prayed to the patron saint of, of the hitmen, and, and they had that weird satanic uh, Colombian flavor of um, whatever it was they were worshiping. But yeah, it's, it's big because they're very superstitious and. Um, they like you know make it be a clean hit make me get away with this make me get enough money so i can give some money to my mom and things like that yeah and, and i think once you start tuning into it and and the the more bad you do the more bad you become you know and the violence becomes normal and of course it, it's not honorable anymore but what have you spiritually opened yourself up to a lot of badness and it's going to take a long time to come out you know yeah. and it's you know and it's only when you start talking to the people like i've done for many years now they, they realize that you know they had to turn their whole lives around and realize in themselves they they were absolutely racked with demons yeah totally and utterly racked with them this is reality this isn't fiction or anything like it this is reality and it's consistent and that is the one thing you're seeing consistent. It, it, it's going across cultures and social and economic divides. It's it's absolutely rife, you know. Um, but yeah, so for the time being, you know, that's on hold. But I, I was at one point, I was really on board to putting out a lot, a lot of videos, you know, on this sort of stuff. But again, a lot of disruption would occur as well. But again, there wouldn't just be this concerted disruption like, like we discussed. There would also be this spiritual disruption that they would be putting out, you know? And they would deliberately be doing it. So someone wrote in, Hey, Sean, you may know this, but you could be undergoing some serious demonic attack. Yeah. This happens when you are seen as a threat, and thus that is when the oppression starts. You have been doing great work. Um blah 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 don't give up just know the enemy and it's almost a felt and in, in the last year when all the attacks just multiplied and multiplied and I, I was it was it was pulling my energy from content creation to dealing with it that it was demonic it is demonic and um i discussed it with some people and um it was like we needed we needed to clear the energy somehow some of my friends were like Pray. Get get a hold of John Wedger and yeah, get, pray. Some, get an exorcism yeah, yeah, off, get, off yeah. John Wedger. Yeah. That's what they were pray. saying. <laughs> pray. Well, what, what, what I do, I mean, before I did my walk, yeah. I felt all throughout that walk that like I've been stabbed in the stomach. 
before I went for a walk, took the dog out and I went with Dylan and there was floral reefs laid outside the back of my house and there was an, like an altar made out of acorns with all things stuck in it, you know, and it, it really, it was like a little satanic, like a pagan sort of thing. And all through it, I felt that I was stabbed in the stomach and just, I just pray for it. Now, I, what I do sometimes, I sit and I, I call up Chris Lambriano because he's a very committed Christian and we pray together. We pray together, you know, and Wilfred, he always makes sure that we pray before anything goes on. We pray and pray and pray because they are doing the same. They are, this is real, you know, and, and Jesus has warned us about this. It's there and it is, and it is a matter, but if you stay in the light, they can, they can I thought that when I started doing this sort of stuff with, with the, with the child abusers and, and the satanic, that when I come up against people heavily involved in Satanism, I thought that I would be facing raging bulls, grizzly bears, great white sharks. I wasn't. I was facing little mosquitoes, right? Little ants that bite you, wasps that sting you, you know? And this is what it is. It annoyances. And, but you they know, swarm, don't they? They swarm, and yeah. Drain yeah, you. drain you. And, you know, they they are the stone in your shoe, the crumb in your bed sheet. You know, they are the, the, the ant that's gone down your shirt. And, and this mm. is what they are. And they, then I thought it would be an honourable enemy, but it's not. It's a vexatious, vicious enemy. They tell teacher, that sort of thing. Always belly aching to someone else. Always trying to undermine you. Calling someone else up. And, and this is what they do all the time. They're non-stop. Because I've non looked at some of my videos in the, from the thick of um, the attacks. And I look a bit disorientated yeah. and depressed and, and just not myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can feel my strength coming back now yeah. with the strength of wild man. Um, looking out for me, but um, it, it it drags you down for a period. Oh, of time, oh it does, doesn't yeah, it? yeah. Until I mean, you emerge from and, the the, uh, the darkness. Uh, uh, and and this person who's written in is bang on because yeah. I've had people ring up and they said, John, we know you're being attacked. This guy that, that, that's talking with me at the moment, you know, he works with with deliverance, taking demons out of people, with a pastor, and he and he said we can see the attack. We can see the attacks on you, John. You know, you must close down now. Start shutting doors and stay in prayer. Stay, you know, I mean, I do this because God wants me to do it. You know, I said this on many things. I feel driven by it. I believe in Jesus. and and But the devil will hate me for what I'm doing. Doesn't want it. One of my podcast guests, and I won't say her name, um, she asked me to ask you if you do or you know anyone who could do an exorcism on yes, her. Yes, I do. I do. Okay. Very much so. I'll convey that yeah, information yeah, then. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have anything else to say on that, or do you want to get on to the next subject? No, I mean that's it, it, it's. I mean, I could talk for hours on that, you know, on yeah. on, on, on this. Yeah. It's a it's a deeper, dark subject, and, and you know, and it'll be a podcast in its own right. But no, I'm 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 happy to move on now. Um, so, so the next subject then was um, I I C S A and Catholic Church. Oh, Catholic Church yeah. cover ups. Yeah, well. Um, IICSA is an acronym for the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse. And it started about uh, eight years ago or so, and it was the government saying, right, we, we've got to do something about this, or proclaiming they were going to do something about it. So it's been wrecked with controversy, and uh, and it was all to do with all the care home cover-ups, uh, you know, police cover-ups. And in order for them to go forward, they need core participants, which are witnesses, survivors, and everything else. Um, they had, we're on the fourth chair now. So the first one uh, was linked uh, to Leon Britton. And of course, Leon Britton was mentioned in there. Um, I think the next one was also linked to Leon Britton, was his sister-in-law or something, uh, which wasn't good. And again, we mentioned about Leon Britton and the last one we did, you know, I was Home Secretary and many accusations about that bloke and the cover-ups that went on. Um, one was um, an Australia, a, a New Zealand um, chair. She left uh, claiming that the British intelligence service will never let the truth come out, which I would like to go on about, actually, to be honest, because um, that has been proven. And they've now got the former head of social services is a chair, Alexis J. And so under that, I was asked to give evidence myself and Maggie Oliver to give evidence. And what happened was the, uh, the government blocked us from giving evidence, right? Um, we fought and they said, well, they can give evidence, but statement form only, not in person. So they didn't want either Maggie or myself being cross-examined. 
Um, however, we did get our evidence out there and, and my evidence was well received. And, and, and when you look at the inquiry on the whole, we had the fact that Special Branch were exposed for funding PI, which is a paedophile information exchange. Mm, we've done a lot of work on that with yeah, Sonia. Yeah, so Special Branch was shown as funding it. So the Metropolitan Police's intelligence service were funding. And what was the motive? Well, they said that they could monitor them if they did that. Um, it's just mad, you know. Uh, there was that. I mean, what's just come out with the head of the the Catholic Church, uh, Cardinal Vincent Nichols. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, um, I had a lot of correspondence with him because I said, as the uh, spiritual leader for the Catholics, what are you going to do? And basically, he turned around and told me to sod off. And then a lot of Catholics wrote to him and said, John, we just got a point. So he said, okay, come and see me. So I then went to see him and I went with my friend Tracy big respect to Tracy so they they, they wouldn't let Tracy in um, so uh, Tracy weren't allowed into Westminster Cathedral and then Vincent Nichols said that he wasn't about he was elsewhere so he was deputised to a bishop called Paul McAleen so but as Paul McAleen came in to meet me Vincent Nichols walked past you know so you can make it up um, I walked out of the meeting because the bishop for, for Westminster in the London area um, turned around and started blaming the victims of Ted Heath and saying what, what a horrific reputation, you know, damage to a good man's reputation. And, and basically it was his cognitive dissonance. Now, what's happened since the inquiry is that he's been berated, um, Paul McLean, but also Cardinal Vincent Nichols, has, they've attacked him, and rightly so, because he's put the reputation of the church before the victims' needs and the cover-up. So the Catholic Church have been seen as being covering it up and then deliberately, you know, um, rubbishing the victims. Mm. So absolutely appalling what's gone on, you know, and I've spoke to many, many victims and survivors of not just the, the Catholic Church, but also the Protestant, you know, the Anglican Church. Um, there's, I don't know if you're in touch with them, there's a, a brave um, couple of twins called the Blair Brothers, they'd be great to get on your show to be honest and they're victims and survivors Bobby and Joey Blair they're, they're, they're real stalwart campaigners they're very good friends uh, of mine and they were in a care home in uh, in Northern Ireland and they were uh, pimped out by the priests it was appalling what they went through mm. and they're made to uh, have sex with each other and things like oh. that whilst the priests would sit around masturbating and you know Oh, and, and to, to get justice, the, these boys are, are priceless. To get justice, the police wouldn't wouldn't listen to their um, their gripes. They wouldn't, they wouldn't report their crime, right? So they went into a police station in West Midlands, both of them. They poured themselves with petrol and they pulled a lighter out right? and said, unless you take our crime report, we're going to burn, right? And one of them turned around and said, next thing, the police... He sees a red dot and the police have got a taser on him. And he went, well, pull the trigger because we'll burn if you pull the trigger. You know, you're, you're, you're ignite us. We'll carry on. And um, in the end, he wow. said, we just want to. And that's what they had to do. It got in the Sun newspaper. That's what they had to do to get their, their, their complaint registered because the police kept pushing them off, pushing them off. So, again, when we were talking earlier on about how I, does a cover up goes, well, it goes right to the top, right to the top, my friend. You know, and so there is so much um, in in that in its own right. What's gone on in the Catholic Church, and and you know this cognitive dissonance, and we've seen it. But I I was when I first started this, um, I was called to a whistleblowers um, forum uh, in Parliament, a committee room, and this is very interesting because they had they brought all the heads of faith in right um, on this panel, and they were to address what their faith is doing and of course there was the catholics there and you know they, they were like saying well you know the papal father is doing this and doing that and has acknowledged it and out of ixa the pope has spoken out and has said yes we we've massively massively screwed up and you know we have allowed pedophiles to infiltrate and, and carry on with impunity and all that so this this guy from the catholic church says his bit and the anglican church they're missing their uh representative priest bishop whatever they wanted to send but what had happened is they'd sent a solicitor right and a bit odd anyway there was um uh, the hindu 
chap there and he said this is what we're doing hinduism in london where we've got these safeguarding and then um i think there was uh, someone from a synagogue jewish guy and um who, who bizarrely claimed that he hadn't heard of any allegations regarding his faith which seemed a bit odd um and then there was an imam and i'd given a speech like about an hour before about the truth and everything else so this imam stands up and he said um i listened to to the former police officer john what he said he said john it's about the truth and it's about speaking the truth isn't it and i said yes it is and it's in a packed room in parliament and the next thing this solicitor stands up who represented in the Anglican church and said i suggest that you refrain from what you're going to say and that you know you, you realized what a litigious state that you could be and it was all this sort of thinking well, that's a bit odd and he went i will not be silenced and i said i'll tell you why because father so-and-so made me suck his cock it was an imam saying this and he looked at me and he went the truth's the truth right and i went yeah the truth's the truth and he went i went to so-and-so's boys school and this bloke boom 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 and he shouted it out right anyway um it turned out that this priest had something to do with with a police force he was a chaplain for a police force and the solicitor was his brother right the next thing the imam um rings me up and he said i've just been bailed i've been arrested i went why he said contempt they've, they've arrested me so they've arrested him a bit like what we've seen with something to Jeanette and all that all he did was speak the truth he was sexually abused by by the bloke who's now quite high up in the anglican church and they expected the imam to give a speech about safeguarding what a geezer what a geezer and he said what do i do i said well you you, you go to court you go to court he went but if they find me guilty I, I'll have a black mark against my name because I'll have a conviction and I won't be able to work, you know. I said, don't worry. I said, I'll help you where I can. I'll help you where I can. Anyway, he went to court. I said, just go to court. You must go to court. So he went to court and it was uh, uh, in East London and they turned up, they opened the case and the Metropolitan Police withdrew their case, withdrew everything. You know, lo and behold, withdrew everything, you know. And, and see this is this is the you, you could not make it up you know how dirty it comes but who sanctioned his arrest in the first place and that's what you've got to look at who sanctions these things and they're the ones you go for but it shows they haven't got the balls to see it through when you speak out that's one of the things where these podcasts are so important they probably save lives to a degree they probably do because if you was loose lips and everything else you could be taken out no one no but when you give a testimony it might not negate people from uh, other problems later down the line but i genuinely believe that people's lives have been saved because of podcasts like this like many others like some of the ones i've done you know they've definitely saved lives and they've brought awareness beyond awareness but the ixa thing it's coming with mixed uh, reviews but the one way i say it look any way of speaking out is a way of speaking out and and when change is brought about it's a slow change and it has to go through the legal procedures and they are changing now and they are listening to people like me so for once i felt very honored because i was listened to for the first time i was officially listened to and it was recognized and it was documented you know on on a, on a national governmental level you know and on national media as well so it was a good thing for mm -hmm. me, i think so during your interactions with the church then you learned that cardinal cormac o'connor was on the reins yeah 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 which right so we've got the head of um the, the the catholic church now which is you know vincent nichols cardinal vincent nichols but before that was a bloke called cardinal um uh, murphy mccormack right um now i don't know much about this guy all i do know that his name he's dead now his name is on the reins list as being an active satanist so the head of the Catholic Church for the United Kingdom and overseas territories is an active or was an active Satanist according to Joan Coleman's reigns list. Okay, um, you know, so having, you know, checked out the reigns list, I mean, I stand by its validity. I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm going to sit on the fence legally here with this one because I don't want the Catholic Church suing me, but they never contested it. They never contested it. They never made any statement against it. And this was one of the things I was doing 
was with my campaign, not only with this senior police officer who's named on there, who was in charge of the clubs and vice unit, which I was working on, is named on there. There was also the head of the Catholic Church. So I said to people that this needs to be written in there. And if we look at, um, I think it's, is it George Carey or um, Lord, I think it's Lord George Carey now, um, who's a former Archbishop of Canterbury anyway. Uh, he's now a Lord, House of Lords. He he stood up for a bloke called Peter Ball, Bishop Peter Ball. Bishop Peter Ball is a child abuser, a convicted child abuser. And he was protected by Prince Charles for, for many years. You know, and he's a vile individual, um, Bishop Peter Ball. And, and this, and I think it's George Kerry, protected him and prevented a prosecution against him which would have saved at least one individual because he went on then to to abuse one young lad who then took his own life as a result you know so what so what i was doing was a campaign saying we need to write to house of laws to, to uh, question this bloke's validity and his reason for standing you know as a peer he should not be unless he fully explains himself he was, however, brought in uh, by ICSA and cross-examined over Peter Ball as well. So that they, they do get their way. But the problem is, is when when you put your questions, that's why they didn't want Maggie and myself giving live evidence because they can't control us. There'd be a mic on us, a TV camera, Sky News would be there, and that'd be going around the world. So I could say what the hell I wanted. So it was a wise move on their behalf as protectorates of the perverts to have us as statement-only submissions you know, and every question that my team had to put across to the government, everything else had to be filtered. Okay. Double filtered, then okayed again. And then, so it was an arduous process and it was full of constant arguing, legal arguing all the time. But God bless my barrister, you know, um, did a phenomenal job in, you know, in getting it out there. So it might not be seen for the victim and survivors. They might see it as a load of old crap and, and, and poppy cup and everything else. But, it was, I'm telling you now, it was a good step forward, a massive step forward. But yeah, again, th this guy, can't, you couldn't make it up. You've, you've got the head of the Catholic Church has been named on an official document as being an, an active Satanist. He's dead now. I can't account for Vincent Nichols. All I can say about Vincent Nichols is his reluctance to help me, reluctance to help um, victims and survivors of abuse. And he was criticised, heavily criticised by the national media and the ICSA inquiry. For, for how he would denigrate in victims and protecting the reputation of the Catholic Church. So a lot of question marks around them. So when we communicated this morning, you said you wanted to speak about ex-gangsters and the occult. Well, yeah, that, that goes back to what I was saying with um, the, the fellow that I'm dealing with at the moment, how heavily involved he was saying that as an armed robber, he was involved with witchcraft and the juju, the Mahamrabats, and these are witch doctors which were, which were put in on protective um, demonic shields. So he would be safe in his mission. He would have the aggression and the anger and no one would touch him. And what he was saying to me, it's very, very rife, very rife. So you've got, you know, the juju from the West African and the voodoo stuff, you know, the juju are the, the, the witch doctors. The, the Jamaicans have got the opia, which is a... a, a derivative of voodoo a bit like santeria you know and, and it's very active with their criminals as well you know and um and he was just it was it, it's an ongoing thing at the moment but yeah i sort of covered that a bit earlier how he would be absolutely invisible he said i'd be totally invisible i would just the police couldn't see me and, it, and he, he said it involved me having a reign of terror for a very long time so cops and racism and we had the guy in America who got, um, what was the guy's name, who got choked out? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, well, they knelt on him. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, he was a convicted drug dealer, wasn't he? And um, there's a lot There's a lot of strange stuff going around there. But, I mean, one, I mean, anyway, he died, and that's tragic enough. Um, they call it positional restriction as well. A lot of people would die when people were on them. Uh, I used to call it the Met Police free fall team because everyone would be like diving on top of some. Um, I've even been in situations where, where someone's had 10 people on them just stood up like nothing's happened and just thrown them off. But cops and racism, right. Um, uh, it's a bit rich, me talking about racism. I mean, the only thing I've ever been called is a gypo. They thought I was a gypsy. So, uh, Who so, called you that? 
Uh, Not the trolls. Uh, everyone. They all call me. You know, they used to put pictures up if I was to move. Uh, and they put a picture of a caravan, wedges on the move, you know, <laughs> any scrap metal. To be. And and I was asked if I wanted to buy a senior officer, if I wanted to take it further. I was like, no, you know. <laughs> but that was, they just thought it was a gypsy. I was always poor and on the cadge for something. So they just, uh, anyway. But, you, you know, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing a book now. Um, I'm well on way now to... Um, to getting a, a good chunk of it completed. And I've been talking to colleagues uh, about racism, you know, because it's one thing that, that, that that's very on vogue when, when you talk about the police, the police racism. And, uh, you know, I said to them, have you ever experienced racism or seen racism? And the answer tends to be no, no. And homophobia. Have you, no. And what, what seemed to be consistent was, and one guy, um, he, he'd always worked in South East London, you know, uh, a lot of black officers, a lot of gay officers, and it was. We had a lot, a lot of lesbians when I was on the team. You know, we had a lot, and um, I, I was on a team of of six, and we had two black geezers, um, and a les and a gay bloke. That's right. And you know, so when you come to that thing, the, the when people get ostracised in the police is where they're snidey and they don't have a go. Street policing, you've got to get stuck in, especially if you're in a in a dangerous area. You get judged by whether you get stuck in or not and that is in a fight and that, that's, that's it because if someone stands by while you're getting stamped over they ain't good enough so they didn't care if you was gay lesbian black asian whatever they, they didn't care i'm talking on a low down level higher up yes there is racism yes without a doubt yes i'm not black so i wouldn't have experienced it and and when you talk about races racism is mainly aimed at, at at the black officers my mate um I won't name him because he's still serving, but he, um, Jamaican, and he used to, um, when he joined in, in sort of the early 80s, he said it was rife, which it would have been because when I joined officers, uh, uh, joined in the 60s and the 70s, and, and yes, back then it would have been, you know, heavily, yeah, but everywhere else would have been, to be honest, you know. So where I saw racism was before joining the police at work, and then subsequently after joining the police, I went back to building sites. I ended up working as a labourer and, and a block layer on building sites. And it was absolutely like going back in time. The banter, it was honestly, it was because it, it was all white geezers. It was all like old, well, say old school banter, but it was it was proper racist. And I thought, there's no way you'd have got away with that in the police. You'd have been sacked. You'd have been in prison. So, no. No, I'd say no. If you work certain areas, you're going to get a bit of a disliking for certain cultures. So um, if you work Southall, some of the Sikh boys would end up getting on your nerves because they would be in your face and they would be the boys on the street in Southall. And if you work Peckham, it would be the young black lads would be the more prominent in your face. But if you talk to officers who work in Hertfordshire, their problem is travellers, Irish travellers. And they'll say, our biggest problem is Irish travellers. And that's how it goes. So it depends, you know, where, you know, and one of them, he um, said to me, he worked um, Golders Green and he, he didn't like the Jewish community because they were rude. He said they were just always rude. You know, so so that's that, that's how it was. So um, it was mainly the demographics of where you worked and what you dealt with, you know. Um, but like I said to someone, that the, the people I, I saw get picked on the most were ginger hair people. They actually got picked on and openly you know berated and whatever more than anyone else because they were fair game you know but um so, so it's it's an interesting topic to to go on um but um that i'm not a black officer i'm not an asian officer you know uh and i would be it, it would be a different story but i would say on a higher up i know one guy he he was he was passed over for promotion because he was catholic because the Metropolitan Police had never, ever promoted um, a, a Northern Ireland Catholic above the rank of superintendent. So you've got sectarianism. And if you if you was to go and policing in Scotland, you go to um, uh, Strathclyde as it was, it was a predominantly Protestant police force, as is Northern Ireland, 90% Protestant, absolutely horrifically sectarian. Now, if you mention sectarianism down there, they're like, well, what are you on about? It basically isn't there. But you go up there, it's a massive issue, you know, a real issue. And, you know, and it's it's life or death up there. You know, people actually do get a good kick in. And, and I would have thought um, Merseyside would probably be predominantly Catholic police force. 
So you're going to get it wherever you are. But I, I just think it's an important thing because whenever people think that police and racism, it's this white officers against the black officers. And I never, ever saw that. And not only that, the, the black officers I, I worked with were tough, you know, and if anyone would have said anything to them on their on their level, not on our, they would have just smashed them anyway, you know. So I lived in America for, what, 16, 17 years, very multicultural. My friends were black, Mexican, Korean, on and on and on. And um, all those people would make jokes about other races, yeah, yeah, racist yeah, yeah. jokes. Do you think then that racism, everyone t has got a degree of it in them, whether they show it or yeah, not? And yeah. perhaps racism and nationalism, there's some kind of psychological explanation about protection of the hive. Of course, of course. You know, and it used to be with jokes. We'd make jokes about the Irish. The Irish would make jokes about the Kerrymen. You know, and if you got Poland, they make jokes about the Lithuanians, and so the Koreans in Arizona making jokes yeah, about the Mexicans. Yeah. And I, I, it's really <laughs> funny because you're going about New York. I I had to go there with with the Met Police to New York, and and I I turned up and I went to um, Midtown Station. I had to meet someone a copper there, you know, and they had they were very old fashioned, and they had uh, a desk sergeant where we we got rid of them like. A decade ago maybe two decades ago in, in in the uk and he's there with his stripes and he's got the irish trickler badge and i think oh, okay and he, and he said oh, explain who i was where i come from and i was with a colleague and uh he said well where, where are you from son i thought i've just told him I'm from the metropolitan police and i've come to see detective sansa and he went no 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 you don't understand what's your heritage i went well i'm british and he went you don't look British, you know, because it was a summer and I I was tanned, you know, and I said my father was, you know, uh, from from Sicily and that. And uh, he said, you don't look... I said, well, I am. He went, no, son. He said, well, your real heritage, your heritage, your real heritage. I went, oh, and I sort of got it. And I went, oh, no, 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 my dad's from Sicily. And he went, you was... And I went, no, he said, you're... That's right. He said, you... Timestamp these. We might have to um, YouTube policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, means without passport. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, There's policies. Yeah, oh, like, yeah anyway. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so I said, uh, oh, I suppose so. He said, you don't talk to me. He said, you need my colleague. So he whistles over, and he and he, this bloke there, another copper there, and he's a little guy about my height, my colour skin, grey hair, scruffy. Goes Vincenzo. There's some. I said, just say it, some spick bobby from London to see you. And he walks over and he comes up to me and he, and he prods me. <sighs> he goes, what's your name, son? I went, John. And he went, hey, Johnny. <laughs> and I thought, and I was, so I pulled him back, went, hey, Vinny, really English. <laughs> and next thing he gets me in a headlock and he starts going, hey, Johnny. And he throws me on the floor, starts tickling me. <laughs> and let's forget, he goes, don't talk to that Mick, come with me. And, and then smacks me on the horse. <laughs> and I said to him, Vinny, what's that about? And he went, Come and see our locker room. Come and see our locker room. He said, he said, us Italians, we don't, we'll never ever work with the Irish. He said, we work with the Polish and the South Americans and Mexicans are okay, but we never work with the Irish. And they had segregation in their locker room. So the Irish had their locker bit, uh, and then the Polish officers, and then the Italians had theirs, right? But what was odd about it was that there was like, on the Irish lockers, there's like, like a little bit of black marker pen. I said, what, what, what's that for, Vinny? He went, the integrity guy comes, right? And I said, okay. And if someone put something racist about the Irish, you know, he'll come and paint it off, right? With a bit black. So is it, the, the Irish lockers had a little bit black on them, right? Polish had none. And you go to the Italian section, they just sprayed them all black. And then we, <laughs> we went, he said, he got fed up of it. He said, because <laughs> someone put, Vinny's mum loves elephant dick or this, that, and typical Italian banter, you know? Yeah, and yeah. then. So they, they were just, so they in there and they just sprayed them all black and every once a month they'd just spray them black again. But it was really weird, the segregation. And he said, you get that in England? I went, no, not at all. Really heavily entrenched in, in the American culture where we don't get that here. We don't get that. I mean, we're so mixed in this country. I mean, especially with the East Europeans now, you, you know, we had the Lithuanians, we had the Polish, and we've got the Romanians now, but no one really gives us hostage today. The only thing is they cook better food than our women and they like to have a drink, so <laughs> everyone seems to get on. But, yeah, no, it, I think there is always that something. There's always someone you've got to hate, but I don't know. I think we're quite a tolerant bunch compared to the uh, rest of the world. All right, going over to the questions then. 
who was the most famous British entertainer or sports person John knew of who was a paedophile? Probably Jim, is Jimmy Savile well, the most be, famous it, entertainer? Yeah, it'd have to be Jimmy Savile. I mean, there's one I can't name, you know, and what you've got to understand is that these are people that, if I said it, they never got convicted. Now, there's a world of difference between proof and truth, a world of difference, right? With investigators, you will deal with the suspects and the victims. We have the highest burden of proof in the world, beyond all reasonable doubt. It's incredibly difficult. And for a, um, a historic child abuse case to get through to conviction from start to finish is a 2% success rate. It's it, it just because there is no evidence, right? But certain names would always crop up, always. The name that always cropped up and it angers me even to think of how this person got away was Leon Britton. Mm. Always mm. cropped up. And that came from so many sources, so many sources. And, you know, and um, the paedophile unit were the ones when I was doing stuff with them. They He was like, boom. Um, there was a case in Buckinghamshire where a young boy was abducted and abused over a weekend period. Two people were convicted. A third person got away and this kid always said it was a third one the actor he was the one who did it mm -hmm. and this actor is so famous on comedy on sitcom right the, the, this case is in the paper right and if but, but what i'm going to say is i could say his name but what i'm going to say about him would would, would would denigrate that you know and put me in a world of trouble mm -hmm. um because he was the one that was abusing the kid. And um, my mate investigator said, that kid weren't lying, it was him. And I heard it from someone else, again, from another source, this one actor, and he's so well-known, the comedy, people love him. They mm. love him. They dress up like him, and their their mannerisms like him, say his, his sayings and all that. And he's, you know, um, and again, there was, you know, a famous singer, you know, and... Um, I've heard that from quite a few coppers. This bloke was prolific and actually was worse than Jimmy Savile. You know, so it's a difficult one. It was the politicians, yes, you know, they would crop up. They would crop up on a lot of inquiries. Um, and, and you know, I know about them and get to know about them. And they did in certain stuff that I dealt with. Um, there was another one when Operation All come out and it was to doing the downloading images. There's a man that had a conviction from that, a caution from that, from having the images. And um, he's always on the telly now, him and his wife, you know, um, saying that what good parents they are and everything else. And again, I can't say anything. So it, it, it's a difficult one, that. A difficult one, that. But but posthumously, you know, the dead can't sue. And um, Leon Britton was always, always mentioned, always mentioned. And, you know, from many, 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 many sources that come from. So this one ties into what you've just said. Does John think there are more Jimmy Savile types working in the media today and to the same degree? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, worse. I mean, worse. J Jimmy Savile was unique in as much as I, I heard many years ago someone say about he's a gangster, he's a tough man, and, and he apparently was a wrestler and he was a hard man and he was a, meant to be a ruthless, ruthless man. And I heard that a long time ago. He had someone kidnapped in a basement, didn't he, according to his uh, Louis Thoreau interview? Yeah, and it's quite interesting. And it ties in with what this guy said to me. He said he was, he was a hard man, you know, and I heard he was a nonce as well, you know. Um, but he, I mean, he was a fixer, so he was sorting everything out. And I think his attitude and his ego, he, he just did it to such a degree. I mean, incredible at the level. But there, there's many others working you know, that they're keeping their heads down, you know, and, and they're probably carrying on and successful and will never be exposed. You know, it's those you don't know about, the names you don't know are the dangerous ones, you know, but th th there's many more and it, it's rife. It, it is so rife. Does John think they should arrest Prince Andrew and free Julian Assange? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah massively, yeah. Yeah, without doubt. What? Why, why is, I mean, the only person who's infallible is the Queen, his mum. Why was he not arrested? I mean, look, in our in our statute law, right, it says that, that you can be arrested for an offence overseas if it were an indictable offence in the UK. So you could go and kick someone in the balls in Thailand and be arrested for it over here, right? That stands, right? What he did in America, 
needs investigating. You know, they should have been arrested. And what and, he did and, on the island and, as and, well. And so should have so should have the McCanns have been arrested for child neglect. They should have been abandonment. They should have been arrested. Uh, both of them and and him, yeah, without a doubt. And Assange, what they, I mean, Assange clearly ties in what we were saying earlier that that when when you get to a level that they that they can't shut you up anymore, then they bang you up. You know? So like we talked about character assassination, physical assassination. So him, it's like they've just buried him. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised he's not been done in, to be honest, you know, but he'll go mad. You, you know? can see how he's aged and yeah. his, the effects it's taken it, on it, him physically. It was, it was mental health, isn't it? It's, um, you know, it's slowly, slowly. I mean, I t I'll tell you something. There was um, a, a guy I knew um, and he was in prison with Abdul El Magrahi, the Lockerbie bomber. Right, and I think it was either in Balini or Sockton. Now I spent a lot of time in the in the Scottish prison system, going up and interviewing various people. And I, for some reason, I always ended up in the Scottish system. Quite a brutal system up there. And again, we're talking Balini. about races. Balini, um, that they hated the English, and this guy was saying the English stay in their cells. They don't. He said, go for breakfast. They'll just get punched in the face. They 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 the guy go mad. The English in there because they hated absolutely hated and they are game on for everyone the english so i mean imagine we did that to a certain race in our prison system you'd end up being done but there it was like a given the, the, so the english are like just hated in the prison system but um so i said to him well, how does um el mcgrahi and he said well I, I sometimes i get to talk to him in the mosque both muslims he said then there's not many of us you know the prayer room or whatever they got in there and uh he said he's a good man he said he was doing for the british government what i do for you give information he said he was working for the government and he said he knew too much and he said everyone here knows he never did that everyone knows he's innocent that's why he doesn't get beaten up in here and he said that's why he's safe in here because they all know he's and he said he's a good man he said he's a really lovely man but he said everywhere he goes he has two guards and you're not allowed to talk but he said we would end up talking you know in arabic or whatever to each other and he said that's you know every now and then we'll i'll get a moment with him i'm allowed near him you know because of the, the the Islam thing, but he said, you know, the others, he said, no one's allowed near him. So they go to all that level to silence him. Abdul uh, McGrath said, so this guy was saying, he is innocent, Al uh, McGrath. And you think, what a cover up. And I think they go so far, they've got to see it through. They've got to see it through. It's a bit like with what they did to me. They, they just did so much to try and shut me up. And in the end, it was like, in the end, it was a high-ranking officer. Just, he just said enough, and he was good as gold to me. And he just said, you, you, "You're out of here. You're, you're getting pensioned off. You'll get no more trouble because they don't want you talking." They, you know. So Sanj, everything he reported on was proven to be 100 percent true. So it seems like he sacrificed his life for the truth. Yeah, I know. And what, what a price to pay. You know, what a price to pay. I mean, he's where is he still in? Have they extradited him now? Is he gone? No, he's fighting it. He's in uh, Belmarsh, isn't he? Yeah, we're trying to get um, an Assange lawyer into the podcast. No, oh, that'd be good. Yeah, it's a, I really want to support But he will, he will be well thought of in, in the prison system. I think a lot of people will yeah. know that he's, you know, he's not snide. Yeah, yeah. Um, Prince Charles has many dodgy pedo associations, including Jimmy Savile. Do you have any information on Prince Charles? Yeah, yeah loads, and I'm not going to talk about it. And that's <laughs> it. I mean, I'm really sorry, but yeah, I mean, my words. Uh, hopefully, one day the truth will come out. Hopefully, one day. But again, I can't honestly because that that'll be it. That'll be curtains for me. But um, right, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. I have not one bit of good to say about that man. Not one bit of good. Um, but alternatively, I've got a lot to say. But again, I can't. Again, I can't. When the camera's off, chat, so I'll uh, fill you in on that one. How widespread does John think paedophilia has become in society? Does one person committing the act lead to multiple victims? Well, well, of course. Perhaps some of which commit the same crimes, leading to more and more victims overall in society. Yeah, um, I mean, Corrine, this this is this is quite um qu quite an interesting sort of thing. The pyramid. Corrine uh, gives a brilliant analogy on that. And she said, one active, very active paedophile will will cause 2,000 victims in their life. The the reoffending of a victim, the demographics of reoffending of a victim are 10%. So 10% of the victim community go on to, to reoffend. Oh, I didn't know that. 10%, yeah. Um, and, and again, 
you know, it's higher in that society. Well, well of course, it's going to be, isn't it? So you the know? nerve victims, another yeah. 10%, it just goes, uh, psh. But, but not only that, let's look at, at not just the sexual um, aspect of reoffending. What about offending in general when 80% of, of the lower category, you know, younger prison population have come from abused backgrounds? Mm. We're talking alcoholism. We're talking suicide. Paedophilia is a rot like no mm. other. You know, it's like gangrene. You'll never get rid of it, you know. But what you can't do is ignore it. You know, it needs exposing, like what I've been doing, like we've been doing these podcasts with people like Brave Darren and many others coming forward. It needs exposing, you know. And in doing that, you're educating society, you're educating parents. You know, we need to keep our families tight and close. You know, we need to bring love back to the family. You know, we need to value our children because if we don't, they are prey for these monsters. And once they start doing this, kids, they, they are going to, turn change something in that child forever forever um it, that's a massive question you know that, that is so loaded i could go on and bring on so many ev so much evidence so many witnesses to that question it's um let's bang on that is but kareen i say kareen uh, has said that a study shows that one very active paedophile will cause two thousand victims in their lives in their lifetime so i don't know whether the next one is a question or a statement but i'll just read it and then get your thoughts Hi, Sean. I just wanted to know if these elite horror allegations is just going to roll on and on and get milked for all it's worth for decades like the alien conspiracy indefinitely without any of us ever getting conclusive proof and eventually fizzle out just like the alien stories because it's quite frustrating being kept in suspense. And two, I think people will simply switch off and get bored by that at the same time as being called upon to pay attention and then the alleged have won. Yeah, no, I get where they're coming from. I um, don't. What, what? They're a bit of a dissenter. I think they're okay. saying, you know, a bit like when we've seen people like Cliff Richard accused and then got off and all this. But let me tell that, that person who sent that in that whenever someone is abused, sexually abused, there's only two people present, unless it's an audio, of course. That one who's being abused and the one who's getting it done to them. Right. The, the, the fundamental thing is you always lack evidence when it comes to, to child abuse allegations. Usually when people come forward, it, it's years, years later after years of torment and, and self-abuse themselves, self-worth, you know, loathing and all that, you know, drug addiction and everything else. And, and all they want is some corroboration. Now, that's where good investigation comes in and, and it is doable. I had an 80% success rate on a 2% parameter. So I did very good at it and, and was commended and rightly so for it because I enjoyed what I was doing. So you're never going to get that. But listen, if the same person is being accused time and time again, there's something in it, my friend. And this is one thing I say to people. If you've got a young family, right? A, a husband and a wife and a little kid and they're going to go out for the night and they want a babysitter so they they say well who do we get and they say well th this person here is lovely beautiful never any problems with that person really sweet kind the kid loves them and all that however there's that one never been convicted but there's a lot of rumors and allegations i mean are you going to send your kid there well the answer is no the same analogy how are you ever going to know right you're never going to know these celebrity allegations aren't malicious right I would say to anyone like that, you know, just, just sit in on an investigation where you'll never be privy to it and you see when a kid gives the AB interview, the paediatric examination, you, the evidence that a kid will give about the place and everything else, and then it's corroborated by another, by another, by another, by another. I mean, Jana is, 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 is the one, Lord Jana, you know, victim after victim after victim after, oh, you could go on and on and on and on. And one of his victims, a brave, brave guy who stood up and, and, kept himself alive just so he can speak out and inquire. He was harassed by, by Janice's son, Daniel, and then and then by his daughter as well, trying to demonise and rubbish them. And because they can do that, because these are, on the whole, lower and working class people that are usually, some of them are literate, especially if they've been in the system, the care system and then the prison system. You know, they might have weight issues for overeating because they're, they're tormented, drink issues, drug issues, whatever. And then they're going to have convictions usually for dishonesty or for violence. And they're easy to trash and rubbish. But, you know, this is coming from someone who's very ignorant to how this goes on. This, this is coming from someone who has no victim intervention. 
you know, and there's no reality of what goes on in these things. So the, 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 I get where they're coming from. But what I'm saying to it, the reason they're going on is because the police is not investigating it. They're refusing to investigate it. They're sidetracking it because higher up in the government, they don't want it coming out. And I'll tell you this, if the truth, no, that person, if you ever knew what I and so many other child abuse investigations knew, you know, from our intelligence and from the work that we've done, I'll tell you what, you'd never watch a Hollywood film. You'd never watch a BBC comedy for a start. You wouldn't even turn the radio on. You know, and, and, and you take no interest in politics, you, you know, and that's the reality of this. And it's deep and it's dirty. How come our corrupted government has been put on trial for treason when they, our politicians, are loyal only to their bank accounts? Yeah, and that's a bit of a freeman of the land thing, isn't it? You know, because I think going into Europe was classed as a treasonous act when it... By, by, you know, if we're going down the, the common law route. And All right, let's, let's move on. Yeah. Are we moving towards a society that accepts paedophilia as a sexual orientation? Because there has been some jurisdictions yeah, and places course. around the world where they're yeah. trying to lower it, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are. And it's just the LGBTQ and now they want another one. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of that. That's a good question. There was um, a lady who was a former prostitute got in touch with me and I was going to do an interview with her. Uh, but again, the, the, the health scenario stopped all that. But she was at a conference and she was giving a talk and there was a politician there. And this politician had um, either a conviction or a caution for, I think, sexual assault on a child or something like that. Anyway, child porn or something like that. And um, when we look at, I, I think it's the, the Reform Act where a politician can have convictions. They, they, they can only be kicked out if they've served a prison sentence of greater than a year. And if they can, after seven years, they can get that expunged. So, you know, they can basically do what they want and keep their job, which which is wrong. It shouldn't be allowed. And she said there was this politician who had, there had been uh, something to do with criminality involving a child, right? A young boy. And she brought it up. She was a victim survivor of abuse herself. She was a, a, a prostitute and then a madam of a brothel. And now she's an outreach worker. Very streetwise, worldly-wise, and outspoken individual. And she called this guy a nonce, right? Uh, meaning paedophile, you know? And he then went into a meltdown, a little bit of a, and then demanded that she was removed. And he turned around and his answer was, I'm not a paedophile, I'm a minor attracted person. Oh. Might they call him a map. And so he, he's, and, and he was then seen as a victim. She got booted out and then he went off sick and, putting for some compensation or something what? because yeah and he turned around i can't remember his name now and uh, i've lost contact with her but yeah he's a mine and this is in terms of a big public forum a minor attractive person so it's already underway i mean if we look at pornography what is it doing to our youth that's I mean, how the teachers tell me the kids get their sex education off the phones oh man and and of course and what education oh. are they getting it, it gets more and more extreme it's gang banging, you know, it's, you know, this multiple ejaculation and, on faces and all. It's horrific, really, what it's desensitizing them. And again, and where, how, years ago, you had to go to the top shelf and you wouldn't be able to buy one anyway because you wouldn't you know, buy one, you know. Um, now, where, where, are, where is the, the gatekeeping on it? You just go on it and that's it, whatever you want. Porn, 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 porn. And there is no attempt to, to diminish it or regulate it. No attempt whatsoever. It's absolutely horrific. Um, so it, it's, it's wrong. And the other thing I think they should um, ban is, is when people are videoing someone fighting and they're cheering while someone's getting their head stamped on. I watched one, a special needs boy, and there was five girls stamping on his head. Mm. Imagine that was your son, you know, and they were cheering and it made me feel sick. And I, I just thought, well, what have we become as a society, you know? Well, we're doing a series on this channel on the dark web and red rooms. Are you familiar with red rooms? Uh, was it a nightclub? No, no. Red rooms is where, like, they have a live broadcast of a kid, for example, in the Philippines. Right. And you, the people watching get to pay for levels of torture on the kid, and they can actually snuff the kid out. 
Well, that will be the ultimate thing when it. That That's what they've got. Snuff, they've had, they've got it now. Them, yeah, they've got it. And and you know the thing is, the British government, even to this date, deny the existence of snuff films. They deny the existence of them. You know, and a lot of these kids, you know, when they when they're abused in these satanic things, it's filmed as well. It's filmed. I've heard of so many that the way it was filmed, it was filmed, it was filmed, and it's just um. Oh, the, the stories I could tell on that alone, that will come out in the book. I'm going to individual um, accounts that people have given me and what, what they've experienced. And it's all to do with, with the torture, the rape and the murder of children, the murder of children. Um, Please, could you ask John about his views on the Samantha Baldwin and oh, Victoria Hay cases yeah. and the hamster to cover up? Yeah, of course I will. Oh, Samantha Baldwin is without... We've had her on the channel. She's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, she's what, the most honourable, she's got a book out. Um, so please buy a book. The most honourable woman, I will stand by Samantha Baldwin 100%. That is a woman telling the truth. Um, what she's gone through is appalling. What she continues to go through even to this day is just, just absolutely shocking. How this woman even functions. Her own mother has gone to prison for, for standing up for her and her grandchildren. And um, yeah, I feel all the time for Samantha. I, I just think she is a decent human being. Uh, Vicky Haig as well. I spoke to Vicky. Again, very similar circumstances, you know. And this is the, 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 the secret family court covering it up, covering it up. And the Hampstead thing, again, look what they've done with the Hampstead thing. They had to denigrate everything. It's quite strange because a cop had come to me that had some dealings with the Hampstead thing, right? And he said, John, you know, I've been watching you for quite a while now, your, your stuff. You know, and he said at first, he said, when them kids made them allegations, eating babies, and all that, he said, I thought, you know what? Like, he said, seriously, John, you were always a copper. If someone said that to you, you, really, what would you do? And he said, they were all, all the protesters were all sort of like lefty lot and they got on our nerves. So you can sort of see where he was coming from to agree. But he said, having watched your stuff now and listened to it and many others now, I don't think them kids were lying, John. And I said, well, I'm telling you now, the kids weren't lying. They were not lying. My opinion I, I'm not giving any opinion on, on, on the parents. The children were telling the truth. They gave a free-flowing narrative, a totally unbroken free-flowing narrative. How that evidence was attained and put out was probably going to diminish the case because it's already been put out there and therefore their, their, their first account will be trashed. But what was put out and what I saw of it and the way that the kids articulate, they were telling the truth. And it ties in very much with what we spoke about, you know, on, on many stuff anyway, you know. So, yeah, a big topic, the Hampstead thing. I've heard many times now, including two cases on a personal level, of police not taking the computer or even looking at the computer oh, yeah. of a person arrested for sex with a child. Yeah. Why is this not police standard practice it, in these cases? Yeah, I know. Uh, and, and I was, funny enough, that's really bizarre. Uh, because I was talking about this the other day, when um, Fred and Rose West were arrested, right? Oh. They they had um, a, a dirty video club, right? And there was coppers involved in this club, right? And I no doubt it was snuff films as well. I mean, these, these were serial killers. They were probably killing to order as well. And they were making their own porno films. Because she was having sex with some of the police, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was. She was yeah, being yeah. to them. There was 900 videotapes seized. Not one, not one was watched. When Mark Dutroux was arrested, right, boxes and boxes of videotapes were, were seized and not. Now, when I, when I used to take, I would take everything by the kitchen sink. And it would all go off. This is what I was saying about the Tommy Robinson thing earlier with his little girl in the swimming pool. Then blokes who had recording devices. It should have all been interrogated. Laptops, computers, um, you know, uh, phones, and also um, printers, because printers, there's a history on the printer and you can work out stuff from that. They should be turning the houses over. They should be doing everything. It's laziness and it's bad leadership. And what's happened is they have diminished the police to such a monumentally piss poor degree. They're now recruiting. But what are they recruiting? They're kids training kids. When I joined, you couldn't even drive a car till you had five years in. Now they're teaching them. I was taught by what they call old sweats. You know, I had some brilliant teachers, you know, and they knew it inside out. And they knew the psychology of people as well. Now they haven't got any of that. They haven't got that tenacity and they've lost their tradecraft. So 
it is there. It's down to each individual officer that who, if they fail to take their computer, well, why is the supervisor? If I was a detective sergeant, so what the f and you go back and get it. And I tell you what, that happened on the Baby P case. Mm. That was one of the officers failed to seize toys, and it said to me, said to me, this this lad totally screwed up, and it went, go and get a warrant now and seize that. So I had to go to that house and get a warrant and go and um, boot their door in and seize a load of equipment. But, yeah, so it happens all the time. Lazing, right, listen, a lot of the time, it's not corruption, it's laziness and incompetence. Most of the time. Also, another question for John, this is from the same person. How can we ensure change happens and our children are protected? Well, we, we got to want the change, you know? We've got to stand up and demand the change. We've got to make everyone accountable. These chief constables, whenever they let the side down, Manchester is now in uh, GMP, Greater Manchester Police, and now in special measures because they were embarrassed through the ICSA inquiry and through the grooming gang scandals, right? Now, we've got politicians. They do F all, right? We should be writing to our politicians. We should be making these chief constables serve us. They're there to serve us. The politicians are there to serve us. It's apathy on our behalf. The first thing I say on, 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 on a personal note is, men, stop leaving your children. Stop getting girls pregnant outside of marriage and leaving your children, right? Stop it. Women, take an interest in your children, right? Lioness, protect your cubs on a personal level, all right? On a greater level, a bigger society level, or whatever you want to call it, start making these highly paid individuals earn their effing money, you know, and bring decency back. I should have thought, though, lioness protect your cubs. Yeah. What about these women who were offering the babies up to the lost prophets? Yeah, yeah, singer yeah, Ian yeah, Watkins? Ian Watkins, yeah. What yeah. possesses someone yeah, to do yeah. that? And, and do you know, the, the strange thing is, um, his, one of his girlfriends, she said straight away, I knew he had a, an unnatural interest in, in young girls, right? And didn't she end up getting investigated? Yeah, she did. But prior to her, he'd been going out with, was it Holly Willoughby or one of them? Can't or was it, was it one of these TV presenter girls? Well, where's her voice on this? We don't hear her. Oh. And she's she's like, it's either Holly Willoughby or, 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 or Cotton. Who's the other one? Fern Cotton. Might be her, Fern Cotton. Or, I don't know, one of them. Anyway, it was one of them girls. We don't hear them speaking out about it. And and they've locked away the files for 40 years. Mm. Haven't he got a 40-year sentence as well. So we never really know what he was up to and who he was linked with. But, yeah, appalling. But, you know, again, we look back at the satanic abuse. It's the mothers that were grooming the girls for a lot of it and procuring the kids for it. So, John, you talk about satanic ritual abuse, but do you know the difference between satanists and occultists? Oh, it's a bit like Satanists and Luciferians. I mean, it, it depends, right, who you're asking. Now, <laughs> if you ask a fundamental Christian, right, anyone who sort of stargazes is an occultist and therefore doing the work of the, the demonic, right? I, I mean, was in the bank once and um, this little old lady heard me say that I did yoga. Yeah, again, I was just going to say... She was like, I was just going to say... Satanist! Uh, Satanist! I was just going to say yoga. <laughs> yoga um, is another one that they turn around and say that the yoga opens the chakras and, it, and, yeah. It's, yeah, and there's yeah. a form of yoga which, which is deity worship and idolatry. And so, I mean, and, and then you go down the, the topic of demonology. So it's a big subject. I mean... You have to draw the line somewhere, right? I mean, I know people that think that that Muslims are worshiping who worship Allah are worshiping a demonic god. You know, uh, um, I've had Christians say to me, "I can't interact with Sikhs because Sikhs don't believe in Jesus." Therefore, it's you know, I don't entertain that because you know, if I was born in the foothills of, of Pakistan, right, there is no way I'd be a Catholic. You know, I would be a Muslim, you know, and the same if I was born born in certain parts of India, I would be so. And, and of course, on it goes, you know. Um, but with Satanists, you know, th these people intentionally are worshipping a very malevolent and negative, well, the ultimate malevolence deity, which is Satan. You know, there, there is no ignorance here and there's no do you know what i mean they know what they're doing now there might be someone who goes and buys a few crystals and someone will call them a satanist and they well no it's nice i like holding them i like this it's not you know again that's maybe lack of education or whatever it is a choice but they're not deliberately and intentionally worshiping satan so it's the difference then someone who is worshiping satan versus someone who is into esoteric practices yeah well, well well again i mean i have other people say there's no such thing as a white witch 
I mean, I had white witches who contacted me and say, we're sending you protection. I had one, one woman, she's, she was heavily involved in the satanic because her parents were Satanists and she was, and, and, and she'd become a pagan, right? And she, she would give me some cracking information, right? Brilliant. And one day she said, oh, can I, can I meet you? I've got a present for you. And I went, okay. So I went and met her and she said, um, well, it's not a present as such, but what I've done is I've put a curse on all those who've hurt you. And I went, <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't want that. Oh, please, no, I don't want I said, if you want to do something, go into church and pray for me. I don't want you doing, don't ever do that again. But she thought she was helping me. So, you know, um, I, I think if, if you're if you're dealing with like Wilfred, there's a line in the sand, you know, and you don't cross that line, you know, very good because, because any doorway is a doorway, you know. And, and sort of, again, what we discussed earlier about praying, you felt oppressed, spiritually oppressed, because you, you're bringing the truth out. The devil don't want the truth out. It wants to be, occult means hidden. It wants to remain hidden. Now, I don't believe in the, in the occult because I want everything in the open. Let it out and let it breathe, you know? So it, it depends on what degree you're involved in it. I think those that are very heavily involved in it, and I may have been on the precipice of getting heavily involved in that as well. So I had to keep myself very much aligned to Jesus because I was up against such demonic malevolence. And but sometimes my life isn't clean, you know. So am I opening the doors there? So it's it's a big topic. I mean, we're going into theology here, and we're going into demonology, and we're going into the, the real crux of Christianity as well. So it's a big topic. Um, but what I say was, you can't be careful because some things are veiled, very, very veiled, and you might not know really the real extent of what you're getting into until it's a bit late. You know. Going back to what we do, then I think on my channel now I've been exposing um, this kind of activity for about two plus years, perhaps. Yeah. There's a quote from Nietzsche. If you stir too long into the abyss, yeah, you I, might fall in. There's a mate of mine likes that saying. Are and, we and, uh, are yeah. we absorbing yeah, yeah. what we are combating? And it's, it's it's getting inside of us. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful, and that's why I have had to step away. I mean, I'm now digging. I'm doing voluntary work, but I'm bricklaying. I'm block laying, and I'm converting a property for someone all for voluntary for free, you know, and all that because I had to. Because I was I was staring into the abyss, and again, you know, we've got someone here there who always says that, and I think that's exactly what happens. You know, you, you live with these beasts for too long, and it can get under your skin, and you don't realise the effect. You know, but on the other hand, you you can be a shining light. You know, there, there's a lot of people that need help. They need help, but the problem is, like a mate of mine who was in the Marines, he said, you go up to a drowning man, first thing you do is punch him. Because he's going to claw you and bring you down. So you've got, boom, you know, align them and make sure you're 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 in control. But otherwise, what happened with me? Everyone jumped on board. Bang, 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 bang. John, John, John. And in the end, your energy is drained. And you, you, you're going to be dealing with people with very negative energy, you know. And you're going to be dealing with people that have had heavy dealings, maybe with proper malevolence. And there may be a lot attached to them that's going to want to bring you down. Some people don't know they're doing it. I mean, there's one woman, she, I think she's a lovely woman, but she's so badly uh, been abused and damaged, literally, she, all she does is lie. She just can't help it. It's just a lie after a lie. But she, you know, her lies will turn people against people. But she doesn't mean bad, but that's her way of surviving, you know. Um, but some will have this darkness attached to it. And you think that when this person comes into your life, you hear the story and you want to help them, you think you've got the energy to fix all that. No, no, no. But somehow it drains yeah. you and you end up not not helping the situation i think you know it, give it to god let him deal with it because you can't you know it's um and and, and you, right I, i'll tell you something in respect to that there's a parable in the bible of the man down the well and i always say to people don't be the man down the well and and what the man down the well is a, a fella falls down this well i don't know how but he falls down it and he calls out for help a wealthy man walks by and he thinks this man's in trouble. So he jumps down the well. And and the, the fella who's down there says, you've got money. What are you doing down here? He said, to help you. He said, no, we're both now going to starve and die. You could have bought a ladder. You could have got help. You could have done anything. <laughs> so you can't be the man down the well. So sometimes you have to say to people, you, you are down there. I can help you, but I'm not going to get in the pit with you. And that's how you have to draw the line. You can't jump into that pit with them. 
don't throw your pearls to the swine, you know? <laughs> Hi, John. I so appreciate what you do. Could you list under the next video the SKIH organization which actively deals with pedos and any others that are genuine and also any you may know of in New Zealand where I live. Oh, New Zealand. All right. S-K-I-H? Does that person uh, mean uh, Sikh? Not yeah, S yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it might be Sikh, yeah. Pronounce. I mean, because the Sikh, the, the, I mean, I, I had dealings with the, what they call the SAS, the Sikh Awareness Society, and they're brilliant, they're proactive, and they were going out and they were they were helping kids. But they, they did it in, in, in um, a way in which they told the police. So they would say, look, this kid's in trouble. We want you to come with us. We're the agents. We're going to go in there. We want you to prevent the breach of the police and 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 help us with your statute laws to save this kid. And of course, the police was, don't want to know. They won't do anything. So if it all goes wrong, then they said, "Well, actually, what was we meant to do? You know, under common law, we got a duty to to prevent life. So that's what we did. Um, so it's probably Sikh. Um, they were great. I really liked them. I, I, I I've got a lot of support from the Sikh. Um, yeah, Chet Sandu is Sikh, and he's yeah. a great guy. Yeah, they they, yeah. they and and the other thing about the Sikhs. Um, my old boss in the police was he, he was a cracking fella but when the lorry drivers were in stacked up on the m20 because the french weren't allowing them in they were basically starting to starve some of them dehydrating and it was the sikhs who went down and fed and watered them mm. not the british military not the south well, i think the salvation army might have done but you know all these other agencies that we've got you know British agencies, the Sikhs went down and did wow. it. The smallest religious group we've got, <laughs> and they went down and helped them. So, you know, big them up. But New Zealand, I don't know. I don't know in New Zealand. Um, I know that there there is, you know, satanic abuse. I'm in touch with a couple of people from New Zealand, survivors. And Australia is very prevalent with, with satanic abuse. It's I get a lot from there, a lot from Australia. How many football players are into this activity? Can we get an idea who... In Germany, we got one who confessed this week being in possession of child porn, a very famous one. Probably children will follow with accusations. Yeah, and, and well, we had Barry Benel when, it, um, you know, uh, up in the north that was doing it. Now, football. What you're going to get with football? You're going to get working class kids making a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, they want it. They're 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 icons. You're going to get a lot of kids from damaged backgrounds that they're going to look towards football as a way out, way forward. You know, kids where parents aren't really bothered. So it's an open playing field, really. Excuse the pun. That if you have got a pedo, he's got access to all them children. Mm. You know, so we've never seen football because it's a macho thing and all that. So you haven't got people coming forward, whereas you were having swimming and things like that a lot come forward. You know. But with football, it didn't. But when it started, it flooded, you know, mm. and they couldn't stop it. And there will be many, many, many more will come from football. So I'd say football, especially in countries where it's the number one sport, that's where your pedos are going to be. Does John happen to know if the methods of therapy and available resources are improving in the UK? For those recovering from PTSD suffered from abuse, P.S. Tell Me Who I Am was a very good documentary. So tragic, but the loving relationship the two brothers had was beautiful. Well, that's that's the one, isn't it? We we discussed. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what what we say with therapy, and we can discuss this afterwards, don't we, about that? Um, uh, is that the, where do people go? I mean, you have got. I mean, there, there's a lovely lady called Carolyn Bramall, who is a survivor of satanic abuse. Um, she'd be a great one to get on your show, and um, she's a therapist herself, you know, and. You know, she's flooded with people all the time trying to get in touch with her. And But what, where is there on the NHS? A lot of them don't recognise it, especially the, the, the DID, the multiple personality. They don't recognise that, that, the abuse, especially when our society won't even recognise satanic abuse. So how are you going to deal with it? And so I'd say no. I'd say there is nothing, in there, and it's going to diminish more and more if we go into recession. It's going to get worse. So I, I don't think it will get any better. I think it's appalling as it is. I think there is a massive fundamental lack of understanding of, of of the damage sexual abuse does to people, and and the therapy just is inadequate. And medication is not the way forward. You know. Okay, just going some. Oh, there's a few more on my phone here for you, um, Jerry Taxeria. Um, what do you know in particular about the Queen's involvement? Um. 
Not a lot, to be honest. Not a lot. I mean, w w what we can look at is a lack of involvement. I mean, we can, we can, that speaks volumes. We can draw an inference there. The fact is that, that she isn't speaking out against this. I mean, you know, and if her children are anything to go by, you know, she's not really a good parent herself, is she, you know? But uh, I, th I think her silence is deafening on this and, and the failure for her to, um, to commission our police forces to deal with this properly and adequately is also speaking volumes. So, you know, again, she's, she's not got much confidence where I'm concerned and I don't think she's doing enough. And uh, I don't trust any of them, really, uh, you know, but I've never, ever heard of... Oh, I have it. Oh, I don't know. No, I can't. No, no I'll, I'll leave that as a no. But, um. Next question from Alex Spencer. Thank you for your work. Does John know any information regarding Lord Bath and whether or not Darren Jeffrey will be taking things further, he and others deserve justice. They do, they do. All, also, the foster social housing owned by Lord Bath that Darren stayed at the time close to Longleat is not listed anywhere. Can you confirm the building, please, as I was at Longleat not long ago and wanted to try and locate it? Um, Dar Darren was... Um he was taken to Rainbow Woods. I can't remember. And it was called four, was it four ways or three ways care home in Bath? Um, Lord Bath is on the reigns list. He's mentioned as being a Satanist. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's been a lot of controversy over him. Uh, so he, he's well involved. But I mean, I think Darren is just getting on with his life now, you know. He's relocated um, and he's taking a, a quiet path now i mean he, he seems happy i spoke to him a little while back you know his life is moving on big step for him uh, but sometimes you, you know the fight is too much you know you it's a bit like when you whistle blow you speak out and then do you sue well that's a fight in its own and, and you haven't got the fight at times that's how they get away with it because people lose their fight they lose their tenacity and then, then when you have people like me that's speaking out and encouraging of course we get attacked and it all stacks up and drains you so i mean what it needs is a survivor group there was one guy um he did come forward via his sister um regarding the care home that darren was in uh, but his sister said look he's t whenever i mention it, he kicks off he's, he's he's just so aggressive he's an alcoholic you know he really wants to help darren and speak but it's not going to happen uh, you know, which is a bit of a shame. They could have set up a survivor group, but, you know, you've got to have someone, you know, the moment you start that survivor group, you're opening all them wounds and all them people are going to come forward at various stages of PTSD and hatred and hurt and harm. And, you know, I mean, Darren wouldn't be able to coordinate that because it would be too much for him. So it needs something like the Shirley Oaks or or the, the Beach Home team and and all these other survivor groups to get proper backing. They need people like Michael Mansfield behind them that, that will fight them, professionals, you know, a bit like the ICSA team. And that's, I mean, one thing I would say to that, that person, speak to ICSA, the IICSA, um, contact them and tell them that, that you are a survivor of, of a care home and see if that care home was listed. There may well have been other victims of that care home in there. And they might then take take your testimony and put it forward for another stranded inquiry. So that's the best thing I'd if say. If you're watching this and you're not familiar with Darren Jeffrey's story, it is on my channel and it's on John's channel as well. Okay. Um, next one is from Julie Victoria Thompson. Um, John, do you believe law enforcement are nationally controlled with child protection infiltrated at a county level? I think everything's controlled at a national level. Um, I think it's these people that are in these positions, like these um, chief constables and commissioners. You know, they're told what their parameters are. I mean, I, I mean, when I was threatened and silenced, and that, that was by someone that was a chief superintendent, he said, "You've got no idea who you're messing with. You've got to back away." So he knew in my opinion, what, what lay in front of all of us if I was to be allowed to speak freely about what was being covered up. So I think they're, they're told, look, this is your role, especially the Special Branch Intelligence Services. They're, they're very aware of what's going on. I mean, the, the military intelligence, I mean, they've used it as an anchor, a, a, as a bargaining tool and as a bribery tool for a long time, you know, and that's come out in inquiries as well. 
And when you had people like Sir Peter Heyman that was in charge of MI6, was a paedophile himself. I mean, what more do you need? So, yeah, I think if it, if it starts causing economic and political embarrassment, then, you know, the game changes. But like we've always said, they will always, always only deal with low-hanging fruit. And that's that. But. Next question ties into exactly what you just said. It's from Silver Sobe. What is the end goal of child trafficking, blackmail operations, and the controllers in society? Well, I, I think that the when you get to that level of, of controlling people, I think you'll get into you know into the remit of military intelligence or or some sort of um, uh, you know these big businesses or whatever. You know they've always they've always done it. You see these James Bond films, and you know they break the window in the hotel room, and there's a film crew behind them. And you've always had like um, corporate espionage. I mean, there's a, there's a very good film called um, Michael Clayton. Um, if anyone wants to sort of really look into the corporate espionage, and it's uh, George Clooney plays someone who exposes a big corporate cover up and the level they'll go to. It's a fantastic film. Um, but yeah, no that. The, the the goal is I, I spoke to um uh, a survivor um of I forget which care home but it was a whistleblower for Elm Guest House this person and he was telling me about the politicians that were involved and everything else and I said to him why would when when there was um paperwork in the police that that needed to go it got burnt they used to call it midnight barbecue and I'll be writing that in my book they'd have a midnight barbecue. <laughs> tapes as well they say don't they can't appear on landfill sites you know because landfill sites get sifted sometimes so everything would get it, it was sending you know on a night duty there'd be like a, a little bin with a load of flames coming out of it <laughs> and uh, you know it would happen you know um stuff would go on but um what was that question again we're saying that so the question was um i've got my i lost my thread <laughs> It was. I have to scroll down a little bit. Oh yeah, no, it, it was blackmail value, right? Well, yeah, yeah intelligence right, agents yeah, blackmail. What blackmail. is the end, what's the end? Yeah, right, right. So, so I said to this guy, why, why would special branch of military intelligence have paperwork that is so incriminating to politicians and to polit political parties? Why would they keep it? And he said, blackmail. It's always kept for blackmail value, always. So even with people like Leon Britton as being Home Secretary and all that, but we see files going missing. Theresa May, was it 163 files or something went missing with her? You know, uh, and then we saw it with, with um, uh, same Leon Britton when he, he lost all the files that Jeffrey Dickens gave all him. All these Catholic yeah. um, places that end up on fire. All of, all yeah, of, all floods of, and fires. Of, yeah. Floods and fires. Floods I mean, that's come from God, isn't it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you something about funny about that. <laughs> we're going on about. There was... Um, before a kid takes um, their the, the holy first Holy Communion, they have catechism lessons. They've got to go and learn about God and the church and all that. I right? have to do so, that. Yeah, yeah, so do I. So you have the catechism. So there was, I don't know, somewhere in the UK, this priest brought all the families in and he was doing the, the pre-catechism lessons, talk to them, what to expect over the next few weeks of their lessons. So he puts the, got his laptop, which is linked to the big screen, puts it on and a gay porno comes on, right? <sighs> The gay porno on his laptop he blames it on the work of the devil right not that he's watching gay porn and forgot to download it and get rid of it he blames it and he said this and he used that as an example of how the devil can infiltrate oh. while, while they're all watching his gay porno oh. yeah, yeah so it's just what are people meant to do when they're in trouble they're gonna lie aren't they they're gonna lie they've got nothing less just lie you know next question from sl hi john just want to firstly say thank you for being an angel and protecting our children. Oh, My question is, how do you cope and keep your mental health on track? Once you've seen these children who have been trafficked, sexually abused, I imagine it is horrifying and very draining mentally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is you don't cope. Um, you don't. It's, um, it's a choice you make. Uh, but the thing is with me, I, I, I saw it as... I work with people that want to be in the flying squad, right? There was others, I wanted to be a detective and others wanted to uh, be in the TSG and all that. I I, I just wanted to be, a, I, you know, I didn't want any of that match of stuff. But what, the moment I dealt with uh, child victims, it got me and I thought, what other crime is there than this? There is nothing, you know, someone robbing a bank, so what? So what? They rob us every day of the week. 
you know, why do they need protecting? Royalty protection? Well, well, they've got the army if they want. I mean, but they've all been in the army, all tough. You know, years ago, the Queen's would walk around the streets anyway, didn't need protection, nor did politicians. So I didn't want none of that. And I didn't want to ask Lick anyone anyway. But when I dealt with children, I thought, they're kids. They can't, what What do they, if they get a hard time, what can they do about it? Nothing. So it just got to me and I just saw it as a crusade. And it just become, and I thought, I've got to keep doing this, doing this. But in answer to how do you cope? Well, you, you do what most people uh, do, like soldiers do, like, like other coppers do. You drink. You drink and you become an alcoholic, a, 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 a functioning alcoholic. You do. You just drink or you smoke um, and you prematurely age. And, and, and it, you know, you can take exercise, which is brilliant. I mean, I swim in that freezing cold lake and whatnot. But when you're traumatized, you don't want to do them things. You know, you only do them things when you're, you're when you're aligned. But when, you, when you're going down, you, you, you're too... It's it's all easy to say to someone, oh, come and get out of bed, come and get some fresh air. But when your brain's gone and scrambled, and, and alcohol would have this effect where you, you'd be gone. It would take you... Numbing to, it out. Yeah, and then you'd... We're, we're, it's really strange because when you was on, on uniform, they all used to go and have a drink, right? Big social thing. When I went on child protection, no one went for a drink because firstly, we were all too busy and if there was one detective off, the other one had to cover anyway. But on the rare occasions when we went, it all went tits up. Mm. You know, we, we, we'd have a Christmas drink. It would last about half an hour. The, the, I remember one, we all thought we we're going to meet in the pub once a year. You know, usually it'd be once a week. All the child protection officers, right, we're going to meet in this pub, have a drink, and then go for something to eat. Um, um, we had about three proper alcoholics, you know. And um, one girl, bless her. She said to me, I've not slept in my bed for two years. I'll just wake up on the floor, get a bottle of wine. And anyway, we're going to the pub. I'm waiting in the pub. This, this girl we just talked about, she's a bit late. She's already had a glass in the office. She comes in, gets, someone gives her a glass of wine. She just throws it straight in the sergeant's face and then slaps him right around the head and then bursts into tears. And uh, and it just all kicked off And because it was all of that pain and that, you're just dealing with terrible things day in, day out, day in, day out. And on top of that, you have to then interview paedophiles and, and child hurters and liars and, you know, and, and it's just too much, you know, just too much. So uh, you have to you have to step away sometimes. You have to and restock and get away from the trenches. Otherwise, you'll be, you know, it's like that scenario of the um, guy in the trenches just standing there having a fag laughing, you know, because he's lost it, you know, and it's like that, you know, and, and I have seen people lose it, totally and utterly lose it. There was one guy, uh, I think it was at Hall Street Road Magistrates Court, this copper had lost it, and he just, the fella had got off, got acquitted, and he just had enough, and it was a bloke who just had enough. So he went out, and he found the barrister's car, and he bricked it, he got a brick, and he just chucked it straight through the window, <laughs> And he got another one and did the other window and he totally he'd gone. And he just <laughs> decided to brick the barrister's car and just smashed it. You know, but it, 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 you could see in his eyes he'd gone. He just, it, you know, that was it. It was all too much. He'd just too much grief after too much grief and that was it. So um, I don't know what happened to him. He got nicked, but I don't know whether he kept his job or anything, you know. <laughs> so you talked about coping mechanisms when you were working and you, talk, you said you've recently stepped back and, and coming back. Yeah. Do you have any other techniques you employ presently to stay sane of mind? Um, the writing is very good. The writing is fantastic because it's cathartic. And, and I'm going back. It's really weird, Sean, because I'm going back on old memories, right? Mm. And I'm going back and I'm looking at myself as a child. And, and I'm realizing these experiences were there as a child, you know, but we didn't know them. I mean, there, there was one, I'm, I remember we had like, a, there was an old manor house, um, it was ruins, but it still had its grounds and it had pear trees and apple trees. And we would go and when they're out, we called it scrumping, but yeah, no, no one owned it, you know, yeah, yeah. and go and have the apples out and someone's mum would have them and the pears and all that. And we was also into fires, always lighting fires in the woods and things. And only about 10, 9, 10 years old. And I'd had, I think we'd had a fire and I, my clothes smelt and, oh, sorry, and my mum had kept me in, right? It's, they call it it's not ground and they call it something else back then but my mum just anyway my mate knocked and said oh do you want to come in scrumping and I went oh, I'm not allowed you know and he went oh, alright so he knocked on my mates 
and he won't allow. So he ended up finding the kids to go scrumping. And then what happened was they went up there and a bloke had got out of a mental institution, but he was in there for child abuse mm -hmm. and he'd kidnapped them and he tortured them and he'd raped them and he tried to strangle them and kill them both. And um, uh, they both had to go to hospital and they, mm -hmm. their backs were, he'd been whipped and, and this guy was then arrested and, and he tried to murder him. And I was just sitting back thinking, and then a, a couple of doors down, there was two little girls um, weren't allowed to play with us. They, their mum wouldn't let them. They were our age. And then one day all the police were outside and their dad was hanging. He hung himself in the garage mm. and they were put in the cab because he was raping them. But mm. it was only when I'm reading back thinking, my God, I was surrounded by it back then. Just didn't know it. You know, just didn't know it. But attitudes were different. And you used to have public information films about child abduction, you know, and they were telling, but we don't get that now, you know, so they're keeping us in the dark. But so that is a really, when I look back and I'm I'm trying to understand why I made the decisions I made and, you know, and then I had like a, a stepfather who was, who was a very dangerous man. He was, a, he was an incredibly violent man, um, but he was very good to me. But he was a hard man. He used to fight for money. He used to fight in fields and all that. He paid his mortgage off through fighting and he beat, um, uh, 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 who's that? Um, Gypsy Johnny Frankham. He beat him in a fight. Who's a well-known boxer? Gypsy Johnny Frankham knocked out Muhammad Ali, and he beat him in a. You know, so and he was really good to me. Um, and he, but he hated the police. Mm. Absolutely hated the police. And I can remember saying to him, um, I, I was too frightened to tell him I'd join the police. But he never laid a finger on me. But he was a real man. You know, he could do everything. And I said to him, What would I do if I had to arrest someone like you? He went, what do you mean? I said, but, you know, you're a great big, and he was a great big guy. And I, he said, well, what, what, are you, what are you worried about? I said, but you're too big, you, you know, you, you'd hurt me. He said, I'd never hurt anyone, you know, that didn't want to be hurt. And I said, no, but some might be. And he, he had a pint in his hand. He was a bit of a drinker. And he changed his pint to his left hand. He said, look, it ain't what I'm going to do. It's what I'm not going to do. And he never laid a finger on me. And I thought, what does that even mean? And with that, he went bang. And he smashed me right on the chin and just knocked me out. But because I, I, I'm a dopey idiot, I'm a tongue out. And I bit my tongue, blood everywhere. And he picked me up and I sort of come around and he went, listen, the quiet one, it's the one who's not going to, they're going to hurt you. The ones who, who, who threaten you, I'm going to this, I'm going to that, I'll do this, I'll, which is a bit like with the trolls, really. He said, don't worry about them, you go for them, go for them. But the quiet one, watch them. And, and it saved my life because um, mm. I got really badly assaulted uh, once and it was a quiet bloke who did it. You know, and it was a bit too late by the time I realised. You know, this bloke's going to have me. What but were the circumstances of that? He was he was over the side from prison, over the side from prison, and uh, he just didn't want to get caught. And I, we stopped him in a mini cab, and he was all he was lovely, he was quiet, and no worry, and and then it, off it went. You know, but it was like, um, what it, did it start with? Uh, it started with he, he, well, what he said was, he said, Look, I'll give you my name, check it out on your radio. I was only young, you know, check it out on your radio, <laughs> and I went, all yeah, right, and as I went like that. He headbutted me. So I've gone back, but I managed to grab him. And, and with that, he's then kicked, punched, boom. And he just turned into a massive fight, you know. And, you know, broke ribs and all sorts. It, it, you know, absolute, you know, terror. But I kept hold of him, wouldn't let go of him. But it, it, it just got messy. But my mate was with me. His mate jumped my mate. So, you know, and the radios had gone everywhere. So it was just like two on two in the middle of South East London on the streets, just smashing whoever you could, you know. And, uh, Luckily, it, it all got resolved. But um, and and the ironic thing about it is, um, he he actually gave up in the end. Mm. And uh, just because he was older than me and I was fitter and younger, and and he stopped and he shook my hand and said, "You fight like a man." He said, "You're you're, you're a good bloke." <laughs> and anyway, I went back to the station. I was covered in blood. And it was oh, it was all down here, right? Um, and the cussy sergeant went, "What's happened to you?" I went, no, nothing, nothing. He's wanted. And, and he went, no, but what's happened to you? I went, oh, no, it's all right. He said, no, things like that are never all right. Go and change your shirt. And by the time I come back, there was an ambulance called and they'd, they'd, they'd smashed him to pieces. Wow. Smashed him to pieces. And they they threw down their pocketbooks and they said, copy them notes. I'm not saying I did. I'm not saying I didn't, right? But <laughs> it, it had no bearing on the truth. But he went, <laughs> went to court and, of course, this evidence gets given and and he's he, fair play to this guy he turned up and he said you know i thought the police had changed when they employed him we had a fair go and 
he, he said, what he said, he best me, he beat me. And he said, uh, and I like him. He's a good kid. He's a nice kid. And he said, but listening to all this lies that's just come out, I'm not saying I lied. I'm not saying I didn't. But he said, I'm, I'm appalled. I'm appalled. Anyway, he went to prison and I thought the end of the matter, right? And uh, and he, he turned around to me, he said, don't you be like them. This bloke was giving me like a father son kid. Don't turn out like them. You're a good kid, you know? And then he goes away and months so later, pathetic. yeah, months later, I'm in a garage buying a pint of milk. He's been released from prison and he's with his mates and he sees me and he pulls out a knife and he sticks it straight under my throat all night garage and like that. And he's poking it right. And, and his mates were going, who is he? He goes, he's a cop. And I go, jerk him, jerk him. Tell him to stab me. And he went, no. He said, you learned a lesson tonight, haven't you? I went, yeah. He said, I ain't got to stab you. I went, no, please don't stab me. He went, I told you back then, and I'm telling you now, don't you be like them. And and it, it was a major turning point in, in, in how I gave evidence. Wow. You know, uh, and it was, yeah. And he said, I, I liked you. And, it, it, you know, you know, whatever happened, happened. But, you know, I just hope to go to prison for that, you know, fair play. But, but yeah, and he was... But I just think he, he because they they brutalised him. They did brutalise him. He broke his arm and all sorts. He, he was ambulanced off, you know. And it was wrong. It was wrong. So yeah. So that changed me. But I don't know what bearing that had on the question. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's from Ronan. Well, um, a question to John is: When he was in the police, did he ever come across SRA in any way or hear SRA reports? Yeah, yeah. No, that's I did, but it was from the african community the congolese community and also the jamaican the opia dealt with opia but they didn't take it seriously right and, and i i end up working in in haringey on the child abuse and um now i'm gonna i'm gonna give you another example actually another example um but they would always if you went to a jamaican job they send a jamaican social worker so they they had they call it representational um I don't know, there's a way of calling it something, proportional representation or something. Um, and this Jamaican social worker was brilliant, but she knew all about opia. And we had a job. She said, John, this is opia. This is what they do. This is how they do it. So, yeah, but it was never, you were never taught, well, you were sort of taught it um, at the initial child abuse training, but it was never really forced on you. However, it was my team that also dealt with Victoria Climbier which clearly that there were very demonic and almost witchcrafty issues going on there with the mother. Um, and then funny enough, um, a guy contacted me and, um, and it's a former Royal Marine lad. And he said to me, do you remember when we, we raided that house and there was the videos and it was actually a snuff video. <gasps> and, and it was, um, there were, it was all like a ritualistic snuff video. I went, Oh my God. And I've forgotten all about it. And, it got put away, you know, reported off, sent away to a unit, went off to the murder teams, and we never heard nothing back from it. Did you have to watch that video? Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sat down, we took it back, and um, it was my mate got it, and he would put it on, and then you could see what was happening, you know, and it was like a ritualistic setting, but but they, they cut a kid's throat. Oh. And um, the, oh my, so it all got bagged up as evidence and went off, but it wasn't in England. I don't think it was in English, you know. And the murder team's got it, and it will never heard back from it again. But the UK always denied the existence of it. I'd forgotten all about it, and it's only my mate ringing me up and saying, do you remember it? And I was, oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, it was somewhere in East London. So when you say ritualistic setting, what kind of setup was it in the room? It, it was like, um, it was a bit like a cave sort of thing. It was like, you know, and there was all people stood around, and it was, it was all grainy because it was, it was an amateur thing. And there was a kid there. And you could see someone lean over and then, you, you know, you can hear them screaming. It was, it was just a really bad amateur one, but you could clearly see that they cut the kid across the throat. So do you think that, like, you know, societies advance at different rates? And I've been recently watching the Vikings and they, they sacrifice people um, throughout it. Do you think that some societies are still stuck yeah. in that kind yeah. of well, mentality well, well the, the the mayans as well used to didn't they yeah you know and if you look at you know what is satanism it's bow worship mm. you know it's babylonian it's what they used to do yeah. this is how they did it and and the child's blood has got more power than the animal blood i mean animals are still sacrificed in voodoo and in, in the yeah. vikings they're sacrificing people for 
like to to have a good crop that year yeah, and to have good luck in battle and things like well, this. Well, well, if you look at um, the Wicker Man, the film, the Wicker Man, you know that was, you know, brilliant film, and you know, yeah. and it's, it's paganistic and all that, and it's um, and it's all gone on, and and you you hear about it in other cultures, you know, um, especially like the the West African, you know, there there was a story the other day where they a little kid and they said he's demonically possessed at two years old, and this poor little kid. They say he's got witches and demons in him. But a priest um, was talking to me, um, one, one of the few good ones, a Catholic priest, and he, and he is African, you know, and he said, in the UK, they don't believe in it. He said, but Africa, it's alive and well. And she said, especially where I used to work, he said, John, it's alive and well. They believe in the demonic, you know. So it, it does go on. But the, the, the satanic stuff, it was. it's only when you look back there was a lot more that, that had satanic connotations, but I weren't trained in it. I was ignorant, to, and, and there was a need to get jobs dealt with and out of the way. And, and and there was a lot, like I said earlier, that we found a big voodoo, you know, thing with the chicken legs all in it. You know, there was a lot, especially in that community, uh, Congolese community, there was one where a kid was brutally beaten to get demons out, and that was in one of these, um, it's in Tottenham. It was like this warehouse above um, some shops or something. Um, by seven sisters and uh, it, it was like a big meat plate a bit Congolese community and it was going on in there and then again it was told we'll just deal with what you got and you're so overworked and tired you know I'm not making any excuses but you, you just don't know what is really going on it's only if you've got someone that proportionally represents that community they'll tell you look, this is actually demonic this is actually like opia I never even heard of opia and they said no it's voodoo it's voodoo but the, the only one was was when that video was there but you know, and uh, honestly, that had totally and utterly slipped my mind until my mate rang me up, you know, about two months ago and told me. I was like, when oh, you man. saw that video, was that the hardest core thing you'd seen at that point of your career? Um, uh, probably, probably. No, 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 it wasn't. No, because they'd, um, I'd, I'd seen other stuff, you know, other stuff. In real um, life or on video? No, that well, it'll be during training. They showed us. They, they were showing. They showed us. But they, again, there were snuff films, but they denied existence of them, you know. And also in the training, there was child porn as well. They show mm. you child porn, and, and that was shown to about two hundred of us in a massive auditorium. Is one of the goals of that to desensitise you for what's coming? I, I, I think so also to 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 show the reality because there was you know. The people that have no idea. I mean, unless you've been sexually abused yourself, mm. what? How are you going to know about it? You know. So that this, they're saying that this is what you're going to come across. You know, and, and then they'll show animal torture videos um, where the RSPCA had seized things and stuff like that. You know. So it, it, so it, yeah. I mean, the desensitising just comes with the job as well. I mean, we got sent to a um, uh, an autopsy. Um, and that really is tough. And with, with, with police, you, you're going to see, I mean, I've had two people commit suicide in front of my own face. In front of your face? In front of my own face, yeah, yeah. Were they adults? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> you know, on one, I, I, I kept alive for, for 20 minutes doing CPR on him. I was covered in blood and everything, so. Had the person stabbed themselves then? Yeah, yeah, no, he jumped off the top of a building. Oh. Tried to take me with him. Tried to take you tried with him? Tried to pull me, yeah. Um, but oh. someone grabbed me and I, he didn't. And then he landed on a, a flat roof. Bloody he hell. was high up, and I I managed to get down um, a pipe drain pipe, but <sighs> the fire brigade couldn't get up to put up a gantry to get the ambulance crew up. So it was about half hour away, <sighs> and, um, and and so I was just there on my own. And, and a firearms officer managed to climb up and get with me and help me. And he did die, but I was covered in blood and everything. And he was a builder that had lost his business, and mm. it all got too much. So you know. Uh, you know, and the other one was someone had gone in the river, you know, and and things like that. So you you get it. But we went to an autopsy, and um, and then afterwards they said, right, we're going to the fridges and show you a few things. And they said to us as a little group, who's who's a parent? And this woman put uh, her hand up. And the next thing, this thing gets slid across the floor. And it's a frozen baby. What? He takes it out of the fridge and he throws what? it. He throws it across the floor. This frozen baby, and it just lands in the middle of us, and. And I mean, it's it's just sick, but it's just how it was. She screamed, and he went, "Oh, we got another one in here." And they're all, all identified bodies and all sorts. Mm. And um, there was loads of like yardies that had been shot. They didn't know where they were, 
But as they were doing the autopsy, there was uh, the pathologist and his mate, the mortician bloke, and they were having a fag, and they were chipping the ash in the body. What and hell? then they threw their fag butts in there what and sewed hell? it up. Yeah, yeah, some, I don't know who it was, I think it was an old woman. And they went, because they, they, they cut, take the brain out and weigh it, and they throw the brain in there, because they, they, they throw all the organs in. And they had their fag, and then just chucked them in the... And then just sewed it up and went out, you know, and no one said nothing because that's what you did, you know. Um, but yeah, no, there was a lot of death. I mean, the last role I had before I left, I investigated road deaths and you could deal with three bodies in a week. Oh. But the last the last one that really did it was an 11 year old girl that was oh. killed. And uh, that that really did screw me up, really screw me up. Um, that, that took a lot of getting over. Uh, but again, there is no there, there is no therapy. You know, you just get on with it. If you don't, you're considered to be a puff or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's seen as weakness, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was there was a hell of a lot of death and it just was not healthy. It really wasn't, you know. And, I mean, in the end, I started praying over them because some of them, they just died, you know. And and I remember an ambulance driver coming up to me and put his arm around me and went, I do exactly the same. He said, some of them are still here. Mm. And the strange thing, what I, I prayed over one lad who, who his head had been taken off. Oh man, it was awful. What? And um, and his his brain it, and brains are really funny. They're really tacky, and it sticks. It gets stuck on your clothes. It's it's it's, it's it smells as well. Brain very odd. And I prayed for him, you know. And it was a little while later. His wife come to see me, and she said, "I he was in my dream last night. My husband and." He wants to say thank you for what you did for him. And I went, what do you mean? She said, you did something for him and he, he appreciates it. He really thanks you. And she said in his dream, he come and said, that policeman, go and tell him thank you. And she did. She came down and, and thanked me. So it's, yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot, a hell of a lot of death. And it does, it just, um, it, it's, it's odd. But also your sense of humor molds around it as well. And Gallows humor. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, but I actually like it. it I find it quite funny. And when I talk to my old mates, it's quite... It's a coping mechanism, isn't it? It's brutal, but it's funny yeah, as well. Yeah, you know? cope. Yeah. You know, and it is, and it's some, you know, some things I look back. And if I talk to an ex-copper, mm -hmm. and, you know, they'll say, oh, shut your mouth, you see you and see. And you know that they've come from that. Squad is very similar, sense yeah. of humour. You know, and it, for some people, it's too much, but... Um, and prisoners have got that Prisoners well. would be exactly yeah. the same, yeah. exactly yeah. the same around, you know, that aggression, the violence and mm -hmm. the lack of um, compassion and things like that, you know. So, so in the movies then, when someone's dying, they try and portray how the, the life goes out of the eyes. Have you actually seen that in real life? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you can see when they're gone. Yeah. You can see when they're Transformation. gone. Transformation. Yeah. And the body sometimes, they it's like their death row they fits and all that before so what goes die. through your head when you see the life cut of someone's eyes yeah you, you, you know they're not there you know what's in there. your head i don't know it, it, seeing a dead body is a strange thing but seeing it, the actual moment you know what i mean yeah it's i mean i know with this guy he was alive and then we lost him and you, you could actually you know he's just your eyes glazed or whatever you know went like a gray you know and the body You're feels just thinking, different. I've done my best. Yeah, and the body feels different. It gets solid very quickly. The body, but yeah. but but also touching a body because the, w when there was a, a body there, it'd be a crime scene. Now it was my job to turn up, and I was in charge of the body, so I'd have to search the body, and then you'd arrange for the coroner to come, you know. So that that was my exhibit, the body and the such. So I'd have to turn it over, make sure there was no other injuries that were unaccounted for get ID out and things like that. Personal possessions have to be taken off and given to the family, the money and all, all of that if there's a chain. And, you know, the, sometimes these bodies were badly broken, you know, distorted the limbs that were unnaturally bent. Um, and it, it, it's a very horrible feeling. It's it's just, and they're very heavy, like a dead weight, but it's someone's child, you know. It's a, But with an adult, I sort of gone with it, but when I dealt with an 11 year old girl, that I couldn't cope with it. And I refused that to. That was a road traffic accident. Yeah, yeah, and I refused to go to the autopsy. I refused to go to. Uh, and the pathologist um, said, You don't have to go. I said, Well, you don't. I'm not going to watch a little girl get cut open. I'm not doing it. And I, I refused to do it. I didn't want to see a child. Um, it was just. It was years and years of it. Uh, that was enough now. And I'd, I wanted to speak out anyway. And that, that was sort of. Um, my little my, my defining moment my pivotal moment and i just thought no I, i've got to um 
speak out and move forward. And we tried everything to try and avoid it. But I was after conflict. So what I would do is I would deliberately create a situation where I'd get in trouble. Mm. So I, I, I would turn up, I meant to wear a suit, I'd turn up like this. And or I'd have a cigarette in the car so it smelt. Or, or sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd drink. So there would, someone at one point would try and, it took months before anyone actually confronted me. And then I was like this hand grenade, boom. And I just went mad. And I just started shouting and just saying these are cover-ups and all this because I needed something to mm. to spur it on, you know, because the world needed to know what I had to say. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's... So I understand people when, when, when it all comes out and they lose it because it's too much. It's been there. Too much, yeah. You know, it's going to come out one way or the other, isn't it, you know? Yeah. So this is the next one. I've been... I've been guilty of this. I've heard guests use this terminology and I've seen people get corrected by other people for it. And I've changed my terminology over, over the uh, course of these podcasts. Why does John call victims child prostitutes? They clearly don't know any difference. So why refer to them like they know what they are doing? Well, well that, that's just a seminar in semantics, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, really? I mean, do, does, this, does this person go out there and give testimony to the voiceless. Does this person spend hours helping people? You know, that they cannot see my good actions. You know, all they have to see is, is my use of a terminology. When Nit I, nitpicking. Oh, they're, they're just idiots. I mean, when I was on Vice, it was child prostitutes. That's what they were called, you know. Just that the world has changed. And that's it? how it is. I mean, yeah. and they're making out that I'm inferring in some way that these are, you know, um, what do they call it? Um, victim blaming or something like that. There's a, there's a terminology for it. But I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just beneath me to even answer that. They cannot see the good I do. Then I won't even warrant that with an answer. Next one then. Max Green. Um, hey, uh, John and Max. How did you start a career in child protection as I feel like I want to make a difference as I've seen the result of sex crimes on children and people close to me? Thank you for your work, by the way. You're a legend. Oh, bless. Um, well, I mean, I always say the children found me. I never found the children. I was bringing up four kids on my own, Sean. So the last thing I wanted to do was deal with someone else's snotty kids. But it was... It was when I ended up, when I went to do an interview with a girl called Zoe, um, and I sat down with her and, you know, she had this reputation as being a right little horror and she's anti-police, she's this. And then when I sat down, it was a little kid. Mm. She was a little kid. And then she started telling me what they were doing with her. And I thought, why has this been ignored? Mm. And it just, I just saw them as my kids. And that's how I saw it. And it, it's in your heart with it. And it's it's a hard, hard sort of road to go. Vice, when I was dealing with the child prostitution, as I boldly say, was different to child protection because child protection has a lot of politics in that. You dealt with neglect issues and, and they would have plans put in to keep the family together and all, you know, like that. But the, the other stuff, the street stuff, these were kids that were being trafficked. They were in desperate need of help. And, um, and it gets in your heart, you, you, you know, I mean, it, you either love it or you hate it. Anyone who's got a heart, it would get in Yeah, it. yeah. And it's understanding the magnitude of what, what it really is that you're dealing with. But there's no glamour in it, you know, none whatsoever. Next question is from um, Leo Mulgrew. I want to ask John if the horrific things he's seen has informed his faith. Yeah, of course. It's... Um, it consolidates it it does because you know you, you you're dealing with death and the real horrible negative elements of society and at my, no, no point have i sat there and thought oh satanism looks beneficial it's done the opposite you know it's made me realize how powerful being good is and how powerful god is you know not the other way around at all you know and i've seen those that perpetrate these crimes as weak weak people i don't see any strength in them at all you know, and and also uh, also working with people like Chris and Brianna when when they've come from that real hardcore crime area and the good that that man does now, and I can see how how, how it can change people beyond all compare and go on to do good and to carry on doing good. You know, whereas when people go bad, everything goes bad, everything around them. You know, everyone has to pick up the pieces. But when people go good, everyone benefits. So 100% on that one, yeah. And then for the viewers, we had a podcast with Chris Lambriano 
and John. So please check that out in the True Crime playlist. All right, so here's one from Don't Watch That, yeah. I heard a while ago that the police facilitate the gangs because they need criminals so that they can keep their arrest numbers up. Can you confirm this? Also, I've been told about something called the Parliament Clause, where the police allow a drug dealer to deal to the city boys, judges, and politicians, and when he gets really big, they take him down for a promotion, and they just repeat the cycle over and over. And from my own research on the war on drugs, there is a massive amount of corruption with, with well, what's well, going on with the drugs. Well, well with, the, with the city, it's strange with the city of London, because when I had um, the complaint going through Parliament with the policing minister, um, he said, there's nothing I can do with the city of London, because they're their own entity. And they are literally their own entity. Um, but what you're dealing with there is very, very high level stuff that's going on, you know? I mean, I can't comment on it because I didn't get involved with it on, on the drug level basis. The, the one thing, the nearest thing I can ever say to that is this, that one of my informants once told me that uh, a shipment had come in of, of heroin from the Turkish gangs, right? And it had been brought in and it ended up in North London. And he said it was a container. He said there was something like, I don't know, a ton of heroin. I don't know. It's a huge multi-million pound amount. And he said the police came. But they weren't police like you, John. Their badges were different. And they had guns. And they, they handcuffed us all. But they drove the lorry away. And then they let us go. And we never, ever saw it again. And this was a good informant. And, you know, so whether that's the intelligence services that have taken the drugs and they've gone back into circulation, I don't know. But I don't think they do enough to, to, to stop the hard drugs. They seem to allow it. It seems to perpetrate. And again, they pick low-hanging fruit, you know. They never go for the big boys that are bringing it in. All, all they, mules and all they want to do is a deal addicts. by a mouth, you know. You know, and then what they were doing was they'd send down, you know, like the Jamaican boys dealing 10 rocks in their hand down to Kingston Crown Court where they'd get 10, nine years, you know, for... Whereas the big fellas that were bringing in the Turkish gangsters and all that, they were they were walking free. They were they were you know all confirmed by our interview with Neil Woods, former undercover cop, and um, you think he runs Leap in this country, which is a brilliant organisation, which our um, cop from Scotland um, has become part of since he came on the podcast. Um, Angelica has asked. Question for John. I heard him speaking about rituals in Ireland, mm. Donegal, and Mayo. Yeah, yeah, Donegal, yeah. Can he give us any more information yeah. on those? Um, uh, I, I can't say too much because the source of it, you know, um, bless her, she doesn't want to be um, identified and, and she's she's very, very fearful. But, yeah, Donegal um, was mentioned and, and that was one of the, the, the worst accounts I ever heard and that's where um, she was made, this girl as a young kid they abducted a young boy and and she said he's on the missing list this kid if you she said if you investigate it he went missing in whenever this year was in ireland and she said um i was made to bite his beating heart till it stopped bite what? it mm. what she said and as she said and as as he died she said it was like this electricity emanated out and they all started squealing like pigs all the people she said I had to bite it, what? bite into it. And that was in Donegal. Holy shit. Yeah, Donegal. And she named a politician as well that was a, a, a very high up Irish politician that was there. And she said it was all videoed. Donegal, yeah, it was, it was massive. Stan B wants to know if you have any hobbies to relax with. Well, I, I used to do my swimming. I used to love, love my swimming, you know. And I mean, and now I'm doing this building work and I love it. I like know? a bit of swimming too. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You know, I really enjoy me. Get the body stretched. Oh, great. And yeah. the cold water, but I went Christmas day, I went for a swim in a lake and it was a bridge too far. It was pain, <laughs> you know, so there was, but I was doing it up until November. You're turning blue. It was horrible. It was, oh, you know, it weren't good. It weren't good. But, you know, exercise is always good. Always, always good. Rail Turner's asked, just wondering what your thoughts are on the policing system now in regards to people harming children. Is the message getting to the right people that there has been an incredible amount of corruption? Thank you, John, for all of your hard work. Well, what I would say is you take where we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and where we are now. I mean, and the fact is now we're looking at Prince Andrew, people like that being involved in, in, in stuff like this. We, we've seen so many um, actors, actresses, politicians. So we've come a long way. So it's got into, I mean, they have tried to sort of curtail it and then attack the victims like people like Carl Beach and things like that, 
which has put a lot of victims away from, you know, off coming forward. But I think we've moved mountains, really. I think we've really, really come a long way, you know. And once what was classed as incredulous is now deemed as this could well happen, especially in respect to people like Jimmy Savile. You know, that Jimmy Savile w w was a game changer, right? I mean, I think that was, you know, as much as the, the devil's sneaky, I think God's cleverer. And uh, Jimmy Savile really, really sort of, he didn't know it, but he did God's work. He exposed so much corruption, paedophilia. Uh, he, he is legendary in that respect, you know, because... um. He never served his master when he got exposed. You know, God really won that one and it really come out. And I think that was probably the biggest victory we've had in a long time was Jimmy Savile. In a previous, this is from Ash Watkins, in a previous interview, John requested speaking to a high-ranking female officer when in the police yeah. as they wouldn't just, quote, roll their trouser leg up. I, he didn't want to speak to a mason. Yeah. Can you get in, him to elaborate on why he's so distrustful of them? I'm I'm not distrustful of them, right? At all. And and it's really funny because that 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 line I gave is used in that series line of duty. If you watch that series line of duty when when he comes forward, it's exactly the same scenario. Look, masonry is unavoidable in the police. It's everywhere, right? You know, and and I'm, one of my mates, he's a mason, right? But is he a bad bloke? Well, not at that level. I'm I'm not in agreement with masonry. I think it should be outlawed. I don't think it should be allowed. However, it, it, it's uh, it, it's a pledge within a pledge, right? It's an oath within an oath. I was exposing something so serious and so potentially dangerous. I had to cover my bases. Now I was working on a unit that was heavily masonic, right? With majority of the high ranking officers were masons when you went to a unit that's heavily mm -hmm. masonic how would you know it was heavily well masonic? well well, well they, firstly they all knew each other beyond knew each other right and if someone left they always went to a good job uh the main telltale sign is once every so often on like a wednesday or thursday there's no one in the office you know well, where are they all gone they've all gone to a lodge meeting you know and they would all do each other favors without and some of them i mean one bloke went how do you know I'm a Mason? I said, well, you've got a Masonic watch on. He actually had a Masonic watch. It's got like Hebrew script on it or they'd have the ring, you know, and some of them would even leave out, they've got a thing called the summons. So it would have the lodge. There's millions of these lodges and it'd have so-and-so lodge, Masonic lodge, and it'd have all their names and addresses, right? And it'd be the date of their meeting on there, right? And they'd all get one before a meeting. And it was on his desk. It was, and I remember sitting there looking through it and thinking, I know him, I know him, I know him, I know him. <laughs> I mean, some are in <laughs> police lodges and some are in non-Masonic lodges. You know, you can have an actor's lodge, you can have, I don't know, anyway, so. But, and that's how they knew each other. And some of them would openly tell you, I was in the lodge with him. And there was one guy that was on our, our team and he was, that year he was a worshipful master and the inspector was below him, you know? And so, and, and you just sort of got to know him, you know, you, you would get to sort of know who's who. And that's why I couldn't have that when I, specialist units are massive with masonry because you, 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 if you get in there on credit alone, you're doing well. Um, but a lot of them were useless. And now did they get there because it's Masonic, you know? We used to call them Larry's, Larry Grayson's. They're in the Larry's, you know? And, but I never understood it then. It was only years later I understood really what was going on. And then, and then you're wiser. And then you could start, really start picking them out, you know? And, uh, you know, there was one, there was one guy who was a Jamaican guy, but he, he could sniff him out a mile off, and he used to just call him devil worshippers. He's a devil worshipper. He's a devil worshipper. He's one. He's one. He's one. And he sort of, I said, how do you know? He said, I know him. I know him. I know him all. Did they try to indoctrinate you? No, they didn't want me. I was always scruffy. Really? I was always scruffy. You no, know? yeah. but but how they would do it was they they'd have like the golf society was a big inner, and my mate said, oh, they've invited me to the golf day out, and I I never had any money anyway. You know, I was always skint. <laughs> You know, so why would they want me? You know, but you know, it's so, but others did. You you could see that's how they were going to go, yeah. and they would get in there. But you know, they quite a lot, quite a lot of them, you know, went in there. <laughs> so, John, you're on the cusp of doing the longest podcast ever with us today. Right. You've beat all of David Ike's. <laughs> <laughs> We've got him. Um, let me just see. Well, I I, I deserve to beat him because he's given me all his trolls. <laughs> So uh, it's about time I took something back off him. Let me just double check. 
on um, what the longest one ever that we've done is. I think it was Yami B. All right. And um, let me just see the exact length of it because right now we are at. Do you do you know how long you've sat there and spoke for? About three, maybe. Four hours, ten minutes four presently. Hours. Four hours. Oh, Yami Bees was four hours, four minutes. All right. Oh. You, you, this, is the, this is the longest podcast Sorry, ever, ever <laughs> on oh. this channel. Oh. And this is the first podcast in the Sovereign Studio of 2021. We've got the strength of Wild Man. He has encouraged this to go to go for four. Is it four hours ten yeah. right now? Well, God bless four Wild hours Man. Ten, four hours ten, just to show the world we are back with a vengeance. Yeah, yeah. You troll scum cannot stop this. You yeah. troll us, and we double. We double down to four hours ten minutes. Take that! <laughs> take that, troll scum. Oh. This is what you get for threatening James. My cameraman, you do any more James James videos and you've had it. For farting. For farting. They'll be moving on to right. Joe next. Right. Well, well done. Well, they'll, come, they'll have to do a, another big troll <laughs> epilogue and they to try and beat this. Does anyone have a, um, like to say anything in conclusion? Have you got anything to say in conclusion? No, no. I mean, all I would say is that I've not gone away, but I've, I've, just, I've just diversified for a little while. You know, yeah. things, things had to change. And that's that. But I'm still, I'm still about, still doing me thing. If they want to get hold of me, the website's still running. But no, no Facebook, no social media, uh, and that's it. Yeah. But um, but I, I am, I'm, I feel better because because I've just troll free now. You know. Yeah. It's it is like detoxing. It is. Your strength's back. Yeah. It is. It is. The song for four hours, ten minutes. Yeah. That's strong, oh, man. A good job we bought a bottle of wine. I'll follow them in a minute. <laughs> oh. All right, so people watching this, you've been on such a multi-hour journey, and we appreciate you staying tuned. Please let us know in the comments what you thought about this. Please let us know what you think about what's happening with Wilfred Wong, Jeanette Archer. I'm sure um, perhaps John will be so kind to come back to do a part four, so any questions, put them down there for him. And um, huge thank you to all the new subs. Subscription logo is in the bottom right-hand corner. It's free to subscribe. It helps us to get to attract more and more guests. We do have 600 guests right now pending <laughs> on, on, on the list that Ash has compiled. So endless content coming this year. Uh, huge thank you to all of our guests and supporters. And in the description box below this video, your YouTube channel is still going, right? Yeah, that's still. I've not looked at it. But okay, yeah, I'm presuming it's still going. We'll we'll, but, yeah. we'll have the link down yeah. there to, to John's yeah. YouTube. What's your preferred method of people contacting you these days? Uh, yeah, email. So there's John Wager. Is it www.johnwagerfoundation.org or something like that? It, it, so we'll have that. Yeah, link yeah, down yeah there you, as you well. just put my name in. The foundation comes up, and yeah. just email because with the email it's filtered <laughs> and all that, and I can track it. And yeah. you know, and if I don't want to read it, I'm not going to. You know? <laughs> A huge thank you to people who have clicked down and gone on our socials and our donation links and checked out our other um, playlist. All right, John, we're going to have a big hug for the Yeah, biggest, man. Biggest, oh, God, biggest, all over. biggest <laughs> longest, 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 longest I'm podcast I'm ever. Got a hug for. Take, take that, trolls. Take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Um, and anyone who don't think it goes on well, you know, I, I've got news for you. This, this clearly was a dangerous man. Um, would he have gone on to commit other murders? I think, yeah. What he's done is he's, he's abducted and he's raped, murdered a woman, and then he's, he's gone to extreme lengths to dispose of her corpse. And a midnight barbecue was any paperwork that didn't need to go anywhere. It's, yeah, it sort of accidentally got incinerated. I think our policing needs independent adjudication. Police should never be allowed to adjudicate each other. But when you get to specialist units, it's very big. And when you get to detective specialist units, it's like a stick of rock. It's basically all the way through, you know? You know, the, the youth need to take an interest in politics. They've got to stop these old Etonians riding roughshod over everything. You know, they've got no grasp of reality. They're contemptible in, in their, their mannerisms to you. And the more that we shy away from that, you know, the more they're going to continue with this old boys network. God bless you and all your endeavours. You are a beautiful man for what you do. And he knew it. He knew the police had covered this up. He knew they'd lied. He knew it. So when you get attacked by the, these vexatious, spiteful individuals, and this is what they are, they're jealous, jealous people, and they prevent victims and survivors speaking out, right, they do a lot of damage. This is a really chronically failing system. A sixth of the, of the budget, our gross income budget, goes on criminal justice and it does not work. So here we are with John Wedger, part five. I think I've lost count yeah, now. There's been a few, isn't there? <laughs> Some of them were removed during the great deplatforming. You can find them on our backup channel. I think parts one, two, and three are on the backup channel. I'll put the link in the description box. Part four is on the main channel. Part five, you're watching it today on the main channel. If you're not familiar with the story of John Wedger, well, good grief. Before we had to remove the videos, they had millions of views on his combined stuff. And his story is a harrowing one whereby he put himself out there in the police as at the forefront of investigating certain crimes that the higher ups did not want investigated. And they said to him, John, if you continue to open these cases, you will lose everything. You will lose your job, your house, your family. And guess what happened? John did not back down and he did lose absolutely everything. So, you do not find a crusader with a bigger heart than John Wedger coming out of the cops and continuing to this day to expose what's going on in the world. Now, this is a educational video based on true life events of John himself and cases documented in the news and the courts that he has researched. These are not conspiracies. We're not gonna go into any grounds that will break YouTube's community um, guidelines today. These are all fully documented court cases. You can Google them yourselves, and it's for educational and documentary purposes. Co-hosting today is Jen of Boomer and Jen. And if you've not checked out her line of organic cotton clothing yet, her links are also in the description box below this video, as will the links to John's YouTube channel, and any of the other links where you can click over and support him. Now, one of the guests John has referred to us over the years is Karine. Is it pronounced Hutzibart? Hutzibart. Hutzibart. Karine has gone into prisons across Europe and interviewed people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes on the planet. A proper Clarice Starling going in the as a younger person, and then just building this career up over the years and publishing all these books. Kareen has actually had a major breakthrough recently. When John sent me this text the other night, I was just like, wow. So we're gonna start out talking about the case that Kareen has, has um, opened up and 
then we'll be getting into the case that John's working on and some of the other ongoing things in his life. I know you guys always love it when John's on the channel, so please let us know in the comments, you know, what you thought about this and please post any questions down there for John as well. So huge thank you for coming back, John. Brilliant, thank thanks. You. Yeah, cheers. So this news about Kareen, then you sent me a text and um, I read it, but I imagine there's a lot more to it than that. So if you want to let the viewers know. Yeah, yeah. Kareen, for those who don't know Kareen, Kareen Hutzterbart, she, is, she does want to call herself a profiler because she said everyone profiles. And we all naturally profile anyway. Whenever you're in, in, in a, you know, an unusual environment, you're going to profile. And I think in, the more hyper vigilant you are, the more tuned in you are. But she's one of the FBI's top 10 profilers. There has been attempts on her life in the past. She was the one who profiled Mark Dutroux, the Beast of Belgium. And if anyone has no idea who Mark Dutroux is, D-U-T-R-O-U-X, what a phenomenal um, insight into how this system works. You know, uh, Mark Dutroux was really a low-level criminal who was used to abduct children. The man uh, was a pervert himself, he's dead now, uh, but he was abducting um, kids for, I think, 150,000 euros a hit, uh, young girls which were used for sex parties. And when um, eventually it did come out, uh, there was numerous victims, some died, they kept them in underground chambers, they were used for parties for CEOs of big corporations, there was members of the clergy, very high up members of the clergy. There was members of, of the British establishment, uh, the Belgium establishment. Um, and it was covered up, you know, it was covered up at police level, which is something I know all too well goes on. Um, and anyone who don't think it goes on, well, you know, I, I've got news for you. And, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll sort of go into it. I call it the, like the algorithm of how this works. There is always an algorithm. There's an algorithm of how these perverts get together, how they, their, their MO, their modus operandi, and there's also an algorithm of how they bully you. And it's very similar. So myself and other whist, police whistleblowers were all bullied, although it was different forces, were all bullied in exactly the same way. Uh, and it works. So it's something that they know works. And, and this is obviously intelligence-led. Um, uh, and... Uh, they tried to shut this down. They couldn't do it. And this is where people got to understand their power. Um, because in the build-up to the trial for Mark Dutroux, 90, 90 civilian witnesses died. 90 died. Um, there was threats to the journalist. There was a good journalist, a, a man called DeConnick, who actually put it out there. There was a good chief police officer again, who pull it out there, they were all removed, threatened, silenced. Um, the police went round to search a house and, and they could clearly hear kids' screams and they put it down to background noise and they were actually in the basement. Wow. Uh, there was porno films, again, this is the other thing, snuff films, porn films and snuff films, you see this all the time. The British um, uh, criminal justice establishment always, always deny the existence of snuff films. It's a total lie. Uh, there is evidence from the, the Belgium and the Dutch authorities that have been snuff films that have been seized, which have not only come from the UK, but also ones made abroad with UK children. And, you know, so th this is what we call now trafficking. It's been going on a long, long time. We have seen this come out in the, the inquiries, the government inquiries, which I'd like to talk about, if I may. I've um, been a, what, one of the very few national core participants in the government's uh, independent investigations of child sexual abuse. Um, I was given evidence alongside a guy who spoke out against, which we saw on Sky News um, only yesterday, uh, and how, you know, what he endured not just in the abuse, but also afterwards in an attempt to silence him by the establishment, you know. Um, and again, we spoke about this in other podcasts with, 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 the, with Pi, the information exchange and things like that. These are all factual things, things that they can't take away from us. And this is, you're right in what you say, things that are supposition, you know, they can be attacked, but when it's concrete, they don't like it. So this is why I say to people, you need to speak up. You need to go through the process because it's public domain. Once it's public domain, you're on solid ground. 
You know, I've just finished a civil case against the Metropolitan Police and I spoke out openly and candidly about how they threatened and silenced me. That's a matter of public record. I was threatened, you know, in an attempt to silence me by a chief officer in the Met Police. I called out, I called out. Um, there's a woman I would really like to mention her name, but I won't because I actually had a lot of respect for her in the police. She was a very good woman, um, but she gave a statement and I called her a liar. And I called, said it to court. Her statement is full of lies. She's now quite high up and she is a trustee of a charity, so I don't want to bring any badness on that charity because they help kids. So I don't do that. But what I like to say, if she, she knows who she is. If you watch it, you have no understanding the damage you've done by lying. You know, you're a good woman, you shouldn't have lied. I expect it off the hierarchy because they sell their soul. But good people, please don't lie. Don't lie, you're better than that. And it, it, it stops uh, victims, vulnerable people from ever getting justice when you lie. Please keep the lies away. Um, but Mark Dutro, they tried to suppress this and Corrine, she profiled him perfectly, right? Had they listened to her, two lives would have been saved, two lives. There was an attempt on Corrine's life because of what she knew about someone very high up. Again, we can't go into that. Um, and then, um, for some reason, what had, the cover-up had been leaked and it got out. And the um, Belgium Fire Service. Now, Brussels is is an, Belgium's an industrial city anyway. Belgium's quite an angry place because it's um, it's always been divided, conquered, and very split country between the Flemish North and, and the French speaking South and they're not the happiest of people. I don't want to denigrate the Belgians, but they, you know, they, they do, because they've always been pushed and pulled. They've got like an elastic border, you know, and it's, um, you know, a, a lot of, there's a, bit, a lot of death has gone on in that country. You know, the first world war, the trenches are, are, are littered all over that place. And, uh, and it's an industrial thing. Uh, area and it's got quite a bad crime rate and um but i think brussels i don't know how big the population of brussels is but if you take a social demographics it's not too dissimilar to london um and a million people took to the streets a million people they tried to keep it down the fire service turned up with their fire engines and they blew the windows out of the parliamentary building and then the farmers turned up with their tractors with their shite flingers and they they splattered the building Oh, shit. Yep, and they said this place needs to be cleaned, and that's why the fire service blew the windows out. And a million people, and they tried to push it down, and then they pushed the numbers down and down again. And I think that the official estimate is 500,000. But again, for a small country, that is an incredible amount of people. But the, you know, the, the realistic um, estimate was, was a million. Uh, now, Kareem was part of that machine. I met uh, Kareem. Um, uh, when I gave evidence at a tribunal, and we sort of connected through that, and an incredibly wise woman, and she contacted me the other day, and she contacted me about a week ago, and she said, look, watch the news, something big's gonna come out in France involving a police detective. Now, we are being saturated at the moment about stories of police malpractice, uh, misogyny, and, um, cover-ups, you know, really, um, and who better f to sort of voice their opinion on it than me, you know? Uh, and so we, we, we've just had a story in the UK of Wayne Cousins, yeah. the diplomatic protection officer, who's, um, you know, w what he's done is he's, he's abducted and he's raped, murdered a woman, and then he's, he's gone to extreme lengths to dispose of her corpse and then carry on with his life. Now, quite funny because he was caught exposing himself a few days before and Kareen said to me be very very dubious of flashes and years ago anyone was sort of brought up around the 70s and the 80s there's always reports of flashing and people who run on like soccer pitches wouldn't they and flash yeah you flash and, and streakers yeah, and streak, flashes. streakers yeah not people yeah. coming out of bushes in parks that's what we're on about yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the dirty mac sort of yeah. room you know and it was always depicted in like benny hill show and, and the 1970s comedy you know yeah. and she said they they are people that are so opportunistic and the the only thing that stops them from taking it further is, is that that reality and that opportunity right and when it presents itself, they will abduct, they will murder. 
So you're getting this, what was seen as a, a, just a, a, a nonsensical, sort of very weak-minded, um, minor level act of sort of perverse stupidity. Well, actually, no. The, the underlying factor here is something of extreme malevolence. Now, a couple of days before, Wayne Cousins, um, you know, abducted that, that poor girl, Sarah Everard. He had exposed himself and he'd been caught driving naked. And there was this extreme history of weirdness throughout his... Um... Was that reported in the papers? Um, yeah, yeah, it has come out, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, he, he would, he'd been caught, um, I think this was post-trial that that come out. Pre-trial it come out that he was in a McDonald's getting his penis out. Um, and then post-trial it come out that he'd, he'd been caught driving like from bottom down naked. Um, and things like that. And she said, look, the people that do that, they have the opportunity to kill. They're very highly dangerous. And it is just really, when it presents itself, they will take it. Um, and she said, look, I'm dealing with something in France so similar. She said, please just, just watch this space. Well, of course it came out in the, in the sort of international press. Now, there was a, a Parisian detective who'd um, abducted and murdered, not 100% certain on, on the full ins and outs of it. Um, I'm just going through a documentary at the moment that, that has covered it. I think it went back from 2003 and they filmed Kareem from 2003 on this case. And she said straight away, um, it's a detective, it's a police detective. That was a profile. How accurate was she? Because what happened was, um, she has been quite inspirational in how I'm, I'm now operating today, which I'll go on to shortly, and how this has evolved. And I've used my tradecraft and that of other professionals to start being a viable alternative to serious criminal investigations where there is a massive failing in this country, a consistent failing. You know, considering that we've mentioned this in many podcasts, that really the police are just picking low-hanging fruit. That's all they're doing. They're sending four or five police officers at four in the morning round to someone's house because there's been a Facebook post, you know. Uh, I mean, four in the morning, I heard of it the other day because someone put a post on Facebook. You know, it, it, it's unreasonable. There's no need for it. Things like that can be dealt with by a summons. It doesn't need to be brought in under, you can know. Can you repeat the post? Um, yeah, I, I don't know what it was. It was Probably not because if that's a crime, yeah. then we will be republishing yeah, yeah. the crime. Again, and, and if you look at what, what happened with you more recently as well, yeah, it's, okay. it's just, it's ludicrous. This isn't what the people are, are paying for. Now, she works in conjunction, Kareem, with, with a cadaver dog handler, a really lovely guy um, called Patrick. Uh, and, you know, I've had quite a lot of communication with Patrick. And this guy, um, he said to me, my dogs will find bodies up to 50 years old in the ground. I was like, wow, you know, um, he said, if, if they're there, we'll find them. And he said, we've, we've been finding bodies in, from the Bosnian War, or even going back to the Second World War, we, you know, if it's mass graves. And so these two went out and they started finding corpses. So how the authorities never found them, God only knows, but they did. And how the bodies were tied up and everything else, she said straight away, this is a man, a policeman that's done this. And due to other sort of background information, crime scene information, she's deduced straight away, it's a detective. He's used his status as a detective to coerce, similar to Wayne Cousins, very similar, you know, um, to get girls into his car and then he's gone on to, to do whatever and murder them. But he's gone on through, through years and years and years. Now, of course, they never, they never took it up. But so what she's done is... She's taken the matter further and it's ended up going before a magistrate. Now, in the UK, we've got a common law system. We, we've got a brilliant legal system. And this is, this is the tragedy, you know, and the shame of all this, that we've got such a good system. If it's implemented, we don't need any more new laws. Common law co covers harm, loss and nuisance. And that's all you need to know, right? Harm, loss and nuisance. And it's perfect. And there is an assumption of innocence with us, right? you know, uh, presumption of innocence. And it's down to those that are, you know, an accusatorial system, down to them to do all the work, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is like 99%, whatever it, you, you can sort of. 
So they've got to do their work, and when they do it, on the whole, it's a very thorough job. I know there are um, anomalies that occur, but on the whole, if someone is found guilty, there's a good chance they've done it. You know, there are cases when people are stitched up, um, and I'm fully aware of that. Um, anyway, abroad is different. It's Napoleonic, right? So they accuse you. It's down to you to say you, you didn't do it, which is a lot more difficult, you know. And that's why they can never combine the British judiciary under European law. With, with law. It, with, the, the two things don't match. They don't. Um, so a, abroad, the, the magistrate will coordinate it, which I think isn't too bad a thing because... I think our policing needs independent adjudication. Police should never be allowed to adjudicate each other. A complaint, it's really strange because um, when I took my complaint initially to the Met Police, of course, I might as well have gone out there and told a squirrel for the difference it made, you know, it was pointless. But I went to the, it used to be the IPCC, the Independent um, Police Complaints Commission, and they didn't do anything. Um, they said, we'll look into it, and, and it just, it didn't. And when I asked for, you know, and anyone who, who makes a complaint or is a victim of a crime, you should be getting a 28-day meaningful update. If you don't, they're, they're breaching their own standards, okay, and you should push that further. Um, when I pushed it, they said, don't ever write to us again, Mr. Wedger. If we get another letter from you, we're not opening it. And they should put it in writing. <laughs> So then the government said, oh, we're going to change and we're going to go to this new governing body called the IOPC, the Independent Office of Police Complaints. So I thought, right, we'll write to them. Well, they're in the same building, right, in Sale in Manchester. They've got the same postcode and they've got the same telephone numbers. And lo and behold, they've got the same staff. <laughs> Do you know, so they've really done a good effort and they are totally changing it. And, and we buy this crap, you know, and how much money have they spent on all the livery and all the, the stationery and everything else? So anyway, going back to Corinne, she's gone to the magistrate. So this magistrate's ordered that 700 detectives within this policing jurisdiction are to be DNA tested. Right, so they said, no, this is what I want. So um, it got ordered by the magistrate. Well, the other week, one of them, he goes on holiday. He's like, well, and, and King said, I've told you from the start. Go get this man. It's this man. Again, they didn't listen. Um, he was found, I'm not too sure. I believe he was hanging. I'm not too sure. But um, he's dead. He's committed suicide. And he's fully admitted to every single murder, nine of them. You know? And I think in the early days, it was only a couple. Had they listened, do you, do you know what I mean? They could have. And again, it's this reluctance. We, we, we've seen it. There's a programme on the telly at the moment. Um, regarding Colin Stagg, you know, that was accused of the Rachel Nickel murder, you know. Um, I remember back in the time, because I was working in South East London, a, a lady called Samantha Blissett was murdered and her daughter was murdered. Um, so uh, this guy, his name was Robert Napper. What Robert Napper had done, he'd, he'd, he'd picked her out of a Lonely Hearts thing and gone round her and he, he'd murdered her and he'd murdered her, her infant daughter but I, I can't tell you because the information I got from one of the officers on the scene was what he did to the daughter was just um, beyond yeah beyond you know he'd, he'd actually butchered uh, the thing but he'd actually gone to the local police at Plumstead where I was working and said I've done something really bad to a woman and um, I think he got nicked for that but prior to that he'd killed Rachel Nickel and he said I've done another one I've done another woman. And his mum even went to the police and said, you need to look at another woman who's been murdered because my son's, I think he's done it. And they, they didn't. And I can always remember the court um, press release after Colin Stagg was convicted. No, he was convicted and he was acquitted. He, he took him on and an appeal and he won his appeal. And it was the DCI, the Detective Chief Inspector, turned around and said, well, we will never be looking for another suspect. So there was that adamant, stroke arrogant, you know. They get entrenched into this mindset. Now, sometimes that is down to institutional arrogance, you know, ego and everything else, but also sometimes they're lent on. And you can never rule that out. And especially when you're, you're dealing with crimes, which start then involving members of the judiciary, members of parliament, 
there's a lever. And I can always remember saying to um, a guy that was a, a big source of information, a whistleblower, um, he was um, a, a very senior social worker. Um, and I said to him, why, why do um, the National Archives and the intelligence services, why do they keep records, you know, like this? I said, because in the police, and I remember this, there used to be called, a thing called a midnight barbecue. And a midnight barbecue was any paperwork that didn't need to go anywhere. It's, Be in the Bernie bin. Yeah, it sort of accidentally got incinerated, along with custody records. Um, there used to be another, the booking in sheet that would go, and they would have a thing called a midnight barbecue, you know, uh, and tapes. I can always remember saying to, I can always remember saying to um, uh, a sergeant once, well, why, why, why would they burn tapes? He went, if you throw them in a bin, they'll end up in a landfill site. Everything's got to be burnt. Now, I'm not saying it was a regular practice, but it went on. It went on. You know, computer records are different. You know, there's... But again, they can go missing as well, you know? Um, there's a guy that we're looking at at the moment. Um, his whole prison record's gone missing. He just doesn't exist. Yet he's in prison for, for murder of a child. And his prison record's gone missing. So, so the, these things do go on you know um and so we can't be that naive to see they don't and we, we're seeing this now with, with government inquiries and it's the same consistent outcome and it is cover-ups and lies and it always in sort of like the police's side of thing the social services have done the same and it's a need to get rid of bad news and the reason that the intelligence services don't do it is because it has blackmail value. And that's what I was told. Again, I can't, I'm not pointing any fingers or anything like that. I said, we want this to, to, to have legs and continue to be broadcast. So that's our reason why I could spout names all day long. And I've been no, heavily criticised. <clears throat> I've been heavily criticised from the word go. John Wedge is a, a whistleblower with no whistle. He never names names. Well, the moment you do that, it, you're finished, you know. Um, uh, but these people can be used at a later stage, you know. They can... And the intelligence services, you know, this is how they work. So, um, what 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 has happened then is uh, um, I started off, as you know, uh, left the police and thought, well, what am I going to do? And I decided to give a voice to the voiceless. So I went out there and I spoke to survivors of abuse, and I podcasted with them, and then that sort of mushroomed. It just it just went crazy. I couldn't believe it. But again, I was ill-equipped to deal with it because there was a lot of people that had chronic mental health problems. You know, when, when someone has been abused in their childhood, there's always an audit trail of damage, you know. And a lot of them, they will take it to their grave. You know, there isn't a the support for them. 80% of the prison system has come from terrible, terrible childhood background. The prison system does absolutely nothing to take... I mean, I'm no social scientist, but I've become very, you know, adapt really, uh, understanding that this is a really chronically failing system. A sixth of the, of the budget, our gross income budget, goes on criminal justice and it does not work. And I gave an analogy once and I said to someone, if, if I was a building contractor and then I was to say to you, look, you want an extension built in your house, so I'm going to get you a builder that builder charges £450 an hour, right? And they'll even charge you for invoices and for emails and for estimates, right? Which is exactly what a solicitor does, right? And it's unquestioned, right? And I said, but bear in mind, 80% of all buildings that this person puts up instantly falls down, right? <laughs> You're yeah. going to say, get F, F off, you know? But it's the same with the criminal justice system. Sex offenders, the average offending time on release, right? Because the majority of it is, is pornography and, and stuff like that. The average offending time for 90% of them is four hours. Four hours. It don't work. It's, it's just crazy. And then when we get sex offenders, a lot of them have come from abuse. There has to be another way of dealing with this if only to stop other victims being made. You know, I can get people say, why should we put effort into sex offenders? I get that. 
But let's understand their MO, their thinking. But you're dealing with very, very deceptive people. You know, these are snakes and they will get under your skin. And one of the things, one of the golden rules is you don't tell them about yourself because they will instantly use that against you. I've interviewed so many in the past and that, 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 there was three things they used to always do. They used to cry, lie and deny. Cry, lie and deny. They would always be crying and oh, you know, and, and then they'd lie. Well, the, the whole life is a lie. And they're denying it. Oh no, Trying no, no, no. every yeah. textbook Everything. manipulation. But crying, yeah. but crying. That was always, you know, a, a sign of, of like the narcissistic traits that come into it. So, um, so I, I, I did the, the podcasting thing, and then of course, like yourself, Sean, I got in, into the Valley of Trolls, and I, I, I just, I mean, now looking back on it, like someone said to me, Look, there's only one way to deal with narcissist, and that's run. You know, really? Yeah, don't engage with them. Just get out, get away from them. Block, 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 block. That's it. Do not engage with them. And I say this now to any, uh, because we're getting a lot of ex-criminals going into podcasting, which I think is a cracking idea. I do, but I'm telling you what: if you've got this penchant for a little bit of anger and all that, be very careful because you can lose your rag very easy and, and end up deplatformed and nicked. You know, if anyone calls you trouble, just block them, get rid of them. Don't engage with them. You don't need to. There's a lot of jealousy out there. There's a lot of narcissism. There's a lot of hatred. And haters like to hate, you know? All these ex-criminal podcasters are warring against each other now. Yeah, and, yeah. and how long before someone gets killed, you know, or badly hurt, you know? Um, I mean, again, I started working with a lot of ex-criminals. And I've never had a bad experience with any of them. And some have gone on to become very close friends, you know? Um, and, and I'm so grateful for that. I mean, the main one is, is Chris Lambriano. I mean, I look at him now like an uncle. I mean, what, a, what an incredible man, you know? 82 years old, still out there campaigning to, to protect children, you know, put him right what he put wrong. Um, and I, one up and coming one, I said to him, the key word's redemption here. Don't promote crime, do the redemption thing. But we can all work together here. Now, this is this is the, the, the crux of why I've come on here. Let me just tell the viewers, if you want to watch our podcast with Chris Lambriano and John Wedger, it is still standing. It's on the True Crime podcast playlist. It was not removed during the great deplatforming. <laughs> the great deplatforming. <laughs> do, do you know, something was really interesting. If I just digress slightly, I, I was with um, Chris and a few through other ex-criminals, um, uh, giving a talk, I raised some money for them, raised a few thousand pounds for their knife crime charity. And he was giving a talk in, in the East End of London to um, families um, of, of knife victims who've died, right? Um, it, predominantly a, a, a black crowd, you know, um, a lot of mothers there that have lost their, their children through, through knife crime. And Chris turned around to them and said, look, you know, John's here, he's an ex-policeman and all that. What would you want the police to do? And how this differs from the official narrative. Every single parent said, more stop and search. Every single one said, if they stopped and searched the kids, my son would be alive today. Mm -hmm. And I found, I, honestly, I nearly fell off my chair. And I said to one woman, seriously? And, and there was the big like, raster lad there, he went, yeah, man. He said, more stop and search. So when the government come out with this, stop and search, stop and search, I'm telling you what, it's an inconvenience for you because it's saving lives, stop and search. And this is what we got out of it, you know? Um, so it shows how imbalanced sometimes when they do these, these opinion polls, they are, right? Um, so if we could just cover, before I go on to what I'm doing now, if we could just cover this Wayne Cousins thing, because yeah, this, is, yeah. this is really interesting, because this, this clearly was a dangerous man. Um, would he have gone on to commit other murders, I think, yeah, definitely, yeah. hundred percent. You know, um, you know, he's a dog with a taste for blood now, and he's seen how it works. Um, had he done more? Well, we don't know. I mean, there was a really strange thing when I was investigating, and it was the anonymity that tourism gives people, right? So you'll get people. <coughs> let's just stick with men for the time being. That will go abroad. 
And what, what a profiler said to me, I was working with a, a profiler called Joe from Ireland. Um, so I, I had that before I met Karina, so I took a real solid interest in what Karina's doing because I know it works. <clears throat> and it saves a huge amount of uh, money as well. He said it's like hurdles. So a man goes to Thailand and he wants sex with a young prostitute, right? And he's come from a normal sort of background, but he's abroad. No one knows him, right? So he will do it, but it's it's a big deal for him. A big deal. And he'll go back and there'll be all the guilt, remorse. There'll be a lot of emotion going on in him and he'll hate himself, but he'll want to do it again. Mm. But this time that hurdle's got a bit lower, right? And then lower. And in the end, it's so low, he doesn't need to step over it, right? And that's how it works. And it's the same with Wayne Cousins. I think his barriers were going lower and lower, you know, lower. And, and of course, this is, this is where I need to point the finger, and I do this a lot, to, to the upper echelons of the, of the police. Uh, that, that isn't me grinding an axe. Well, it is in one way, I suppose, because um, like anyone who's been hurt by anyone, you, you'll always have to, you know, you know you, 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 do you know what I mean? The same with you with the prison system. There'll be things where the prison system, you think, you know, they, what are they doing? They're, they're hurting people, not helping people. But you've got a culture that is incredibly misogynistic. Now, it could be seen as very ladsy and a right bit of laugh when you're there, but when you're new to it, it's a bit of a shock because the women are, what you used to call them, geezer birds, because they were like that. Um, women were, were referred, WPCs were referred to as plonks. In the county forces, they called them Doris, Dorises. We called them plonks. I don't know why, but they were called plonks. Um, for like plonkers. I don't know why it was, and they, and they used to say to me, the women in the in the old bill, they're two things: they're either bikes or they're bikes, or, you know. Um, and when a girl joined, right, what was a custom thing? They put her posted to to the, the front office, right? And every front office had um, a stamp, a station stamp. So it had Metropolitan Police, Peckham Police Station or whatever, with the date and your job if you was early there to put the date on it, stamping passports and, 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 and other bits of, you know, official correspondence. So on a night duty, the girl's first night duty, it would be the job of um, a couple of PCs would be brought in to pick her up, lift her up, and the duty inspector would stamp her bare ass, pull her knickers down, right, lift her skirt up, pull her, or pull her trousers down, and stamp her bare ass with the station stamp. That's fucking disgusting. And that's what they did. Um, and, and it was, there was, uh, and I'll give you um, a, 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 an anecdote. One guy came up to me and he said, he was in a Scottish force and he transferred down. And uh, he said, one day the, the duty officer comes in and he says to him, right, he said, a woman's going to come in and make a complaint. She's a nutter, get rid of her, right? Just get rid of her. So anyway, sure enough, this woman comes in highly distressed and she said, I've been raped. So they said, well, look, love, you know, the, the chance of catching a rapist are really low and all that. Um, and, and they told us, go home and have a shower, right? To wash yourself, which is contrary to any sort of evidence uh, capturing procedure, you know? Um, and he said, the duty officer come in and went, she was well done for that. And the reason he did it, he, the duty officer had raped her. It was a duty officer who raped her. I know one guy that was a home beat officer who was going around and teaching women, vulnerable women, on his home beat thing, self-defence. Um, just doing it because he's a kind man. And during the self-defence lessons, his fingers were going up. You know, um, you know, oh, um, I know one guy who got um, a prisoner, a female prisoner, a shoplifter. He was a jailer, he went in there and, and got her pregnant. You know, um, it never went down as rape. Um, every single police station had someone called the rape. Every single police station had someone who had been accused of rape. Every, I, I worked with one guy, he stood trial twice for rape. Twice for rape. You know, and got off with it. Wow. Got off with it on every occasion. You mainly found that the, 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 as it were, came from the very ego-driven um, uh, units. The TSG was 
there was always a TSG officer standing trial for always. Uh, this guy was from the DPG. It stands for Diplomatic Protection Group. We used to call them doorways, porches and gates because they did sod all. They stood there with a gun. They hadn't even nicked themselves shaving, these people. And uh, uh, why they give them a gun? I don't think they've ever... I think one of them shot himself in the foot once. You know, and I think one girl that was on it actually killed herself. Yeah, I think they have more injuries, coppers shooting themselves than they do shooting people that they're meant to shoot or whatever. Um, yeah, they're not, but very ego driven, you know, they're not confrontational. They're not, they're, they're not coppers in my opinion. And the same as these coppers that work in the airport. So I'm probably going to upset people and say that, but I'm, I'm beyond that, gone beyond that. They should be doing their job, mate. There's a lot of bad people out there that hurt. And for me, there's nothing more honourable than, than catching someone who's hurting children, and that's it, end of, you know. Mm. I think diplomats, if they take that job, they should police themselves, the royal family should police themselves, I'm not interested. Um, but you, you tend to get them from them units, you know. There was always um, um, someone having an affair with someone else at work. There was always couples being caught shagging in, in police cars. One, one guy, they banned him from the from driving police cars because there was so much semen stuck on the dashboard oh. after he'd taken it out on every occasion. He was banned. The inspector went, oh, he can't have a car anymore because he was going out and having sex with uh, social workers, other police women, every single night, you know. And, you know, um, I worked on the clubs and vice unit, so I worked on vice. We had the obscene publications squad there and they had a room and they had these cubicles and they had banks of videos and DVD recorders and all they would do most of the time, apart from proactive operations, they would have to categorise pornography so they watch porn most days, men and women. And basically it was, it, it was um, not frowned upon if anyone was caught wanking in there, let's say that. And every few months someone would come and disinfect the booze oh, because so they knew that, that it would, you know, women as well as men, you know. There was one girl um, when I was on the vice unit, um, someone said to me, I'm not going to mention her name, uh, have you mentioned, um, uh, met so-and-so? There's something I need to go on about why these things don't get reported. I went, no, she, uh, she was a northern girl. Oh, uh, you know, you wait till we go for a drink. Very social bunch, right? So anyway, I met her one day and she said, oh, um, they're all going for a drink. And she said, oh, do, do you hear what happens? when we go for a drink. I went, no, they said something happens with you. I don't know, I, you know. And she opened her handbag and she had a pair of knickers in there. I said, okay, what's that? She said, oh, I have to, I have to bring them each time. You'll see what happens, right? So we go in the pub in Covent Garden and there was family sitting there eating and all that. And everyone gets drunk. And then that's it, the next thing, one, one copper puts his hand down the front of her trousers and grabs her knickers. One grabs her down the back of her knickers they then lift her up and someone times it how long before the knickers rip. And then she gets groped and everything whilst they're doing it. And that happened so often that every time we had a drink, she carried a pair of knickers. Did you try and stop it? No, it was everyone clapping and cheering and, you know. And there was people, women and kids eating their food and, you know. And it was just like, I mean, there was, there was one, um, one police station where if... Um, someone's appointed to the CID, it's a big deal. So they go to the pub at the back of the police station and the pub had, there's an old pub, but it had this metal pole. It was just a support. It wasn't like a pole dancing pub or something, pre them days. And they had this pole. So what, what the new detective had to do was had to strip naked and see how high up the pole he could climb. And everyone had to do it. Strip naked and, you know, it, it, there was things like that, these things that, that, that just went on. Um, you've got more of a prevalence of lads that have been in the military. There was, there was, they had more of a, you know, an inkling to do bits and pieces like that. Um, if we move this forward, um, a girl I know, a young girl, who's a friend of one of my lads, um, her dad, no, her granddad actually, was, was, was quite a well-known police officer. Um, uh, he, he arrested a, a well-known murderer, actually. And she always took a liking in, in, in the police. And even when she was about 16, she used to say to me, oh, I, I want to join the police, what's it like? So 
I, I got permission one day to take her into work. Um, and she's a lovely girl. She's a good, kind girl. Um, and she used to do a bit of modelling. She's a very attractive girl, all right? And I used to say to her, be very careful because they're, they're perverts, you know? And they are like hyenas, you know? And what they would do, especially when clubs and vice, when they, when they interviewed girls, they would solely be picked on their looks, solely. I worked with one girl, and she was a black girl, and she said, John, I'm the token black, because she was my partner. And I went, what do you mean? She said, look at all the others, all blonde young girls, right? And she said, I'm just here to keep their um, diversity figures going. You know, and, and she, I said, well, how does that make you feel? She said, what, what, what can you do, you know? What can you do? Um, I'll stick with her, and then I'll go back to, to, to this young girl in a minute. And she said to me, she said, um, uh, have you heard the rumours about me? Because they all said, be careful of this this black girl. She's grief. And she was she was just old school. I've, you know, she she joined very early, I think in, in maybe the early 80s, maybe late 70s. Um, London girl, you know. And um, they all said, she, be careful what you say. If you say something inappropriate, she'll report you and all that. And, and I said, look, I'll be fair. Yeah, they said, you know. And I could be... I was never inappropriate with women. I was never, never, ever like that. But I, I, my language could be, I wouldn't say, it, it didn't bother me where anyone was from or what they was, you know, if anyway, you know, but I, I, I never had any complaints about impropriety ever, ever. Um, but, you know, people say, we just said that again and, you know, whatever. So anyway, so they put this girl with me and, um, and she said, uh, you know, I've got a reputation of being really griefy, but I'm not. She said, I'll tell you what it's about, John. She said, someone got sacked because of me. And I went, okay. So I explained what it is. She said, you know what it's like in this job. And I went, yeah. She said, so when we went out for a drink, you know, blokes will grab my tits and I'll grab them, right? <laughs> right? But we knew each other, she said. And she said, a new, a new uh, inspector turned up and he just came straight up to me and grabbed my tits. The first day in, she said, I don't know this man. So I've kicked off and I've told him, don't ever do that again. And he did it. And she said, you apologise now. You know, who, what do you think you're doing? She said, I knew these other blokes, you know. So it was, whether that's right or wrong, but, mm. uh, and she said, I gave him every chance to apologise. And he wouldn't, he thought it was his God-given right. And she said, I just thought, this man's dangerous. What if I hadn't been a strong black girl? What if I'd been you know, a, a weak-minded little dolly girl, you know, it, what else would he have done? Um, so she said, I reported him. And he was then given the chance to back down and apologise, and he was so arrogant that he didn't, and he got sacked. And she said, that's why. She said, you were up there. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, and, you know, she was a great girl. We worked together for years, you know. Um, but that's how it, the old school, they used to give him the opportunity, you know, but this this young girl, I've got to be so careful because I, I always want to say names, but I can't do it. She's um, joined joined the police. She's very proud to have joined it, and she went to um, a very busy um, police station, which I think was probably okay because the busier they are, the less chance they've got to really sort of have time to muck around, you know. But then um, she brings me up. She'd been in about two years, and she's suicidal. Right, heavily depressed, suicide. She said, "I want to leave. I want to leave." Um, I said, "What's happened?" And it's her sergeant kept coming into the locker room while she was changing, and and, and, and groping her tits. Oh, and I went, "Oh no!" I said, "You've got to, you've got a complaint." I said, "Listen, I know a good lawyer who specialises in suing the police. I don't have no nonsense now where they're concerned. You know." I said, "I'll write. Let's write to the MP. Let's go and see our MP. Our MP's brilliant. He's former policing minister." I said we'll deal with this, you know. Um, let's get the Police Federation for what they're worth. I think they're hopeless, but for what they're worth, let's get them involved. Anyway, she did, bless her. She started doing it. And it had been witnessed, right? It had been witnessed. And this is this is only going back a year or so, right? Or maybe a bit longer. So when you get going on about they're trying to address this, let's, let's, let's explain what's going on in this force, you know? Um and and this is what they brought in. They brought in these new like personal liability sort of laws. So before it was the commissioner was liable. Now they're they're rolling the ball downhill, you know. 
So everyone who come forward and said, yeah, we saw little so-and-so, him doing this, and, and, and he's got previous for doing it. So we've done it to other girls in the past. And um, when they went to the professional standards people, and of course we've seen that, what was that line of duty? That was a program about the professional standards. We used to call them the duty state squad, right? The duty state squad. Because out of all the allegations that were ever given to them of proper, proper criminality, all they could ever do was, was give people words of advice for falsifying their duty states. They're the most inept, moronic bunch of coppers going. So that program, Line of Duty, is the most misrepresented program ever. The Sweeney has got more reality than that, <laughs> you know? And, and, and that's the truth. They are appalling. They don't deal with proper corruption, and they never will. They went, every single witness come forward, they then threatened them with discipline for not, for not speaking out when they saw the offence happening. So they pull it on these poor, you know, individuals, right, and ostracise them. So every one of them then withdrew their statement and she was then left and, and she becomes suicidal as a result. So, so this is, it is so appalling and this is how they, they, they just don't address it at all, you know. Um, and again, this isn't me being anti-police or anything else, but you're dealing with an institution with a massive history of, you know, and and there was a lot of victims of crime that, that got sexually assaulted. Um, there was one guy, I, th I think he actually did get sacked and he he went round and he, he was a victim of crime who had special needs. Oh, wow. Special needs, you know. Uh, he had something like a year left, you know. And he went, I mean, what's going through these people's minds, you know? Um, and, you know, that again, they used to park up the vans outside nightclubs back in the early days, giving the, giving the girls a lift home. And then, I think some coppers in Guildford got in trouble for that. Yeah, yeah. And there was one TSG unit. They picked two girls up. Um, and the girls, I think, were into porn or prostitutes or something like that. They ended up making a porno film in the back of the um, police van. Do you know if it ever got online? Yeah, it did. It, it didn't get online, but it, it got it got in the, the the newspaper. It was just around the corner from Euston Station, in about two thousand and two, something like that. They actually made a porn film in the back of the, you know, and of course then that that sort of leaked out. I don't think it was the girls. It, it got passed around somewhere, and then, you know, um, but they, it, they was always doing it. Always doing it. I mean, I've had one woman come to me and she would be picked up from school by two detectives, taken to a pub in Cornwall and just raped by, by the pub and then dropped back and she was in uniform. You know, and where do they go to? She said, where, where, what do we do, you know? So, where, you know, corruption, they say, you know, it just corrupts absolute, you know? It, it's just you can't have corruption. And um, it just needs to be dealt with properly, you know? Um, but so... So what happened was um, I got approached, again, there's going to be no names whatsoever here because... Yeah, I want to keep my channel. What, <laughs> what, what I do now is, is I work um, as a single entity, right? And every member of our gang is a single entity. And, and Corinne advised us on this and she said, listen, be linked to a chain. You come in and then when you're not needed, you break away. If you become a group, especially when it's trauma bonded, it always, always breaks, always breaks down. So I um, got approached by some ex-special forces. And again, I don't want to just say it because, you know, it's, it's like the SAS is probably the most oversubscribed regiment in, um, in, the, in the British Army. Everyone's been in the SAS, haven't they, you know? It's like Lambriano said that um, the night George Cornell got shot in the blind beggar, the blind beggar had more seat in the Wembley Stadium, you know, <laughs> so everyone was there, you know. So again, these are genuine lads that have, um, uh, and they've got like a, a, a unit and like a little depot that they, um, they've done some work abroad, um, helping out kids and all that. And they didn't realise the sheer extent. And this is where podcasts like, you know, podcasts like yourself, what I've done and many others are so important, you know. Um, so when you get attacked by the, these vexatious, spiteful individuals, and this is what they are, they're jealous, jealous people, and they prevent victims and survivors speaking out, right, they do a lot of damage, a lot, a lot of damage, because 
for healing to take place, people need justice. And one of the things they need to do is to speak, give them the voice. And these podcasts give the voice. And uh, I mean, you've only got to listen to, to the testimony of Darren Jeffries, you know. I mean, probably the most powerful um, podcast, you know. I mean, I interviewed him, you interviewed him over a couple of periods and, and it saved him. And he said, he said, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't done it, you know. And what that guy's been through. So um, it, it really means a lot. So these guys started watching these podcasts. So they, they get in touch with me and say, look, can you come and see me? So I go down with um, a member of my, my team who, again, ex-forces, getting a lot of interest from the ex-forces. And um, again, we've got to be careful here because we can't be seen as being subversive. But I think the British government, I know, I know the intelligence services watch these videos. I know for a fact that they do, and I'd like to, to embellish that a bit more in a minute, you know, how I know that. Um, they need to take note that, that, that there are some very, very well-equipped, well-skilled, well-meaning individuals that have had enough of injustice. They've had enough of what they've seen of cover-ups, you know, um, the low-hanging fruit being picked when the real perverts because of their position of privilege or power are getting away with it and the victims are the most vulnerable you know and i'm i'm always say this i i'm not here for an adult i'm not here to placate adults i don't care if i insult or upset an adult you've got shoulders use them but I, the children haven't they need protecting you know at all single levels so he said john we, we never realized the sheer extent of all this what do we do about it and I said, well, we need to really become some sort of viable alternative. And, uh, and they said, well, look, leave it with us. So at the same time, I got contacted by, by a family um, whose um, children went missing many years ago. Um, one, was, one was their child, one was their, 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 their son's um, and brother's friend. Little boys of 11 and 12 went missing, never seen again. Where were they when they went missing? It was in the West Midlands. Yeah. Were, they, were they like going to school or something? They, they were out, um, just out playing, you know. There were a couple of kids that were always on the street, you know. Uh, one had been given a bike for Christmas. It was Boxing Day, 1996, and never seen again, you know. Um, there was a guy that was arrested as he was the main suspect. This guy subsequently went away for murder of another child. N not even a couple of miles away from where we are now. And um, there was a police investigation, that went nowhere. Um, the guy did do time, but it was only because Surrey police caught him, not the West Midlands police force, you know. And um, there was, a, there was uh, an anniversary investigation a decade later in 2006, which again went nowhere. And the family were so disgruntled, so disgruntled with the police. And they got some credible information that, that um, the main suspect was seen burying something around circa 1996 in this waste ground, woodland type area um, in the West Midlands. So he told the police, the police did nothing. So what they did was say, right, they're not going to do anything, we're doing it. So they went down there and dug it up. Did they find him? No, unfortunately but they carried on. So they raised money and people said power to them. So they went on the telly and said, look, if the police don't do it, we're doing it. And they've got this collective and this community built up and it ended up like, um, like a commune. And they were working almost 24 hours a day digging this, this wasteland up with mini diggers. Um, they were doing a fantastic job. They were uncovering a lot of old artefacts. There was a lot of children's clothing. Um, there was bits of bone. There was, there was things that, that, that were conducive to, to, to the crime, you know. But again, the police never went and, and helped them, never offered any assistance. And there was a lot of weirdness going on in the wooded areas. There was people turning up and photographing them and in the woods. And it was a very, very strange environment. And uh, so they, they contacted me and just said, look, you know, we've seen you and we've heard about what you've done. If there's anything you can do. So I went back to, the, to these ex-Special Forces guys and said, look, 
if you want to help, help is something. So they said, right, arrange a meeting tomorrow. We'll be there. So I said to the family, can we come down tomorrow? So I took um, my little team, you know, all the volunteers. And then the ex-forces guys turned up, you know, the, you know, the ex-special forces guys turned up. And they've turned up with this incredible individual who's got ground penetrating radar, he's printed off maps, but he's, he's got access to satellites, he's gone back to the, to the time when it happened. You know, he knew all about the topography of the land, everything, and off we went, descending. And, and he said, look, I've got forensic capabilities. I can actually um, take this stuff and process it. So um, he cracked on doing that, hundreds and hundreds of exhibits. Um, we got, um, the military guys started doing uh, field craft and going in there and trying to identify um, burial sites, things like that. Um, Kareen got involved and went, right, I'm gonna profile this murderer. So this suspect did an incredible job um, to quite a frightening degree. And she said, um, you know, there's many more, many more. You, you, you're talking a lot. Now, West Midlands Police have said that this guy could be responsible for as many as 25 missing children. When we held them to it, personally held them to it, they denied it. They said that was a misrepresentation by the national media. The national media have tried to liaise with them and they've just been met with arrogance. We liaised with them and we were met again with arrogance. This is ongoing, so we've got to be careful. So what? So we've got now Kareen doing the profile and Kareen said, right, I'm gonna get a cadaver dog over to you. But this guy uh, has found bodies in graveyards all around the world. Bosnia, he's been out to, you know, the Somme still and everywhere. He's been all around the world, this guy. Um, and he couldn't take him over because of the COVID regulations, right? Abandoning him, and he said it's gonna, all doing it for free. Everyone's doing it for free, right? Um, and, and one guy's saying my, my fee would be 1,500 quid a day, you know? Um, but boom, so we all do it for free. So I said, right, well, let me do my thing. Give me a list of all the witnesses that you know of. I'm gonna visit them. So I started visiting them, right? And I started doing statements. Now I've seen, it was my thing doing statements and I've seen how police do statements now. There, there, there's a horrific statistic that in 2025, the average service of 90% of, of the Metropolitan Police will be five years, five years. So we are in five years time or four years time, the, the, the population of London are gonna be policed to a 95% degree by a, basically students with, with five years with no trade craft because they haven't recruited, people have left, people have had enough. There's no skill. I mean, how could you do, how could you set up, you know, 95% of all buildings built by lads that are just out of college? You couldn't do it. And, and, and this is the dire, dire state. And I have seen statements now done by young coppers and they're appalling, you know? And some of them are done in jargon, you know, with street speech in it. And you're thinking, oh, really? Absolutely appalling. Um, and no detail, you know, it's all the devil is in the detail. So um, I, I got in touch with one guy and he said, I went to the police. And I said, well, what happened? He said, they told me to F off. And this lad had met these kids on the day they went missing. And he said, um, they're in this, this woods, a different woods to where they're digging, but only the other side, right? So he said, um, no, they were in there. They, I met them a couple of days before and they told me that, that, that they're digging a hole to Australia with a man, right? I went, okay, he said, it's, it's in these woods. And he said, and I went past an hour later and I saw him with a man. And um, he then later on said, years later, um, he was in a job center and he was talking to someone and this man come in and this man was talking to the guy he's talking to. They were having a conversation, ex parte to him, didn't want him involved. And when this guy left, the fellow he was originally talking to said, I was in, I was in prison with him and he's admitted to taking them, them two missing boys. I was like, do the police know about this? He went, well, I tried to tell him, they told me to F off. I went, so you've got first hand 
information that and he's identified this guy and, and I've supplied the name. Um, and then we go down to, to the wooded area, but the, 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 the train, the ISB train company have taken over the land and they wouldn't let us on. I said, no, you're not coming on. But a couple of the guards said, I know you, I've seen your... Uh... So I contacted them and said, yeah, yeah, it's not a problem, we'll have you on. Again, I've got to be careful now because this may come out as a, as, a, as a civil suit later against maybe the police, maybe this. But the long and short of it is they initially allowed us on there to, to, to search the land with radar. Kicked you off. And then they wouldn't. And then the politicians got involved. So I took it to politics, to the political level. We got a, a former chief constable, said, I'm gonna help you. We got a well-known um, senior detective who does a lot of TV now. He, he come on board, said, I wanna help as well. So they all started saying, we wanna help. Um, and then this- not, not, not Peter Blacksley. No, not him, no, not him, not him. An another guy that's on a lot of TV. And he said, look, I'm, I'm with you. He, he said, what do you need? I said, look, we need cadaver dogs. We can't get any. Because we've got one in Belgium and the, the police don't have any. Um, he went, contact this guy, a military guy. And this military guy said, I know this case. Um, I'm with you. I'll, I'll be with you. And he said, um, I'll bring as many dogs as I can. Let's get on there. I said, well, can you narrow it down? I said, yeah, we've got the radar guys. We can be in and out in a couple of days. And, uh, but they're about to excavate the land, you see. So now if they excavate the land, we lose it. And I'm saying, look, please just let us on. So we meet with the police. And I said, look, this statement is so credible, you know, and uh, bear in mind, I've worked on cold case files, you know. Um, I know the score. I know the burden of proof to get in a warrant. You know, when it's to deal with sex crime and children, you could get a warrant and even a rumour, it would give you the warrant. I said, can't you come and declare this a crime scene? and bring some cadaver dogs and we'll go down as a group and we'll search it. No, no. And he just, honestly, I don't want to at this stage mock the guy, but he may have his, he, you know, he needs his right to reply. But if this, this comes off, then, then there needs to be a public inquiry and this guy needs to be held accountable for his absolute reluctance to do anything. And, and it was just, his arguments were just ludicrous. They were so fundamentally flawed. Um, and, and he just basically said, I'm not helping you. And I said, right. And of course, this lot wouldn't help us, so we'd take it to Parliament. So one MP speaks to the Minister for, for Transport and everything, and it all sort of gets agreed. Then I get a call from one of the ministers. And the intelligence services have got involved. And, and basically being said, stay away from John Wedger, he's a dangerous lunatic. Mm. And I'm thinking, why would they get involved? You know, the, 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 the civil servant, what, what, what is it to do with them? That, so all of a sudden we're getting obstruction. And I'm thinking, if we're getting it as a group of professionals, you know, we, we, had, we had a room, when we went to the meeting, we had good ex-military guys who knew field craft to a T, we had one of the best ground penetrating radar geologists. He knew the woodland, he knew everything, right? Amazing what this guy can do, put drones up, put everything up. Um, you know, again, we were backed up by one of the best FBI profilers and we've now got the best cadaver dog handlers in the world, you know? And that's what we've had to do. And, and they still treated us with contempt. And I said, if that's what they do to us, you imagine what they do to a working class family. You know, and they hadn't even gone and visited the family, you know, on the dig site. They hadn't bothered. They'd sent no encouragement, no support, nothing. They hadn't even visited um, for over a decade the guy that, that's in prison. And not only that, the next wood along from here, a lad was found at the same time hanging, right? Hanging. Um, dead. Been there for a few days, his corpse was starting to decompose. Uh, this lad was a little bit what we might call special now, you know, about denigrating him that, you know, again, he had learning issues, I think. He was a happy-go-lucky, kind kid. He was miles away from home. Um, he'd just been to the bank that morning and put some little pennies in his little kiddie savings account. Sweet little boy, you know? So he's got a projection for the future. This isn't a kid 
that's got anything other than wanting to live. You know, he loved his mum, he loved his dad, and he liked going out on his little bike. He was found with a knot round his neck, so sophisticated, right? Um, and it was identified by a knot expert, this is a military knot, right? A maritime military knot. Well, the, the main suspect is an ex-Royal Marine, right? Who'd been done for kidnapped boys in the past. He was a suspect now for, for multiple murders. Boom, 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 boom. And they, do, you know what, do you know what West Midlands Police said? Suicide. Suicide. Oh. Suicide. Why would they say that? So just so there's no work for them because it's not a priority. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. This is what we are dealing with. It's just unbelievable. So, you know, and again, they really gave us a hard time. Um, so we said, right, we're doing... So again, now we've got, you know, the... the, the, the Civil service have got now intervening, trying to block us. We don't know why. We've got Chief Constable pushing for us to get on there, former Chief Constable. We've got um, MPs, so I, I, I take it to um, a, a member of the Privy Council who takes it up to the Deputy Prime Minister. He gets involved. Lo and behold, within minutes, we're given access. Whoa. Right, given access within minutes. So Dominic Rabb gets involved, boom, we're on there. Right, uh, so we're now on there. Um, the security firm, police don't want to know, but they're, they're in constant info volley with the police because the police want to know exactly what we're doing. They can't be bothered to do it. You know, they could have put a cadaver dog. We're paying money for this. This is their job, you know? And it's like us collecting our own bins and then paying a bin man to do nothing. And then we get arrested for having to go to the bin man for not doing the bins and we've taken the bins out. This it's, it's just ridiculous. pure madness. And you've got a family there that have lost their kid. You can't get any higher stakes than this, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I've spoken to quite a few witnesses now that have got good information, good stuff to bring to the table, and they were told, F off, go away, go away, go away. So we've now surveyed it. The dogs are going on um, and we'll wait and see, you know? It might, we might not get anything, but this is what we should be doing. Then let's look, right? Because what, what this senior officer said to me, well, if we do it for you, we've got to do it for everyone. And I thought, well, well, firstly, that's insulting because we're professionals and we are not turning up saying, oh, search here. Now can you search here? No, you know, we're not asking that. And that was just an unreasonable even thing to say. It's just a ludicrously insulting thing to say. But then if we look at a comparison to the Madeleine McCann investigation, and the countries they've been to for that are based on rumours and whims and everything else. They've been to Morocco, they've been to Australia, they've been there, they've been there. They're constantly in Portugal where there is no jurisdiction. And the Metropolitan Police are doing it when, when it's a Leicestershire police crime. None of it makes any sense. They spent millions and millions and millions. Yet yeah, this lot, what, we said even come with us, please come with us. Um, so this is what you're up against, you know. And, and so what we're doing now is we're going to try and make ourselves a viable alternative because policing systems may change, right? But the court system and the rules of evidence haven't changed since its inception, right? So all we've got to do is present old school evidence, statements and evidence like it's always been. So the police might have all different systems that, that cross-examine, it still doesn't matter. The court will still just want section nine statements and exhibits and witnesses, and that's all they'll ever want, and that's all they're gonna get. And there's a lot of experts out there now, and whatever it costs an expert to do it, it's gonna come in cheaper than what the police are charging the government anyway, you know? Um, and all we would then ask is that the CPS take, take the case on once we've achieved the reasonable standard of a prosecution, you know? Which, you know, if you haven't got the evidence, you haven't got it, if you've got it, you've got it. Um, so, so this is where we're at, but we've got, oh, and um, of course we're all individuals and we all, we all link in everything we get, we share with the police. We tell them this is what we got. And it's been incredible. It's it, honestly, what a monumental thing we're doing, you know? Um, and it's, I'm really, really happy, you know, with how it's gone. And, and in addition, again, not naming names, got ex criminals that I work with now, um, got them introduced, um, uh, to, to to an agency, they're giving talks in schools and in kids' homes, you know, and things like that. 
And, and, and this is a way forward. This, this really is a way forward. It's what the police should be doing. John, there's just so many people talking the talk and not doing anything. Do nothing. And you're out there making real world yeah. changes yeah. against this massive bureaucracy. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, I've got my little evening job and my pension, right? I've never been support. Well, well, I have actually, but I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on my ass. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know. And then you've got people like Corinne over in Belgium doing it. Her dog, Ander, was going to come over at his own expense to do it. I mean, the dog handlers, they're going to get paid, the ones we've got in the UK, but they've got to because but they're putting four dogs on. And what the price they're paying is, is so bargain. I mean, it, it's a pound land, of, but they're getting a Rolls Royce service, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is all the community getting together, you know? And the family of these poor children, you know, there's members of them that have been in trouble with the police. It's a very, very rough working class environment. But there's been no reticence or, or animosity towards myself or any of our team, none whatsoever. They, because they just want to be heard. They just want to be... So have you met the parents then? Yeah, been, well, the brothers and the family, yeah. I work closely with them. They get updated all the time. Um, they've had run-ins with the police in the past. There's been, you know, the police have turned up there. But for, for ridiculous reasons, not to assist, you know, uh, you, you know to frustrate, really. And, and it, it's wrong. This shouldn't be happening. We pay for, for the police to be doing what they're doing and then they're not doing it. You know, it's like in the prison service where they're getting other prisoners to go and counsel those that are on suicide watch. Well, you know, I mean, it's just crazy, isn't it? You know, it's a, good, it's a good thing, but it's wrong as well because there should be professionals doing that, piecing together these shattered little minds so they can go out there and be better citizens and get their lives back, which is all they want. They just hurt, you know? Um, so, you know, that is, that is my update, really. And, and since I, I, I met with you last, it's just... And this all started from podcasting, being introduced. And this is a value of what, what we as a podcast community are doing. And it is an alternative. It's a brilliant alternative. And, and my message here is, is these are vexatious people, and there are groups out there, that what they do is they, they transcribe everything I say. Same here, and then they put it all together. Yeah, yeah. They take little bits and put a video out and make it like sound like you're working for the devil. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it says in the Bible. They see a speck of dust in your eye, yet ignore the log in theirs. And, and, but also what they'll do is they'll go to, to the police and they'll get the acts and statute and they'll say, look, John Wedger has violated this, which is what I know that they've done it with a couple of other people that have... Um, that have been on your podcast and things like that. They've been arrested because they said, oh, they mentioned this child's name. They mentioned and they've been arrested. Name. I was, well, I had to turn myself in to the police station. Yeah, there, there's, there's two others that were, were brought in for mentioning a name. And, and you know... Well, I'm not going to get arrested, am I? No, no, no. no, no we get, <laughs> look, look you, you've just got, always got to be mindful of what you're doing. But yeah. we shouldn't be because we're not the bad guys. We're doing a good thing, you know? What, what we're doing is phenomenal. And you know now... Spiteful people just want to shut it down. Oh, haters want to hate. Yeah. Haters want to hate. But I have seen people that have been on these podcasts go on now. I've got two, three brilliant examples that have gone on and I know they save lives. I know they do. Because I've seen the emails. If you hadn't come and spoke to me and give me your time, I'd have committed suicide. I've seen it. And I've had it myself. You know? And... Um, and again, there's one person he's starting out, so I'm not going to name him, but he's, he's been on your show, an ex arm robber, and um, the work he's doing is unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And, and I hope he really goes to the top. Shimmy is. Yeah, yeah, I will yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, the rest of us in this room know who he is, but he's, again, I don't want, to, I don't want him no, no, no. getting the nonsense that I got, because it's not fair, but for what? If I've done something wrong, that's okay. Let's address that, but... If you're doing good, why would you want to hinder anyone? Anyone ever um, doesn't make any sense. And again, with the police, why would they not want to help us? Why would you know the the civil service and the intelligence services want to to to, den to denigrate me? You know why? For what reason? Well, it just shows that there's probably something going on very connected. If there are 25 children linked in, 
then this could well be a big, big thing. But again, this is all subdued to see. This still hasn't gone its full distance. This could end up in the court at some point, the ground court. Um, and we'll wait and see. But um, if, we, if we can pull this one off, if we can do this, and we can then, um, even if the police don't want to prosecute, well, look, we've got the capabilities, let's do it. You know, let's crack on. The floodgate will open. Yeah. Earlier on... Floodgates, can I quickly... Yeah, yeah, go for it. So, so earlier on, John, earlier on, John, you said that um, the procedure is to gather statements and get enough evidence yeah. so that there's a minimum threshold. I can't remember how you expressed it exactly. There has to be a minimum threshold of evidence yeah, met. Yeah. What is that threshold? Uh, right, there has to be a reasonable um, prosecution of uh, 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 the reasonable prospect of a prosecution. That's it. All right. Um, and then within that, the, the Crown Court relies, uh, and the magistrates, they want beyond reasonable doubt. On a civil matter, it's, it's a lot lower. Civil courts aren't nice places to go, and people are always banished about, oh, I'll sue you, I'll sue you. They've got no understanding. It's not a nice environment, the civil courts, and it can cost you dearly, right? But we have the Crown prosecution, you know, they prosecute for the Crown. It doesn't need to be that the police are the... Um, are the, are, the, are the evidence gatherers because we see the water board doing it we see the gas board doing it you know we see um social services doing it um uh who else are the big ones that, that sort of always um local authorities always take people to court so if you go into a listings in a magistrate court you'll see rv so-and-so you know rv atwood or whatever which is regina versus that's so a crown versus you but also you might see british gas versus so-and-so but and, and, and so um, the statements have, have to be what they call a Section 9 statement. So if you look underneath there, I think there's the Perjury Act, the Magistrates Courts Act, and what it's basically saying is ev everything I give is, is, is true to the best of my knowledge and belief. That's what it really means. There is a way of taking statements, okay? Um, now, if... If you said to someone, because people say, oh, I'll do it myself, I'm going to represent myself, that's a, the, the most craziest thing anyone can do is represent themselves, because that, yeah. that is a minefield. You are putting, you might as well cover yourself in honey and jump on a hornet's nest, you know? <laughs> it's crazy. Now, if you took a statement and said to someone, Look, you know, tell me what happened, and, or, or write it down, and that'll be your statement. And they said, right, I was in a pub, and Jimmy Smith come over and punched Peter Brown in the face. Right, right okay, that's good enough. Well, if a police statement... Will be Jimmy Smith. I, I know Jimmy Smith. I know Jimmy Smith because I went to school with Jimmy Smith. Boom, 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 boom. I described Jimmy Smith as, as five foot ten, proportionate build. Boom, boom, boom. Any marks and scars? Any reason to know him? Um, what was he wearing? Um, I saw Jimmy Smith. What were the daylight? Was there any obstructions in the way? You know? Did you have a clear and unobstructed view of Jimmy Smith? And then when it comes down to the punching, and you said Jimmy Smith. He clenched his fist. I could see all, all his all his um, fingers clenched back. He drew his arm back six, six inches. He then, and and it is like bit by bit, slow motion of minutiae detail, absolute incredible amount of detail. So what a civilian might do is like there, a police officer that could be five six. And if you're dealing with, I've taken statements that have been a book, have been hundreds of pages, you know. In one case, it was a minimum of 50 pages each statement. One was 93 pages, a phenomenal amount of information. Um, but again, it's a tradecraft, and then it'll back it up with, with pictures, plans. Then you'd, you'd then go to like uh, maybe like the um, Met Office, the metro Metrological Office, and get the, a statement from them about conditions of the day, you know, and, and what all the witnesses. And not everyone sees the same thing as well, you know. Um, and... Again, if you're taking that evidence, you've got to cover statement yourself because are oh, you going to contaminate them? What what contact did you have then prior to that? And that's what's called non-disclosable material in case you get thrown out for that. So you need to keep a note, an original contemporaneous note that every time you call me, I write it down. And when I meet you, boom, boom, boom. And then know this is what we spoke about um, prior to that, especially when it goes to children because they'll then accuse you of contaminating that evidence. You know, and some people might not be articulate, so they might need like a setup like you've got here, cameras, camera on a person and a camera around. And when you interview people, you, you've got to have a very neutral stance because you can gesticulate 
to people and that can cause what they call acquiescence. Mm. Children have a need to please and leading questions, right? So you can easily lead a question. Now, there's, there's only four questions you need to ask anyone. Tell me, explain, describe and show. All non-leading, right? But they will get the most information out. Tell me what happened. So you will get a narrative and in that narrative, you're going to have to pick out the bits you want to expand on. Well, you say, you spoke about Sean Atwood. Well, explain to me about Sean Atwood. How do you know Sean Atwood? What's he look like? Boom, boom, boom. Explain about the venue. Describe. Show me. Draw a map. And it's incredible when you give someone a pen and paper, they come to life. Right? Because we think and we dream in objects. You know, years ago, outside a shop, it would be a little symbol outside. Symbolism. And because it prompts memory, no one, no one dreams in numbers, you know, it's all in symbols. So when you start drawing, you, you, you can take someone right the way back and you, you can see it, boom, boom, boom. So there's a massive tradecraft in that. And this is where you get very clever barristers. They can't attack the information, they attack the source of the information. Uh, so if you take, bless him, like Darren Jeffries, right, you know, if he was to report the crimes, well, look what they bring up. Well, you're an armed robber. You, you, you've lied in court. You've done and This is what they do. This is a spiteful thing to do. I'm not a fan of solicitors and barristers. We need them, but I, I think it's quite a dishonourable trade myself. I've got friends that are them, but they're making money out of people's misery, aren't they? But then they are needed because there are some that are brilliant at, at prosecuting sex criminals. So, again, should they be paid the amount of money? No. I don't think so. Anyone who's a professional should be paid a professional's wage, you know. Um, but when you get these, and it's because you end up paying for justice, you see. So that's one thing we've got to get over that. We've got to find a legal firm that's willing to sort of um, help out with that and, and make connections with the Crown Prosecution. And if we do that, you know, now people don't need to go to police stations years, any more years ago you would instantly be arrested and you would be put in a police station. Now, a lot of it's done by summons. A lot of interviews are done, what they call caution plus three. You could rent a room somewhere and then you could have recording equipment and you can just caution someone. And this is what, again, you, you get that with local authorities. If someone's been fiddling the benefits and things like that, you know, or they've been nicking water or nicking electricity, they'll come around and interview them under caution and then and they'll piece it together from there. So you don't need... Um, and then you've got people that are experts on forensics. Now, a lot of, for all forensic means is evidence for court. That's what forensic means, evidence for court. Um, so a lot of the, the forensic experts are civilians, you know? Um, profiling is being a big thing. People watch these CSI programs and are taking a huge interest. So these courses are oversubscribed. And um, we want to see, look, I approached the, um, Minister for Justice, right? At the time, I think it was Buckland. Um, it's someone else now. And he said, like, six of the budget, like I mentioned earlier, goes on, on the justice system. A justice system that fails 8% of the time. <coughs> there is something like a £100 million that the government will put up if you can prove what you're doing works. Right? If we can use, for an example, what we've done as a podcast community... How many of the people that we've had on that have given their testimonies have gone on to commit crimes? None of them. Absolutely none of them. They've gone on to live normal lives and they're part of our community still. I still get calls from, from Anthony. I still get calls from, from Darren. Uh, you know, all of them. Alan Merritt, we, we talk a lot. You know, Chris Lambriano rings me up and prays with me every couple of weeks. You know, none of them have gone on to reoffend. And if you look, people like Terry Ellis, you know, phenomenal amount of work, gone on to help. And and they, the system never changed them; they change themselves, and they can encourage people. And what they're doing works, to works to such a degree that it that, that it, it's tangible, and they should start getting the recognition and the funding that these people duly deserve. And they and and this is what should be doing, and that, that's why. Um, it's so important that you carry on doing what you're doing, you know, and speaking to these victims of crime and everything else, and, and you know, and the criminals themselves. And it, it's, I, I think it's just the, the best thing that's really happened. The media's not doing it. Um, but it's, uh, and what, again, people are saying, look, two, three hour podcasts. But what do people do? They go to the gym and they listen to it. They work and they listen to it. I do myself. 
you know. I quite regularly listen to some of the stuff. I mean, I was listening to one with Brian Cockrell. Uh, again, Brian Cockrell, I've got a lot of time for him. He's doing a lot of good work in the Northeast, you know, and, and I get in communication with him every now and then. And and, and this is what he's doing. And it, it's, it's, it's such a positive thing. And it comes down to that old tribal thing of sitting around a fire talking about your problems, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, keep making sure fam my message is one of family. I want people to stay together. I want people to, to stay with their children, not to abandon their children, to, to be a family, you know, and put the children first before you put your lifestyle first, you know, and, and, and you know, people with drug and alcohol issues, you know, that needs addressing. You can't go living that sort of life if you're supporting a, a drug addiction and alcohol. You can't do it. It ain't going to work, you know. It crashes and it burns. And again, we saw it in the police, uh, massive, massive alcohol issues. Shocking, shocking alcohol fuel problems. But um, but yeah, look, any update I get, you know, and... Um, Would you say that caused the most problems then in the police force was alcohol? Tra trauma, trauma, right. okay. trauma. Um, it's, it, it damaged your violence, you know. Um, when I joined, it was a very violent area I went to. And that rubbed off, that made me violent. You know, most of the prisoners were getting a clump, you know. Um, I, I never really saw people brutalised for no reason, right? But if they wanted it, they got it, you know. And some, it was basically, you get the first punch in, because if not, we're going to give it to you. But they never really had a problem with it. You can meet them in a the pub, and it was like, you know. And... Um, one bought me a, a pint once and uh, one of my colleagues got slashed across the face. And um, it was a massive fight. It was, went down as the Battle of Looper Street, it was called. And it was years later, it was in a pub and this, this bloke brought a pint over and he went, do you remember me? I went, no. He said, remember the Battle of Looper Street? I went, oh yeah. He said, you know, and it was it, one of his friends, they, they slashed this poor copper's face and it all kicked off. And uh, How did the battle begin? It was over, um, it was a very like Chelsea, uh, Chelsea hooligan area, right? Pimlico, you know? Uh, There's a big estate there called the Churchill Gardens and one of the local families, because it's always, it's always a local family. It's always any problem. There's about two local families and it's intergenerational nonsense with them all. And um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another one in a minute. It's quite amusing. One of them booted over a, a, a traffic bollard, you know, like a keep left sign. And it, they just put in CCTV cameras, the first area ever to use it. And it was caught up, so he sent two coppers down there. And so we just booted over a keep left sign, you know. And of course, it kicked off. So they start fighting. So it's two coppers fighting two drunken blokes. Then the whole estate descended on them and started filling the coppers in. And one of them slashed him. And of course, it then we all turned up. The cavalry turned up. And it, it was just like, it was like two schools fighting. And it was just mental. It was just like... But one, one of them, the funniest one, oh, this was crazy. It was another estate further along. And there was a lad there, he'd come from quite a bad family. And he'd got himself a job with the local council. And he got into gardening. And he stayed away from crime. And I love gardening, right? I really like it, you know. My stepdad was really good. Um, my stepdad was, was quite a violent man. Uh, he was a big, tough guy, but he, he just loved gardening, and he got me, in, and I liked it, I liked growing seeds, I got a lot out of it. And this lad, it stopped doing crime, and he got in the garden, but he got into hanging baskets. Oh, lovely. So he did these beautiful, honestly, they were beautiful hanging baskets. And he put them up all around the estate, right? And he managed to get the council to allow, uh, to fund him to do it. So he turned this shithole into this, like, beautiful, like, Floral dream. floral dream it was lovely you know and and it was so you know and seeing this lad that was always nicking motors all of a sudden doing this it was like i was thinking oh, how, you know talking to him i said well done well done mate I'm, you know good on you and then what happened uh, some kid had gone by and picked one of them up and loved it and i went i said no way you ain't doing your nicked right and i thought that's this is out of order so i grabbed him and he was a uh, kid from a big family so he screams out and his uncle who's a big sort of noise on this estate tower block estate he, this is so funny he comes running out and he decides to fill me in right so he throws a punch at me so as he throws a punch 
I put his nephew's head in the way, he knocks his own nephew out. <laughs> he, he smacks his own nephew in the head and it, it's all gone off. So I'm with some lad, bless him, he only had a year left. And, um, uh, oh, it was, it, it was carnage, right? So it's gone up is what they call an urgent assistance. And we, we, we had a lad um, that joined us from another force. And it was funny enough, they, they kicked him out of, I think, Strathclyde, because he was gay, right? Um, and they said, go, go to the Met, they'll have you, we don't want you, right? So he came and, and joined us. And um, he was, I wouldn't say he was effeminate, but he was a little bit, you know, sorry, anyway. It was never an issue with anyone. Anyway, we're, we're getting really badly done over and they've actually turned the police car over and it's turned into like mini riot. And he was the first one on scene, right? And bear in mind, they all thought he, he was quite an effeminate camp guy. He took out nine blokes. He, he was like, it was like Zorro, yeah. <laughs> and he was, honestly, he was just. I can remember all I can remember being on the floor and being covered in blood, thinking, "What? I didn't know if I'd been stabbed or anything." But he he hit two fellas over the head. They just brought out the new metal asp. He'd asked both of them over the head. They landed on top of each other, but on top of me, and all their blood was like flowing down onto me, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and he was like, it was mad, but it was all over a hanging basket. And it was just how it just kicked off. But it was one of the things that it was never really, the next day it was, you know, they went to court and went, yeah, all right, yeah, fair enough, you know. And, and that was it. No one really made a complaint about it, you know. But it, was, it can be over the smallest of things. But yeah, no, and it was, uh, but it's was, it was just a mad job, you know. It was a, a crazy job. That's why I got out of, um, I didn't like wearing uniform anyway. I never liked it. Um, I don't like being told what to do. I don't like being told to be at a certain time, at a certain place. You definitely were in the wrong job then. Yeah. A huge, I, don't, I, I look back and I think, what was I even doing there? Yeah. What was I doing there, you know? It was just, uh, you know, I can, I can remember once, um, it was when I worked with the, um, tracking down the paedophiles on the, on the rivers and all that, and that got shut down. Canal boats. The canal boats, yeah. And we they have a scam whereby you have to report your address every so many days. So if you've got a canal boat, you just move over to the next jurisdiction and it resets the clock. Yeah. Because you've just changed your address. And you can live forever and not ever get caught. There's some dangerous people living on their boats. My auntie's just bought one. <laughs> but, but the thing is now, now it's changed because the waterways, British Waterways Board were really on board with us because they didn't want it either because they before got funded by the government so they weren't really interested in doing too much because the government gave them so much money. Um, but then they made themselves self-regulating. So like, we don't want this. So they worked really hand in hand with us, you know, and they were, they were pretty, and a lot of their patrol officers are ex, are ex coppers. Um, but when, you know, it, I, was, I said it on one before, they, they got intelligence there was two paedophiles in London living on boats and they said, so that's how they do it, they just live on boats and they can't. Yeah, yeah, and they can move about and not get caught. Once they got to the limit of when they have to report their address, they change their address just by moving up the river to a different jurisdiction, which resets the clock. Reset. So they don't have to... Yeah, they, get, they had 28 days to register. Do, is that very popular? Uh, back then it was, because Rosie and Jim had come out. Oh, I love that programme, you know? yeah. And, um, <laughs> and of course, one of the indicators for, for paedophilia back there were dolls. So you could have a Barbie doll, and an action man would indicate we've got girls, we've got boys. Um, Bill and Ben, dolls, we've, we've just found one of them. There was all these little indicators when you dealt with who you were told to look out for, and Rosie and Jim became an indicator. Either Rosie or Jim or both. Or they, they also put the fleur de lis badge, you know, like the um, Boy Scouts badge, because that's, if that's anywhere, that's shown as a haven for a Boy Scout, right? So if oh. a Boy Scout sees that, he knows he's in safe hands, look also and putting it there and and there, there was there was one years ago it was called it monkey on a stick there was a pedo um a big fat bloke in this wheelchair and he used to have this his walking stick with a monkey on it and you pull it out on a bit of string and when a kid went by you pull it right and the kids have found it nuts. yeah kids were found it funny but he was just like the child catcher out of the you know oh. cheek cheek bang bang and uh and that, we used to call it monkey on a stick, these blokes. Uh, oh, you, you'd see them on their little wheelchairs with loads of toys. And of course, the kids were like, oh, same thing. It's the same thing. It's a lure. Yeah. If you're going fishing, you need a lure. Um, but when, when, 
they, they gave me like a month to find two more. I found 90 in a month. It was ridiculous. And one of them had plans on dismembering a child and oh, wow. special needs kids. Oh, it's horrific. Um, and that got shut down. So what they did was they said, look, we're going to we'll give you any job you want. Um, and I wanted the job I wanted. So I moved to the vice unit. But in that interim period, they sent me on this anti-terrorism unit. And we were working with the special boat squadron, um, marine tactical skills. So they taught me abseiling. So all of a sudden I went on abseiling courses. So, you know, going down blocks of flats through windows and all that sort of nonsense. So, but I quite liked it. And then they sent me on um, this other course and I had to go to a public order school. And they, uh, I mean, I was, I wanted to investigate paedophiles. And, and, and they sent me on another guy and they went, look, go down to this, this unit. Yeah. Um, it's all to do with anti-terrorism and everything else. You, you'll like it. And the next thing, they, they shoved me and this other lady in this room and chucked a CS gas canister in there. And they gassed us. And then we got CS gas. And they locked the door and couldn't get out. And, um, oh, it was horrific. Her face was streaming. And, and I thought, well, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here. I should be doing what, you know, sod this. So that's when I ended up, you know, going in, on to the vice unit. And, of course, then that got covered up. And, of course, the rest is history. You know, that that's... Uh, that's a talk in its own right, that one, you know, but um, there, there is no one that can tell me that they don't cover the stuff up. I mean, I've just, if I can just cover the civil case that I was in, I, I took the Metropolitan Police um, to, to civil court um, for the way they treated me for speaking out, you know. Uh, they, they, have, they don't just treat um, me that way. They, you know, the police forces treat anyone who speaks out on contentious matters the same way. They bully them. And they do it all the time. They'll probably continue to do it. But the more we, we bring it out in the open, the, the more it gets exposure. And the more we hold these chief constables accountable, that's why I do have a problem with... I, I do have a problem because of how I was treated under her command. And and I called her out in court. A matter of public record, I called her out in court as, 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 as lying about uh, a statement um, in which she said that she never had a meeting with me when she did and, and everything else. Um, but my, my, my court case come to a, 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 a good conclusion. There was, it, it wasn't a monetary payout, but it was a settlement, but it wasn't a monetary settlement. Um, and, but the judge, it was really strange because the judge turned around and he, he said to me, um, cause at one point I, I, I got so enraged by their, their barrister. I just stood up and walked out and my barrister said, where'd you go? And I said, I'm going for a fag. So I just walked out and I had a cigarette. And when I come in, my barrister starts shouting at me in court, saying, Mr. Wedger, you ever do that again? I'm, you know, going to stand down. This is contemptible behaviour. And, and he's shouting at me. And uh, the judge said, no, I'll deal with this. This is my court. And he said, Mr. Wedger, I have no problem with what you've done. He said, just let me know next time. <laughs> Even give me a little nod and it's not an issue. Off you go. No problem. I said, oh, I was thinking, oh, this is a bit strange. A journalist come up to me afterwards, he said, he liked you, that judge, you know. Anyway, at the end of the court, he turned around to me and he said, Miss Wood, I want you to stand up. So I stood up and he said, God bless you in all your endeavours. You are a beautiful man for what you do. And he knew it. He knew the police had covered this up. He knew they'd lied. He knew it. And he'd probably dealt with it. Time at, a good man, a good man, you know, who did the right thing. So the, the system has got good people in there. They see the police corruption. They see the police lies. They see the ineptitude, you know. And, you know, they go on the same thing. Openness, honesty, transparency. My God, Bernard Hogan, how you still always going about it. Really, if only they did have that. Well, there's a lot of them senior officers wouldn't be in a job, you know. There was only one chief constable that, that had integrity, and it's a man called Mike Veal who stood up, spoke out against and what was purported to be doing um, and said that there was 33, uh, 33 um, victims and he said he would have definitely have stood trial if he'd have been, you know, alive under my jurisdiction. And they ruined, they ruined him. So they even bully a chief constable. Mm. And this is a man of total integrity. And the good thing about the, the whistleblowers, we we all do still keep in contact. We've seen Maggie Oliver's just won a Lifetime Achievement Award. We've got a man like Lenny Harper, who exposed a kid's home in, in um, Hope de la Garenne, myself. 
and Maggie were both um, witnesses in the last government hearing and they're going to use five recommendations on my evidence. Five recommendations are going to be used now, implemented. So it has made a difference, you know, but you've got to endure immense bullying. I mean, there was nine cases I could have gone to prison. You know, they tried to take one of my kids into care. You know, they did some horrific things to me when one of my kids was in intensive care, dying. You know, they stopped paying me. They, oh, man, it was just, there was, there was not, and this was all this Department of Professional Standards, which is this um, soppy program, Line of Duty. Mm. And a very strange thing, very strange thing I, I, I want to sort of, um, uh, you know, conclude with this one is that when when I managed to um, to report it as a criminal allegation, right, because the first time I reported it to a senior officer, I was actually threatened. If I mentioned what was going on, I'd lose my home, my job and my children. And that was the, the deliberate pimping out of young kids, ages of nine onwards. And kids were dying as a result, they were dying. This was trafficking in London. They denied it existed and I had proof it did, right? So I was threatened. So I went to a senior officer to say, this is massive, thinking I'd get help and I got threatened. Um, anyway, so that come out in, in the hearing as well. So, but. A few years later, I um, I generally thought that they would take my kids off me. I was a single parent of four children. And um, when I did uh, make a, uh, a criminal allegation to this department of this anti-corruption, Department of Professional Standards, I said something, right? And I said, I want to speak to a senior detective and it has to be a woman, Yeah. right? and it has to be a woman, it has to be above rank of detective inspector, right? I'm not talking to no sergeants, and I'm not talking to no constables, it ain't happening. So they then contact me, and it's a police constable, a uniformed police constable, and I said, sorry, mate, no. He went, well, we're not gonna bother then. I said, this is serious, you've got, you've got to listen to me. And then another uniformed police officer, and he gets the same treatment. I said, you know, you need to talk to me. Um, here's my stipulations. So I get a call from a DCI, Detective Chief Inspector, which is above an inspector, but detective, and it's a woman. So John, I'll, I'll listen, I'll listen. Now I, I'd moved on, I was on another unit by this time, and I go up to this secure building, they have these secure offices all over the place. I mean, they have some crazy buildings, you wouldn't even know they were there, you know? The National Crime Squad, you, you, the only way you notice these buildings is because of the, the security cameras, there's too many of them. And so the National Crime School, we had plumber's vans in there, and, and you think they're a builder's yard, but they're not. They're, you know, um, they're on trading estates. That's where you find a lot of the real serious ones. And, and, and the intelligence services are even more bizarre, some of their buildings. Um, one, one, one of the intelligence services places in, in, um, by Victoria was a barber shop, you know? So, so it's, Anyway, um, so I, I go up there, and on my way up there, I'm met by this this detective inspector from the vice unit, and I'm thinking, I'm about to, what's he doing here? And he starts talking to me about the senior officer that I'm going to report, and it was, a, how did he know? Do you know what I mean? I just right, and uh, he wanted me to come and have a cup of tea and chat with him. I went and seen it. Let's go for a beer, and I said, mate, I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to go. So he's, he's collared me in this corridor. And I thought, that's weird. Anyway, I then managed to get through into this um, secure area. It's all swipe card access. Someone has to take you in. And, and I go in there and this, this woman, DCI, comes in. And she was a nice woman. She wasn't a bad woman. And she said, John, I'm here to listen. I said, this is involving cover-ups of young kids being pimped out. And, you know, and I've been threatened for speaking out. She said, we will take it seriously. You'll be a protective witness with us. He said, why have you stipulated a woman of my rank? I said, because, boss, you can't roll up your trouser leg, right? And that is an inference is you won't be a mason, right? Um, because part of the Masonic thing is they roll up trouser legs. Now, I work with many masons. I'm not knocking masons. I just, I just had um, someone from a free Masonic lodge have a go at one of my friends saying, John Wedge has upset us because he's talking about Masons. I'm not. What I'm saying is you shouldn't have an oath within an oath, right? And 
there is corruption and the Masons have been involved, like the Catholic Church has been involved, like the police have been involved, you know what I mean? It's so so if that Mason had done, why didn't he help me instead of berating me, you know? He could have said, well, if it's our people that are doing it, we'll put this right, instead of saying, well, you shouldn't be talking about it, sort of thing. So, But, you know, the, the unit I was on was heavily Masonic, you know? Very, very, it's, you, you'll find Masonry is big in the police, but when you get the specialist units, it's very big. And when you get to detective specialist units, it's like a stick of rock. It's basically all the way through, you know. Mm -hmm. But women can't join. Now, I know there are women in Masonic lodges, but they're on the old. But in the police, it ain't going on. Um, and of course, I'm reporting a senior officer covering up child abuse and like. So years later, someone rings me out and they say, "John, watch Line of Duty, right?" I was like, all right, I don't really like watching them, so I think, okay, I'll watch it. And there's a series about a superintendent. I watched it. Yep. Yeah. And then and a woman officer, and exactly that same line was used, because, mum, you can't roll up your trouser leg. And I'm thinking, who's leaked that? That was my <laughs> case. That was my case to a T. But, of course, what happens in that, it, it all goes down to its high level up there, you know, it's all hidden in that in allegory as they say it's there and, and it's it's the inference you know we, you know what we've seen with jimmy savile and we'll see it again and again it will happen it will keep coming out and, and people will keep getting subdued but the more we have outlets you know like this the more they're going to struggle to keep a lid on this and, and that's why i think we've just got to keep going be a really really strong and credible alternative I get a lot of ex-military guys come to me. Some of them are getting politicised, which I don't think the government are very happy about. One of them rang me up and about three days later, he gets his yard raided, you know. He's an ex-officer. And, and he said to me, you know, is any advice? I said, yeah, don't have any dirt on you. And whatever you do, do it legal, you know. Um, if they've got any dirt on you, it's going to come out. I mean, you look at like, you know, Tom, Tommy Robinson, what, what he's doing, you know, th th there's been this to and fro between me and him, and, you know, because I helped him out with his, um, his daughter got sexually assaulted and he got arrested, you know, and I said, this is wrong, you know, you know, and I actually contacted Bedfordshire Police and said, look, this is against protocol. And I said to him, look, this is the protocol they should have adhered to, and they haven't, but I don't agree with your political stance or anything like that. Yeah. But they can use it against him, the people who follow him, you're going to have that working class right wing mentality. And I don't want to align with that. That's not my thing. But, you know, the, the youth need to take an interest in politics. They've got to stop these old Etonians riding roughshod over everything. You know, they've got no grasp of reality. They're contemptible in, in their, their mannerism to you. And the more that we shy away from that, you know, the more they're going to continue with this old boys network, you know, um, the ex-military lot, there's a lot of coppers or ex-military. They'll find it very difficult to go against them. And, and if, you, if you want to take, I said to him, if you want to take um, uh, an example, there's a film called Pride. Um, and Pride is it's on film four, did it? And it's about a bookshop in, I think it's sort of um, Fitzrovia, that sort of, or King's Cross, that sort of area. Um, it'll come to me in a minute exactly where it was, um, Russell Square type area, right? And it, it's like a, a left-wing gay lesbian bookshop back in the 80s, right? It's based on them, right? The gay and lesbian community that will operate out of this, this left-wing sort of um, anarchisty type community, right? And the minor strike has just kicked off, right? And they're seeing that what the miners are doing is they're fighting for the right reasons. So they politicised themselves and they said, right, we want to help them. What do these people need? Well, they're going to need money. So they do a fundraiser amongst their community and they get a load of money and they go down there and of course they get told, get stuff, we don't want you, you freaks, we don't want you in our village. Anyway, so what they do is they go and buy them a minibus. They buy the, because they realise this, these miners, the colliery and all that, they haven't got a minibus, it's broken or something. So they buy them a minibus and they get to like them and then they start raising more and more money and it, it goes from there. And it changed history because the point of it was, was that they all stood together. So all the colliery bands, 
the, 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 the gay and lesbian said, right, we're going to do a, a march in London. So they said, well, good luck with it, right? Um, and when they, when they turned up to do this march, right, they were met with um, all the colliery bands turned up with all their, their standards and their, their, you know, marching bands and everything. And all the miners came and, and it changed the law. You know, it actually changed how they were treated and everything else. It was one up the trousers for old Maggie Thatcher, really. They sort of took it to her. And I said, if you do the same, you look at all you ex-forces guys, you know, you turn up with all your regimental standard badges, you, 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 you look berets and whatnot, you march, you take it down, the firemen do what they did with Mark Dutroux. I'm not advocating violence, but just say, we're not having enough of these cover-ups. The taxi drivers... I've been and I've podcasted uh, uh, the the monthly black cab disputes right in in central London when they would block all of all of London off. No one ever gets arrested because there's a lot of ex coppers go into a black cab in, and it's very very tight community. You try prosecuting a black cab driver. I think War Boys is about the only one they they managed to prosecute. He let the side down there, but on the whole, they're um they you know but they. They always helped the coppers. We had the power to commandeer their cabs. So they would take, especially in the West End, they would, if you was on foot patrol, they'd take you to a call. And I never had an issue with them. And my, my, my dad was a black cab driver anyway. So, And I said to him, why don't we do what the cab drivers, you know, get hold of them, the firemen, the hauliers, you know, all get together, but no violence, none of that. Get together and take it to them and say, we've had enough of you. And your MP is there to serve you. Get your MP right in. I've had people, because I, I, I've got this thing on my website, a list of, of um, people that are involved in paedophilia and all that, and there's some politicians' names in there. And, and they said, well, he could, you know, he could be linked in. So what? they still got to do their job. Go to them and make them do their job. You know, and take an interest in it. And you will change it, but sitting down doing nothing ain't going to help. You know, you've got to do the job. And the same with what we're doing with, with, with the health um, situation in the country now. If there is an opponent, then, then but do it the right way. Don't have someone who's got history. You've got professional people, get them, get them up front, articulate people. And, and, and the same with the survivor community, you know. You know, you can change this. You can. You can change our... This Sarah Everard thing... Look at, the, they went and they did a candlelit protest. They end up arresting that girl, didn't she? And she got trolled by about 50 coppers, didn't they? They were perving over her, mm. her Facebook account. I mean, it's just, but that girl has changed things. Not poor Everard who died, obviously that, that will, but that girl who, 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 who took one for the regiment, you know, she's changed things. You know, very powerful what happened now, you know? because she was doing nothing wrong. And they mob handedly jumped on her and it was, it was outrageous, you know? And then they're now holding accountable and saying she should stand down. And, I, and I'm with her. She should, if she's not serving the people, you go. And the same as the Lord Mayor, you're not serving, you go. We put them there, we get rid of them. But you, you try and talk to the youth now, they've got no interest, you know? They're, what's going on? So that's the thing, we've we, we got to educate the youth, we've got to take an interest in the youth, you know? We must invest in them um, and they've got to take an interest because this is is their world that we're going to leave behind. None of us are going to be here forever. You know, I'm in my 50s now, my mid-50s. What I don't know, maybe I've got 15 years left, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Um, I'll be gone and they'll be down to my kids. And, you know, and again, while they're sitting there and just doing all that, then, then we're not going to move forward, are we? You know, yeah. we're not. So, but yeah, no. So that is my thing is, is just really that, that we are coming together as a team of good people, good professionals, and being a viable team. If the police aren't going to do it, then we'll do it. We'll do it. But we'll do it the right way, the respectable way, and, you know, and, and if we get results and it shows it, what we're doing works and what they're doing doesn't work. You're almost a 21st century superheroes. Yeah, we could be, can we? Yeah, with <laughs> tight pants over our trousers, <laughs> you know? Right, well, power to you then, John. And if you want to watch the other four podcasts, I'll put the links in the description box. The first one really details John's experience in the cops and decades, was it 30 years you did? I did, I did uh, 25 years, got a 27 and a half year pension. 
uh, you know, joined beginning of the nineties, and I would have, I would have been out with um, thirty years by now anyway. But yeah, yeah, I, it was slightly short of the full distance, but that was enough. I was happy to get out. You know, I'd done my time. And for all the people out there, you know, to hear John just coordinating this massive effort now to to make real world changes, it's so impressive. So all these links will be down there if you want to reach out and support him. Jen's links will be down there if you want some organic cotton clothing or to follow her on, follow her on Instagram. <laughs> James's link will be down there if you need a cameraman. And please let us know in the comments what you thought about this video. Really appreciate you spending time with us today on Jen's sofa. It's a really lovely background, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, John, give us a hug. Hey. Yeah, yeah, cheers. cheers yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, great hug, <laughs> team hug. Hey. Well done. Uh, thank, thank you. Brilliant. God bless. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organiccottonclothing.co.uk.